Block 2. Scott looked out of his F-15's window. Bright orange explosions lit up the pitch black beaches. He gave a thumbs up to his weapon system officer, Gerald Wallace, who was sitting in the seat behind him. Scott banked his F-15 to the left to get ready for another bombing run. Corporal Dejer hugged his legs. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Oh gods, please save me. He rocked back and forth in the hole he had dug only a few hours ago. His guard Majapanzer had been destroyed from an air attack and his crew has already scattered. He didn't even have any weapons on him other than his pistol. He also had no commanders to answer to. Other than the colonel that was currently taking charge, elves were following whoever was the highest ranked of the survivors of their units. Corporal Dejer had no idea where his unit was. It was pitch black in the hole but there were constant flashes from the explosions that shook the ground like an earthquake. Miles behind the front line. All aircraft have dropped their payloads. It's our turn now. The guns on M109A7 Paladins of the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment all traversed upwards in unison. The blasts of the gun rocked the air. The self-propelled artillery moved back a bit from the force of the blast. A few minutes later, front line, the explosions stopped. To the elves, it was a sign that the American assault would begin. The elven infantry in their foxholes and poorly organized trenches gripped their weapons and peeked out. The Magipanzer crews stayed quiet in their Magipanzers. Anticipation was heavy in the air. Lights had all been turned off in order to surprise the Americans. Then, the ground shook suddenly. The Americans hadn't begun their assault. They were just getting ready for another round of firing. Throughout the night, the firing let up only for short intervals. It switched constantly from American aircraft bombing runs and artillery strikes. A few hours later, a convoy of trucks appeared on the road. The truck in front of the convoy stopped a few yards from the line of firing M109A7S. The lieutenant colonel of the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment walked to meet the men exiting the truck. He shouted to someone on his left. Bannock, the magazines are here. Bannock walked up towards them. Are you with the 26th Brigade Field Artillery? Yes, we have orders to support you. You are the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment, correct? A blast from a paladin interrupted their conversation. Yes, we are unsure of the range of your guns so you might need to get closer. Wait a second. Bannock turned towards his lieutenant colonel. We are going to need to give them a map that marks where the elves are. I don't think their guns have the range of ours. I will get someone to grab it. Bannock turned back towards the Magusian commanders. Give us a second. We will show you where you need to fire. 2230 April 13th, 2020 CE. 0215 Sun 14th, 195 E. Cease fire. All around the front. The artillery immediately died down. This command was also given out to the Magusian artillery units through their communication lines. Only the tip of the sun was out of the horizon. For nearly six hours, hundreds of thousands of pounds of bombs and shells were dropped on the elves. Captain John Rose directed his tanks forward. The orders had been given many hours ago. Once the ceasefire order was given to the artillery, all other ground units would begin an advance. Isaac and his infantry platoon slowly walked forward. They had disembarked from their Bradleys earlier. The ground was full of craters. It seemed highly doubtful that anybody had survived. Then they heard voices. We surrender. We surrender. Please don't shoot. They couldn't understand them but it was clear from their hands that were up and the lack of weapons they were carrying that they were surrendering. An American infantryman looked down into a foxhole. He laughed. Hey, this guy in this hole is still alive. Get over here. You gotta look at this. He's asleep. A few other infantrymen walked towards the hole. Hey, wake up. Ha. Huh. W.H. Deja blinked his eyes and looked around before slowly putting his hands up. There were humans surrounding his hole and had their guns pointed at him. He realized that he had fallen asleep during the bombardment since it was day now. 0424 April 14, 2020 CE. 0512 Sun 14, 195 E. Afvalin. Elven Nation. Zeno was pacing around in Taran's office. He had some dark circles under his eyes. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the Hexenpsons. I'm sure of it. We looked through everything. Every little detail. They should have worked. Taran sighed. But they didn't. Are you sure you aren't overlooking anything? Unless they were shot down. Then I haven't overlooked anything. The fuel consumption is correct. 
There were no problems with the rocket then. Zeno got interrupted. Wait, stop. What? Say the first few words of what you just said again. He blinked. Unless they were shot down, then. Stop. What? You can't be serious. The Heximpsons have a speed of more than 700 miles per hour, nearly the speed of sound. Nothing can shoot it down. Taran sighed yet again. Nothing in our arsenal but what about the Americans? Their aircraft obviously can go faster than the speed of sound. It won't be far-fetched if they have technology capable of shooting down aircraft that can fly at the speed of sound. We have technology capable of shooting down our own aircraft. The Americans should have technology capable of shooting down their own too. Taran shook his head before continuing. The Hexenbsons aren't going to work. I'm putting a stop to all Hexenbson production. What? You can't just do this. They will work. If we fire a large enough amount of them, then we can surely overwhelm whatever defenses they have set up. Taran set down his pen. I know you were very invested in this project but we need the material for the jets. The Hexenbsons aren't working and we don't have time to produce more. Even if it's just an issue as you originally said and it wasn't the Americans shooting them down, we don't have time to fix it. 0506 April 13th, 2020 CE 0533 Sun 14th 195E. Somewhere in the Pacific. Admiral Adam Vanor sat quietly in his office. His aircraft carrier rocked up and down in the violent waves. A large storm system was over them. Outside, the sky was dark and the waves were ceaseless. A massive formation of ships moved forwards. Each ship going up and down the violent tides. Joint Region Marianas Guam. A radar operator started to look a bit panicked as he watched his screen. Holy shit. Um. Guys. You guys gotta take a look at this. Is there an issue with the radar? I don't think it is. Um, it might be the entire Elf Navy. Washington, D.C. President Hayes was clearly agitated. How did the satellites not see that large of a fleet? It's a 100 ship fleet for crying out loud. Secretary of Defense Carlson had a glum look on his face. Clouds, sir. By their luck, a massive storm is moving through that entire area. What units do we currently have based in Guam? Not much. We have stopped the continuous rotation of our bomber forces there since we no longer have any adversaries in the Pacific. It is also much faster to go across the Atlantic to reach the Imperium so units have been redeploying from Guam. However, from the direction that they are going, they are going to completely miss Guam. They are heading straight for Hawaii. Kralson paused shortly before continuing again. We have time. If they were going for Guam, we would have been in trouble. We can rush a response using ships, submarines, and aircraft from Naval Base San Diego and Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. There are also additional units in other naval bases and Air Force bases across the West Coast. We can further what we have and assemble an organized response. If push comes to shove, we can try to reactivate the USS Missouri in Honolulu. The USS Missouri, the battleship? Isn't that just a museum piece now? How are we even going to use it as a naval ship? I doubt it can even move. Well, we are not going to use it as a ship. We can use it as a stationary missile platform. There are four MK-141 Harpoon launchers and eight MK-143 Armored Box launchers that were installed in the late 1980s. Those weapon platforms can probably be reactivated in time. Phalanx seals that can maybe still be used. We need everything we have got. 81. Chapter 58. Preparing for future battles. 0215 April 14, 2020 CE. West coast of the United States. USS John C. Stennis. Rear Admiral Charlie Kirkland looked sternly over the horizon. The sun had yet to rise for the new day. He shook his head. This will be one hell of a fight. In addition to the ships in the carrier strike group of the USS John C. Stennis, 13 Arley Burke class destroyers, 7 Los Angeles class submarines, 5 Ticonderoga class cruisers, 4 Virginia class submarines, and even both Zumwalt class destroyers were at or sailing towards Hawaii, Tucson Air National Guard Base Arizona. Lights lit up the base. Pilots ran onto the runway and towards their planes. The alarms of the base seemed like they were going haywire. They quickly climbed into their F-16A-Bs and F-16C-Ds. Although designed for air superiority, the F-16 Fighting Falcon was considered a multi-role aircraft. They were capable of carrying and were currently equipped with anti-ship missiles. One by one, they taxied onto the runway. 
the 162nd Fighter Wing, which was based at the Tucson Air National Guard Base was flying to the Hickman Air Force Base. The Hawaii Air National Guard that was based at the Hickam Air Force Base had the 154th Wing which was only equipped with F-22S. Those would be useful against the naval aircraft that the elves have brought but useless against any of the elven ships. On the west coast, squadrons of jets were taking off from Air Force and Air National Guard bases. 0724 April 14, 2020 CE Washington, D.C. We have also detected a large number of submarines, however, the exact number is unknown. The president was visibly irritated at the news. How bad is the situation? Will they be able to reach Hawaii? Our current analysis of the situation still deems it highly unlikely that they will be able to reach Hawaii. Even with Guam closer to the United States than our original world, we still have time. The president started drumming his fingers on the desk. What to do? What to do? It's clear that we have to crush them. Yes, Kralson, I understand that. I'm worried about the civilians. If we fail, Hawaii would be in danger. A million people live there. Should we call for an evacuation? I need to assure the people that we can handle the situation. Should we keep it a secret to prevent mass panic? It has been more than 80 years since an enemy nation has ever attacked American soil. And it would be at the same location. During his presidency. He took a deep breath and his drumming turned louder. 0811 April 14, 2020 CE. 0705 Sun 14, 195 E. Beaches of the Magus Imperium. Isaac and one of his squad mates wandered down the beach, although under the pretense of looking for more elves, they were just having a leisurely walk. Isaac watched as his squad mate kicked at one of the charred remains of an elf. How many prisoners is this? Isaac looked up at the question. From what I have heard, nearly 50,000. His squad may twistled at the number. Have we ever gotten this large amount of POWs? Probably back in World War II or something. Still, it's surprising that that many are still alive. Isaac glanced around at the elven bodies lying on the beaches. I'm pretty sure this is going to be a headache to handle for whoever is handling this. Poor guy. Isaac chuckled. Good thing we are just grunts. Captain Rose looked out at the ocean from the cratered beach. He knew that they would be sailing across very soon. Elven weapons were strewn all over the blackened sand. The burnt out husk of an elven tank was just a few yards away. Around him, the infantry was guiding the surviving elves off the beach. Athvalin, Elven Nation. The headquarters was bustling with elves. The situation has been turning worse and worse by the day. High-ranking officers talked amongst themselves. We have lost contact with multiple of the other convoys. We have also received absolutely no reports of the sinking of any of their submarines. How bad is it? We are expecting a 60% survival rate. All the officers went quiet. That was a couple hundred thousand casualties. The leader would not be happy with that. The ocean between the Elven Nation and the Magus Imperium. The journey has so far been extraordinarily smooth. It was surprising in comparison to the hell she had experienced from the Americans during her retreat. Ara placed a hand on her knight. Its metal armor glinted in the sun. She thought back to her mother. She quietly sprouted out her thoughts as if she wanted to confirm them. Maybe I really should try settling down. Finding someone nice to marry doesn't seem too bad right now. If it was a month ago, she would have scoffed at the idea. Distinguishing herself was all she could think about in the past. Somewhere in the Elven Nation, the two Green Beret split teams have rejoined each other after scouting their areas out. They had been on the move all night and morning. Finding a comfortable and secure place, the two weapon sergeants started conversing. They have done immense amounts of preparation in these areas. They are throwing whatever they have together. They seem to be using some of their outdated arsenals. I spotted some clearly older. World War One era style artillery pieces and tanks. They look extremely strange but by technological comparison, they are definitely World War One. Well, from what we have learned about the elves from the information we gathered from the natives, those strange looking World War One era tanks and artillery are probably about 150 years old. I'm surprised they are even in working condition. We didn't find any outdated 150-year-old weird equipment from our investigation. In this area over here, they are much less prepared but they are all definitely German-style World War II equipment. 
they're currently still in the process of fortifying. I'm not sure how our satellites haven't been able to spot any of the movement for this. The assistant operations and intelligence sergeant commented on that. This continent is extremely rich in temperate forests, they could have just decided to move them through the forests instead of the roads. Why would they do that though? They should have no understanding of our reconnaissance technology. Maybe they do suspect that we have the capability to view them using satellites. Do they even know what satellites are? Doubtful. They have been underwater all this time. However, it's likely that they felt it extremely fishy that we were able to strike their forces at any time and anywhere. Pablo nodded at the conversation and turned towards one of the communications sergeants. Start sending this information back. Inform HQ that we will go back to our main objective. They had brought along radios for communication with headquarters. It was ascertained that the elves could not intercept their radios. The elves relied on mana waves for communications so it was doubtful if the elves had any technology capable of listening in on radio waves. 0933 April 14, 2020 CE Washington DC President Hayes was in another deep discussion of the current situation. Although the elves in the Pacific are clearly an issue, we still can't neglect the invasion of the elves' homeland. Kralson nodded his head. The fanaticism of the elves is a worrisome factor. They do seem more similar to Imperial Japan than Nazi Germany. Is there a way we can exploit this fact? We can do some things similarly but not everything. Keeping the current leader of the elves is not possible. He's the source of this fanaticism. According to the elves we have captured, he also isn't viewed as a god. A large portion of elves themselves have a hatred of humans. What are our choices then? Our most feasible option right now and the one we are currently preparing for is to launch an invasion. There are a few problems with this. We will most certainly meet stiff resistance from their military and the civilian population. In addition, we will have to worry about resistance fighters. This won't be like Iraq in the Gulf War. We faced a total of 900,000 then. The elves here have more than a couple million. It will be a hard fight. Our second option that may solve those issues and may seem like an easier option is to launch a nuclear missile or two and hope that their leader surrenders. If their leader surrenders, then the elves themselves might lose some of their fanaticism. Similar to what happened with Imperial Japan. What's different is that we can just dispose of the elven leader afterward. I highly doubt we can use him as we did with Emperor Hirohito. The president pondered about Kralson's suggestions. What would happen if we launch our missiles and destroy a few of their cities but they don't surrender? Well, we would either have to actually invade them or completely annihilate them using our nuclear weapons. Well, the first one leads back to our first feasible option and the second will certainly cause an outcry from the people. That's why I believe an invasion, however hard it is, is our most feasible option here. 1148 April 14th 2020 CE 0854 Sun 14, 2020 CE Elf Nation. The Green Berets were continuing towards their objective at a quick pace. They had already passed a few towns and cities and were able to gather the current circumstances of the civilians. From what more they had observed, the entire elven civilian population was barely informed of their current predicament, but they did seem to have an inkling that something was going wrong. However, they had immense trust in their leader and brushed it off. The elf newspapers were clearly filled with propaganda and falsehoods. Articles ranged from saying that they were winning and that the human empire has already fallen to advertisements for human slaves. There were many pictures in the newspapers of their past victorious battles against the Magus. 1148 April 14, 2020 CE 0554 Sun 14, 2020 CE Kingdom of Albia Sown continent, Miller got out of the Humvee to stretch. He looked back at Wolfred who was sitting in the driver's seat. That was a long trip. We are a few miles from the front line. Seems like these Nazi elves haven't made much progress. Well, we are here to push them back. Anyways, I'm exhausted. Let's get some rest. Behind them, other diamond wolves got off of their vehicles. In addition, the Cat Kingdom's 5th Division was further behind. The Diamond Wolves had purchased drugs in order to accompany them. 74 Diamond Wolves Interlude Part 1 1148 April 14, 2020 CE 0554 Sun 14, 2020 CE Kingdom of Albia, Sown Continent Miller stretched. That was quite some journey. We still got work ahead. 
would prefer to have a short break, I was the one who drove. You slept nearly the entire trip. Still doesn't feel comfortable being crammed into a vehicle for hours on end. Weren't you in the Marines? You know my military background as clear as day, Commander. Wolfred shook his head. Let's go there's no time to dally. We still have to get everything organized before we can actually go to bed. The area was bustling with soldiers of all shapes and sizes. Wolves, bears, tigers, and many other strong beastmen. There were also human knights. Following Wilfred, Miller walked up to Flame Tail. Wilfred got her attention. We are here as support attached to your division but I would still like to join in on whatever meetings you high-level officers are having. Of course, I was just told that we should be having one soon. You and your subcommander can join. Just follow me. They were welcomed by a large bear, Commander Flame Tail. Good to see you again. It is too. Commander Grizzly Jack. Grizzly Jack looked down at Ron and smiled. Ron, how are you doing? Still falling off bridges? Commander Grizzly Jack chuckled at his own comment. Ron bowed. I'm doing well, Commander Grizzly Jack. No need to be so formal. I still remember the time you were just this small and I had to dive into the river to save you after the bridge came out right under you. He looked towards Miller and Wilfred. Ah, you two must be part of the human mercenaries that were hired. Miller felt as if the ground shook from the bear's booming voice, they got their introductions out of the way and were welcomed into the tent for the meeting, there were tigers, jaguars, wolves, bears, and a few other types of beastmen sitting around, there were also a few humans, sitting at the opposite end of the entrance was a very imposing rhino beastman, welcome commander flametail and commander grizzly jack, they both saluted and replied at the same time, reporting for duty, lord commander. The rhino who was called the Lord Commander turned his attention to Miller and Wilfred. You two must be the mercenaries from the United States. Welcome, Commander Wilfred and Subcommander Miller I presume. I'm Lord Commander Darkhorn. I'm in command of all frontline forces. Wilfred and Miller acknowledged him and the meeting began. He began to speak. We have been fighting the elves for some time right now and we have only been on the defense and retreating. However, it is now time for us to begin our counterattack. We will push them out of the kingdom of Albia. Murmurs rose up in the room among the commanders. Miller and Wolfred stayed quiet and looked around. One of the humans in the room raised his voice above the murmurs. Lord Commander. Yes, Gladwine, with all due respect, sir, how do you expect us to accomplish that? The elves have much more superior technology and there had been no way to get around that. True until now, but with the help of the mercenaries we have hired. The mercenaries? Sir. This is a slight to the honor of knights. Depending on mere mercenaries, Commander Flametail has written to me that she holds these mercenaries' abilities in high regard. I have also heard that their country has nearly pushed the elves out of the Imperatoria continent, single-handedly. He looked towards Miller and Wilfred. I have high expectations. I hope that you do not disappoint, but Lord Commander, Commander Gladwine sat down clearly upset. I will tolerate no more protests. We still have more matters to discuss. The meeting proceeded for around another hour. There was further discussion about the positioning of the units and the plan for the offensive. Flametail walked out of the tent with Ron following closely behind. Still carrying that little kitten with you, Commander Flametail, Commander Grizz, a wolf beastman greeted them with that. Flametail turned around and nodded with a neutral expression. Ron is a very good squire, thank you. I'm not that surprised that humans are with you too. He laughed before continuing. Typical. The weak always flock to you cats. Ron started hissing. Ron stop. His hissing immediately stopped but his hostile stare didn't. Understood Madam Flametail. Madam Flametail this. Madam Flametail that. It seems so funny. Well, now if you will excuse me. I have some important matters to attend to, you cats can go laze around in the sun. In a tent, Ron voiced his complaints in a childlike manner, but mom, he was being a prick again, I know, Ron, but we can't be having fights amongst ourselves right before a major offensive, if it was any other day, I would have given him a good beating. Ron was still clearly upset. Flametail shook her head, he's just being jealous of our division's accomplishments, now go get some rest. We will be marching into battle tomorrow. Ron nodded and walked off to his tent. His back felt very sore. He had been accidentally bumped off of the trucks multiple times, 
Miller asked Wolfrid as they were walking towards their supplely trucks. I'm not sure if I had heard that rhino correctly but they want us to be the vanguard. Seems like that Lord Commander guy is testing us. From the way this is planned, the only actual support we are getting in this battle for the first 30 minutes is from the 5th Division. Won't it also be bad for him if we lost? He's being cautious. All the other forces are far enough that they will be able to quickly retreat if we fail. We are just some mercenary unit. Of course, he doesn't trust us completely but he clearly has high hopes in us. We just got to prove ourselves. What are we going to do about those elven tanks? I thought we were planning to use hit and run tactics. Wilfred pulled something out of the back of the truck. Why do you think I brought these then? Less than an hour later. Miller started setting up his tent when a commotion got his attention. Wolfred was arguing with a human knight. As he got closer, he saw the human knight was Commander Gladwine. I challenge you to a duel. I don't use a sword. He laughed. You don't have a sword? The elves don't have them either. And neither does the Imperials. And why do you think they don't have them? Swords are archaic weapons. I will give you a sword and we will. A booming voice disrupted Gladwine. What is happening here? Gladwine turned and immediately saluted. Lord Commander. Commander Gladwine. What are you doing? Sir, um, I just wanted to test the capabilities of these mercenaries, as they are a vital component of an operation that my men will participate in. I need to understand if they are qualified. There is no need for that. But sir. Darkhorn glared at Gladwine. Are you doubting the words of a superior officer? No sir. I will take my leave. Sir. Gladwine scampered away as Darkhorn looked over at Wolfred. Sorry about that. He's a proud knight. It's fine. Wolfred knew that even Darkhorn had some doubts about the Diamond Wolves' capabilities. It was hypocritical of Darkhorn but Wolfred was still happy that he was giving them a chance to prove themselves. Afterward, Darkhorn departed as quickly as he had arrived. 1535 April 14th. 2020 CE 0747 Sun 14th 2020 CE Elven Headquarters Subakan Kingdom Field Marshal Nvnayana Commander of all Elven forces on the Soan continent studied the laid out map the current line is finally stable we can now restart the offensive their allied human kingdom the Subakan Kingdom had finally mobilized their entire army. Even though it only consisted of human knights who were much weaker when compared to the beastmen. With this vast boost in manpower, the elves were able to regroup their spread out forces without losing any territory. He laid out his plans to his subordinates. We will push through their center. When we cause that to collapse, the sides will give way. Having such a meager force, it was decided that it was best that they concentrated it into a heavy punch that could destabilize the technologically inferior enemy. 0825 April 15, 2020 CE 0412 Sun 15, 2020 CE Frontline The Magi Panzer engines roared to life. A division of them headed straight for the Sone League Army's center. Report Surprise attack Multiple groups of tanks are coming. Scouts from the Sone League had quickly come back when they sighted a large Magipanzer force headed straight towards them. The usual elven artillery fire and close air support that preceded attacks didn't appear so the Sone League was caught completely off guard. News of it spread quickly across the front line. The Diamond Wolves had moved out earlier in the morning to take up the position from where they will be starting the offensive. A somewhat worried member of the Diamond Wolves was talking with Wilfred. What do we do about this commander? We can't be expected to take on 100 tanks. We have never done this before. We are literally in the way of an armored spearhead. Wolfred shook his head. Well, it seems like the elves got a jump on us. Funny how we decided to go on an offensive at nearly the same time. Miller looked up from cleaning his gun. Well, we should be prepared for this. Depends on how large that tank force is. The scouts just said multiple groups of them. Any orders to pull out? Wolfred shook his head again. The Soans is trying to stop it. Seems like that rhino is pulling units from the flanks to reinforce us. If they punch through, the Soans is gonna have a major problem. I won't be surprised if they had invested everything into this defensive position. Well, I guess we are using a different weapon. The Carl Gustafs won't cut it. Wolfred stood up before talking again. We are moving out. The person who was talking to Wilfred earlier looked up. Where are we going? Can't stay on open ground when tanks are coming. We are going to a better position. The Soans instructed us not to move though. Miller laughed. He remembered that this guy was new. 
We are mercenaries, we don't have to follow orders. We are getting paid to kill and defeat the enemy and that's our objective. If the orders given don't help us accomplish what we are being paid for, then we don't need to heed them. More than an hour later the first elven tank appeared from the horizon. It slowly got close and closer. Even more elven tanks appeared from out of the horizon. Like test these babies out. Fire. A tow missile slid out of a tow launcher. An hour earlier. $100,000 a pop. Didn't put much of a dent to the gold we got from the zones. Though these things are still expensive. We only got two of them launches so we have to use them well. Should have the range to take out them tanks. You literally seem to be pulling these weapons out of thin air. Why don't I know that we bought these? What can I say? I love surprises. Miller sighed. He was getting a bit tired of his commander's recent shenanigans. Where did you even get this? Was this approved? I can understand the Carl Gustav getting through but tow missile launchers? Don't tell me you got these off some sort of black market. Had some connections. When you are in the mercenary business, it's important to have them. Back to the present. The forwardmost guard tank exploded. They shouldn't have ranged anti-tank weapons. Where is it coming from? They are firing from somewhere hidden. Spread out and move forward. Another guard tank went up in flames. Wilfred laughed while looking down his binoculars. Ha, huh, look at them cook. They still haven't seen us. Pretty sure they are expecting some sort of massive anti-tank gun. Keep up the fire. I only see ten of them. Now they're spreading out. Well, that won't help much against guided missiles. A tow missile slammed into another one of the elf tanks. It went up in flames as the tank lurched forward before stopping. 68 Diamond Wolves Interlude Part 2 0937 April 15, 2020 CE 0448 Sun 15, 2020 CE Kingdom of Albia, Sown Continent, at once. The guards stopped their advance and started backing up at full speed. Another one blew up as a tow slammed into its turret. One of the tow operators laughed. Look at them go. They haven't even fired yet and they are running. Then, the guns on all of the guards flashed. A shell impacted close to their position and exploded. Another one was way off target. A couple flew right over them. The force from the overhead shells was easily felt by the mercenaries below. Everyone turned their heads to look at the operator who said that. I will. I will shut up. Miller watched as the elf tanks backed further and further away. They are out of range now. We got six of them. That's what I would call a job well done. Okay. Boys, time to pack up. We are moving. Wolfred dusted off his cargo pants as he got up. He watched as his men picked up the tow launcher. Careful with them. If any of you break it, it's coming out of your paycheck. I mean it's seriously this time. And it ain't cheap. They walked back to the Humvees and trucks that had been parked further back. Miller caught up to Wilfred. Where should we go? Somewhere close by but not too close would be sensible. We are gonna keep ambushing them until they give up and go back home. A person came running up to them. Commander, there's a knight on a horse coming in our way. Wilfred nodded. Stay on guard. Wilfred shouted towards the incoming horseman. Stop. Identify yourself. The horseman stopped and reined his horse in. A messenger under the orders of Lord Commander Darkhorn. I have an important report to make to Commander Wilfred. You are speaking to him right now. The horseman got off his horse, walked to him, and saluted. Sir, multiple elven tanks have overrun positions of the 9th Division and 15th Division. Lord Commander has ordered your unit's retreat. You are in a dangerous position and under threat of encirclement. In addition, he has commanded your unit to reposition to help the 5th Division. They are currently engaging enemy infantry. Scouts have also reported that elven tanks are approaching their position. Got it, but what about the elven tanks that came through here? The messenger was alarmed. Elven tanks came through? Well, no, we beat them back. Ten of them came and we destroyed six of them. The messenger blinked at Wilfred in surprise. You destroyed six of them? Yeah. You, I, I will report this. Um, where did you exactly destroy them? Can I take a look to confirm? Not too far from here. Wolfred pointed towards the back. Go over that hill and there should be a clearing with their destroyed tanks. Thank you. The knight saluted and rode off. Wolfred turned towards his men. 
Okay, boys, change of plans we are skedaddling. Seems like our friends in the 5th Division need our help. Elven Headquarters, Sabakan Kingdom. Field Marshal Ayana looked at the battle report in surprise. Our flanking force was defeated. Only 4 out of the 10 guards survived. Some sort of anti-tank weapon is blocking the way. So the hands of those slimy Americans have even reached here. The Field Marshal spat out those words in disgust. The adjunct continued his report. Other than that setback, all other positions are not facing any difficulties. Categorize this as a small American unit that has come to support the kingdoms here. We will have to find a way to deal with it. Kingdom of Albia, Sown Continent. The knight slowly trotted his horse up to the wreckages of the elf tanks. He stopped his horse and came down. He touched the twisted metal of one of the tanks. They actually killed six. Thirty minutes later, the sounds of gunfire echoed in the sky. Keep security. Bravo one, please move up to scout the area. We should be coming up to a battlefield. I don't want any nasty surprises, got it. Bravo one is moving ahead. One of the Humvees got out of the line of vehicles and moved up from the sides of the road. I don't see any tanks yet. Is the road clear? The 5th Division is defending it. The elves are firing from a sparsely wooded forest. We can drive up to them safely. You heard that boys. Go, go, go. The line of Humvees and trucks quickly whirred to life. Flametail had her back to a mound. I now see why they wanted us to use these guns. The 5th Division was holding extremely well against the attacking Elven infantry. The AK-47s easily tore through the Elves' lines. However, the Elves were still returning fire. If they had been using swords against the Elves, they wouldn't have stood a chance. Just then, she heard noises and looked up to see the Diamond Wolves vehicles heading towards her division's position. They are using assault rifles. The elven infantry had been completely caught off guard when the beastmen started using guns. Their formation had been designed to counter the fast sword charges of the beastmen. This meant that they were bunched up together in multiple groups. They had been quickly gunned down when the beastmen opened fire. As the Diamond Wolves arrived at the battle, they were greeted with a bizarre scene. Beastmen from a fantasy world donning medieval era armor and firing modern weaponry. Fighting Nazi elves who had World War II weaponry. It seemed like a real-life mash of civilization via and total war. War armor too. The doors of the Humvees were slammed open as men jumped off of the back of the trucks that followed. They immediately set up positions in order to fire upon the elves. Wolfrid popped up from the mound and fired his AK-47. Besides him, Beastman and his members were also firing. An occasional shot from the pinned down elves would come but it usually missed. As the forest was not really that dense, it didn't provide much cover for the elves. The gun battle raged for a while before the elves gave up and retreated. Flametail came up to greet Wolfrid. Surprised to see you here. Got orders from your commander to assist you. There are tanks coming your way. Speak of the devil. A rumbling noise came from the forest. Wilfred turned towards his men. Get the Kalgustaffs. Elven tanks are coming. They will be close to us this time. The first tank appeared a few minutes later. Wilfred shouted to the beastmen. Keep clear of the back of the anti-tank weapon. The Kalgustaff operator then also shouted. Back blast. A massive puff of fire came out from the back and around flew out and hit the first elf tank. The tank stopped and exploded. The beastmen have anti-tank weapons. The group of remaining nine Magipanzers instantly stopped their advance forwards. The Magipanzer in the lead had been destroyed. The commander of the Magipanzers made a quick decision. We will flank from the left. The five Kalgustaf operators looked around. I don't see any more movement. Was it only one tank? Wilfred got his binoculars out. There is trees blocking the way but I don't see anything. Stay on alert. I don't think there was only one tank. The one that just fired. Reload. They could try to rush us so be prepared. A shout rang out. Tanks coming in from the left and right. They are trying to flank us. Tanks simultaneously came out of the forest from the left and right. Dirt was scattered into the sky as the elf tanks opened fire and hit the ground. The sound of machine gun fire began. Fire. Back blast. It wasn't long before the firing died down. Suffering some light casualties, the Diamond Wolves had successfully beaten back the Elven Armored Assault. Elven Headquarters, Subacan Kingdom. Sir, we have broken through at the left flank but we failed to break through the right. The plan won't work under these circumstances. What do we do? Field Marshal Ayana hit the table with his fist. Damn it. This had ruined his entire plan. 
He wanted to encircle them and crush their center but that won't work now that only the right fell. He thought it over for a while. We will keep a defensive posture on our right and center. Tell the units on the left flank to continue their advance as planned. Divert the 3rd Guard Major Panzer Company, the 19th Infantry Company, and the 36th Infantry Company all to the left flank. They will continue the push deeper into enemy territory. Right flank of the Sone lines. They had had some success while battling the Elven infantry but it was short-lived as Elven tanks soon showed up. The beastmen were unable to place their sticky bombs on the elven tanks as they were being heavily protected by their infantry. Commander Gladwine looked around at his dying men. He didn't want to give the order but understood that the battle was lost. Retreat. Sona Headquarters. Kingdom of Albia. Report. The right flank has fallen. Lord Commander Darkhorn showed no emotion at those words. Internally, he cursed at the fact that the elves decided to start an offensive when he did. Left flank of the Sone lines. Before long, the 5th Division and the Diamond Wolves also received word of it. After a messenger gave them the current situation, new orders were issued. Lord Commander has ordered your unit to begin an assault. Your job is to make the elves have to pull units away from our right flank. Wolfred turned to Miller. I have a better idea. We are splitting into two units. Your unit takes the tow launches. We will be taking the Carl Gustafs. You are to set up a defensive position and halt the elven advance. I'm gonna attack as ordered to, Miller thought it over and nodded, will do, the messenger looked quitsaciously as Miller moved towards the vehicles and gathered his men, um, sir, what are you doing, Wilfred explained to the messenger, the messenger immediately protested, this is against orders, <laughs> it's not against orders since you never specifically stated that my whole group has to attack, there was also no specific order preventing me from sending units to help the right flank. All I have to do is to attack the elves from this flank which is what I'm doing albeit with a smaller force. The messenger hesitated. But, he started to speak and trailed off since he didn't know how to respond. Wilfred nodded, time is off the essence. We will be setting off, we will advance with you. Wilfred nodded at Flametail's offer. He understood that with the diamond wolves split in half. It would have been difficult to advance by themselves. Thirty minutes later, Wilfred drove his Humvee through the sparsely wooded forest. With him were a bunch of other Humvees and trucks. Up ahead were the 5th Division and the Diamond Wolves that had the Carl Gustafs. They had been advancing for a good while. Wilfred got on his radio. Dalton Rodriguez was the one commanding the Carl Gustaf unit. Keep an eye out. There are probably still tanks in this forest. A few minutes later. There were sounds of explosions up ahead. Three tanks. They are taken care of. Probably the remnants of the ones that attacked us. Nearly an hour later, Rodriguez came through the radio again. We are seeing some elves. How much is there? Um, I think we found their main position. Okay, dismount. We are attacking. An elf sat there enjoying a talk with his friends. He was very glad that his company wasn't the one who had been ordered to attack. The elves from the infantry company that came back from their failed assault were in terrible shape. Enemy attack, enemy attack. He looked up to the shouts and blacked out as a 7.62 by 39 bullet went through his head. Right flank of the Sone lines. Hurry, hurry. Commander Gladwine goaded his knights. The elves were hot on their trail. A tank appeared behind them. It stopped and started to turn its turret towards them. Dispers. The tank exploded. Miller smiled as the toe slammed into the tank behind the knights. Seems like we got here in the nick of time. We will stop them here. Don't let a single tank through. A few minutes later, Gladwine trotted his horse up to ones who saved the survivors of his unit. He recognized the man as one of the commanders of the mercenaries. Elven headquarters, Subacan Kingdom. Our attack on the left flank has stalled and the right flank is being pushed back. Field Marshal Ayana sat down. Retreat and regroup. As the adjutant left, he could hear loud shouting behind him. This was all going so well. Until those idiots attacking the human empire messed it up. Now I'm stuck here. 66. Chapter 59. Looming Battle. 1425 April 14, 2020 CE. Washington DC Time. 1012 Sun 14, 2020 CE. Elv Nation Time. 0825 April 14. 2020 CE, Hawaii time. A submarine of the Elven attack fleet, S-56. Captain, there's something approaching from our front at high speeds. The captain looked over the umt. 
underwater mana wave emitter, operator's shoulder and watched as a blip moved closer and closer to the center. He had been warned about the fact that American weapons were a bit superior to the elves. Must be an American weapon of sorts, probably an advanced torpedo. Dive, 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 evade it. The ballast tanks inside the submarine filled with water as the submarine started going deeper. The submarines behind them started turning left and right. It should pass right over now. The crew waited quietly. The blip on got closer and closer. Then the submarine shook. It hit us. Sounds of panic started. We are taking on water. The bottom compartments are all filling with water. Submarines behind the S-56. S-56 has been hit. The torpedo has come out the other side of S-56. It's changing directions and coming towards us, sir. Get us to the surface. Being underwater isn't safe. Elven attack fleet flagship, N and Conqueror. Admiral, our submarines are under attack. Some sort of torpedo is going right through them. Admiral Adam Vaynor sat down with a beleaguered face. He had experienced the power of American weaponry and still had no strategy to completely deal with them. He said his next words without the commanding aura of his past self but that of a normal man in a regular conversation. Since we haven't been attacked yet. This weapon may only be capable of attacking submarines. Tell all submarines to surface. They are doing just that sir. Good. S-88. S-71 had been taken out. It's changing directions towards S-102. It's fast. S-102 has been taken out. It's changing directions again. It's targeting S-34. Why can't we rise faster? The captain of S-88 felt panic welling up in him as the single American torpedo destroyed one submarine after another. Come on, come on. We are approaching the surface. Captain, NN Conqueror. Admiral Vaynor questioned his staff. What's the situation? Eight submarines were taken out by what we classified as some sort of torpedo. What is this torpedo? It's not explosive but it's guided and goes straight through our submarines. Causes them to fill up with water from where the torpedo entered and exited. It's too dangerous to submerge. Tell all submarines to travel on the surface. What will they do during battle, sir? Admiral Vaynor hesitated at that question. Submarines were made to be stealthy and attack from underwater. Now that they couldn't go underwater, they had lost their main advantage. I will find a way. Ocean near Hawaii. Two sailors on the USS Zumwalt were talking while doing their jobs. What the hell are the higher-ups even thinking? The main guns don't even work on this thing. Well, we still have our missiles. I heard that the elves have a hundred submarines. How in God's name are we gonna deal with that? I don't know how exactly but I do know we are still gonna beat the shit out of them. Besides, you're panicking far too early. The battle shouldn't actually happen until like 12 hours from now. 1634 April 14th, 2020 CE Washington DC time 1034 April 14th 2020 CE Hawaii time the suburbs of Honolulu Hawaii Gary seems like the neighbors are panicking they are packing up and leaving honey we will be fine it's a bunch of world war 2 ships but still i'm a tad bit worried don't you think we should try to find a safer place maybe go closer inland at least the words from the tv in the background caught their attention the president will shortly be addressing the nation on the current situation. Honey, they are just overreacting. This isn't some independent stay movie. Aliens aren't coming to obliterate us with a massive laser. Look I'm pretty sure the president is coming on to tell everybody to calm down. We were caught off guard and suffered severe losses. Now, we face a similar threat. However, history will not repeat again. We know that a large elven fleet is closing in on Hawaii. We know their exact location. We know what we are facing. The United States Navy, Air Force, and Air National Guard will confront and stop them soon. My fellow Americans, you have nothing to fear. Your safety is guaranteed. Hawaii is not under threat. People of Hawaii, do not panic. Place your trust in the armed forces of the United States. The enemy will not lay hands on American soil. I promise you that not a single enemy explosive will land on Hawaii. Thank you and may God bless America. 1823 April 14, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. White House. First engagement should occur within the next 12 hours, Mr. President. President Hayes nodded. How's the fleet that's going to clear the way for D-Day 2? 
it was decided to call the operation to invade the elven homeland, D-Day 2 because it truly fit the situation. It also shed a good light on it. The purpose was to emphasize that this was a war to defeat a country with a similar ideology to the Nazis should be approaching soon. The operation has been set to commence about two weeks from now. Good, good. What about the current ground situation in the Magus Imperium? How's our land forces? Everything should be completely secured now. We do have a problem with the prisoners though. There's too much for us to handle. 50,000. President Hayes' demeanor changed at that number and whistled. Any solution? I was just about to ask you about this. We are thinking of handing most of them over to the Magusians. They seem well experienced at handling large numbers of prisoners taking into account their massive wars with the Mac. They also seem quite willing to take them. Hayes knew that handing the elves over to the Magus would end pretty badly for the elves but not doing so would have caused problems in the future. And besides, he didn't really care for the elves. They weren't even human so there weren't any pesky rules of war that applied to them. Of course, he still wanted most of the rules of war to be followed in order to maintain a good public opinion. I suppose that's fine. Any news from the Green Berets? We inserted, nothing new since the last time I briefed you on them. They should either have arrived or gotten close to arriving in the elven capital. Ocean between the Sown Continent and Magus Imperium. A large American fleet was sailing straight towards the elven homeland. Seaman James Murray was talking to his friend, Seaman Zach Stevens again. Why aren't we turning around then? Won't get there in time. And besides, I don't think a bunch of outdated ships are gonna do much. 0350 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0455 Sun 15, 2020 CE, Elven Nation time. Afflin, Elven Nation. Two elves walked into the hotel. Welcome. What are you boys here for? How much is the cost for a month's stay for both of us? A month you say? <clears throat> Let me calculate that. Give me a few seconds. The receptionist got out a piece of paper and did some calculations. That would be about one gold and ten silvers for a one month stay. Okay, thank you. One of the elves fished out one gold and ten silver notes and placed them on the counter. We have breakfast every morning. If you have any problems, come down to this desk and we will gladly fix it. The elves got into the room and shut the door behind them. They quickly took their ears off. Phew, finally. These fake elf ears get very uncomfortable very fast. The other elf got out their radio. He spoke into it in a low voice. Is everyone in position? Over. Fairy 3 has already settled down. Over. This is Fairy 4. We just got there. Over. Yep for Fairy 2, over. Fairy 5 is nearly there, over. Fairy 6 is um somewhat lost. Um, we shouldn't be far from where we are supposed to be, over. Good to hear, just follow the plan. Out. They had decided to further split up the group into a total of six teams, with two people in each. The original two team with six each wasn't optimal. Having such a large group of elven males coming into the capital city at once and staying at the same place was bound to raise suspicions. An hour later, Pablo and Dennis strolled through the streets of Afflin. It was extremely lively. People crowded the streets and cars clogged the roads. Other than the noticeable lack of skyscrapers and the fact that everyone had pointy ears, it kind of felt like New York City. As they walked down the street, they spotted a building of interest. It was given a large space and had guards protecting it. Pablo nodded to Dennis. They separated. Dennis wandered around the street but purposefully and slowly got closer to the protected building. He walked right into one of the guards. What are you doing? Oops, sorry. I'm so sorry. Get out of here. Um, I'm completely lost. Where exactly am I? Are you blind? This is the home of our great leader. If you don't leave, I will shoot. Sorry, I'm leaving. Dennis turned his back and walked away quickly with a smirk on his face. 0350 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 2150 April 14, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Honolulu, Hawaii. Deck of the USS Missouri. Whoever ordered this to be reactivated is a complete idiot. An engineer looked at one of the manuals for the USS Missouri. What the fuck is this part? Another engineer walked over and looked at it. Not sure. I guess it's saying that that's connected to that. Oh, reactivate one of the missile systems, they said. It should be easy. 
They said, motherfuckers, this ship hasn't actually been maintained for 29 fucking years. Can't whoever is on top understand that? The generators are kaput. We won't fix them in time. We are gonna need to bring in our own if we want to get the missile systems running. How are they even gonna fire the fucking missiles? We have to replace the electric panels. 0712 April 15th. 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0112 April 15th, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Miles away from Hawaii. On the USS John C. Dennis, two FA-18 Super Hornets got ready on the catapult. 77. Chapter 60, Defense of Hawaii Part 1. 0714 April 15th, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0114 April 15th, 2020 CE. Hawaii time. Near Hawaii, two FA-18 Super Hornets launched from the USS John C. Stennis into the night sky. In a mere 30 seconds, another two were launched. Washington, D.C. seems to be some sort of show of force. It was clear from the satellite imagery that seemingly all the elven submarines of the fleet that was currently heading towards Hawaii have surfaced. President Hayes scratched his head at Kralson's words. Show of force. Show of force to who? They shouldn't know that we can see their ships. Maybe it's to boost their own morale. I fail to see how having all your submarines surface would boost morale. It seems like a stupid thing to do. Then I don't know what they are doing. Vice President Woggs got their attention. People, people, this isn't important. The Super Hornets will be in missile range soon. 0735 April 15th, 2020 CE. 0135 April 15th. 2020 CE. Somewhere in the Pacific. Four Super Hornet squadrons flew in formation. Let's waste these fuckers. They each had a full load of harpoon missiles. From the 44 aircraft, 176 harpoons were fired. They broke formation and began their return to the USS John C. Stennis, Washington, D.C. All missiles have been launched. President Hayes leaned back on his chair as he watched the screen that broadcasted the positions of the Elven fleet the U.S. fleet, and the Super Hornet squadrons. We are going to need to procure a lot of new missiles or we are going to have a massive shortage soon. A few minutes later, Elven fleet, the sound of explosions echoed. Admiral Vaynor grimly opened his eyes and looked at the metal ceiling of his room. So it has begun. A massive explosion occurred on the bottom left side of a small aircraft carrier as a harpoon missile struck it. Smoke billowed out before a massive explosion seemingly ruptured the aircraft carrier. The harpoon has struck its magazine compartments that have been filled with bombs and torpedoes. Another harpoon hit right on the bow of a massive battleship. It caused much less damage but there was a gaping hole where the harpoon hit. The elven fleet did not stop advancing as one missile after another hit. Smoke billowed out of the superstructure of a cruiser where the missile hit. A destroyer, ripped in two by the explosion of a harpoon hitting it, started slowly descending into its watery grave. It's surviving elves jumping overboard. More and more ships were hit with each passing second. The night was lit with explosions and the fires coming from the ships. S-101, dive, dive, dive. The sound of explosions reverberated in the submarine. They were more willing to risk the threat of the torpedo attacking them than be obliterated by air attacks. The NN Victory has been sunk. The NN Zumlor is taking on water. The crew says that they can keep it afloat. There was a minor magazine explosion on the NN Ilana. Crews are working to take out the fire. The S-29 is gone. Reports of the damage came flooding in. In the end, 25 destroyers, two submarines, one light aircraft carrier, and three cruisers were sunk. Much more ships were damaged to varying degrees. Admiral Vaynor viewed the damage from the bridge of his ship. Black smoke billowed into the sky as ships engulfed in fire sunk. Elves waved their arms and floated around the sinking wreckage. Rescue them as quickly as possible. We don't have time to idle. Understood. Before the officer could leave, Admiral Vaynor stopped and turned around. Wait. Don't get me wrong. We are saving all of them. No one will be left behind. We just need to do it fast. Even amidst all this destruction by and without them knowing, they were still a bit lucky. Not all harpoon missiles reached their targets. Some of them just missed by chance while others accidentally targeted the submarines. Most of the submarines dived away just as the harpoons were about to hit Washington, D.C. President Hayes stared at the screen as reports came in that the missiles had hit. 
the elven fleet showed no change in direction, they are just recklessly charging us at this point. Although reports say that they have suffered high damage from the harpoon attacks, the elven fleet seem to show no signs of retreating or even a change of tactics. Albeit with fewer ships, the elves continued steaming forward. Kralz nodded. They are probably on a suicide mission. It's almost as if their commander gave up already. We are preparing for the second strike. Their ships should be moving into the missile range of our ships. They are getting awfully close to Hawaii. We have multiple Air National Guard fighter squadrons on standby there. They are ready to take to the air at a moment's notice. Why weren't they launched already to attack the Elven fleet? Most of the aircraft there are better suited to be or are just air superiority fighters. Some of them could be used for anti-ship purposes but we will only do that under dire circumstances. 0753 April 15, 2020 CE 0153 April 15, 2020 CE Elven fleet Inside the officers' meeting room, the officers of the NN Conqueror gathered. Our scout planes have been out searching for the enemy fleet but we haven't found them yet. Admiral Shouldn't we try to redirect our course? We will be destroyed before we even reach our target. Admiral Vaynor shook his head. Even if we did, we would still suffer the same amount of casualties. The Americans can reach us even if we split up into groups. Can't we employ the strategy we had used in our last battle? We were the ones defending while the Americans were the ones attacking. Now it's the opposite. Is there anything we can do? Admiral? Vaynor pondered for a bit. Although he had already given up his subordinates hadn't. At this moment, he decided to accompany them all the way. We will send the submarines ahead, but what about the torpedo that attacked yesterday? Our submarines have submerged and have yet to be attacked. I have no clear idea on how American weaponry really works but I believe that the Americans will attack when they can. The submarines should be safe for now. A few minutes later, everyone left the room after the strategy meeting concluded. Vane or side. Surrender was unthinkable to quite a lot of the officers, especially the younger ones. Vaynor expected a full mutiny if he dared to entertain the idea of surrender. U.S. fleet, the Super Hornets started taking off once again. This time, harpoon missiles were being launched by the ships besides the USS John C. Stennis. White smoke trailed behind each missile as they headed for the sky. The trails of white smoke filled the sky as they curved towards their target. Missiles were being fired from Arleigh Burke destroyers, Ticonderoga cruisers, and Zumwalt destroyers. Washington, D.C. A report on a different situation came from Kralson. Seems like the Green Berets have found quite a few important locations. Kralson placed down a satellite map of Afflin on the table. Marked in red excess were important civil and military buildings. They will all be targets in our first strike. President Hayes rubbed his eyes and stifled a yawn. He had woken up early so he could be there when the naval battle started. Now it has started to affect him. I guess it's a good time to call a meeting soon on finalizing the plans for D-Day 20834 April 15, 2020 CE. 0234 April 15, 2020 CE. Elven Fleet. More explosions started occurring. The NN Zumula had already taken five hits to various places. Although with a limp, it was still moving. Even his own ship, the NN Conqueror was hit. It was by sheer luck that the explosion didn't reach any of the bombs or torpedoes that were stored. One battleship, one fleet carrier, one light carrier, three cruisers, and twenty destroyers were destroyed in this second attack. A MAGA radio operator came up to Admiral Vaynor. One of the scout planes has a report. We haven't found their fleet but we have found land. This could be their home base or maybe even their homeland. Admiral Vaynor nodded. Launch all aircraft to attack. We can't let this opportunity slip away. One of the officers protested the decision. But Admiral, we will leave our ships without air cover. The enemy can attack us without even getting near us. Our air cover is useless. We will just worthlessly waste our aircraft as the carriers get sunk one by one. Admiral Vaynor was being extremely stern in his reply. The officer who had objected hung his head down. Understood, Admiral. All aircraft carriers of the fleet prepared to launch their aircraft. Pilots got into their planes. Bombs and torpedoes were quickly loaded on. On one of the light carriers, the NN undefeatable, the propellers of their planes spun to life as the ground crew prepared them. Lights from the aircraft carrier lit the runway. 
a flag was waved and the blocks on the wheels of the aircraft were removed. The flag was then waved down and the first plane went down the runway. As the aircraft continued to launch, three explosions rocked the NN Zumla report. The battleship NN Zumla has been struck by an enemy attack again and is heavily damaged. The sounds of explosions reverberated in Vaynor's room. Launch all aircraft as quickly as possible. Speed it up. Although it took some time, it wasn't long before 147A192N, naval modified, fighters, 162RA189N, naval modified, dive bombers, and 135RA1 torpedo bombers took to the sky in groups of large V formations deep in the sea. The submarines started passing the surface ships, although they were told to advance ahead. The submarines weren't that fast so they were still right next to the Elven main fleet. Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, Honolulu, Hawaii. The alarms on the base rang loud and clear. Men quickly scattered onto the runway. 14 F-22 Raptors of the 199th Fighter Squadron, part of the Hawaii Air National Guard, taxied down the runway. 70 F-16A-Bs and F-16C-Ds of the 152nd Fighter Wing from the Arizona Air National Guard followed right behind F-15C-Ds of the 114th Fighter Squadron from the Oregon Air National Guard were idling on the parking spaces. Aircraft from many other fighter squadrons were also there. Although they were intended only for emergency use only against the Elven ships, when the Navy couldn't keep the Elves at bay. They were now being launched in response to the approaching Elven aircraft. Elven Air Fleet The designated commander of the assemblage of planes got onto his Magi radio. The scout aircraft spotted multiple buildings and ships. Our mission is to destroy all of them. Dive bombers will approach in three waves. Torpedoes bombers will sink any and all ships that they come across. Fighters will provide cover in all circumstances. 0845 April 15th 2020 CE 0245 April 15, 2020 CE 199th Fighter Squadron. We got a horde of them. Weapons free. The bay doors in the center belly of the F-22 Raptors opened up. The other 13 F-22 Raptors followed suit. 84. Chapter 61. Defense of Hawaii Part 2. 0845 April 15, 2020 CE. Washington DC time 0245 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Air over the Pacific, from the open bay doors in the center belly of each F-22 Raptor, an AIM-120 MRAM dropped down, all the MRAMs propelled forwards at once with a blaze coming from each of their tails. Only a few seconds later, another MRAM dropped from each of the F-22S. It wasn't long before each Raptor expanded all six of their MRAMs in their central bay. 84 MRAMs streaked through the sky. A few minutes later, the 70 F-16S followed suit. Their MRAMs launched forwards from where they were situated under the wings of the F-16S. One after another, the missiles shot forward with a blaze. Each F-16 fired off their four MRAMs. A total of 280 MRAMs were fired from the F-16S. Break formation. Break formation. If aid. If aid. Because of the similarities between the description of the human weapon used to shoot down planes and the arrows fired from a bow and arrow, it was decided to dub them arrows. The once organized fleet of propeller aircraft started crisscrossing. They went in every direction in order to try to confuse the missiles. Ra 189N dive bombers and Ra 1 torpedo bombers started diving. The EA 192N fighters started turning left or right. The pilot of an Ra 189N, Several Ralokin, put the nose of his plane down and followed the other Ra 189NS. His backseat gunner, Camus Aurora, Panickedly shouted as he watched one of arrows curve towards them. Several, it's coming right for us. Change directions. The plane started banking left. Nonetheless, the arrow quickly gained on them. It's right in my far. The arrow smashed right through the tail and exploded. It didn't take long before more of the arrows started hitting. It's turning towards me. I can't shake it off. It keeps follow. Protect the dive bombers. In the sky, elven aircraft burst into fireballs. Pieces of metal floated down from the orange, fiery explosions, confused by the mass of crisscrossing planes, one or two of the arrows went off course, all others hit, the remaining elven aircraft got back into a few V formations, 
the commander of the air fleet had barely survived. No clear loss count yet. We still have more than 50 aircraft at least. Continue the assault. Do not back down. Understood. Lieutenant Colonel Alex Jackson, commander of the 199th Fighter Squadron, looked at his radar. We still have many survivors. 90 or so aircraft closing in on targets. A few minutes later, what seemed to be silver arrowheads were approaching them at incredible speeds. With their remaining targets getting closer and closer, each F-22 opened up both of their side bay doors. Fox 2 AIM-9 side winders flew out from the open side bays. Break, the Raptors flew towards the Elven aircraft that were breaking formation. Side winders started hitting an EA-192 and that was banking left exploded as a side winder hit it. Its main body disappeared in the explosion and the wings fell out of the sky. All 28 sidewinders found their targets. Only 12 EA-192 NS, 23 RA-189 NS, and 19 RA-1 S remained. We are about even in terms of numbers of fighters. Form up and engage. It wasn't clear who was giving orders since their commanders had already died but the elven pilots followed what was said. The EA-192 NS started turning around, the 20mm M61A2 Vulcan rotary cannon on one of the F-22S opened up, it shredded one of the Elven fighters, the F-22 banked left and avoided the debris from the destroyed fighter, the EA-192 NS tried to get behind the F-22S but they were just too fast, an F-22 quickly turned and got behind one of the EA-192 NS. There's a hum. The elf pilot stopped as he watched his fellow aircraft get hit and go down. His face was flushed with anger. Death to these humans. He banked his aircraft left and turned towards the F-22. Then he shook violently. His plane dipped towards the ground. He frantically looked back at his tail which was completely gone. He was so blinded by anger that he failed to notice an F-22 strafing his tail while flying by. The Ra 189 NS and Ra 1S tried to get out of the dogfight, but the F 22S quickly started pursuing and shooting them down. The remaining EA 192 NS tried to get the F 22S off of them. A lone Ra 189 N flew in the sky, it had miraculously gotten out of the dogfight. The pilot, Ninin Paden, got on his Magai radio. We were the only ones to escape. Orders have not changed. Continue assault and do not back down. A heavy silence fell for a few seconds. Ninin turned to his backseat gunner, Ivas Loreira. Anything behind us? Seems like they didn't follow us. Ninin turned back to the front. Good we might have slip. Ivas, facing the back of the aircraft, was scanning the sky. He noticed that Ninin stopped his sentence midway. What's the matter? Ninin didn't reply. The Avasa looked behind him and towards Ninlin. Hey, Nin seems like a dive bomber. The 70 F 16S flew closer and closer to the single Ra 189 N. The lead F 16 opened fire with a single sidewinder. Ninlin gritted his teeth and started turning his plane towards the sea. It was too late. The sidewinder struck the canopy of his aircraft. It exploded and evaporated him and Avasa. The F-16S got them. We are Winchester and RT Bing. The F-22 Raptors turned and started to head back. 0911 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0311 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Elven fleet. We lost all aircraft. A silence fell over the meeting room. A few of the Elven naval officers were surprised. Admiral Vaynor stood there quietly and expressionless. He had long expected the end result. After a moment of silence, he started giving out commands. Tell all remaining aircraft carriers to toss all torpedoes, bombs, and aviation fuel overboard. We don't have any use for them anymore. They are now just unneeded explosives that could set off if another arrow hit us. Washington DC. All enemy aircraft have been shot out of the sky. No loss from combat. A few of the people in the situation room started clapping. President Hayes interrupted it. Save your clapping for later. It ain't over till the fat lady sings. Give me a quick sit rep on the naval engagement. The Navy is still firing their missiles and they are preparing another wave of F-18s. The missiles are having some trouble destroying what we believe to be the battleships. They have taken multiple hits and haven't sunk. However, we should be able to damage them enough to become inoperable. U.S. Fleet. 
we are detecting multiple submarines approaching. The 11MH60R Seahawk on the USS John C. Stennis has been rotating in order to keep a constant high for submarines. After a few hours of rotations, they have finally found the Elven submarine fleet. RUM-139 Vielas rock missiles launched from the Ticonderoga class cruisers and Arleigh Burke class destroyers. Elven fleet. The Elven naval officer had grim faces as the damage report was given. The NN Zumula has been hit nine times. The crew has done emergency repairs but it is still limping. The NN Vulcan has been hit five times. It has sustained some damage but nothing too detrimental. The NN Alahais and NN Care Baron have been hit four times. Not much damage reported for either of them. Our ship has been hit two times and miraculously is still afloat. It probably won't last another hit. A few cruisers and carriers have also already been hit but suffered nothing major. We have lost, so far, a total of a battleship, two fleet carriers, three light carriers, 56 destroyers, seven cruisers, and 10 submarines. The Elven naval officers, already shocked by the news of the loss of their entire air fleet, were further disheartened by the report. It was nearly half of their fleet. Admiral Vaynor didn't seem phased by the report. We will continue heading for the area where the enemy fleet could be. Admiral, we will be destroyed before we even get there. Our air wing has been destroyed. We have lost almost half of our destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers. We need a new strategy. Should we try to split apart so they can't all target us at one location? Admiral Vaynor shook his head. Even if we run now, the humans can still destroy us. The chances of us surviving were dismal from the start. The only path we have now is forward. Skies over the Pacific, and RUM 139 streaked through the sky. Then, a MK-54 torpedo dropped into the ocean from it. Multiple other RUM 139s were right behind it. S-89. The captain of the S-89 had been constantly checking in on his UM operator. He was scared of a repetition of the last attack anything on the um all is clear and then something shook the submarine what's that a few minutes later the magar radio officer shouted report s23 has been hit another explosion shook the submarine we are under attack even more explosions started elven fleet on the deck of the nn conqueror torpedoes and bombs were pushed over and splashed into the sea report our submarines are under attack by torpedoes are they the same ones we experienced before no sir. They explode on contact like normal torpedoes. S-89 The S-89 shook violently as something hit and exploded on it. We are taking on water. We are taking on water. Surface. 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 We can't, sir. We are taking on too much water. Slowly, the S-89 sunk into the bottom of the sea. 0845 April 15, 2020 CE. 0722 Sun 15, 2020 CE near the Magus Imperium. As rock missiles were also being fired from the Arli Burks and Ticonderogas that were guarding the five aircraft carriers, the elves seem to be increasing their submarine patrols. They probably know where we are at now. I'm surprised that there's not a bigger response. I think they send most of their forces to attack the west coast. The American fleet near the Magus Imperium was preparing to start the air campaign against the elven homeland. 78. Chapter 62. Defense of Hawaii Part 3 1032 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC Time 0432 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii Time Somewhere in the Pacific Sitting on his bed, Admiral Vaynor looked at the gray metal ceiling of his room. He had returned to his quarters for a short break. He could still hear the shouts of his ship's crew. He whispered to himself as if in a daze. I already quit. My leader. A few more minutes passed before he stopped looking at the wall and got up. He opened the door and walked into the brig. His officers immediately came up to him. Admiral. The NN Zumla has been sunk after 17 hits. We have to find a way to attack them. Admiral. What do we do? With the ever-diminishing number of ships, the battleships have placed themselves on the sides of the flagship, the NN Conqueror, in order to prevent it from being hit more. Suddenly, Admiral Vaynor had the air knocked out of him as his chest and face slammed into the floor. He got up on all fours, winced, and started coughing. Soon, sounds of panic started around him. We have been hit. We have been hit. There's damage to the bottom right compartments of the ship. What happened to the battleships? Weren't they supposed to protect us? 
The NN Falcon has been sunk. Admiral, are you all right? With the help of one of his officers, Admiral Vaynor staggered up on his feet while still coughing. I'm fine. After composing himself, Admiral Vaynor walked to the windows of the brig as his officers scrambled to assess the damage. Slowly turning his head from the left to the right, he took in the carnage. The light from the moon and the ship fires provided a clear view. Smoke billowed out from the battleships as multiple fires raged. A cruiser was slowly sinking into the sea. Its front end was halfway in the ocean and its back jutted out in the air. Some elves jumped into the ocean from the sinking cruiser while others on it boarded lifeboats. Tiredness washed over him. Admiral Vaynor took off his naval cap and placed it on the ledge of the window. He sighed. I'm stepping down from my position as admiral. There is nothing I can do at this point. Just let an old elf die quietly. Vaynor turned and left. The officers watched with wide eyes as the admiral walked out of the door. Pandemonium ensued. What do we do? Who's in command now? Vice Admiral. What do we do? The Vice Admiral looked around at all the panicked officers. Calm down. We still have a fleet to command. Then a report from one of the crew further shocked them. Report. The repair crews are unable to fix the damage caused by the last hit. We are taking on water. There was a heavy and panicked knocking on Vaynor's door. Vaynor felt exasperated. He had already told them that he quit. He wondered if they were just like Taran. Admiral, the ship is sinking. The damage from the last hit was too large to be contained. I told you already, I'm not the Admiral anymore, but add. Sir, the ship is sinking. We have to evacuate. I may not be the Admiral anymore but I was only a few minutes ago. I will go down with my ship. Washington DC. President Hayes looked somewhat nervously at the screen. They have set their course directly for Hawaii. We must stop them here and now. Secretary of Defense Kralson rubbed his chin. We are trying. We have destroyed a majority of their fleet but their battleships are still there. Under current calculations, it should be impossible for them to reach Hawaii before being completely wiped out. Still, their battleships are quite a nuisance. With enough harpoon missiles, they will sink. Eventually, President Hayes closed his eyes and nodded as if coming to a decision. We will need to make some changes soon. Somewhere in the Pacific, Seaman Joe Bennington watched as missile after missile was launched. In his entire time of service so far, he had never seen so many launches happening without stopping. Streaks of smoke that blanketed the night sky were illuminated every time a missile was launched. The blazing fire of a missile coming out of its tube in the middle of the night always seemed beautiful to him. 1032 April 15, 2020 CE Washington DC time 0516 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Oceans near the Magus Imperium. Rear Admiral, lower half, Halbert Johnson, in command of the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group, viewed the deck of his aircraft carrier. Admiral, the entire surrounding area should be clear. Nothing is coming up on the radar. Good. Make sure it stays that way. They had already engaged multiple submarine and destroyer patrols. The fleet sent to clear the seas near the Magus Imperium had suffered little to no damage whilst inflicting heavy casualties on the elves. Seems like the amphibious assault ships are arriving. Magus Imperium. Isaac sat down on a rock near the beach. His squad mates were loitering around. In front of them, bulldozers and diggers were piling up dirt. Engineers were setting up the buildings and infrastructure. In their haste to retreat from the Magus Imperium, the elves were unable to destroy everything. The most important structure of all to the Americans were the ports that the elves had been building in order to transport in new supplies and units. The Army Corps of Engineers was now busy modernizing the ports that the elves had left behind, in preparation for D-Day 2. It was vital that these ports were able to accommodate a large bulk of the U.S. Army and Navy. Most of the U.S. Army was already located in the Magus Imperium so it made much more sense to use these ports to invade the Elf's homeland. 1052 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC Time 0452 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii Time Somewhere in the Pacific, the NN Conqueror started listing to the side. Objects in Vaynor's room started sliding forward. Shouts of his last remaining sailors could still be heard as they ran to board the lifeboats. A knock sounded on his door. Vaynor felt annoyed. What? Sir, are you sure you don't want to evacuate? I have already said so. I will go down with my ship. 
There was a short silence before the elf behind the door spoke. Understood, sir. The room had been tilted to an extreme degree but Vainor could still sit on his bed. Water started seeping in through the bottom of the door. He sighed. I should have stayed home. The survivors on the lifeboats watched as the NN Conqueror was slowly enveloped by water. On the NN Alahais, the survivors climbed out of their lifeboats and were helped onto the ship. The officers of the NN Conqueror also gathered there since it seemed the safest. The NN Alahais was the least damaged out of all the remaining battleships. It had only been hit six times. In the brig, the officers bickered about their next step. I propose that we retreat. Retreating will bring shame on the navy. Then what do you want us to do? Just continue straight to our deaths? We are doing nothing more than walking off a cliff at this point. I already brought up the idea. We should split our forces so the humans can't target us all. Being in one blob is making us easy prey. I have no idea why the Admiral didn't allow us to do this. A few minutes later, the remaining ships in the Elven fleet all started moving apart. Ships in the center continued forward while the ones on the right and left flanks turned towards their direction. The missiles being fired were almost all Azrock missiles. A seemingly endless stream of Elven submarines was showing up on radar. Los Angeles-class submarines had also gotten within range and were firing their torpedoes. S-57 the 7th submarine flotilla has faced heavy casualties. S-22 has been sunk. S-156 has been sunk. S-74 has been sunk. S-80 has B. An endless report of losses came streaming in. The captain bit his finger. He screamed in frustration. Have we found their ships yet? No, captain. We are being shot out like literal fishes in a barrel. We have no idea where they are firing from but they seem to know perfectly where we are. Somewhere in the Pacific. The officers of the NN Conqueror looked at each other hostilely, they are still sinking us. Splitting up didn't do anything to help, in fact, it might have worsened it. The three groups have been moving farther and further apart from each other but the attacks still continued on all of them. Then, another explosion rocked the NN Alahais, objects started sliding to the right, although it started off minor, there now was an obvious listing to the right. Abandoned ship, we are sinking. One of the officers slammed his fist on the table. A few minutes later, we don't have any ships left. On the lifeboat, the elves watched as the NN Alahais quickly toppled to the right, its tower splashed into the ocean and the keel could be seen out of the water. Before long, it was completely upside down and quickly submerging. Now only debris and the wide expanse of the ocean surrounded them. Not a single warship was in sight. Washington DC. All enemy surface vessels have been destroyed. There are still a few remaining groups of submarines but I can almost confidently declare that we have prevented the elves from reaching Hawaii or doing any major damage. President Hayes started clapping. In a flash, everyone was cheering and applauding in the situation room. A bit premature but it has been a stressful few hours for everyone. S-57, a MAGA radio operator who had been trying to contact the surface fleet for the last 20 minutes looked back at his captain. We have lost all contact with the main fleet. They are lost aren't they? The captain knew that the surface fleet had been taking a beating. He didn't expect them to be destroyed so fast. Give me the Magai radio. I need to directly talk with the commanders of the other submarines. The Magai radio operator handed it over to him. I would like the attention of all flotilla commanding officers. The S-57 was the flagship submarine of the entire submarine fleet that was present. The surviving commanders or lieutenant commanders of the various submarine flotillas that made up the fleet acknowledged Captain Nolareris. With deep consideration of the mounting losses and having no clear picture of where the enemy is, I have decided to announce a complete retreat. If you have any opposition to this, please speak up now. None of the commanders opposed. Having already lost a total of around 50 submarines, each surviving flotilla had already been heavily battered. 84. Chapter 63 Mop Up 1138 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC Time 0538 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii Time Hawaii Their submarine fleet is turning around Cheers rose in the brig of the USS John C. Stennis Rear Admiral Kirkland smiled Mission accomplished everyone Although the elves were retreating As rock missiles were still being fired the streaks of smoke from the missiles could clearly be seen as the day started to brighten. The tip of the sun was barely peeking out of the horizon. Somewhere in the Pacific, 
multiple ribs sped across the ocean, large wakes formed behind them, an MH-60S flew over them and headed towards the same direction. A few more MH-60SS followed behind, the lead helicopter came upon a bunch of wooden lifeboats. Whilst keeping a distance, they hovered. You are being rescued, do not resist, we are here to help. Under the gene, the announcer stopped for a second. Realizing his mistake, he coughed before continuing. Under the oath of the government of the United States, you will be treated humanely as prisoners of war. One of the MH-60S started lowering itself at one of the lifeboats. An elf on the lifeboat stuck his hand out towards the sea. A small blob of water rose out of the sea and the elf swung his hand at the MH-60S. The blob of water flew towards the helicopter and stuck it. It shook a bit from the impact. Oh fuck, they are shooting at us. Abort. Abort. More and more elves stuck their hands out at the water, the MH-60S quickly started pulling back up as more blobs of water started hitting it, the water was hitting so hard that it sounded like the ricochets of bullets. After returning back to its original position, the firing stopped, they are shooting at us with their magic. Understood. Give them a warning, the elves in the lifeboat cheered as the MH-60S backed away. The elves started hollering at the helicopters. Get out of here you inferiors. I repeat we are here to rescue you. We have no intent on harming anyone. You will be treated humanely. A few of the elves tried to hit the helicopters with their water bullets but they lacked the range to do so. They soon stopped firing and started rowing their lifeboats. Washington DC. Kralson gave a suggestion after learning that the elves were firing at the rescue helicopters. If they continue resisting we will probably need to shoot them. President Hayes raised an eyebrow. Won't that be considered a war crime? War crimes aren't important in this world anymore. I'm pretty sure the word war crimes doesn't even exist in this world. We will probably face no international backlash for what we do. Okay. Dot. But what I meant was public perception. We should be asking whether or not the American people will be outraged by our actions, and I don't believe the public would approve. It will definitely seem like we are shooting defenseless people in the waters. The media will have a heyday with that, it's domestic backlash that's important now, but Mr. Dot President, we can't just leave them there, we can't let them land in Hawaii, they're clearly rowing towards Hawaii, they will endanger people if they land, the president couldn't respond, he sat there in deep thought, tell the commanding officer to threaten them but don't actually shoot them, let's see what happens, somewhere in the Pacific, only the sound of the blades could be heard as the MH-60SS hovered in the sky, I repeat, continued resistance will be met with deadly force, the lead MH-60S lowered itself once again and once again, the elves shot at it, Washington DC, the rear admiral is asking whether or not he has permission to shoot, he doesn't sound too happy about us telling him what to do. Well I'm the commander in chief and it's my reputation on the line here. Are the ribs armed? The personnel on them are. The ribs themselves aren't. Then instruct the MH-60 to fire warning shots at the elves. If the ribs are shot at when they arrive, then they can return fire with intent to kill. Somewhere in the Pacific. There. 50 calories on the open side door of the MH-60S opened up in a few quick bursts. Small amounts of water sprouted up close to the elven boats as the bullets hit the water. Boats are here to pick you up, if they are shot at, we will use deadly force. The ribs quickly came into view, the elves are not cooperating, we have fired warning shots. Try getting closer. Weapons hold. Stay frosty. Over. This is Dolphin 1. Heard you loud and clear. Out. They are opening fire. The sailors on the ribs ducked as water bullets whizzed over them. The single. 50 calories on the side door of the MH-60SS opened up at the boats. The sailors on the ribs started firing their rifles at the elves. Water sprouted up as .50 caliber bullets hit the ocean. Holes were punctured through the elves' wooden boats. The elves tried to shoot back with water bullets but were being quickly cut down. The sheer volume of fire terrified the elves, some of the lifeboats started taking on water and sinking, a couple of elves jumped into the water in a desperate attempt to survive. Many dead elves floated on the ocean but there were still many boats afloat, the elves who survived started raising their hands in surrender. A few minutes later, get them on the boat, don't let your guards down, their literal hands are weapons, don't hesitate to shoot if you see them lift their arms and Rib got up next to one of the elf lifeboats. One by one, the sailors dragged the elves onto the Rib, 
Every time an elf was helped on, at least four M4 rifles were aimed at them. The sailors had their fingers on the trigger and were ready to shoot at a moment's notice. The other ribs and MH60SS all had their guns trained on the other lifeboats. Each of the elves' hands was zip-tied as hard as possible to prevent movement. Petty officer, third class, Dan Haley did a quick sweep of the elves being rescued. We captured quite a few of them alive. I thought they were all suicidal. 1120 April 15, 2020 CE 0540 Sun 15, 196 E. Afvilin, Elf Nation. Our assault fleet has failed and the Americans have pushed us out of the seas near the Magus Imperium. Taran slammed his fist on his table. It seems like the Navy can no longer protect us. How is the defense construction going? Taran's advisor stayed silent for a second. My leader, wouldn't you like to know about the condition of the assault fleet? Taran raised his eyebrows. There are still survivors? Yes, about 30 or so submarines. They are being pursued and attacked. The Navy is trying to save them. Taran waved him off. That's the Navy's concern now, not mine. I want to know how our defense situation is. Well, we have hidden hundreds of tanks, dug thousands of miles of trench line, placed down thousands of mines, and anti-aircraft guns blanket the land. We also have large weapon stocks ready to be handed out. What about the PAMs? I'm sorry, what? Taran looked a bit irritated. The portable anti magapanzers The advisor flipped through the papers on his clipboard. Those are you. Under mass production and will be available soon. 1153 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0553 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Somewhere in the Pacific, an MH60R flew swiftly through the sky. It was on a search and destroy mission. Near the left side door of the helicopter, there are multiple evenly spaced holes. A sonar boy popped out from one of these holes and splashed into the ocean. We have found multiple submarines miles in front of our position. We'll be engaging. How copy? Over. Solid copy. You are free to engage. Out. On each side of the very small stub wings of the helicopter, there was an MK-54 lightweight torpedo. It launched both. The other MHRS-60 was speeding to the location. 1210 April 15, 2020 CE. 0605 Sun 15, 196 E. Somewhere in the Magus Imperium, an American engineer got out of the M4 Sherman. Congratulations on your first M4 Sherman. Seeing that you followed the manual to a T, there should be no issues with it. Emperor Arstant nodded with an impressed look on his face. Compared to the clanky-looking and riveted Magusian Magitanks, the M4 Shermans had much smoother armor. Good. Very good. I like it. I do recommend you test fire it though. I'm an engineer so I don't actually know if you made the ammunition correctly. The gun is made correctly though. Aster Air Base, Magus Imperium. Get the papers loaded. Originally a small airbase with a bumpy runway that accommodated the wyverns of the Magus. The airbase had gotten larger and larger ever since the arrival of the Americans. There was now even a brownstone sign right outside of the base with the white words U.S. Air Force and Astor Air Base right under it. It was located next to the small town of Astor and right behind the massives the jungle that cuts through the Magus Imperium. Large containers of papers were stacked into the C-130. The sound of more and more planes landing could be easily heard. Various units have already been stationed at the Asta Air Base. 1302 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. Washington DC. President Hay had a busy day ahead of him. He had spent most of the morning keeping a close eye on the situation near Hawaii. Now with that over, he still had to deal with the affairs of the rest of the day. He sat down in his chair in the Oval Office and rifled through his presidential daily brief. A knock came on the door. Come in Kralson. What did you want to talk about? On his way to return to his office, Kralson had urgently told him that he had a very important message. Well, it seems like the Magus wants to cooperate with us in the invasion. I don't see why not. They have been quite useful in the past and we just gave them Shermans and P-51 Mustangs. I really don't think we need to do a joint offensive. It would just be too big of a headache and I don't really trust the capabilities of the Magus. Well, we have the technological capabilities while the Magus has the numerical one. There have been circumstances where the Magus have been quite helpful with their numbers. 82, 
Chapter 64, Around the World 0923 April 17, 2020 CE Washington DC It was morning but President Hay still felt a bit worn out because of the constant reports and briefings. The Green Berets have reported that there are multiple human concentration camps scattered across the Elven Nation. We are currently pouring through satellite photography in order to try and locate them. What are the chances that we will have a massacre on our hands if we start D-Day 2? The military analysts have described it as too much for comfort. Then devise a plan to get them out of there. The invasion will still proceed on the same day. 0904 April 17th. 2020 CE 0732 Sun 17th 196 E Primopolis, Magus Imperium. Here are the main stipulations. You will provide your own vessels to transport your invasion force. We do not have enough to accommodate you. However, our navy will protect your transports. You will have independent control of your units but you will have to cooperate with our officers. Our officers will also have the final say on decisions. We expect humane treatment of the elves who surrender. We do not condone the killing of non-combatants, and we expect your soldiers to act civilized. More detailed information would be in the document that I have given to you. Emperor Rastant nodded as he skimmed through the document. I see. Then how will we divide up the land? The American ambassador to the Magus Imperium, Jimmy Manning, looked at the emperor with questioning eyes. It's a small continent. We suspect that they have a lack of resources because our scientists have noticed that the compositions of their armor are not entirely made of metal. The elves seem to be trying to make up for this lack of resources by using magic. So what is your country planning to do then once you have defeated the elves? We will just occupy and install a democratic government before leaving. Are you willing to leave some land for us then? Our policy is a period of occupation while reforming their government. If you are invading with intentions of doing a land grab, then we will pull out all support. Emperor Rastan seemed to be fuming. You are just going to let them go after all they have done. My nation has suffered the most out of this invasion. I would like them to give us some land. Isn't this how it usually goes? When a nation loses a war it has to cede some of its lands to the victor. Your words are utterly ridiculous. Have you not seen what happened? The towns and cities in the northern regions of my country have been reduced to nothing. My entire navy is nearly gone. Hundreds and thousands of my soldiers and civilians have lost their lives. We understand this. However, taking their land will do you no benefit. There seems to be nothing there that you can exploit. You are allowed to calculate the damage and ask the elves for war reparations. We will see to it that they pay you. However, the US will never condone the annexation of their sovereign territory. We will also not condone any acts of revenge. Do not raise their cities and towns or start massacres. Emperor Rastant had an extremely displeased look on his face. Jimmy stood there for a bit as the emperor thought in silence. Minutes passed by. I will give you time to consider. Jimmy started to walk out. Halfway to the door, he stops and looks back. Remember that without our help, your nation would be at their mercy of the elves right now. Do not consider this a slight. These words are just the mere truth and you know it. Jimmy opened the door and got out. 1055 April 17th, 2020 CE, Washington DC. Krausen sat down in a meeting with Hay. I will get it to you straight. I still don't like the idea that you are permitting the Magusians to come along. We already have our hands full trying to calm one shrieking baby. We don't need another baby that is liable to fall face first onto the ground. President Hay chuckled a bit. Are you seriously describing countries as babies? It's a metaphor. I am seriously exasperated by your decision, you know. President Hay pointed at Krausen. Look Krausen, you have to see it from my point of view. You are a military leader. I'm a civilian one. I know not having the Magus come with us would make the invasion much easier to plan out and execute. But we are a country that is literally alone in this world. We need to form diplomatic relationships. Sure. We have the BAM and MAC but they are just countries under our occupation. Other than that, the countries of the Sone League are quite bound to the Magus Imperium. Their opinion of us and centuries of relations with the Magus won't change with just a few mercenaries. 1100 April 17, 2020 CE 0830 Sun 17, 196 E Magus Imperium Their roads are complete shit. At least the Meccans had actual paved roads and metal bridges. An Abrams driver got out of his tank. The tracks of his Abrams were filled with dirt and mud was smudged on all sides of the tank. Well, 
command centers through the boonies, the main paths have paved roads and metal bridges, that can't even be considered the boonies, we passed through a lot of towns even in the Meccan forests, they actually have paved roads instead of just muddy dirt roads and metal bridges instead of rickety century old wooden ones. What the fuck is wrong with this country's infrastructure? Seeing that this is a magic country, I guess they didn't really embrace the industrial revolution. Well, their magic is still shit either way. Heard some talk about the magic hybrid engines of the Magus to be inferior to the mechanical ones that the Mac have. With the number of American vehicles moving towards the southern tip of the Magus Imperium and the undeveloped infrastructure of the Magus Imperium, a lot of issues have started to pop up. Afvalin, Elven Nation. Pablo looked at his team who were gathered in his hotel room. Although we were originally going to stay here and keep surveillance until right before the airstrikes started, we have a change of plans, we got orders from the top. We need to search for human concentration camps, especially those in heavily wooded areas. <laughs> well, all the recent newspapers mention human concentration camps but not exactly where they are. Can't we go to where the slave auctions are being held and follow one of their trucks until it leads us to one? Well, that will only help us locate one. It has been confirmed that the elves have multiple concentration camps. Satellites already found and confirmed too. They are the more visible ones. There are also multiple possible ones. Satellite footage picked up trucks carrying humans into a few different forests. However, the satellites were not able to locate the exact locations of the concentration camps. That's our job. Then what is the plan? We will split into teams of two. Six teams. Each team will be assigned to sectors of the forests to comb through. Remember don't take any actions. We are only here right now to scout them out. Understood? Yes, sir. 0224 April 18th, 2020 CE. 0412 Sun 18th, 196 E. Magus Imperium. A kid ran out of his house and waved at the American tanks passing by. The commanders, who had their hatches open and their heads out of the tank, waved back. Mum, mum, look, tanks. Arthur get back in here. The mother ran out of the house and guided her child back towards the house. She flashed a fake smile towards the Americans and quickly closed the door. Inside the house, the boy looked down at his shoes as he was scolded. They are foreigners. They aren't us. Arthur, we can't trust people who aren't like us. You don't know what they could do to you. Ignore them and hide. I don't want to see you running to them ever again. Do you understand? While his eyes were still looking at the ground, he quietly replied. Understood. A lot of the Magusian civilians were quite welcoming of them. They sometimes came out en masse to cheer as American troops and vehicles rolled by. Sometimes, it felt like a parade. They were very thankful for the American help against the elves. But that doesn't mean they were all like that. Some people have given them the stink eye. There were also a couple of places where the overall air felt unwelcome. This was one of the places. The inhabitants of the village had shut their doors and closed their curtains as the Americans came through. 1124 April 18th, 2020 CE, Nashville, Tennessee. Jack set down his groceries. He peeled open an orange and started snacking on it. He really wanted to eat an apple right now but they weren't in season. A lot of fruits and vegetables weren't in season during this time of the year for the US. In the old world, fruits and vegetables were in season year-round because of imports. Steps have been taken by companies to make something similar in this world but it had been disrupted by politic and the recent war. What's even more annoying to John was the lack of a lot of products. Quite a lot of those products has made in China stuck onto them in the old world. Companies tried to make up for this vacancy by ramping up production. However, this caused a labor shortage. Not everyone wanted to work in the factory. Some companies have already opened up factories in the Mac and Boom. Quite a lot are still waiting for permission to do so. 1144 April 18th. 2020 CE 0822 Sun 18th 196 E Port City of Jalin Elf Nation In the port, civilians murmured in worry amongst themselves. May had seen the returning military transport vessels and wanted to cheer for the returning soldiers. A crowd had formed right outside of the port. What greeted them wasn't an army filled with victory but a seemingly exhausted and demoralized one. They speculated about what had happened. Were they defeated? No way. Maybe they are just the injured coming back. That seems to make sense. Ten days later, Lawson Kelfer sat down and drank his morning tea. 
His eyes skimmed through the newspaper he was holding with his free hand. It detailed another glorious victory that they have had. The last of his doubts washed away as he read it. When he saw so many returning exhausted soldiers in the port, he feared that they had been defeated. Now he believes that the fear was unfounded. Fifteen days later, Naaman Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium, F-15S and F-16S were scattered across the temporary air base, inside a hastily erected building, men of the 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment checked over their equipment. Four MC-130 aircraft were parked right outside, Asta Air Base, Magus Imperium, B-52S taxied down the runway, B-1Bs prepared to do so as well, 70. Chapter 65, Operation Firestorm Part 1 2306 April 18th, 2020 CE 0233 Sun 19th, 196 E, Port City of Jalin, Elv Nation Ara looked at the ceiling in her bedroom Being a major general had its perks, it meant that she had her own personal room in the barracks She thought over what had happened when she got back, the moment they had gotten off of their ships, they all were escorted away here, being a major general also had its downsides, it meant that she was grilled for information for hours on end and had to recount her entire experience from beginning to end. Then she was warned that revealing anything about the defeats was treason. Of course, this also applied to everyone else as well. She sighed and got off of the bed, she muttered to herself, I wonder if they have any leaf juice left in the cafeteria. 0844 May 13th 2020 CE 0722 Sun 43rd 196 E Lynn Forest Elv Nation In the bushes, Pablo stared at the camp through his binoculars. Fences surrounded the entire place. Elves armed with bolt-action rifles walked around the perimeter. There were sniper towers placed at the corners. Although he didn't spot any, he wouldn't be surprised if there were machine gun nests. Dennis whispered to him. This is the what? Third one we found? Yep. So far we got a total of 12 of them. Some smaller than the others. Invasion should be starting soon. Weren't we supposed to monitor the situation in the capital? Saving people is much more important. We will be rendezvousing with the others soon. We got orders to take one of the smaller concentration camps once the birds have flown. Dennis nodded and grunted in acknowledgement. Pablo did one last scan of the fenced area. Let's go. Crouching low, they quietly walked back into the dense forest beaches of the Magus Imperium. Nick's M1A1 Abrams got onto the USS Bonham Richard. The tank lurched forward before coming to a stop. Damn it Connolly. You nearly rammed us into the ship. Slow down. Sorry about that. Dillian and Brian laughed. Nick sighed. Isaac sat around doing particularly nothing. The construction of the temporary ports has been mostly finished. The marines were going to be the ones to clear the beach so he wasn't part of the first wave. He wondered how his wife and kids were doing back home. 2324 May 13, 2020 CE 0242 Sun 44, 196 E Naaman Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium At early dawn with the sun barely up, a company-sized element of the 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, around 200 men loaded onto the four MC-130J commando is. In other air bases, other ranger regiments and special force teams got onto their MC-130JS. Washington, D.C. The air campaign will begin in the next hour. The special forces units have already taken off. President Hay stared at his water. Chief of Staff John Wills interrupted his staring contest. Mr. Dot President R. Sorry. It's nearly midnight. The president rubbed his eyes and gave a sigh. 0030 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0315 Sun 44th, 196 E. Essenfer's temporary airbase. One by one, an entire squadron of F-35S took off. All of them carried AGM-88 GR MERS, anti-radiation missiles capable of locking onto radar signals. Southern Sector Elven Detection Station. Senior Lieutenant Theodor's Drizmi I yawned as he walked into the detection room while sipping on his tea. Multiple elves had headphones on and were staring at screens. He looked around and found Lieutenant Fuller's Joy RS. Anything on the muds of MWEs? Nothing out of the usual. Well just tell everyone to keep a lookout. I got orders that there might be unusual activity and to report absolutely anything. Well, will do, Theodas. Theodas walked out of the room, 
still holding on to his drink. Even though he just woke up, he decided to go take a nap. Being in charge of the detection station meant a dead end to his military career. However, he didn't really care. Most of the time, he got to do whatever he wanted. He was just getting paid to do almost nothing. Skies over the ocean between Magus Imperium and Delve Nation. No lock, we aren't getting anything. RT Bing, the squadron of F-35S all started banking to their left to turn back. Washington DC, there seems to be a slight issue. President Hay furrowed his eyebrows at those words. What happened? The anti-radiation missiles aren't locking on. The elves either don't have radar or their detection technologies are different from ours. Seeing that the elves are capable of long-distance command and that we have images of what we believe to be radar, I'm betting that their detection technology is different, probably based on magic. That would explain why our jammers seemingly didn't work on affecting the elves' combat capabilities. Then why weren't they able to detect our stealth aircraft if they aren't using radar to detect things? They probably operate under the same principle as normal radars. Some sort of energy bouncing off an object. The F-35 and F-22 are shaped and painted to lessen the amount of energy that is bounced off. On the other hand, jammers and anti-radiation missiles depend on the emissions of the radar. Okay, then what should we do now? Their radar will be an issue. The old-fashioned way I guess. Drop a cluster bomb on it. We will most likely have to delay the start of the operation for about 30 minutes. 0102 May 14, 2020 CE. 0331 San 44, 196 E. Esnfa's temporary airbase, Magus Imperium. This time, the squadron of F-35S carried MK.20 Rock I-2 cluster bombs. They were also accompanied by F-22S as an escort. Naman Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium. Only a few minutes after the takeoff of the F 35S and F 22S, squadrons of F 15S and F 16S took off from their runways. First Lieutenant Scott Miller got into his F 15E Strike Eagle. He looked back at his weapon system officer, Gerald Wallace. Ready? Gerald gave him a thumbs up. Asta Air Base, Magus Imperium. B 52S and B 1BS took to the skies. Multiple C-130S followed right after Afanor Human Concentration Camp, Elf Nation. A guard blankly stared at the forest. His mind was wandering around, inside a building in the camp. Shouts from other elves could be heard amidst the noise of machinery. What are you stopping for? An elf officer looked angrily at a human man who had a dazed look on his face and was sitting with his back on the wall. Please sir, I'm too tired. Can I? The elf officer pulled out his pistol from his side holster and shot him in the head. The human collapsed face first in the ground. The officer looked around at the other humans in the factory. They had all stopped their work and were staring at the commotion. Anybody who stops like this human will be shot. The officer walked away. Although the humans didn't understand him, they understood what he meant. The elf guards inside the factory whispered to each other, What's this? The sixth one he shot? A. Eh? Bunch of inferiors can't even work like the cattle they are. In the forest, Pablo surveyed the area with his binoculars. The rest of his team sat quietly behind him. We have a few guards at the gate. I can see two sniper towers from here. We'll need to neutralize all of them. Good thing that factory there is making a lot of noise. 150 miles off of the coast of the Elf Nation, a massive carrier strike group that consisted of the USS Gerald R. Ford, USS Harry S. Truman. USS Theodore Roosevelt, USS Ronald Reagan, and USS Abraham Lincoln moved slowly through the ocean. Rear Admiral, Upper Half, Jacob Abran approached the commander of the entire five-carrier carrier strike group. Admiral, the Air Force birds have flown. It's about time that ours did as well. Vice Admiral Angela Walters nodded at his deputy's reminder. Get the Super Hornets in the air. Rear Admiral, Lower Half. Albert Johnson watched the deck as F-A-18 Super Hornets, loaded with harpoon missiles, launched off of the USS Abraham Lincoln. 0137 May 14, 2020 CE. 0348 Sun 44, 196 E. Southern Sector Elven Detection Station. Theodos blearily opened his eyes. Rubbing his head for a bit, he got out of bed and decided to check on his men. Scratching his head, 
He went up to Foley's. Anything so far? Foley's grunted a single word. Usual. In the air. F-35S swooped down towards their target. A massive system of radar towers and stations was in front of them. Southern Sector Elven Detection Station. Suddenly, one of the operators popped up. Sir, we got something. That got Theodos's attention as his eyes shot up. Where is it? Right on top of us. What? At that moment, multiple explosions ripped apart the station. In the air. Target neutralized. RT Bing. While the F 35S quickly swung around, the F 22S kept moving forward. Ten minutes later, Nays in Kalen Air Base. An elf mechanic, Vilman Chairhorn, whistled as he tended to a knee A 192. In the air, a squadron of EA 192s flew in formation. Suddenly, an explosion made him stop what he was doing. Vilman looked around, fearing that someone had accidentally dropped a bomb while carrying it. Sweeping his eyes from right to left, he saw a few elves point up at the sky. He looked up just in time for another explosion to occur. This time, he saw one of the flying EA 192s burst into flames. The sirens of the airbase blared. Vilman quickly hastened his work and started skimming through all the unchecked parts. A squadron of EA 192s lined up on the runway and got ready. Quickly finishing, Vilman shouted for someone to help him. He looked outside. The propellers of the EA 192s on the runway started spinning. Hey, this one is fixed. I need some people to help me get this outside. Two elves came running towards him. Just as the first aircraft were about to take off, a few massive explosions rocked the runway. The force of the explosion knocked the two elves off the ground. The runway was completely cratered and the aircraft that had attempted to take off were turned into metal charcoal. More explosions started blanketing the airbase. Vilman quickly dived under a table. In the sky, Scott looked out of his F-15E Strike Eagles and down at the Elf Air Base. Dark plumes of smoke rose to the sky. His plane turned around after the strike. At many other Elven Air Bases, similar situations occur. 150 miles off of the coast of the Elven Nation, from the Tomahawk cruise missiles launched from every ship capable of doing so. White streaks trailed behind each Tomahawk. Angela was watching the spectacle when Jacob came up to her. The Super Hornets are about to reach their targets. 77. Chapter 66. Operation Firestorm Part 2. 0155 May 14, 2020 CE. 0357 Sun 44, 196 CE. Port City of Ilis Zari, Elven Nation. At this point, the size of the National Navy could be considered pitiful. It had been reduced to barely 30% of its size since the start of the war. With their consistent failures, they have fallen out of grace with Taran, three battleships, an aircraft carrier, two cruisers, and eleven destroyers were still in the waters next to the port. Eight submarines were also docked. Elven sailors milled about and tended to their daily duties. Dozens of harpoon missiles streaked through the sky towards the fleet. The first missile smashed into a docked destroyer. The destroyer exploded as its ammunition cooked off. The pier next to it was completely destroyed and the blast wave from the explosions knocked many elves further in the port off of their feet. The naval base alarm blared. Another harpoon missile struck a battleship but did minimal damage. Elves rushed towards the circular sandbag positions that contained day Thor guns. Orders started being thrown around by multiple officers. Man the AA guns. Load them. Move. Spinning the adjusting wheels, the 88mm AA Thor guns and the 20mm AA Quad Thor guns were quickly turned towards the sea where the arrows were seemingly coming from. Black puffs of Magi flak filled all areas of the sky. They had no idea what they were shooting at since they couldn't find what was attacking them but they knew they were being attacked. The harpoons streaked through the skies, unaffected by the Magi flak. Explosions occurred on ships after ships. Inside the large building, not that far from the port, Admiral Linder Kelry listened to his adjutant who had just rushed in. Admiral, we are under attack. The human arrows are destroying our ships. How bad is it? We are taking heavy casualties and the anti-aircraft Thor guns are ineffective. A large explosion shook the building. Tiny bits of the ceiling fell to the floor. Linder wrinkled his nose. What was that? His adjutant looked around. Um, not sure, sir. The last thing Linder saw was his adjutant being flung towards him as the building behind the adjutant seemingly disintegrated in a bright flash. Tomahawk cruise missiles flew down onto various parts of the Ilis Zari naval base, 
Explosions after explosions rocked the area. Elven gunner officers started pointing above, they're coming from above. Adjust the guns. Fire, fire, fire. Some of the AA Thor guns spun upwards. Suddenly everything in the AA emplacement was flung forward as a tomahawk struck nearby. Some elves stepped out of buildings and onto the road while others peered out from their windows. Afar, they saw smoke rising from where the naval base was. Multiple explosions could also be heard. Concerned murmuring started amongst them. Oh my goddess. What's happening? Port city of Jalin, elf nation. Aro ran out of the barrack building. Multiple explosions had jolted her awake. She came onto the street that had a good view of the naval base. What the? Plumes of black smoke rose to the sky from there. 0202 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0401 Sun 44th, 196 CE. Afvalin, Elf Nation. Anne Phelan, the head of the intelligence department, was in Taran's office talking with him. Spying on the humans will be impossible. Any elves we send can't just wear hoods the entire time. It would look too suspicious. Can't you find a way to make our ears seem less pointy? And Phelan vigorously shook his head. Even if we cut off a portion of the ear, it won't look correct. An urgent knock came on the door and someone entered without permission. Annoyed at being interrupted, Taran looked around and Phelan. My leader, this is of utmost importance. You need to evacuate now. The inferiors have launched an attack. Taran's eyes grew wide, he got his coat and walked into the hallway of his office. Other elves were running around in a panic. Some were carrying important documents or objects while others just rushed for the exit. Anne Phelan and the messenger followed Taran out into the hallway. Taran turned to the messenger. Give me a report right now. What is happening? Taran started walking towards the exit. We have reports coming in of explosions occurring at the port of Ilis Zari. We have lost contact with multiple of our southern air bases but some of them have sent distress messages. Did the detection stations not detect anything? They were the first things we lost contact with. We tried contacting them around 30 minutes ago and they didn't respond. We thought some communication systems there might have broken. Taran frowned. You fool. Didn't I give explicit orders to inform me of any unusual activities? Although a bit phased at Taran's anger. The messenger stood his ground. My leader, that was only if the detection station reported any unusual activities. Losing contact is unusual enough. They exited the building and walked towards the road. Multiple cars were lined up on that road. Taran walked close to one of the cars with the messenger and Anne Phelan quickly following. Then a loud boom came from behind them. A blast wave pushed Taran and the others onto the ground. Ark, Taran groaned at the pain from hitting the ground very hard. Still on the ground. He lifted his head and looked behind him. The messenger and Anne Phelan, who were behind him, were also lying on the ground. With groans coming from them, they were clearly alive. The building he had just exited was now just trouble. Black smoke rose. If he had been warned a few minutes later, he would have died in there. Elves rushed up to him and lifted him up by the shoulders. My leader, we have to go. Hearing a loud noise coming from the sky, Taran and all the other elves looked up. An extremely fast object flew by overhead. Nays in Kalan Air Base. The rubble shifted. Vilman coughed as he hauled himself out of the wreckage of the hangar he was in. Covered in dust, Vilman looked around. The runway had been cratered at multiple places. Strewn bits of aircraft laid everywhere. Most buildings were rubble just like the hangar he was in. A couple of minutes later, Jasatha's Mountains. Colonel Herman Yelrick sipped his tea as he studied the blueprints of the EA-196. An aide opened the door without knocking and ran into the office. Colonel, we have reports from command that the capital is under attack. We have received orders to repel the enemy. Herman looked up in a jolt. They were in one of the few buildings that were concealed by the forest of the mountain. A runway ran from inside the mountain to the outside. From a few buildings, elves ran into the mountain. Move them out, move them out. EA 196's hexery were pushed out of the mountain opening. The EA 196 was an aircraft with a weird tube under each wing and no propellers. 
they were quickly pushed onto the runways by the ground crews and their pilots climbed aboard them. A loud whirring sound seemed to come from the tubes as the first one started going down the runway at incredible acceleration. One by one, 87 EA-196s took off. Washington, D.C. Inside the Situation Room, Krausen was giving a briefing to President Hay. We are not exactly sure how their communication systems work so we don't have any airstrike targets pertaining to that. So we have absolutely no capabilities when it comes to destroying their communications? Sadly, yes. Magic is being a major obstacle here. Well, however, compared to the magic in fantasy stories, it doesn't seem that capable, Aftvelin, Elven Nation. A convoy of cars sped through the streets of the Elven capital. In one of the cars, Taran looked out the window. In the distance, arrow-like objects flew at seemingly immeasurable speeds. A large explosion rocked where it had just passed. Tarrant stared at that area, that's the high command office. How do these humans know? Anne Phelan, who was also in the car with him, answered, the humans could have inserted spies among us, how would they have gotten here then? We are on an island far, far away from any human settlement, it would have been obvious too since their ears are not pointy. I don't know, my leader. Taran put his hand to his mouth and sighed through his nose. This is bad. He looked at the front of the car where the messenger and the driver were sitting. Inform those who are still alive that we are beginning operation continued Arrow. The messenger nodded. Also tell the great Magus to flood the city as a last resort, in a field in the Elven Nation. We got reports of something occurring in the capital. Information is a bit fuzzy though. We are having trouble reaching the high command office, from his entrenched night. Colonel Ran Errol Crispinize looked down at his communication officer. Around him were other magic panzers, anti magic panzer Thor guns, and trenches with infantry in them. That's concerning. If you receive any orders, tell me immediately. Hearing a weird sound from the sky, Ran Errol looked up. Then an explosion blasted his magic panzer to the side. More and more explosions occurred. Within a few minutes, their entire defensive position was blasted to charred remains. 0213 May 14th. 2020 CE 0406 San 44th 196 E in the skies over the Elven Nation. Captain Damon Smith shouted at his men in the MC 130. We are green light. Jump. Go. 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 One by one his men jumped out of the door of the plane. With the last of his men off, Damon jumped out too. The air rushed up towards him as he fell. Below, he could see the parachutes of all the men who had already jumped and the men of the three other MC-130s. Even further below was a large pasture of green. He quickly opened up his parachute and started floating down. Before long he rolled onto the ground, getting himself out from under the parachute and packing it up. He quickly got to the others. Let's go. In the air over the Elven Nation. Lara Larakin sat in the cockpit of his EA-196. He had a stern and determined face. He thought back to the last time he had talked with his friend, Elata. He remembered how excited he was to tell Elata that he was going to pilot this new aircraft. Turns out, that was the last time he was ever going to talk with him. Lara Lonely recently learned that the invasion of the Empire has been going disastrously. Most civilians weren't informed and it was treasonous for military personnel to spread this information so Laurel was sure that Alata's family didn't know that Alata perished. Now he was going to face the humans that killed his friends. Laurel placed his trust in his new mysterious non-propeller aircraft. A squadron of F-16s went deeper and deeper into Elven airspace. Although most of the Elven air bases in the northern part of the country have been confirmed to be destroyed. They had to be vigilant for any surprises. Seem to be moving faster than normal elven aircraft. Those are confirmed bandits. You are free to engage. Roger. Fox 3. AIM 120 MRAMs flew forward from the F 16S wings. 84. Chapter 67. Operation Firestorm Part 3. Should I continue naming the next few chapters Operation Firestorm Part Hash? Yes. No. Total voters 213. Cast vote. View results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Should I continue naming the next few chapters Operation Firestorm Part Hash? 0221 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0410 Sun 44th, 196 E. In the air over the Elven Nation. The first wave of 18 MRAMs streaked through the sky. 
It was quickly followed by other waves as the 18 F-16s fired them off one by one. We have reports confirming that the enemy are already there so be ready. The other EA-196 pilots of the 1st Special Fighter Wing acknowledged Colonel Yelrick over the radio. One of the Elven jet pilots noticed something streaking towards them. Break. Each EA-196 started shifting to move in a different direction. Some dived to gain more speed while others banked to the sides. The arrows curved and followed. To the shock of the Elves, the arrows got closer and closer. The first arrow hit one of the diving EA-196 which burst into flames. I see no targets. The second wave of arrows appeared. As soon as the first wave found all of their targets, the elves completely broke order and focused on avoiding the arrows. Laurel constantly looked back. He cursed as the arrow behind him got closer and closer. Come on, come on, faster. He looked behind once more just as the arrow touched the tip of his plane and a bright flash was the last thing he ever saw. 0246 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0423 Sun 44th, 196 E. Afanor Human Concentration Camp, Elv Nation. Pablo nodded to his men as he got off the radio. The birds have flown. Take the shots. Although they were in the middle of the forest with foliage surrounding them, a few hundred feet in front was a massive clearing. There were multiple buildings behind a chain link fence and gate. Whilst everyone else in the team was crouched, their two weapons sergeants were lying on the ground. Frederick came down the scope of his M2010 enhanced sniper rifle at one of the sniper towers. The other weapons sergeant, Douglas Brown, also had his M2010 aimed at the other one. All others in the team had their M4 rifles trained on the front gate. Each sniper tower had one elf in them. Two elves stood at the gate. The two elves at the gate were wearing black boots, grey trousers, a grey tunic, and leaf-coloured steel helmet. They were carrying bolt-action rifles. The weapons sergeants slowly adjusted their sniper rifles. Two loud pops echoed through the air. An elven guard looked around. He tapped the shoulder of the other guard beside him. Did you hear something? I heard a very loud pop. The other guard shrugged. Probably the machinery. I swear it came from the forest. We should go investigate. One of the humans could have escaped. We will be in trouble if we move out of our positions. I guess I will go alert the commander to what I hear. Just as he was about to finish his sentence, multiple bullets went through him. A full fusillade of pops could be heard. The other guard did not even have time to process what had just happened in front of him as he was gunned down at nearly the same time. Ceasefire. Pablo scanned the entire length of the fence and at the buildings behind the fences. Clear. Let's go. They stood up and sprinted out of the bushes, running across the flat meadows. It didn't take long for them to get to the gate. They found out that the gate was just a fence that had to be opened by pulling them apart. Pablo and Dennis pulled it open. And they walked into the camp. There was a lone brick building situated just to their right. It was placed right behind the fence and beside the entrance. There was a sign on the left of its door that said in Elven, Guard House. Just to the left of the guard house was a machine gun emplacement surrounded by sandbags that faced into the camp. A few yards further in front of them were a straight row of brick-colored rectangular buildings. There was a row that led from the gate to the rectangular buildings. There also seemed to be a second row somewhat hidden by the first row. Behind the rows of rectangular buildings was a large factory-like structure. We are breaching and clearing each building. Don't shoot any humans. Make sure they have pointy ears. They lined up next to the door of the guardhouse. Inside the guardhouse, three guards were talking amongst themselves. The guardhouse was just a windowless one-room building with two bunk beds on the left and right wall and a desk in the center of the beds on the wall opposite of the door. Two of the guards were sitting on the beds while one was standing in the middle. The elf standing seemed worried. We are closer to the forest. Maybe something happened outside. I don't see why a few pops would be concerning. No one seems to be coming so it should be fine. It was a fusillade of them. I'm just going out to check. He turned round and walked to the door. Just as he was about to open it, the door was opened from the other side and something was thrown in. The metal tube clinked on the ground. The guards stared at it for a bit before realizing what it was. <laughs> grenade. Then a loud flash blinded and deafened them. Pablo burst in and shot the elf that was at the door. Dennis got the one on the right bottom bed while Frederick got the one on the left bottom bed. 
They looked around the guardhouse. Clear. After clearing the guardhouse, Green Berets stealthily moved to the intersection where the entrance road connected with the road that ran between the two rows of one-floor rectangular buildings. They avoided the road and opted to instead walk on the grass. The rectangular buildings hid them from any elves further in the camp. Looking into the windows of the left and right buildings on the entrance road, they saw it was just rows and rows of bunk beds. There was no one inside. The Green Beret team split into two groups and went to the walls of each building. Dennis looked over the corner to scan the left side of the road that ran between the two rows of rectangular buildings while Pablo looked over the corner to scan the right side. The sound of factory equipment was getting louder as they got closer. Dennis raised up his hand to show that his side had five elves while Pablo also showed that his side also had five. The elves present were spread out and all seemed to be on patrol. They walked and glanced around randomly. Using hand signals again, Pablo gave some simple commands. Robert, the warrant officer, nodded. Pablo held up three of his fingers and started counting down. The moment his last finger was down, both groups popped out and started shooting. The elves were taken by complete surprise since the camp was located deep inside the elven nation. At first, the ones that hadn't been shot stared in shock at the green berries. By the time they started fumbling for their guns, half of them were already dead. We are under attack. Humans. The shouting elf was quickly shot in the face. An elf raised his magia rifle and took a shot. The round went way off. He keeled over as a shot went through his stomach. Another shot made a hole in his head. Pablo swept his eyes across the road. The dead elves were strewn around and their blood pooled on the road. The road seems clear. We need to check. A bullet whizzed past him. He felt its force graze his cheek. Fuck. Five elves had just appeared from behind one of the buildings. They seem to have run here from the factory's direction. Pablo and his team quickly raised their M4S and shot back. Armed with only bolt-action rifles and submachine guns, the elves were simply outgunned by the M4 assault rifles. A couple of panicked shots came from the ones with submachine guns. Soon, the twelve-men team of the Green Berets quickly filled the elves of the five elf squad with lead. Pablo beckoned Robert over. Robert, you and your team watch our backs cover the road. We need to look through each building. Got it. Robert nodded and turned to his group. You heard the commander. Pablo turned to his group of six men. We have ten buildings here. Look through the windows of each one. Quickly. We made enough sound to alert anybody nearby. A few minutes later Pablo went to Robert and nodded. All clear. I think these are where they house the prisoners. The signs said human quarters they are completely empty so I'm guessing the people are all in that factory. Not sure why there hasn't been more of a response from the elves but I will take it. Running towards the factory, a rather large two-floor building appeared to the right, it had been bidden by the human quarters. A grey military truck sat nearby on the road, there were also multiple wooden crates sitting next to the truck, they slowed their pace and aimed their guns at the door of the building. A few others kept an eye on the second floor. Two elves sprinted out of the building and left the door open, they had their rifles slung on their backs. One of the elves seemed to have forgotten his helmet while the other didn't have any pants on. With eyes widening, they skidded to a stop at the sight of the Green Berets. Humans are out. The Green Berets quickly dispatched them. Their M4 rifles let loose a series of pops. A hand from inside of the building quickly shot out for the doorknob and slammed the door shut. A barrage of bullets came down on the Green Berets from the second floor. They quickly hid behind the trucks and wooden crates. Although it seemed to be all rifle shots, the number of bullets from that single barrage was a lot. Pablo guessed that there were no less than 10 to 15 elves in there. That didn't account for those on the first floor. Looking over the crate he was hiding behind, Pablo studied the building. What is this building? Pablo then noticed the sign next to the door. Barracks. He shouted to his men. Seems like there's a lot of them and they are well hunkered down. Miles, think you can sneak over and get a couple C4 onto that side wall? We will distract them. No, scratch that. Miles, how much C4 do you think you can stuff in that backpack of yours? Miles, the engineering sergeant, quizzically looked at Pablo. Won't that alert everyone in this place? We already lost our stealth advantage a long time ago. Pablo and the others started laying down suppressing fire on the building as Miles quickly ran to it. They sporadically popped off a few shots from their M4S. Staying in the blind spots of the windows, Miles stuck multiple C4 onto each wall of the barracks. In a few minutes, 
he ran over under the cover of the rest of the team's fire. Ready? Miles nodded at Pablo's question. Pablo smiled. Okay, everyone back up a bit further. Let's see some fireworks. Pablo clicked the C4 detonator. A blast wave washed over Pablo as the barracks literally exploded in a fiery blast. Dust and smoke obscured their view for a bit before clearing. As the dust settled, only rubble remained where the barrack was. Bits of body parts could be seen in the rubble. Well, that's dealt with. Let's move on to the factory. Multiple bullets whizzed around them. The green berets quickly got down onto the ground. Fuck. I'm hit. 73. Chapter 68. Operation Firestorm Part 4. Do you guys prefer detailed infantry battles like this chapter and last chapter? Or do you want it? Yes. I like the detailed action. No. I prefer that you keep it short. Total voters. 206. Cast vote. View results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Do you guys prefer detailed infantry battles like this chapter and last chapter? Or do you want it? 0322 May 14th. 2020 CE 0441 Sun 44th 196 E Afanor Human Concentration Camp Elven Nation My leg Douglas shouted in pain He laid on the ground like the others but clutched his leg Pablo and the others quickly got into cover Douglas dragged himself behind a crate and sat Frederick looked at where the shots came from The elves are coming out of the fucking factory a few elves came out of the doors of the factory and got into cover behind the crates and vehicles there. Flashes came from their bolt-action rifles. Pablo looked over at Douglas. Jeremy, get on Douglas. Everyone else, covering fire. Pablo wished that they had carried the MK-46 machine gun with them on this mission. Because they were infiltrating the elves and their bags have been made to look like the ones that an average elf carried. They couldn't bring along any of their larger or bulkier weapons. Every member of the team had an M4 rifle and a varying amount of food and water in their bags. They also all had M9 Berettas hidden on them. From there, what they carried differed. The weapons sergeants had found a way to stuff their sniper rifles into their bags. The medical sergeants had their medical supplies. The communication sergeants had communication equipment. The engineering sergeants had the C4 wire cutters and a few other random things. Everyone else on the team had grenades and flashbangs. This wasn't everything that they carried but it was a few of the most space-consuming. As Jeremy, the medical sergeant, Crouch ran to Douglas, Pablo focused his fire on one of the elves. A few bullets whizzed over the green berets but the elves were being suppressed by the sheer volume of fire that was being poured down on them. Then multiple bullets peppered the crate where Pablo was hiding. They got a machine gun to our right. Robert yelled to the others. The machine gun started spraying their entire position. Before long though, it fell quiet. Sporadic rifle fire started coming from the elves but without their machine gun, the rest of the green berets could keep the elves mostly suppressed. Pablo peeked out of cover and looked down the scope towards where the machine gun fire was. Although the elf was ducked behind cover while reloading his machine gun, Pablo could see their helmet bobbing up and down. He kept his gun named at the area. The elf popped out with his fully reloaded machine gun and set it down. Pablo fired. Watching the elf slump over, Pablo yelled over the gunfire. The machine gunner is down. Dennis looked out of his cover as if he was debating to do something. In a snap, he made up his mind. Keep me covered. I'm moving up. Dennis ran out of cover and started sprinting to a tree. It was quite a distance and a few of the elves noticed. They tried to take Dennis out but they were completely pinned down. Dennis lobbed a grenade at the elves' position. Inside the factory, an elf ran into a room that looked like an office. The elf officer, Lieutenant Alokrolana, was at a desk and writing something on paper. The officer looked up at the panicked soldier. Lieutenant, the factory is under attack by armed human soldiers. Calm down. Alert the elves in the barracks. The soldier looked down at his feet and started stammering. They. They're all dead. Alok raised his right eyebrow. What do you mean they're all dead? There were at least 30 elves in there. The humans blew up the entire barrack. Alok took a deep breath. He wanted to scream and question how the humans were able to blow up that big of a barrack but he understood that he was in a bad situation. How many elves do we have left? About 10. A few of them are already engaging the humans outside. What do we do sir? Call a retreat. Get me out of here. We will use the back door. What do we do about the humans? Alok paused as an explosion came from outside. Leave them. 
the remaining elves panickedly shouted after Dennis's grenade killed a few of them. They started running back into the factory. Pablo took a shot and nailed an elf, who was standing up to run, in the head. One of the elves seemingly dropped his rifle as he ran back inside. Pablo turned to Jeremy who was still tending to Douglas. How's Douglas? I patched his leg up and gave him some morphine. He should be fine. He can still walk. Pablo looked over Jeremy's shoulder and at Douglas. Douglas, your leg holding up? Douglas nodded. Yeah, I'm fine. A little pain like this is nothing. Jeremy stared at Pablo's shoulder. Pablo looked at Jeremy questionably. What? Pablo, you are bleeding from the right shoulder. Oh shit, said Pablo as he touched his right shoulder. Ouch. I didn't notice it at all. Let me patch that up for you. Quickly the Green Berets moved up to the factory. They got beside the door that the elves all ran into. Dennis was in the lead and looked back to the others. I don't know how many of them are in there but there's at least three from the survivors. Dennis opened the door and threw in a flashbang. Hearing it go off, the team rushed in. For the nation, an elf lunged at Dennis with a knife. Avoiding the knife, Dennis grabbed the elf by the neck and then went around him. He got both of his arms under the elf's armpit. Dennis locked his hands on the elf's neck. The elf struggled intensely to get out of Dennis's hold and kicked around. The elf started wildly shooting tiny fireballs. The fireballs fizzled out in a very short distance but it would be dangerous to Dennis if the elf somehow got his hand around. Dennis ground his teeth. What the fuck? Shoot him. Blood splattered over Dennis's face as a bullet from Pablo's M9 Beretta entered the side of the elf's head. Letting go, the elf crumpled to the floor, blood flowing out of his brain. Dennis wiped his face. Motherfucker. Moving further into the factory, the Green Berets scanned around. They saw a couple of figures crouching behind some machinery. Dennis approached them with his finger on the trigger. The four men looked at Dennis in fear, noticing that they didn't have pointy ears. Dennis relaxed and held his hand up to the others. Don't fire. They are all humans. Dennis studied the men. They all seemed to be in their mid-twenties. Remembering the imperial language, Dennis spoke to them. Don't worry, I'm human. See, Dennis pointed to his ears. The men, noticing this, all blinked in surprise. Joy soon came across their faces. One of them seemingly threw themselves onto the ground as if in prayer. Another one started crying. Thank angels, we are saved. Hearing the happy shouts, more and more figures started showing themselves. Some came out of closet doors and others stood up from the machinery and tables they were hiding behind. They were all human men and seemingly varied from as young as 16 to as old as around 40. Dennis looked around, okay, listen up, you are all humans right? Albeit all looking nervous, the people in the room nodded, do any of you know where the elves went? The men looked at each other, one of them responded, I don't know, they seemingly disappeared after the gunfire and explosion, we thought they were killing everyone so we decided to hide, Dennis nodded, thank you, you are safe buddy, we will get all of you guys out of here, who are you people? One of the men cautiously inquired. We are American Special Forces. We have been tasked to liberate you guys, said Dennis. Please refrain from any more questions. We have to get you guys out of here. The elves could come back with reinforcements. We will be linking up with a bigger force. 0220 May 14, 2020 CE. 0410 Sun 44, 196 CE. Three miles from the Orvacalora Human Concentration Camp. Elven Nation. Damon and the rest of Baker Company of the 75th Ranger Regiment had quickly collected the extra supplies that the MC-130 had also parachuted out. They were now traveling hastily across the green pastures. Second platoon was sent further ahead for reconnaissance. About an hour later. This is Ghost 2. We have found the concentration camp. Quite a big place. Over. I hear you loud and clear. Is the only elf presence at the camp? Over. We have only seen them at the camp. The route there is clear, but there are a lot of them in the camp. At least a company's worth. Over. Okay, stand by. We will arrive within six minutes. Over and out. Damon got off of his radio. He turned to First Lieutenant Jebba Baker, the executive officer of Baker Company. Seems like they accidentally dropped us off about a mile from our supposed drop-off place. Ghost 2 just found where the concentration camp was. It's further than it's supposed to be. Or the Kalora Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. Senior Lieutenant Kaylin Jendon saluted as she entered Captain Elian Winry's office. Captain, 
We have received reports that a human invasion has begun. Start rounding the humans up, said Elian, frowning at the news. He got out and flipped through a book. Protocol indicates that we need to start exterminating the prisoners. Five minutes later, Damon was lying on the grass and observing the concentration camp when a gunshot rang out from the camp's direction. Fuck, they are executing the prisoners. Damon got on his radio. This is ghost actual. Are you guys in position? Over. We are in place. Ready to take the shots. Over. Good. Do not fear yet. Over and out. Damon turned to the others. The gate is quite sturdy. There are multiple guards and a guard post right outside. Get the Carl Gustav and blow that entrance and post up. Two soldiers aim down the scope of their Carl Gustavs. Back blast area clear. Firing. One head. High explosive dual purpose. Round streaked towards the guard post while the other head brown streaked towards the gate. A bright orange explosion knocked the guards off their feet and made a hole in the gate while another explosion shaved off half of the guard post. This is ghost actual. You are free to fire at any elves. Focus fire on those responding to that explosion. Over. We'll go. Over and out. The fifty men from the fourth platoon swiftly moved toward the gate. Elves showed up from the clearing dust. MK-48 machine guns opened up on the elves at the blown up gate. One of the snipers looked down the scope of his M2010. He led on the head of an elf running towards the gate. He pressed the trigger and the gun jerked. Moving his gun, he found another target. He fired again. Damon watched as the men of 4th platoon took cover behind the debris and objects at the gate. They started pouring down fire. Ghost 2. Ghost 3. We are moving up to Ghost 4's position. Disorganized squads of elves tried to respond. Taking cover behind crates buildings, and vehicles, the elves opened up with machine gun and rifle fire, the 4th platoon responded in kind but with a higher volume of firepower, they started pushing into the camp, soon the rest of Baker company joined in, the front gate is secure, we got a couple injured, we are clearing the buildings near the entrance, while supervising the extermination in an open field in the camp, Elian heard the explosions and gunshots at the gate, he went to find Kaelin. Lieutenant, report. What's happening at the front gate? Kaylin was talking to the company sergeant major but directed her attention to Elian. Human infantry have begun an assault. They have taken over the gate. Get the armored cars out and deal with them. 73. Chapter 69. Operation Firestorm Part 5. Do you guys prefer named characters even if they aren't gonna be present for long? Have minor roles? Yes. I prefer most characters be given names, somewhat like the Greenberry arc. No. Important ones having names would be fine, like the Army Ranger arc. Yes give all characters names. Even the ones that just stand there and shoot or die. Total voters. 206. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Do you guys prefer named characters even if they aren't gonna be present for long? Have minor roles? 0343 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0451 Sun 44th, 196 E. Or the Calora Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. The firefight continued at the front gate as squads of elves tried to push the humans out. Although the elves held a choke point and the camp garrison had nearly equal numbers to the human company attacking them, their unpreparedness caused them to be outnumbered 10 to 1 at the front gate. Pull back, pull back, pull back. The elves started rushing out of their position, crouching behind the debris, barrels, and creates. The rangers continued pouring fire from their M4 rifles and MK-48 machine guns. A few elves fell face forward as they ran. A couple slumped to the side after being shot by the snipers. The firefight died down as the elves retreated further into the camp. Behind them, the 4th platoon was clearing the buildings. Multiple shots came out of the one-floor square building. One of the soldiers from the 4th platoon chucked a grenade into the window. An explosion rocked the ground. Multiple rangers burst in, weapons at the ready. Three elves laid on the floor, killed by the grenade. This is Ghost 4. We have secured the surrounding buildings. Area in front of the front gate is secure. While advancing forward, opposition from the elves came back faster than expected. Elven machine guns opened up and a barrage of fire came down on the rangers. The retreating elves seemed to have done a 180 and started rushing back towards them. It was soon clear why. Two grey armoured cars moved down the road towards them. An elven officer raised his pistol in the air and waved it forwards. Attack. 
attack, crush the inferiors. In the storm of the lead laid down by the Rangers, two heat, high explosive anti tank rounds from the Carl Gustavs struck the two armored cars. The cars exploded and veered off the road, although the Rangers were still shooting. The elves seemed to be in a state of shock once again. The elves started retreating. This time, they were much more panicked. Pull back, pull back. Elian couldn't believe his ears. They took out both armored cars. Kalen nodded. They have some sort of weapon with the ability to destroy armor. Tell all units to regroup near the center of the camp. Sporadic firefights occurred as the rangers advanced further into the camp. Groups of elves hid in the buildings and behind cover. The rangers had taken some casualties but the elves were clearly losing. Moreover, in the midst of the chaotic battle, some of the prisoners were able to get to the rangers. We spotted a large force of elves blocking the road in front of you. Permission to fire? Hold fire. Thanks for the tip, Ghost Sierra. While the 4th platoon swept the area behind them for any hiding elves and helped the prisoners, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd moved up. One of the platoon leaders hid behind a wall. He jabbed his thumb behind him as he talked to his grenadiers. They should be right over there. Hiding behind those crates and overturned tables. Got it, sir. Multiple 40mm grenades shot out of the M203 grenade launchers mounted under the Grenadiers M4. The elves' position was smashed open by the barrage of high explosive grenades. A few of the elves survived but were heavily disoriented. The rangers opened up. A few minutes later, they have easily broken through the first two lines of defense. Elian crossed his arms at the news. He stood still outside of his office as his soldiers rounded up the humans that had not escaped or killed and got ready to execute them. He turned to look towards where the human soldiers were supposedly coming from. Suddenly a bullet whizzed past him and hit the ground. What the? Captain, get inside. Kalen urged him into his office. Inside, Elian had a frown on his face. Great, now, we have snipers. He opened the curtains of the window. Since the shot came from the side that faced the back of his office, he wasn't concerned about getting shot from his window. He watched as his men hid behind whatever they could find or buildings they could get in. Then the humans in the field started running. Shoot the running humans. Shots further into the camp were heard. Damon grew concerned as it didn't seem that the shots were anywhere near where his men were. Not good. The prisoners are trying to run but they are getting shot at by the elves. We are trying to kill those shooting. How far away is it? First platoon will be there soon. Ghost 1. This is ghost actual. Get your asses moving. The damn elves are killing the prisoners. The shooting outside of Alien's office got louder and louder. It wasn't from his soldiers killing the prisoners but the battle against the assaulting humans. Captain. Most of the humans have either escaped or been killed. We need to relocate. If we hug the walls. We can avoid the snipers. Get one of the Magi Radio Elf and tell them to start an organized retreat. A figure walked up the street towards a squad from the second platoon. The rangers aimed their guns. Hold fire, it's a person. At that, they lowered their guns. A soldier of the fourth platoon kicked the door open. He swept his eyes and gun around the entire room and noticed a cowering figure. Looking closely, the figure didn't have pointy ears. Watching from an elevated position, the sniper teams watched as most of the elves started retreating. Some of the elves stayed back and continued fighting. This is Ghost Sierra. The elves are performing an organized retreat. Damon nodded. Ghost 2. Ghost 3. This is Ghost Actual. I want you guys to disengage and focus on one spot. Ghost 2 on the left flank and Ghost 3 on the right flank. Try to create a corridor in their lines where you can go through. The elves are doing an organized retreat. I want you to cut them off. Wilco. Understood. Ghost 1. This is Ghost Actual. Take over Ghost 2 and 3's position. There should be fewer elves now. Elian huffed a bit as he rested. Elian, Kalen, and around 30 of his elves were scattered on the other side of the camp. Elian shook his head. We can't hold this camp. I have requested reinforcements but the closest unit is a couple of hours away. Shots rang out. Kalen looked alarmed. She beckoned over a Magi radio elf and started contacting the platoon commanders. After a short conversation over the Magi radio, she went over to Elian. They were able to get through the ones covering us. The sound of the shots got louder and closer. Captain, we need to get into a building, said Kalen. She also called over a handful of the soldiers nearby. We will take up a position in that building. Elian went up to the second floor with Kalen and a couple of soldiers following. 
One of the soldiers looked out the window at the firefight. He looked back at Elian. Captain, what do we do? They are getting closer. Elian considered the question before looking at Kalin. Kalin, can we retreat? We should but we may not have a safe route to do so. The soldier looking out the window spoke up again. Captain, some of the soldiers outside are surrendering. Elian's eyes lit up. The humans? No, ours. Outside, one by one, the elves started throwing down their weapons and raising their hands. When the second and third platoon penetrated the already weakened elven covering force, the covering force was thrown into disarray and started surrendering. This caused more and more elves to do so too. Before long, the rangers secured the entire camp and killed off the last of the ones still resisting. A few hours later, the rangers guarding the front gate readied their weapons as multiple figures appeared on a road. One of the rangers squinted at the figures before shouting, It's the Green Berets that are supposed to link up with us. A few minutes later, Pablo greeted Damon. Damon replied in a joking manner, What took you so long? You missed our battle. Pablo laughed, Trust me, we had our own battle. Well, I can see that. 0400 May 14th. 2020 CE 0500 Sun 44th 196 E in the air over the Elven Nation. Formations of F-15S and F-16S swooped down low. Their speed made them almost unhittable by the Elven air defense. Off in the distance, black smoke rose from burning metal. Multiple B-1BS dropped their payloads onto large Elven coastal fortifications. 20 B-52S cruised at nearly 50,000 feet. Although they were all in different locations, they were all moving south and deeper into Elf territory. Northern Sector Elven Detection Station. An Elven operator gave an emergency report. We have detected multiple aircraft scattered by themselves in the air across our sector. They all entered from the south where the humans are attacking. The commanding officer nodded. Alert all air bases in the northern sector to respond. Twenty squadrons of EA 192s took off from multiple different air bases scattered across the northern sector, each headed straight for one of the detected aircraft. In the air, the weather in the northern sector was extremely clear and it was easy to see for miles. One of the elf pilots noticed a single aircraft, it seemed so small because of how high above them it was. The elves easily identified it as a heavy bomber but were mystified as to how it flew since it didn't have propellers on its wings. The 12 EA 192s started to climb towards it. Within a few minutes of climbing, their engines started cutting out and they stalled. They had barely reached their target. The EA 192s curved backward and started falling. Falling for a bit. They regain control. How high is it? Regroup and attack again. We will have to shoot before we stall. Again. They tried, they aimed their aircraft at the human bomber and quickly climbed to intercept it. When the pilots felt that they were about to stall, they opened fire. Even with the EA 192s reaching their maximum ceiling of around 39,000 feet, their bullets couldn't reach the lone human bomber cruising slowly through the sky as if it was mocking them. Each squadron of 12 EA 192s was unable to engage the B 52S that they had been tasked to destroy. The B-52S continued on their journey. 76. Chapter 70, Operation Un Firestorm Part 6 In the air near the center of the Elven Nation, Aircraft Commander Evan Matthews glanced out the window of his B-52. Green mountains were seemingly spread across the land. Propeller aircraft darted back and forth below them. His co-pilot, Evan Smith, chuckled. I think tree huggers are a better name. Well, they don't hug trees as far as I have heard. Further inside the B-52, Jairis Barnett, the radar navigator, whistled into his microphone as he looked at his video camera. Those look exactly like those Nazi fighters my grandpa told me about. Just look at them. Never thought I would see one shooting their guns. Oh look, they are stalling. Their B-52, laden with nearly 70,000 pounds of bombs, lumbered on through the sky as the EA-192s gave chase down below. Northern Sector Detection Station, Elven Nation. Based on their trajectory, 
They are going directly to all southern airfields. There's also one headed for our station. Senior Lieutenant Ivazef Awaran rubbed his chin at the words of Lieutenant Alok Yazdan who was standing in front of his desk. And all the EA-192 squadrons that have been sent out can't shoot them down? Alok nodded. Yes. All air bases are reporting that the EA-192s don't have the altitude. So there's one that's headed to our station and it's a heavy bomber. Alok nodded again. Yes. Sir, get this to high command. Ivasa stood up. As for us, we are evacuating. Get all the important documents. Tell everyone to pack up. Alok turned to leave but stopped himself. Um, sir. We already lost contact with high command. Oh, forgot about that. Then switched to northern sub command. Ivasa went to grab a few files from the drawers behind him. Not hearing his door close, he looked back. Why are you just standing there? Alok rubbed his neck. Sir. You. How do we contact them? With a mildly surprised expression, Avasa asked, You are telling me that we have never contacted them before in our many drills even though this region is under their control? Well, sir. This was not in expectation with any of our military drills, it was assumed that the high command office would always be available, just alert all air bases first. I should be able to find the number to call them. Imethmal Air Base, Elv Nation. The 55th Squadron failed to shoot down the enemy aircraft, said Lieutenant Colonel Gurren while saluting. Colonel Veral quickened showed his clear unhappiness at the news. What? How? It's only a single aircraft. The aircraft is flying higher than any of our aircraft can. Veral raised his eyebrows. This is ridiculous. We got reports from our detection station that one of the aircraft, which has been identified as a heavy bomber, is headed straight for us. It's only one bomber right? Goren gave a curt nod. Yes, Veril gave it a few minutes of thought before explaining his thinking to Goren. It shouldn't be able to destroy that much of the base. Tell all pilots to start evacuating by taking off with their aircraft. Tell other personnel to take what's important and start leaving the base. We will all return once the bombing is over. Hopefully, the runways will still be operational or fixable after that bombing. Most of them should. It's only one bomber that probably is carrying very light bombs. No more than 10,000 pounds probably, coupled with the fact that the accuracy of bombers isn't that good either. Our airfield shouldn't be that badly damaged. Goren showed a bit of uncertainty. Sir, how are you so sure about the weight? Remember the cancelled prototype that we had? There are 177 heavy bomber? It could only carry around 15,000 pounds of bombs and it couldn't even fly higher than our fighter aircraft. I'm somewhat overestimating seeing how the humans have their bomber so high. I guess 5,000 to 10,000 pounds would be a good guess. A few minutes later, EA-192s and RA-189S started taking off from the runways. More aircraft were wheeled out from the hangars and pilots got into them. Elves ran in and out of buildings carrying papers, boxes, tools, and various other things. They loaded them into cars and trucks, watched as his aides loaded up the officer car with important documents. Veril's head turned to follow the last airplane, an EA-192, as it sped down the runway. He looked at his driver before stepping into the officer car. Follow the convoy out. Ten minutes later, in the air, Jairis stared at the video feed of the ground below. I only see a couple down there and they are quite abandoned. Evan chuckled over the radio. In massive clusters, MK-82 500-pound and MK-84 2,000-pound bombs started falling out from underneath the B-52. Explosions rocked the Elven airfield below as massive plumes of black smoke rose from wherever the bombs hit, a few miles from the Amethmal Air Base. Veril stepped out of his car and looked through the trees of the forest. He could see black smoke rising towards the sky. He walked back towards the car. Start turning around, contact all units, and tell them to start returning to base. What is this? Our planes can't land now. Once they returned, the airfield was barely recognizable. What used to be runways were now black and ground filled with craters of various sizes. The barracks and hangars were now a pile of metal and wood strewn around. An EA-192 circled overhead. The pilot, Voron Genja, looked over at the ground and wondered how he was supposed to land. Veril stared at the ground of the airbase before looking up and saying, They are going to need to find elsewhere to land. Gorin, who was right beside him, grew concerned. Where else though? Other than this clearing, 
It's all mostly forest around here. Are we able to contact any other rare base near us? We do have a Magai radio. I will try contacting the other bases. A few minutes later, Gorin shook his head when he returned to Veril's side. I can't reach any of the other bases. Now a mixture of EA-192s and RA-189s were circling overhead. Veril became quiet for a few seconds before saying, How long do you think we can make a suitable runway? Gorin looked around and towards all the soldiers that had returned. Their vehicles parked around what used to be the airbase. We don't have any construction equipment and having the men dig a suitable dirt runway will take a while because of these massive craters. Then get them to work. This is probably the only way to get these planes to land safely, because they were filled to the brim with bombs and were flying at their maximum altitude. The B-52S combat range was significantly reduced. However, the total distance from the northern tip of the Elven Nation was around only 15% of the B-52's total unfueled combat range. They were easily able to continue their journey back to their air bases in the Magus Imperium. Voron watched from his EA-192 as the elves on the ground scurried around the bombed airfield. They were clearly trying to clear away so the planes could land. He looked at his magic gauge. It was nearly 80% empty. He was going to have to land soon. Twenty minutes later, he watched as a different EA-192 attempted to perform a landing on one of the narrow roads through the forest. It got closer and closer to the ground while tilting to avoid the trees. It seemed to be doing well until the plane veered a bit to the right. Its right wing struck one of the trees of the forest. The right wing came right off and the aircraft spiraled out of control. The EA-192 disappeared from his view before a loud explosion could be heard. Smoke rose from somewhere in the forest. A few more aircraft tried to land on the dirt roads or small clearings in the forest in the next hour. A couple even tried to land in the rivers that flowed across the forests. Some of the pilots survived but all their planes were completely destroyed. The soldiers trying to repair the airfield were unlikely to finish on time. Voron looked at his magic gauge once more. The magic was completely out. He had even exhausted all his magic when he poured it into the aircraft. He had no confidence that he would be able to survive a crash landing. Pressing a button, he ejected from his EA-192. He quickly deployed his parachute and floated down. A few other pilots followed his example and ejected from their planes. Voron sat on the ground next to one of the trucks near the airbase. He watched as soldiers ran around trying to even out the runway. He looked up at the sky and watched the remaining planes. It wasn't long before something caught his eye. And Ra 189 started lining up on the still unfixed runway. It passed over the soldiers doing the fixing. Its propellers blew wind across the ground, it made a hard bank to the right and circled around, it started flying lower and lower, the soldiers on the runway shouted and started running out of the way, the plane's wheels touched the black and dirt and started running down the destroyed runway, it wasn't long before it hit a crater at very fast speeds and flipped over, the pilot, slightly injured, dragged himself out from under the plane. With the runway unable to be repaired and landing in the heavily forested area nearly impossible, most of the pilots just abandoned their planes and parachuted out. Similar things occurred across the north, as all airfields in the northern sector had been bombed to oblivion. Unlike the south with sparse forests and many plains, the north was full of forests. A large mountain range divided the north from the south, although personnel casualties were low. The loss of most of the planes that had been held in reserve in the northern sector had a severe cost. Somewhere in the Elven Nation, Taran sat down in a chair in his new office room. He turned his head from left to right and looked at the surviving generals. Give me a detailed report of everything that has gone on. The generals glanced at each other. Field Marshal Egord Gale, who had not been in the high command office when it was bombed, responded, That will be extremely difficult, my leader. It's complete chaos now. We are getting reports of attacks everywhere, it seems to be mostly from the air. Just give me everything you are able to find out. In the sea less than 20 miles from the Elven Nation, Nick played a game of poker with his tank crew. We should be there quite soon. Let's finish this game up and get ready. Beaches of the Magus Imperium. Isaacs boarded his transport ship along with the rest of his unit. He stretched while staring out at the glittering sea. 77. Chapter 71. Operation Firestorm Part 7 0522 May 14, 2020 CE 0541 Sun 44th, 
196E. Somewhere in the elven nation, Egord had a grim look on his face as he gave an oral report to Taran. It's absolute chaos out there. We are still able to communicate with some of our units but we are just getting panicked reports from them. From what we could gather, we have lost a majority of our bases and our navy has mostly been sunk. We tried directly calling the air bases, naval bases, and army bases but most of them were unresponsive. However, the aircraft and ground units we have sheltered inside mountains have been untouched. Other than a few other units, the ones in the mountains are the only ones that haven't been attacked. Taran scratched his forehead while keeping his eyes shut. How did these humans know where to attack? Spies would make sense but they seem to know the location of everything. Even with spies, that would be impossible. Aerial reconnaissance would be improbable. We kept up a constant aerial patrol. Not a single scout plane should have been able to get through. Egghorn shook his head. I'm not sure, sir. How about the defenses we have set up? We also tried contacting those positions. Most were unresponsive but we got a few responses from survivors. We can conclude that most of them have been destroyed or heavily damaged. Taran tapped his desk and looked up at Egghorn. Operation Continued Arrow has started, correct? It's well underway. Sulfbal, Elf Nation. The sun had almost risen to the midway point. An elven officer stood on a hastily erected stand made out of crates. The humans have launched a surprise attack and snuck onto our shores. Most of our army is currently winning the war in the human homeland and is unable to return. It is time to serve your duty for your nation. It is time to destroy these inferiors who dare tread on our land. All able-bodied male veterans please line up first. Murmurs of suspicion arose from the crowd. For the past few hours, they had seen strange aircraft flying over the sky. Nonetheless, no one argued. Male veterans started lining up. Elven soldiers handed out rifles, pistols, machine guns, explosives, grenades, and portable anti-magic bandses. After they received their weapons, the officer spoke again to the veterans. We also have a few Thor guns. They are linked up to trucks outside of the town. Okay, now. All able-bodied males. They were given everything that the veterans got except for the PAMs. All able-bodied female veterans, they were just given rifles, pistols, and grenades. All able-bodied females, they were handed rifles and pistols. For those with our new anti-magic panzer weapon, said the officer as he raised the PAM. We will have a demonstration on the field over there as to how to use them. The officer walked the male veterans to an open field. He coughed to bring the attention of everyone. This triangle cone on top of this tube is a rocket filled with magic particles set to explode. You just have to press this button under the tube to fire it. There is an iron sight on it to help you aim. These are to be used against any sort of vehicle and are not reusable. Fire them once and they can't be reloaded. The officer aimed the PAM and pressed the button under the tube. The rocket shot out and exploded a few hundred feet away. Orvacalora Human Concentration Camp Elven Nation. Damon conversed with Pablo in what used to be a guardhouse. Our job is to guard these people at all costs. We were given two options. Wait until our main force arrives or advance towards where the main force will be coming from. We will get air support via any nearby air units. Personally, I think the forest option is better. Pablo considered it for a second. Either way, we have an issue with this amount of people in addition to the elves. I don't think we have the supplies to feed this many people. Good point. Damon nodded at Pablo's analysis. Good thing is is that the concentration camp here does have a lot of food. However, we don't really have the ability to bring it with us. There are trucks and cars here but it's gonna be hard traveling down the road hiding this many people. It seems like we are staying. Damon opened the door and looked outside. Seems that way. We are going to be here for some days. Outside, their men ran around erecting a few defenses. Using shovels, they dug a trench at the front gate. 0644 May 14, 2020 CE. 0622 Sun 44, 196 CE. A couple miles from the shores of the Elven Nation. Nick pulled down his hatch and looked at his crew. Okay boys, we are hitting the beaches soon. The Air Force has been doing some bombing so I don't expect resistance to be heavy. AH-1Z Vipers took off from the deck of the USS Bonham Richard and other amphibious assault ships. On the beach, smoke billowed from the destroyed fortifications. In one of the Vipers, a pilot spoke into his headphones. Anti-tank guns, infantry, and a couple of tanks. You are clear to fire. 
the 20mm M197 three-barreled rotary cannon that was on the front belly of the helicopter started spinning. Bullets soon spewed out onto the beach. Hydra 70 rockets flew out of the launchers on the side of the Viper. Explosions blanketed the area. An anti-tank gun position exploded on the ground. Elves ran around like ants. Nick felt his tank jolt as the cack he was on crashed into the sea. Amai looked up from his driver's seat. And Nick, how many of these amphibious assaults have we done? Two. Ama scratched his head. I thought we did three. Nick waved him off. I don't quite remember. Anywhere between two to four. More than we need. A few minutes later, the cack that Nick Sabrams was in hit the beach and quickly deflated. The front gate opened downright as Ama put the pedal to the metal. A vein popped on Nick's head as the tank sped onto the sand. Connolly, goddamn it. You nearly rammed us into the fucking Lukak. Above them, the AH-1Z Vipers, out of ammo, banked and turned back towards the large group of amphibious assault ships that were just offshore. Besides them, another Lukak came ashore and disgorged two M1A1S. On the M1A1 sides, Afs came ashore. Bullets pinged off of the Afs. Shots came from the stone rubble of fortifications. From the little turret of the Afs, the MK-1940 mm automatic grenade launchers and their 50 calories machine guns opened up at the rubble. Nick shouted at Dillion. We got enemy infantry direct front. Open up with the machine guns. Switching to thermals. The red-orange heat given off by the elves could be seen in the camera feed that Dillian was looking through. The machine guns on Nick Sabrams opened up on the elves hiding behind the rubble. Under the cover of fire, marines rushed out from the open back doors of the AFs. They positioned themselves behind the armored vehicles and started firing. The fire from the elves slackened as bullets poured down on them. A tank shell exploded on the cheek of Nick Sabrams. A knight had peeked out from a small hill. Nick shouted again at Dillian. Tank one o'clock. Firing. The round went right into the turret of the knight. In a flash, the knight's turret exploded and was flung into the sky. Advance. Their Abrams whirred to life and started moving forwards. Behind them, MV-22 Osprey landed onto the beachhead and more marines ran out. Small arms fire from the elves peppered the advancing armored vehicles. The AH-1ZS sped past overhead and headed deeper into land. They began clearing the way for the advancing ground forces. Marines moved up to the rubble and took cover behind them. The supporting M1A1S and AFS gunned down any nearby elves that appeared or started shooting. Sergeant Finn Johnson, sitting behind a piece of rubble, looked over his shoulder. Bullets from the machine gun whizzed past him. The rest of his squad was crouched with him. Finn nodded his head over the rubble. Got a machine gunner there. Blake, give me suppressing fire. I'm gonna throw a grenade over. Got it, sir. Private Blake York peeked out from the other side of the rubble and opened up with his M4 rifle. Finn stood up and tossed a grenade over where the machine gun fire had come from. He quickly ducked back down and Blake returned to cover. An explosion came from where he chucked the grenade and with that, the hail of bullets stopped. However, singular bullets still whizzed by. Machine gunner down but we got some rifle fire. A fusillade of machine gun fire was heard. An M1A1 had opened up with its machine guns on the elves that were firing on them. The rest of Finn's platoon peeked out of cover and started firing. It wasn't long before Nick Sabrams was off the sand and onto the dirt. Something pinged off the sloped front of the tank. Anti-tank gun. 11 o'clock. An anti-tank gun was sitting in a dugout position just to the left of them. It had sandbags surrounding it, near it was multiple already destroyed anti-tank guns, firing. The high explosive slammed into the anti-tank gun just as its screw reloaded. The gun exploded and its screw was vaporized in the combined blast. Port city of Ilis Zari, Elv Nation. Ara sat down, in the room were the current commanding officers of the army units in Ilis Zari. They were all survivors of the failed invasion. Usually, this divisional meeting would be a meeting of major generals and lieutenant generals but some of the elves ranked as low as captain were also participating. Captain Fino de Gola, current commander of what's left of the 7th Infantry Division started the meeting. The naval base, it's completely gone. Colonel Jolis Kinor, commander of what's left of the 21st Major Panzer Division, dishearteningly commented, You saw the planes right? Themo nodded. They are the exact same ones as those that attacked us in the Empire. The humans are already here. High command is gone. We can't reach them. Are aside and interjected. 
they are doing the same thing. Jolise looked at her questionably, what do you mean? Their basic strategy is to cut off the head and let the body writhe in confusion. We experienced that when they destroyed our bases in the Empire. Have we received any exact orders or reports? We did receive some panicked messages. We know that this is occurring across the country. The humans are bombing everything. Nothing is clear yet though. Ara nodded. I suggest we retreat. Lieutenant General Aylard Farah commander of the 34th Infantry Division and one of the few higher ranked in the meeting, disagreed. Isn't it better if we fortify our position? Ara looked down at the map that was on the table. She pointed to the mountain range that divided the south from the north. This is the best place to set up a defense. Aylard scoffed. We are all the way on the southern tip and you are expecting us to move hundreds of miles across land that's under attack by the human aircraft? Ara shook her head. We will not move as one. We will move in multiple small groups. The humans would most likely attack large numbers of units setting up defenses than small numbers retreating. How are you certain? I'm not. I'm betting on it. It's our only real chance of putting up a fight. You experienced what happened when we tried to defend cities against these humans. 74. Chapter 72. Into the Hornet's Nest. When should I start a rewrite? Give me a couple of months after I stop writing this. Finish this entire story first. There should be two more arcs to go. Finish this arc. Now. Total voters, 257. Cast vote. View results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. When should I start a rewrite? Give me a couple of months after I stop writing this. 0910 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0735 Sun 44th, 196 CE near the shore of the elven nation. By the end of the day, the marines had secured a beachhead spanning miles. Nick sat in his abrams while keeping an eye out for any threats. The anti-tank gun fired and the shell ricocheted off of the abrams cheek. After Nick turned the turret towards the anti-tank gun, Dillian quickly dispatched it with a single shot. We just destroyed an anti-tank gun. I think the town can be considered hostile. Over. We are just a couple of minutes behind. Hold until we get there. Out. Afs and Humvees pulled up right beside the Abrams. Marines exited their vehicles and started moving into town. Nick's Abram followed the infantry as they entered the town. The Afs and Humvees lined up right behind. Although the town seemed empty, the air felt tense to Nick. This town doesn't feel right. Amak commented nonchalantly. I guess the civilians evacuated. Nick wondered to himself. Then why was there an anti-tank gun right outside of the town? I dunno. Maybe they were a part of the defenses that they had set up. Brian, the loader, interjected. Well so far, considering the lack of noise, the houses should be empty. The infantry was kicking open the doors to the surrounding houses on the street. So far, there was no sound of battle. Amma laughed. We are in a tank and fighting a country that can't even field modern weaponry. What are we so worried about? Brian shrugged. It's still a war. Who knows what could happen? Shots rang out. Nick wrinkled his nose. More shooting started. Finn slammed his back to a wall beside him as soon as he saw the partially concealed machine gun peeking out of a house's window. Machine gun. It opened up and wildly sprayed bullets at them. Finn returned fire with the rest of his squad. From another window, a grenade was lobbed towards them. It landed right beside Blake. Or oh, fuck. Blake knew that what was shown in movies and video games where people just threw back grenades was utter bullcrap. Grenades only had around a 3 to 5 second fuse and he wasn't superhuman. Blake dived for the ground. A few seconds went by and no explosion occurred. From his prone position, he looked back at the grenade. Oh, they forgot to pull the pin. Finn got his back on the wall next to the door that led into the house where the grenade came from. He threw a flashbang in. Hearing it go off, he burst in with two others from his squad. Seeing armed elves covering their eyes, Finn started shooting. They cleared the living room in no time. Shots rang out from the stairs. Whoever was firing seemed to be randomly firing at the first floor. Johnson, get your team and keep us covered downstairs. The rest of you guys in here. We are going up. Some guys trying to blind fire or something. I'm throwing a grenade up. Finn tossed one upstairs and it clinked onto the ground of the second floor. Shouting was heard and then an explosion. Finn moved up first followed by his men. Two bodies laid strewn on the ground. I'm checking the first door. They methodically checked each room of the house which in the end were all clear. One of Finn's men, Curtis Sheridan, 
stared at one of the dead bodies. They are just fucking civilians. Blake seemed to come to an understanding. Explains why that pin wasn't pulled. Finch shook his head. This feels just like I'm back in Afghanistan. Blake nodded. Well, at least there aren't any children. I hope it stays that way. Multiple gunshots rang out from outside the house. Finn patted Curtis, who was still staring at the body. Okay, we don't have time to chit chat. Let's move. We still have a job to do. Nick Sabrams moved up the road. A firefight was occurring between US infantry and Delves who were taking cover behind a makeshift barricade. Firing and he, the barricade exploded. Nick and Dillian opened up with the machine guns on the tank at the surviving elves. Something flew towards the Abrams at high speeds. It exploded on the glassy plate of the tank. Conley shouted, Is that an anti-tank gun? Nick shrugged. I don't see anything. Well, it didn't damage the tank. Keep moving forward. Finn ran to his platoon leader, 2nd Lieutenant Albury Gray, who was standing outside with another squad of their platoon. Albury had split the platoon in order to cover more houses. Finn shouted over the gunshots. Sir, we cleared out the house. Killed a couple of elves in there. Seemed to be armed civvies. What's happening out there? Same thing as you got. Armed civvies. Now, we got a Humvee coming as support. There are reports that the elves got barricades and cover set up on the streets all around town. The Humvee is gonna help a lot. I want you and your squad to keep the Humvee covered. We got lots of elves further ahead. The rest of the platoon will clear out the nearby houses. Got it, sir. It wasn't long before the Humvee pulled up. Finn slapped the side of the Humvee a couple of times. We got you covered. The rest of our platoon is clearing the houses further up. There. 50 calories gunner started eyeing the windows further ahead. Bullets pinged off the Humvee as shots came from the second floor of the house up ahead. Fuck. Get down. There. 50 calories gunner blasted the window where the shots came from. With the nearby houses cleared, they moved up the road. Rebounds per game. A rocket slammed into the front of the Humvee. Finn and the rest of the squad were flung to the ground. His ears rang and his surroundings looked blurry. He put his hand down on the ground as he tried to get up. He heard shooting and a lot of gunshots. A soldier, he wasn't sure who, helped him up and got him into cover. Gaining back his senses, he took in his surroundings. One of the men in his squad, Private Dave Hunts, was screaming as he clutched his left leg which was clearly blown off. Motherfucker, what was that? The elves have RPGs. Dave. Hold on we are getting you out of here. We need a case of ag. This zone's too fucking hot. Carry him out of here first. We don't want the holly to get blown out of the sky. Bullets whizzed around as elves in plain cloth popped out and started firing. An hour later, Finn sat in a chair in one of the houses as he munched on his MRE which was some sort of meat and barbecue sauce. Corporal Johnson looked very pissed. It was obvious why. Dave was one of the men in his team. When the fuck did the elves get fucking up EGs? Blake responded while eating his MRE. Well, I guess today. And they gave them to fucking civilians. Curtis cut in. Is Dave gonna be alright? Blake shrugged. Not sure. Man. He still has a wife and kids at home. A silence filled the room as they ate their rations. The silence was soon broken by Curtis. Those were civilians weren't they? Blake looked over. Yep. It was clear that Curtis didn't look too well. And you guys are okay with this? Finn sighed. After the first house that they had cleared, Curtis seemingly started to put in less effort. Well terrorists were once civilians and we shot them without a blink of an eye. Look soldier, Finn stood up. If they're armed and trying to kill you, you gotta kill them or they are gonna kill your friends. Curtis still looked upset. Some of them were women. I know this is different from what you have been experiencing so far. You have only been deployed for a year but it's no different from the old world. You see most of us here. We were deployed to Camp Dwyer in Afghanistan. We had to kill kids sometimes. Nobody wants to kill a kid. But when you have one running at you and your friends with a bomb strapped to their chest. You gotta do what you have to do. Blake shook his head. At least the elves in this town haven't armed their kids. We got ten who are probably orphans now. At this, Curtis looked uneasy again. Finn stared unhappily at Blake. Near Port City of Ilis Zari, Elf Nation. Ara set out in her night with another knight and two stallions. A few platoons of infantry and Majapanzas have already set off earlier. It wasn't long before she came upon the damage wrought by the humans. From her open commander's hatch, she scanned the blackened fields of destroyed Majapanzas and Thor guns. What was this all for? 
she said to no one in particular. Staring at the destruction, she thought back to her childhood. At only 59, she was still a young elf so it wasn't hard. She remembered how she was taught that the world was destined to be for the elves, how she learned about the inferiority of humans. There was even a mandatory class studying the shortcomings of the humans. Their magic was inferior, their technology was inferior, they were just inferior beings. She remembered how she was so excited when she had joined the army and learned that they were preparing to invade the humans. To finally defeat an enemy that she had learned to curse at from youth. Looking at the scene in front of her brought her much anger but also a lot of doubt. She was scared of the doubt growing in her, in fact. She hated it. To doubt something she had believed her whole life, she pushed it to the back of her head. 74. Chapter 73. Psyops and Delusions of Grandeur. 1022 May 14, 2020 CE. 0811 Sun 44, 196 E. Near Nalor, Elf Nation. Elves bustled around in the big city. Although they were in plain clothes, they carried all sorts of weapons. Most of them set up sandbags. Some of the elves who have earth magic set up small walls to close off streets. Inside a grocery store, Alien Moore varies. The shopkeeper conversed with his friend and regular customer, Elwin La Edger. I don't believe what that officer said one bit. It sounds ridiculous. What military would invade with such force when they are being invaded? Those planes in the sky are definitely not ours. Elwin frowned. Even if he was lying. I would never allow a human to step onto our soil unless they are coming here as a slave. Do we even have to treat them that bad? The shock on Elwin's face grew into anger. You are actually sympathizing with those trash, right? Look at how their ears aren't pointy. It looks disgusting, who would have round ears? Also, I can easily raise walls. A human can't do that. And they can't even live past 100 years. If they aren't cursed beings only suitable as slaves. Then I don't know what is. Elwyn started to calm down and looked sadly at Alien. Look, we have been good friends and I hope this is a one-time thing. I don't want to do this to you. However, if you truly believe it, I will tell everyone and you know what happens right? Elwyn stared at Alien menacingly. Alien gulped and nodded. Sorry. I just got scared of the human weapons and the fact that they are invading us. Elwyn made a wide smile. It's fine. We will beat them back. You have nothing to worry about. Now, can I get some flour? A whirring sound filled the air. The elves looked up and pointed at the plane. Some started to murmur while others ran for cover. The C-130 started descending and soon flew at a stable and low altitude nearing the city. Its back door opened. Papers pewed out and started fluttering to the ground. Elves cautiously picked up the papers and looked at them. On one side, the picture of a battlefield was shown on top. It was a view of many destroyed elven Majapanzas and dead elves. Right below the picture was this message, Attention people of the elven nation. Almost all of your military forces have been destroyed. Do not take up arms. Our forces do not wish to harm the innocent civilians of the elven nation. The government of the United States of America guarantees the safety and well-being of all peaceful civilians. On the other side of the leaflet was a four-panel drawn picture. The top left panel showed an elf with a bolt-action rifle. An arrow went to the top right panel which showed the elf dead. On the bottom left panel was an elf without a weapon. An arrow went to the bottom right panel which showed an alive elf. With most of the air cleared out and more available aircraft, the US began their psyops. In multiple elven cities, these messages were dropped. In addition to the C-130S, F-15E Strike Eagles dropped PDU-5B dispenser units. The dispenser units burst in Madeira and spread the leaflets. 1155 May 14, 2020 CE, 0827 Sun 44, 196 E. Jana, Elven Nation. Alazrin Ilikian stood with his back against a wall. His elder brother, Amarilikian, stood beside him. Although they were both cooks with no military experience, they were proud to fight for their country. The noise of a tank was heard right around the corner. Alazrin shouted to his older brother, There's a tank. I got the pan. Firing. The rocket shot out at the Abrams. It hit the side of it and an explosion went off. The smoke quickly cleared and the Abrams' turret turned towards the two elves. Amma's eyes widened. Run. Machine gun fire cut them down. Over Kalora human concentration camp. Elf nation. Pablo leaned back in the chair. You think we are going to be attacked any time soon? Damon shrugged. Well, 
You never know. It's been more than an entire day and there has not been any presence of an elven force within a few mile radius. We can probably be a vist soon. Depends on how much progress the marines are making. Well even if this is a concentration camp, this kind of feels like a vacation. Damon started laughing, a green beret calling being in a concentration camp a vacation. Kind of ironic isn't it with your motto to liberate the oppressed? Pablo chuckled. Anyways, with their country being invaded. Do you think they will even have time to care about their concentration camps going offline? I won't be surprised if they don't even know we took this over. They have bigger issues. Washington DC. President Hayes shook his head. I will not authorize the bombing of civilians. These are just towns and cities. If it's a political building or something of military value inside a civilian area, then fine. But I'm not going to authorize the bombing of random streets. Kralson slammed the table. Mr. President. Our soldiers are dying fighting these elves on the streets, it seems that almost all of them have taken up arms. Remember the media has an eye on this war, they threw a fit when I didn't allow them to report on the outside world for the first few months, there are going to be a lot of war correspondents for this invasion. Just continue attacking military targets. If, if the situation worsens, then I will consider it. Jana, elf nation. Finn leaned against the wall. The elven military was the least of their concerns now, this was their second town, a bit smaller than the last one but many of the civilians fought to the death. Heard the armies coming, Johnson nodded, for once I'm fucking glad they are here, these elves are suicidal. How's Curtis doing? He's doing alright I guess, I don't like the pause there, Johnson shook his head while looking at his feet. Well, it hasn't improved. I know. He still knew. I probably should go talk to him again. Finn walked towards where the rest of his men were resting. You guys holding up well? I don't like this either. We are basically exterminating these people. Well, these elves. Blake took a swig of his water. Well, let's just think of them as terrorists. Nothing changed. They just have pointy ears now and even worse weapons. Finn sat down beside Curtis. Through the background noise. There was a moment of silence between them. Curtis, why did you join the Marines? Quite a cliche story actually I guess. I was almost gonna graduate high school and I still had no idea what I was going to do. My scores weren't that magnificent and going to a state college didn't really appeal to me. Really didn't want to go into debt getting a useless degree. I was quite bored so I just decided to join the Marines. By chance, after I finished training. We were transported to this world. Finn sighed and looked at Curtis. Well, the military isn't for everyone. If you can't take it anymore, just talk to me. Elf Nation. Anne Phelan burst in after knocking on the door. My leader, the humans are spreading propaganda from the sky. Look at this. He threw the leaflets onto Taran's desk. Taran read them for a minute and looked up. His fist slammed the table. Get me to the Magi radio room. The last time he made a speech was before the elven invasion of the humans, he knew exactly what to say, the MAGA radio operator switched to the public channel and spoke. Taran gripped his microphone for a few seconds before starting to speak. He shouted into the microphone with force and anger. These wretched humans have landed onto the shores of our beautiful country, will we let these animals encroach on our sacred haven? Will we turn our backs to our destiny? Will the superior species be subjugated by an inferior one? The prophecy has foretold the demons and their weapons. It is clear here that the humans are working with the demons. The demons, the forces of evil, aim for the destruction of all of us. The uncivilized humans are mere pawns of the demons. But rest assured, our military is preparing a counterattack. The reserves are being mobilized. Weapons of wonders developed by our scientists are being brought out. Magipanzers with impenetrable armor, planes that can fly nearly at the speed of sound, rockets that can fly hundreds of miles and accurately hit their targets. Continue your resistance against these pests. They may have demonic weapons but our weapons are a match. You are the superior species, you have the most superior magic, you have the most ideal bodies. Your souls are blessed by our goddess to tame this world, do not falter, near Nalor, elf nation. In the streets, elves that are crowded around the public. Magi radios nodded. Murmurs arose. That would explain those planes. My goodness. The humans working with the demons of prophecy. Just how evil can these humans become? Burn these papers. Burn these lies. The crowd turned into a sea of fury. 
Elves started ripping apart the Psyop leaflets. Some threw them into fires while others conjured up small flames. Bombarded with propaganda for hundreds of years, taught to always listen to their leader, and to consider humans to be no more than animals. Most could not see that they were clearly being lied to. Only a minority knew better and they dared not to speak. Taran did not need a secret police because the citizens themselves were the secret police. Taran took a deep breath. In his mind, Taran assured himself that they would win. He put his trust into the super weapons that they still have yet to use. As long as they could beat the Americans back, they could win. They just needed to fight them until they couldn't fight anymore. He truly thought that it was his destiny to fulfill his further's vision. He left the Magi radio room and made his way directly to the military room. It was a large room filled with desks and maps. Taran approached Egghord. Have we re-established contact with most of the surviving units? Yes, sir, most of them. The situation doesn't look good at all though. Let me take a look. What units are functioning, and what are not? A large map on the table showed the entire elf nation. Egghord placed objects onto the map. He showed the positions of each surviving unit and their conditions. After a very thorough and detailed showing, Taran gathered his top generals. Colonel General viewed you in Roke and proposed his idea. My leader, we are thinking of a spread out defense. The human's air force is very capable of destroying massed forces. By spreading them out, we will make it harder for the human aircraft to destroy our units. They will have to hunt them down one by one. The spread out units will support the citizens who are fighting back. General of the infantry Yomahorn shot back instantly. I propose that we retreat to the mountains. It's a natural defense and is much more easily guarded. Colonel General Roken's plan just causes unnecessary casualties and only weakens us. A unified force at an easily defended place is better. Viewed you in scoffed. We will be losing nearly half the country if we do so. Taran pondered for a bit. I see merit in both of your statements, but I believe that General of the Infantry Myrhorn's plan is more sensible. However, we shall not lose our territory without a fight. We will use Colonel General Roken's plan here. We will organize a few units for a spread out defense. If it works well, we will call back our retreating units. If not, then most of our men will be able to fight another day as they would have already retreated. Yo smirked at Genera. Genera narrowed his eyes. Because of their constantly conflicting strategies and opinions, they had been rivals ever since they were both major generals. When Genera was promoted to Colonel General, Rio threw a fit. 75. Chapter 74 to 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored. 0044 May 15, 2020 CE. 0322 Sun 45th, 196 CE. He is currently following an element of the 1st Armored Division. Mason Booker, to you. The TV screen changes to a person standing on the deck of a ship. A few seconds of silence follow. As you can see the soldiers here are preparing to deploy a lot of these smaller boats towards the shore. Is this anything on the shore? The camera pans towards the shore. Nothing. It's only an empty beach. Much earlier I saw multiple of what I believe to be American jets fly over. Seems like the landing ships are departing. The camera swivels to where the ships are departing the Oak Hill. Off the shore of the Elf Nation, multiple ships pulled up to the beaches, the largest of them all. The USAF Major General Robert Smalls and USAF Major General Charles P. Gross, landing ship vessels, dropped down its front door. One by one, a total of 28 M1A2 Abrams, two armored companies worth of tanks, rolled off. This made up the entire tank force of the 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored Regiment. The 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored Regiment was one of the armor combined arms battalion of the 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team. It was made up of two armored companies and one mechanized rifle company. Besides the landing ship vessels, many LCUs, LCACs, and LCMs came ashore from them. Infantry jumped onto the beach. Humvees, M113A3 APCs, and M2A3 Bradleys also drove ashore from them. Multiple Harpers Ferry class dock landing ships and Hidby Island class dock landing ships could be seen further out at sea still disgorging LCUs, LCACs, and LCMs. Isaac was among the infantry inside the M2A3 Bradleys coming ashore. He was part of the mechanized rifle company of the 2nd Battalion, 
37th Armored Regiment. The 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team was the first army unit to land on Elven shores. More army units were coming but there was a limited number of military transport ships. A lot would have to come by civilian contracted ships. Jana, Elf Nation. Johnson shook his head. Two towns of hell and we have to fight our way through a major port city now. This is going to be a pain in the ass. The populace is just too hostile. I would prefer fighting the Taliban than this. Blake frowned. Then why are we attacking a major port city? Seems like the army is using civilian contractors to get more things ashore. The civilian ships don't have amphibious capabilities. They need a port. Ah, the fucking army. Makes sense. We are definitely not going to be able to do this by ourselves. A brigade combat team from the 1st Armored is coming to assist. They should have already landed. Elf Nation. Taran frowned as the officers of his general staff bickered about his decision yesterday. He had no intention to intervene. Yet, the voices of his generals mixed together. It was hard to distinguish who was speaking what but it was clear what they were saying. I protest this. We will be abandoning the civilians if we do. To lose so much land is ridiculous. The civilians are doing a worthy sacrifice. Even to a limited degree. We will still be assisting them. Do you dare question our leader? But for us to run away is undignified. Dignity or not. It's important to ensure the survival of the nation. This isn't a fight for survival. We just have to find a way to beat them back. The civilians that make up this nation are the nation. To abandon them is to abandon this nation. Then they would understand that they have to do this. They are fighting for themselves. We must reconsolidate our forces. We barely have a chain of command left. Sounding an all retreat to regroup and reorganize is important. It isn't an all retreat. There are units that have been specifically commanded to continue resisting. We need to delay the enemy whilst we retreat. Taran coughed and the room fell silent. I understand your concerns but my decision is final. We will conduct a retreat with some left behind to delay the enemy. The civilians must also fight for their country. 0206 May 15, 2020 CE. 0403 Sun 45th, 196 CE. Nithnas Forest, Elf Nation. The Nithnas Forest was a small forest that was only a few miles away from the sea. It was beside a major road that led to the port city of Philaniers. In the forest, two elves sat on rocks and pointed at the map they laid out on the ground. Around them multiple tents were set up and two knights sat idle nearby. A few magitracks and magitracks were scattered around. They were what remained of the 29th Magipanzer Division. They were mostly survivors from the 13th Tract Infantry Regiment and 4th Magipanzer Regiment. Colonel Tanaran Alayferan of the 4th Magipanzer Regiment laid out his plan. Our recon forces have reported that we have human forces advancing through here. The sun's going down soon. A night attack would be able to catch them off guard. We are well hidden, they wouldn't even know what happened before it's too late. Major Eliza Christian of the 13th Tract Infantry Regiment nodded. We will form a line on this edge of the forest right beside the road. A knight will stay there with its engines turned off. Once the human convoy reaches the end of our line, we will all open fire. The knight will come out from the back of the convoy and block their retreat. Just a textbook ambush, nothing complicated. Sounds good. 25 minutes later, Tanarin crouched down beside Eliza. This is perfect. The moon isn't bright today. We are completely concealed. The elves occupied a stretch of forest that bordered the road. Only the sound of crickets could be heard as they waited silently in the darkness. It wasn't long before they heard a whirring sound. The gunner in the lead Abrams spoke up. I'm seeing some movement up ahead. Multiple elves. There's a tank. They are hiding in the trees. Switching to thermals. The lead Abrams came to a halt. An elf observed the human convoy. He saw the lead Magipanzer suddenly halt. He whispered to the soldier beside him. They stopped. Why did they stop? Did they see us? They couldn't have. It's even hard to see them. Gunshots and explosions came over them. A shout came from somewhere. The night has been destroyed. How did they see us? Retreat. Get deeper into the forest. They can't get us in this dark. Their second night came out a mile down the road in front of the lead Abram. It fired a shot. The driver tried to back up the Abrams but it only started circling right. The track is damaged. There's an elven tank in front of us. They got our track. The second Abrams in the convoy pulled off to the side of the road and aimed towards the knight. A shot destroyed the knight. 
Isaac snored with his arms crossed and head leaning back against the metal wall of the crew compartment of the Bradley. He was shaken awake by his staff sergeant, Jacob who had been sitting beside him. We found a bunch of elves trying to ambush us. Get your NVG and repair to get out. Because of his sore neck, Isaac shook his head from left to right. Stay back and stay in your tank. The Abrams and Bradley swiveled toward the forest. There. 50 calories on the Abrams and 25 mm chain gun on the Bradley opened up. Heavy machine gun fire came from the elves. I'm seeing half tracks in the forest. Three Magitracks laid down heavy machine gun fire at the Bradleys and Abrams. The Magi bullets flashed through the air like bolts of electricity. They pinged off of the surfaces of the American armored vehicles. Using thermals, the Abrams and Bradleys could clearly see the Magitracks. Rounds from a Bradley's chain gun punctured holes into one of the Magitracks which blew up a second after. The remaining two Magitracks were quickly dealt with by the Abrams. The rapid fire of machine guns died down. With their front facing the forest, the back doors of the Bradleys opened. Isaac and his squad ran out. They positioned themselves besides their Bradley and towards the forest before opening up. Jacob yelled, We are moving up. Be careful. It's vital that we clear them out. Don't want an ambush happening because we left a couple of them. A bullet whizzed past and someone cussed. Open fire. The elves started panicking once more when the humans seemed to know where they were. How can they see us? Ugh. Shoot back. I can't see them. Retreating back to the camp. Aliza shouted at Tanaran, they can see us at night. Tanaran threw his hands up in disbelief. How? Are they even humans? I don't know sir, they're coming. Get to the trucks we need to get out of here. I'm not fighting monsters who can see at night. The Bradleys and Abrams, supported by the infantry, advanced deeper into the forest. They soon came upon a clearing that had a few tents set up. A large amount of bullets started whizzing past the infantry. Many pinged off of the Abrams and Bradleys. Isaac got his back to a tree. Someone shouted out, I'm hit. Isaac could see elves piling onto their magic trucks. A few elves stood in the open, firing their rifles and submachine guns. The Abrams opened up on the magic trucks while the Bradleys ripped apart the elves in the open. Isaac peeked out of his cover and shot the nearest elf. He watched as a magic truck exploded from being hit by and he shot from an Abrams. Bodies of the elves in the back of that magic truck were flung around. Some laid burning on the ground. The fighting soon died down. Forest is entirely clear. Move back to the roads. A few minutes later, get the maintenance platoon up here. One of Grizzly 2 to 2's tracks is bust. An engineer studied the broken track. Staff Sergeant Harry Bellow looked at the engineer. Is it bad? Shouldn't take long to fix. Quite lucky. It's only the track that broke. The wheels are fine. The convoy stayed halted on the road to deal with the damage suffered. It wasn't long before they started moving again. Elf Nation. Taran walked into the office of the Advancement Department. He walked up to Ilrin Helrin, the new head of Advancement. Ilrin was the vice head of Advancement until Runa met his demise when an American bomb struck the High Command Office. Is it almost ready? Ilrin nodded. Yes but there is going to be an issue when it comes to crossing bridges. It's too heavy even for our metal ones. Then just go around them. It's also excruciatingly slow. Taran frowned. I don't care as long as it can reach the Americans. Understood sir. Taran walked out into the hallway. There, Anaphalon ran to him. My leader, Taran raised his eyebrow. What is it Anaphalon? I, I don't believe we can win sir. Taran laughed. I know the situation looks bleak but don't worry. The Americans' technology is much too superior to ours. I have been compiling and studying a list of the Americans' capabilities. They are not a few years ahead. Based on our past speed of development, the Americans are at least 300 years ahead. Remember, it took us 150 years to get from our first major panzers and submarines to the current ones we have. Taran nodded and smiled. I agree, but you see, the speed of our development is increasing. Our budget has become more and more focused on technological development. In just a few years, we created a plane superior to the propeller plane. Although it couldn't beat the Americans, I have just unleashed my newest weapon on the Americans. This one should have an effect. But sir, isn't it too late? Taran waved him off. Nonsense. Elves are a superior species. I believe in our inner superiority. We have the resolve and confidence to fight on. The humans will tire out one day and that shall be our victory. Sir, resolve and confidence can't win a war. Taran frowned. 
Your continued opposition upsets me Anne Phelan. You should watch what you say, Anne Phelan froze. Understood, sir. Good, good. Also, Anne Phelan, just know that you are very important to me. It would sadden me if something happened to you. Taran walked away. 65, Chapter 75, Human Slaves. 0245 May 15, 2020 CE. 0422 Sun 45th, 196 E on a road in the Elven Nation. Inside his M2A3 BFV, Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Linda, commander of the 6th Squadron, 1st Cavalry Regiment of the 1st ABCT, listened over the radio to the shouting of Lieutenant Colonel Rogers, commander of the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Armored Regiment. They had their camp in the forest. We were nearly ambushed on the route. A recon section had swept through that area. Dismounted infantry covered that forest and had also reported it to be clear. How big was the camp? They had around five large tents and a couple of vehicles. Where was it? Couple miles into the forest. The recon section misted most likely. I can't guarantee that every single forest in your path has been combed through. You didn't take any casualties, did you? Only a few injuries. We saw them hiding on the edge of the forest before they could do anything. I will need another cavalry troop to actually comb through the entire area and find every single elf. Any force that we don't find should be minuscule enough that it won't greatly hinder your advance. Remember, we are doing security for your rear and flanks too. Two M2A3 Bradleys, a section from the 6th Squadron, 1st Cavalry Regiment, traveled speedily down the road. They came to an abrupt halt as something appeared ahead. Dismount and stop it. Be careful. It could be an eyed. Soldiers came out of the back of the Bradleys and aimed their guns at the car. One of them waved at the car. The car came to an abrupt halt and quickly turned around. Seems to be a civilian. I do hope they haven't invented car eyes. Although there were highways, most of the roads were usually devoid of cars. The elves that they had encountered so far have all ran away in fear. Outside the port city of Philaneas, Elf Nation. Thirty minutes later. The two Bradleys came to a halt once again. The lead Bradley's driver looked up at his commander. So this is the city. Yep. There doesn't seem to be a military presence. Oh. Wait. I'm seeing sandbags. Also armed civilians. Well, I heard that the partisans are giving the marines hell. There's a lot of them too. I can see that. Guess they are waiting for us. How much you want to bet that those cars were scouts? Let's keep our distance. Had they got some sort of rebounds per game? Port city of Philaneas, the water from the faucet ran on to rain out Hunkin's hands as he scrubbed the dishes of his master, an old and rich male elf. Elves could be heard everywhere outside of the house he was in. They were all talking, walking around, and setting up structures. The entire city was in an uproar. Renaud feared for his life since every elf seemed to be armed with weapons. Renaud glanced over at a piece of paper on the kitchen counter. He was pretty sure this was what convinced his master to buy him. He couldn't read it but the picture on it clearly showed a human acting like a butler to an elf lounging around. Every elf a king. Buy your own personal human servant. Assign it to any menial job. Make it do anything you want. It will serve your every need. You will not be penalized for torturing raping, or killing your human, prices vary, as Renaud set down the plates, he looked around, he was alone in the kitchen but he didn't dare run away, some people had foolishly tried to run thinking that it was easy since security was lax, all of them were caught and slowly tortured to death, he didn't want to suffer a similar fate, 0327 May 15, 2020 CE, 0443 Sun 45th, 196 e. Outside the port city of Philaneas, Blake gazed at the port city of Philaneas. The tallest building in the city seemed to be just three stories. If not for the number of buildings, it would have felt like a small town. Blake sighed and looked at Finn. If this was anything like the last two towns, this entire city is going to be hostile. Is there no way we can just flatten parts of it with artillery and air strikes? Well, I'm not ranked high enough to decide that. Blake shrugged. Just asking for an opinion. <clears throat> Probably not. It's too dense. Artillery is out of the question and any bombing run, no matter how accurate, will cause collateral damage. But we are pretty sure that most of the elves will be hostile. Fint shook his head. Not a good enough reason for those that are watching. Pretty sure we have journalists embedded with us. Curtis definitely isn't going to like this battle. 
I'm gonna need to refer Curtis to the psychologist soon. Pretty sure we have one attached with us. He's probably gonna be beyond my help if this gets worse. He seems back to his normal self as of right now. He's quite a soft guy. He's still a Marine. Jacob got out of the Bradley and turned to Isaac and the rest of the squad. We will be advancing into the city at 1300. Isaac glanced at a person getting out of a Humvee behind them. The person was wearing a blue covered vest. Ah, the media's here. Port city of Philanias. Renaud kept his head down as his master walked by and glanced at the dishes. Now take out the garbage. He was glad that his master spoke to him in common. Even though his master knew how to speak common, he had been hit multiple times for not understanding the elven language. Renaud walked out of the house carrying a bag of garbage. Seeing the armed elves walking by, he wanted to shrink himself so he couldn't be seen. Continuing on, he then saw an elf family walking by, a mother and father watching their daughter prancing around. His heart hurt a bit. He missed and worried for the well-being of his younger sister, mother, and father. They had been separated when they were processed and given different jobs. His family came from a quaint rural town. By luck or not, his town was in the area where the elves started taking slaves. If he had lived closer to the ocean, he and his family would most likely have died. He had seen the corpses of the people of the towns closer to the ocean. However, if he had lived farther, he probably would still be home tending to his family's farm. His stomach growled thinking of the food he would be eating back home. His master barely fed him, but he preferred this over the hard labor he would have endured if he wasn't selected to be a servant. The humans are here. They have magic panzers. Prepare to defend our homes. Don't let these humans through. Two elven soldiers ran past shouting. Renaud watched them run deeper into the city. He remembered that there used to be a lot of soldiers here but most of them disappeared for some reason. All around him. Other elves started running in the other direction. They seemed to tighten their hold on their weapons. For some reason, Renaud felt a bit of hope in his heart. Surrounding the city, elements of the 2nd Marine Division and 1st ABCT prepared to launch an assault on the city. Yarin, Magus Imperium. M4 Shermans drove onto the Magus transport ship. American infantry on the dock watched in curiosity at the procession of what was the workhorse of the U.S. Army in World War II. Well thank God the Magus aren't using our ships. We already have enough trouble transporting our own stuff over. Quite interesting isn't it? An M4 Sherman going off to war. I wonder which variant it is. Seems to be an easy 8. My great-grandfather drove one of those. Near the center of the elf nation. On the commander's hatch of her knight. Ara took in the view of the mountain range, some of the mountains reached the sky. A few hours ago, she had run into infantry from another unit and re-established contact with what was left of the high command. It seemed that her plans were almost exactly the same as the orders. Galath Mountain, Elven Nation. The Galath base was a large Elven Air Force and Army base cut into the mountain. It took 50 years to complete and was protected by a few thousand feet of stone. Magipanzers, Magidrucks, small arms, and other weapons were stored in it. What was left of the entire air force was also there. It numbered less than 50 aircraft. The base even had living quarters for the soldiers and a network of bunkers jutting out of the mountain. Unlike most of the situation outside, the base was calm and hadn't been attacked. The only difference was the large influx of troops. Thousands of elven soldiers and vehicles were pouring into the mountains. Some set up their own bases while others came to the Galath base. Colonel General Alfred Adrora shook his head at his aide. I can't accommodate all of this. Get me in contact with the leader. 71. Chapter 76. Battle of Philanias. 0700 May 15, 2020 CE. 0630 Sun 45th, 196 CE. Port City of Philanias. An M1A2 Abrams from the 1st ABCT took the lead. Bullets pinged off of the Abrams. Rockets landed on it and exploded. The machine guns on the Abrams fired at the shooting elves. Are these buildings confirmed hostile? Yes, they are shooting at us from the windows. An AH-1Z Viper flew over and hovered a few yards behind the lead Abrams. Its 20mm three-barreled rotary gun opened up on the elves in the buildings. It raked the windows of the side of the building. Bricks and glass were ripped apart as bullets went through them. The Abrams fired an M908 obstacle reduction round at the barricade blocking the road and moved forwards. Bullets and rockets hit the front of the tank but it shrugged them off. The remote controlled. 
50 calories machine gun on the commander's hatch of the Abrams, a part of the tusk, the urban survival kit, swiveled to the building to its right and opened fire. An elf shouted in panic, it's not doing anything. Why isn't it? The elves watched as the rockets from their PAM seemingly did nothing to the human Majapanzer. A chopping noise was heard permeating the air. An elf in the window on a building pointed towards the hovering object. What is that? Suddenly bullets rained down on them. Gah, we have its sides exposed. Fire down onto it. Elves came out of the windows beside the Abrams. One of the elves readied their PAM. The machine gun on the turret of the Majapanza turned towards the elves at the window. The machine gun is turning by itself. What is this magic? The machine gun opened up. Convoys of American units moved into the surrounded city from all sides. The entire city basically had its back to an ocean. We got the windows suppressed. Clear the insides. Blake threw a flashbang into the building. It detonated and he rushed inside with Curtis and two other marines of the squad right behind. Three armed civilians occupied the first floor of the building and were quickly killed. They moved upstairs and quickly cleared half of the top floor. Curtis opened the door and stopped in his tracks. Blake, who was behind him, shouted at his sudden halt. Curtis, what are you doing? A shot from the elf child's pistol hit Curtis in the leg and he collapsed. Fuck. Curtis has been hit. Blake rushed forward and shot the boy. God damn it Curtis, why didn't you shoot? On the other side of the city, Isaac opened the door with his finger on the trigger, he aimed his M4 into the room, he nearly shot the cowering figure who had their hands up, Isaac was somewhat surprised to see a surrendering elf, he shouted to the others behind him, we got an elf surrendering, this was only the third one, Isaac slowly moved towards the figure with his gun raised, he soon noticed that the figure had human ears. It's a human. A few blocks away. Renaud didn't really know what to do. A heavy amount of gunfire could be heard outside. He hid in the room that was assigned to him and prayed that his master didn't show up to shoot him. If the elves were losing, he would likely be executed to prevent him from becoming free. He also hoped that the invaders were humans. 0824 May 15, 2020 CE. 0712 Sun 45th. 196 e. A very old looking elf sat on a small wooden box outside of his house. He smoked a pipe. A shout came from the window of the second floor of his house. Fino, get inside. He continued smoking. Fino. Fino glanced up at his much younger friend. I'm 197. I don't have a family. I don't care about your silly little war. You are going to die out there. If I die, I die. I will welcome a bullet any time. Not like I'm going to live any longer than a few more years. Fine. The window above slammed shut. A few minutes later, Fino sat there as bullets whizzed around him. However, none of them hit him. Either the humans had terrible accuracy or they didn't care about him. Fino blew a puff of smoke. A soldier looked down his scope and stopped. There's an old looking elf sitting outside of the house. Is he armed? No. He's just smoking a pipe. The squad leader hesitated. Almost all of the elves that they had encountered put up a fight or were armed. He was worried that the old elf was hiding a grenade and would detonate it if they got close. Don't shoot him then. Focus fire on the armed ones. Stay clear of him though and keep an eye on him. House to house combat raged on. Rogers conversed with one of his company commanders. The infantry is taking casualties trying to clear the houses. My tank has taken multiple rebounds per game shots. You are free to destroy any hostile buildings with tank rounds. 0833 May 15, 2020 CE. 0716 Sun 45th, 196 E. An M182 Abrams aimed at one of the houses where a lot of small arms fire had been coming from. An M908 punched a hole in the wall of the house. Within seconds, the entire house collapsed into a heap of stone. A Hellfire missile from an AH-1Z blew open the top floor of a building. Its rotary cannon swept the inside and shredded the surviving elves. 0955 May 15, 2020 CE. 0757 Sun 45th, 196 E. Brandon McKee stood next to an Humvee. Holding a microphone, he looked at the camera. As you can see behind me, intense fighting has broken out in this elven port city. U.S. forces are trying to secure a port for ships to dock at but have encountered heavy resistance. I have been informed that this isn't the elven military but armed civilians who are fighting. A large explosion was heard in the background and Brandon looked behind. A building was just blown up in the city. 
Not sure if it was done by the elven civilians or US forces. Fighting has been going on for the last three hours with no end in sight. 1108 May 15, 2020 CE 0834 Sun 45th, 196 E. The sun started to set but the fighting raged on. Albury's platoon came to a halt and pulled back for a moment of rest and to quickly eat their dinners. Blake leaned against a wall as he munched on his MRE. They are arming their children now. Curtis was shot in the leg by an elven kid. He's doing fine currently. Finn sighed. Blake continued. Also we found a few humans who had been kept as slaves. Well, good thing we didn't blow this place up. Blake shrugged. Probably acceptable casualties at this point. Finn raised one of his eyebrows. This isn't a video game. There are elves who don't want to fight. You got quite a few surrendering didn't you? They were just forced into doing it so they weren't lynched by their own people. I know but one day of fighting and we have already lost around 30 men in total fighting for just this one city. In wars like these, it's hard to distinguish who's good and who's bad. Nothing different from what we experienced in Afghanistan or Iraq. Blake felt irked by that. It's different. It totally is. You know it too. We were in Afghanistan. It wasn't this bad. It was never this bad. Not every single Afghan took up arms against us. It was only a few baddies hidden among a majority of innocent people. The opposite is true here. The majority of elves here are out to kill us. Do you really want to forsake those who are innocent? Stop living in your dream world Finn. I'm not living in my dream world. I know what war is. It's suffering. It's pain. But to resort to killing innocent people. Blake interrupted in anger. The lives we save by bombing this entire place to oblivion will outweigh the innocents that will be killed. Finn took a deep breath. Even if we argue about it here, what will this even change? We are mere grunts. Blake sat down. Those damn elves. Annie snapped her fingers. This is the best time to strike. The fighting has died down and the darkness will cover our movements. The four other elves nodded. Annie looked at one of the elves. Gurus. You have gathered the explosives right? Five bundles of explosive mana. Enough to destroy any Magipanzas. If we stick them onto the human Magipanzas sides, we are sure to destroy them. Ready? Anna E swept her determined eyes across the four other elves. They nodded. Let's go. The atmosphere outside was tense. Many battle-weary elves rested here near the front. The wounded were also being tended here. Avoiding the streets where intense fighting was occurring and using their knowledge of the alleys to navigate, they were able to move past the front line. It was a perfect night with the moon shrouded by clouds. Anil stopped. This should be human territory. Keep away from any lights and stay in the dark. Before they knew it, flashes started and the sound of gunfire erupted. Gerez was shot in the head and fell backward. Anil panicked. What? How did they see us? She was soon cut down with the others. Isaac looked over at a dark corner. I think I saw some movement through my NVGs. One of his squad mates confirmed it. Elves? They're carrying weapons. One of them seems to have bundles of dynamite. Jacob looked and confirmed before nodding. You are all free to fire. 69. Chapter 77. A Literal Slugfist. 1350 May 15th. 2020 CE 0955 Sun 45th 196 E Port City of Philaneers Isaac snorted in annoyance Seems to be a bunch of elven civilians who tried to blow us up with dynamite Isaac's team leader Andrew Bennett shook his head Sheesh we can't get any rest Corey Shop the team leader of the other team of the squad commented Well at least most of the fighting has died down the elves can't see us Jacob shrugged and waved forward. Still good to have a technological advantage. Come on. Let's go. As they walked down the road, Isaac spoke again. Do you know what's surprising? Andrew looked at Isaac. What? We haven't seen a single elven military personnel. I think the fucking elven civilians got abandoned. Probably. Unless they are all fighting in plain clothes. Jacob nodded. They seem more like civilians. Heck they don't seem to even know our weapon capabilities. Isaac chuckled. Do they even know they got abandoned? Well, they are probably so fanatic they don't even care that their entire military abandoned them. The fighting had died down so Fionn decided to go on his usual nightly stroll. His friend had died and he was all alone. He walked past a few human soldiers wearing strange things on their heads that covered their eyes. One of the human soldiers spoke to the other. Hey, arrest that old elf. 
He hasn't done anything wrong though. Who knows, he could be hiding something. I'm not taking any chances. Fion only stared as the human approached him with a gun pointed at him. Fion raised his hand slowly. The human grabbed him. A few hours earlier, he shook his head as he stared at his dead friend. He didn't bend down since he knew he probably won't be able to stand back up that easily. You would have probably lived if you didn't decide to fight. He was surprised that the humans didn't kill him and just ignored him. He thought he would have been surely dead by now. If not for a human actually killing him, then by an accidental shot or stray bullet. Present, the city was completely pitch black. The major batteries that powered the city had been destroyed during the battle. About a few decades ago, large major batteries were built outside of cities. They were fueled daily by elves who had time and wanted some money. Elves were paid every time they came to fuel the magi batteries and there would usually be many filled magi batteries in reserve. Although they were not targeted by airstrikes since they seemed to be just large metal boxes, the battle had destroyed many of them. Using the light given off by those with fire magic, nurses and doctors tended to the wounded. Half a street was filled with the wounded. An uninjured elf ran into the street and started shouting, Get out of here, go. A nearby nurse confronted him. What? Why? We have a lot of injured here. He pointed back to where he came from. The humans are advancing. The nurse blinked in surprise. It's the middle of the night. I know. They don't seem bothered by it and they can see us. We tried to ambush them using the darkness but it didn't work. Hearing this, the nurses and doctor started rushing. Move these patients. Come quickly. Get the stretchers. Suddenly, they heard a chopping noise. The uninjured elf shouted in a panic. Take cover. Human aircraft. The pilot looked at the ground from his AH-1Z Viper. This is Hawk 1 to 3. Seems to be medical personnel tending to the wounded down there. We will refrain from firing on this area. Over. Copy that. Proceed with your scouting. A rocket shot towards the Viper. The pilot's eyes widened. Shit. Rebounds per game. The Viper banked to the left and the rocket narrowly missed. Another rocket flew towards them and missed also. We are under heavy fire from RPGs. We are getting out of here. The Viper reeled back and turned. On the ground, Finn looked around at his weary squad. We are only a few blocks into the city. At this point, it's gonna take us a week to reach the center. One of his squad mates shrugs. The elves would lose their will to fight sooner or later. If we deal enough casualties, they will probably give up. I hate fanatics. You can say that again. 1444 May 15th, 2020 CE. 1022 Sun 45th, 196 CE. Outside of the city, Brandon waved to the city behind him. The sound of gunfire made it hard to hear what he was saying. You can see that even during the night, the battle continues to be raged. Here I have been told that we have a distinct advantage with night vision goggles. Most of the soldiers around me have them on. I'm currently hoping to be able to get into the city but have been stopped from doing so. Flashes of light came from the city. An explosion rocked the sky. Brandon looked behind him as he saw soldiers pointing towards the area. Oh my god. Is that a helicopter? A few minutes earlier, an elf peeked out the window. He had been able to remain bidden in his house without the humans finding him. He looked up into the sky and tightly held his pan. An AH-1Z hovered in the sky above the city. The battle raged a couple blocks further into the city. Hold position. Prepare to support your street. Stay sharp and stay as far back as you can. The elves might fire RPGs at you. Understood, we will. Ah oh, fuck. Mayday. 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 Our tail rotor got hit by an rebounds per game. We are going down. Fuke. The viper started spinning out of control as its tail rotor was in flames. It crashed into a building beside it. Washington DC. 30 casualties in a day for a couple of blocks of a city. We also lost an attack helicopter. On fucking national television, General Quincy Griffith spoke in a raspy voice. The elves are fighting for every single street and almost every house. We have pulled back our AH-1ZS. He paused. We will continue taking heavy casualties if we don't do anything, Mr. President. I know what you are thinking, General. We are not leveling the city or any other city as a matter of fact. We aren't there to do an extermination. I'm allowing precision strikes on any houses with hostiles in them. This won't be enough, sir. Give me the authorization to bomb the city at will and I guarantee our casualties would hit rock's bottom. I will not approve that. Sir, my men are dying here. I know. I'm the commander-in-chief. 
Those are my men too. Port city of Filania's fighting had stretched further into the night. The elves gave much more ground because they were exhausted and couldn't see that well in the darkness. Elves that tried to use fire magic to see were instantly shot. A joint terminal attack controller, JTAC, set down his laser designator. I'm painting the house, keep it on there. Intense amounts of gunfire had been pouring out from the house and with the lack of support, the marines haven't been able to push through it. A jet zipped through the sky above Brandon. A pilot surveyed the ground as his Avenue 8B Harrier 2 got closer and closer to the city. The Avenue 8B Harrier 2 is quite an old plane and has been with the Marines since 1985. However, it was the only jet in the U.S. arsenal other than the F-35B that could do vertical takeoff. The last of the Harriers were planned to be retired by 2025. A GBU-12 dropped out from the Harrier over the city. It started directing itself towards the laser. A blast soon destroyed the building that the laser had pointed at. A group of elves stood together conversing with each other with worried tones. Human soldiers stood around them on guard. One of the human soldiers talked to the other. Why do we have so many elves here? Some of them surrendered and some of them didn't even fight. Why are we rounding up the ones who didn't even fight? Precautions. They all seem to be fanatics. So how is this gonna work? From what I have heard. We are going to assign them houses away from the front and keep an eye on them. Keeps them safe from the fighting and allows us to keep ourselves safe. What about the slaves we freed? Where are they? They will also be assigned housing but there will be helicopters coming after the battle is over to evoke them. 1048 Sun 45th, 196 E, a prison in the Magus Imperium. Simon sat in his prison cell hungry. He wasn't sure what the time was since he had no windows in his cell but he was pretty sure it was night. The humans had given him very little food, but he was among the lucky ones. He hasn't been beaten by the guard yet. A lot of elves in the prison had bruises on them. The prison was also spacious enough to handle almost all the elves so it wasn't cramped. He read a newspaper that was given to him. Although newspapers were published every day, the guards only handed them out once in a while. Sometimes the news was old. This time, he had a recent paper emblazoned on the top of the front page. In the human imperial language was invasion of the elven nation has begun. It talked about how the US and Magus forces are landing in the elven nation. As he read, he wondered when he could return home. Although he was single, he still had a mother and father home. He was greatly worried about them, especially in this situation mountain ranges near the Goliath mountain. In the darkness of the night, elves moved about making fortifications and placing sandbags. Anti-magic panzer Thor guns were put into fortified positions. Anti-aircraft Thor guns kept an eye on the sky. Every route into the mountains was being blocked with layers and layers of defenses. In green areas, leaves and grass were thrown onto large weapons. In the more frigid and snowy areas, white colored sheets were placed on. 64. Chapter 78, Protests 0733 May 16, 2020 CE Washington D.C. Ronell threw the president's daily brief on the table after reading through it. Why am I being told that people are organizing protests against the war? There seem to be people who really like elves and see it as something like their fantasy dream come true. So they can't bear seeing elves getting killed. Weird. But it shouldn't cause protest movements that number in the hundreds in some places. There are also some who are sympathetic to the elves and pity them. We even have people complaining about our technological advantage over them and how it's not fair. There have even been comparisons to Europeans and Native Americans. Ronell stayed silent for a bit before taking a deep breath. They are fucking Nazis, they literally want to wipe out and enslave all of humanity. There are people who are calling it fake news and propaganda. You know, sometimes, I lose hope in humanity, and this is one of the times. 1022 May 16, 2020 CE 1322 May 16, 2020 CE San Francisco, United States of America There is currently a major protest ongoing in San Francisco. You can see it right now behind me. A few hundred people are marching in protest of the current war against the elves. On the screen, a news reporter can be shown with people crowding the streets behind him. Signs that say save the elves, stop killing elves, stop massacring the natives, and pull out now can be seen among the crowd. A couple of people held megaphones and shouted their messages. 
the news reporter got the attention of one of the protesters. Sir, I'm with Channel 29 News. May I ask why you are protesting the war against the elves? He pressed the microphone towards the protester. I'm sick and tired of the government getting us into one war after another. What do you think about the reports and evidence that indicate that the elves have massacred and enslaved native humans? The protester started to look agitated. That's clearly propaganda by the government, don't you see? The government does this every time it wants people to support their stupid war. WMDs for Iraq. 9-11 for Afghanistan. Now, these made-up massacre stories for the elves. Fake. All fake. The people are sheep. They have to wake up. So you don't believe that 9-11 happened? No, of course, it did. It was an inside job. The government did it themselves in order to get us into a war to get oil. Another protester came by and overheard the last few bits of the conversation. That's the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Oh, are you one of them government collaborators? Must be a spy. Hey guys, this girl is a government spy. Looking offended, the girl replied. I'm here protesting this war just like you. The news reporter instantly turned his attention to her. And what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I'm a pacifist. This is just like what happened between the Europeans and Native Americans. I want to prevent a repeat of that. We can negotiate with the elves to find a peaceful solution to our problems. Warfare isn't the solution to everything. You have heard of reports of elves enslaving the native humans, correct? There have been comparisons of the actions of the elves to Nazis. I think the elves and us humans have gotten off of the wrong foot here. We have shown the elves our technological superiority and pushed them out of the Magus. The war should be over by now. I don't believe we need to actually invade the elves' homeland. We can coexist. We just need to talk it out with each other. It was the perfect opportunity to do so when the elves retreated back to their homeland. I fear it is a bit too late now though, thank you for your comments. The reporter turned to the camera. Although folks here seem to have a wide range of opinions, they all agree on the fact that the war should end. 1520 May 15, 2020 CE 1040 Sun 45th 196 e port city of Filaniers on the road was the flaming wreck of an AH-1Z, surprisingly, it was still somewhat intact, the rotor blades and tail boom were completely gone but the front suffered only a few crumples, marines started showing up, one of the marines got near the cockpit that had both the co-pilot and pilot in it, the pilot is still alive, get him out of there, good thing he crashed within friendly territory, now quickly, I don't like these flames, the commanding marine turned his head, we need a medic here. Further in the city, Renaud cowered in his room as a large number of gunshots rang out very close by. Flashes of light could be seen through his window. He peered through the windows to barely see weirdly dressed beings in the darkness. They had strange things covering their eyes. One of them instantly noticed him and raised their gun at him. Renaud shot his hands up, don't shoot. I'm human. Renaud hoped his words could save him and that those strange beings were human too. The beings lowered their guns and approached him. Human? The strange being checked out his ears as Renaud quickly nodded. The strange being kindly smiled. We are here to help. The battle raged through the night and US forces made significant gains in the city. With the expectation of a few left behind, almost all the elves were civilians. There were veterans but there was nobody to coordinate or lead them. They had no ability to launch a counterattack or to organize a steadfast defense. However, they defended every single street and the many fought to the bitter end. Every few yards, the US forces met heavy resistance. However, any defenses that the infantry couldn't get through were cleared with precision strikes from the sky. The elves were completely unprepared for a night battle and were caught off guard on how well the Americans were able to fight in the night. 0044 May 16, 2020 CE 0322 Sun 46, 196 E By morning, the infantry could nearly see the port from the streets. Blake looked at Finn. Fucking hell. We are nearly there. This took much less than what you said it would take. Someone further away shouted. They are surrendering. A group of ten elves slowly walked towards them with their hands in the air. It was the largest amount of elves that had surrendered together. Blake, Finn, and the others kept their guns ready. Drop all of your weapons. Rifles, pistols, and grenades clattered onto the floor. A soldier closed in on the elves. Stay calm and do not resist. You will be searched. Finn relaxed. 
He was quite glad that the language barrier here wasn't that bad when compared to Afghanistan. Latin wasn't really a hard language to learn. Over 60% of English words are Latin-based. Quite a few of the soldiers had picked Latin as a second language during their high school years so they were fast to pick it up too. 20 minutes later, fighting still continued as they moved ever closer to the port. Blake witnessed more and more elves surrendering. Finn looked over a corner. Seems like we got a few more surrendering. A group of elves walked towards them with their hands in the air. One of the elves threw something at their feet. Grenade. Get down, motherfucker. Blake dived to the ground. An explosion rocked his world. Getting up and dusting himself off. Blake took a look at where the elves were. Body parts and a pool of red blood were all that was left of the four elves. Blake shook his head. Fucking hell. Good thing Curtis isn't here. He won't like the sight of this. They are fucking suicide bombing. Finn looked around. Everybody fine? All good. Well good thing they suck at suicide bombing. Finn took a swig from his canteen. He leaned beside the crate. Black smoke billowed into the sky from the city. Finally, it's mostly over. Blake sat down on the grey concrete of the port. Where has Curtis been anyways? I think in the rear. He might get discharged for mental health issues. He really didn't take this well. I do hope he's fine. Two MV-22 Ospreys came over the horizon and got closer and closer. They started landing onto the ground outside of the city. Grass billowed as the powerful rotor created gusts of wind. The Magusian civilians, freed from their slavery were led towards the Apsaries. They formed a line behind the open back doors of the Ospreys. The Magusians murmured amongst themselves while looking at the strange aircraft. One of the Magusians, Freri Relit, eyed the strange aircraft with a sparkle in his eyes. Interesting. Two propellers on the wings, and they can fold up and down. An American soldier shouted to them at the door of the Osprey. Let's go, let's go, get on and make yourself comfortable. We are bringing you all back home. Renaud sat down on a seat in the weird aircraft. He heaved a sigh of relief and couldn't even believe all this had happened. It felt akin to a dream. He hoped that his parents and sister were okay. 1534 May 16, 2020 CE Washington, D.C. One of Ronell's senior advisors for the 2020 elections, Felipe Tiffany, entered the Oval Office. Ronell looked up. R. Felipe, how can I help you? Felipe had a concerned look on his face. A new third party just formed Mr. Dot President. They call themselves the Peace Party. Ronell sighed. Let me guess. They oppose the current war against the elves? Well, in addition to that, their website states that they are angry and shocked at the number of wars we have started only two years after appearing in the New World, Mr. Dot President. To be truthful, I do also find it uncomfortable. We have been fighting so many wars. Well, we have to find a place in this world. It had been quite hostile to us. Anyways, it's only a third party. Shouldn't be that concerning. True but it has gained some popularity. Even though not large enough to be a concern yet. We will have to keep an eye on them. Ronell frowned. How am I doing in the primaries for my party? Still in the lead? You are nearly guaranteed to be the candidate. Who's in the lead for the other party right now? Still Max Snyder? Yes. He probably will be the candidate for the opposing party as predicted. Has he said anything about his policy on wars? Not yet. He's probably still gauging which position would benefit him. Well, I'm already this deep in. Our position is that we will fight wars when we have to. Felipe nodded. That's basically what most of us have decided to. How are the polls? What are they predicting right now? It's gonna be a close race, sir. Just like four years ago I guess. 60. Chapter 79. Advance. 0155 May 16th. 2020 CE 0357 Sun 46 196 E Port City of Philaneers Jacob stared out at the horizon whilst standing and carrying his gun I see the first cargo ship Isaac walked over The port seems to be a bit small as long as it can offload we should be fine Isaac glanced over at Jacob say why did we even need a port couldn't they have just offloaded on the beach we will be dropping cargo into the fucking water. These are civilian cargo ships. They can't do amphibious operations. We do have ships capable of amphibious stuff but there aren't enough of them to keep us supplied constantly. That cargo ship should be bringing in ammunition, food, and whatnot. Everything we need. Crates of supplies came off of the cargo ship, ammunition, food, building materials, and much more. 
It wasn't long before a passenger ship also showed up and started offloading people. Jacob watched as the ships offloaded. Seems like we will be getting CBs too. What for? Modernizing the port probably. The CBs is a nickname for the naval construction battalions that formed the naval construction force. In order for the port to accommodate more ships and speed up offloading, the CBs had been ordered to modernize it. Luckily, the battle did not damage the port area at all and because it was not a port that housed elven navy ships, it wasn't even struck by missiles. Ocean near the elven nation. Renaud looked around as he got off the back of the aircraft. It didn't take long for him to realize that he was on a massive ship. It felt more like a metal island than a ship but it was definitely moving. The top of the ship was flat with the exception of a building to the right near the center of the ship. There seemed to be many aircraft sitting on the ship. Looking into the sea, many other ships surrounded this ship. Renaud followed the others, his curiosity wore off soon. For the entire flight, he had worried about his family. That didn't change even now. He couldn't forget his sister's laughter as they played around and his parents' smiling faces at the dinner table. The second Osprey soon landed on the USS Carl Vinson. Frury got off and glanced in awe around him. It didn't take him long to realize that this was an airfield. He watched as an aircraft took off. Amazing. The fact that the Americans were able to make an airfield go on sea awed him. Hearing his outburst, Others turned to look at him in bemusement. Frury was sort of an outcast in his country. He was never invested in magic but much more focused on mechanical things. Of course, he wasn't being mistreated. Others were just surprised that he never tried to develop his magic skills. A uniformed person greeted them. Welcome. I'm Lieutenant Commander Jensen Lo. Does anybody here have injuries? A show of hand please. A few Magusians raised their hands. Okay, we will get you guys treated. How many of you guys are hungry? All of the Magusians raised their hands, and fed. Okay for those who are injured, please follow my friend, Petty Officer Gerald Phillips. Jensen pointed towards Gerald, he will lead you to the bay. Once you are treated, you will join the others in the cafeteria. Everybody else, follow me. Furry was amazed as he was led through the interior of the aircraft carrier and towards the cafeteria. The interior looked so much more well polished than the ships that the Magus Imperium have. An hour later, after their meal, Jensen got all the Magusians' attention and made an announcement, we will be transporting all of you via aircraft back to your country, your government will be providing ground transportation back to your homes, they also seem to be offering relocation and support services if you have lost your homes. I'm not sure about the specifics of that, you will have to ask your government, any questions? Renaud raised his hand. Jensen pointed at him. Yes, I have a family who has also been captured by the elves. Do you know if they have been rescued? Is there any way that I can find them? We have already rescued a few people but I'm not exactly sure if any of them are your family. I will bring up your issue with my commander. I think it will be best if you bring it up with your government. With the others, Frury was led to the aircraft that was supposed to take them home. This aircraft disappointed him a bit. It was sleek but still similar to a Macan bomber. The C-2 Greyhound lifted off of the aircraft carrier carrying all the Magusians. Frury had stared in wonder as the aircraft took off from a ship. A few seats down, Renaud sat with an unhappy look on his face. 0224 May 16, 2020 CE. 0412 Sun 46, 196 CE. Port City of Philaneers. Blake stood up and stretched. What do we do now? Finn glanced around the deserted street. Well. We are to garrison this city until further notice. M1A2 Abrams and Bradleys of the 1st ABCT moved in an orderly fashion out of town. Elements of the 2nd Marines also followed. An hour or so later, Finn walked into a tent where the medics were tending to the wounded. How are you doing Curtis? Fine. Are you getting discharged? Not yet. <clears throat> Don't go assuming things. Had a long chat with a psychologist. I'm staying. I'm a soldier. I have an obligation to you guys. Are you sure? There was a look of determination in Curtis's eyes. Yes, I'm sorry for having to deal with me. Finn sighed. It's all fine. Not everyone can handle this. You are a good man. Maybe too good for war. Give me another chance, Sergeant. That's what I am doing. We have been garrisoned to protect this place until further notice. So rest up. Shouldn't be much to do for now. Surprised you haven't been sent back seeing that you got shot in the leg? Curtis smiled. Didn't penetrate. Just hurt like shit. Good to hear. 0700 May 16th, 2020 CE. 
Central Time, Nashville, Tennessee. Jack took a sip out of his Coke as he watched the news. Counter-protests have been occurring in response to the recent anti-war protests. Members of both parties on Twitter have expressed their support for the continuation of the war. A few hours earlier, President Hayes addressed the American people, saying that he firmly stands behind the war, and saying that the elves are fanatics worse than the Japanese in World War II and that this war is necessary to prevent the loss of innocent lives. Joining us today is political analyst Bill Oscaro. Bill, thank you for joining us today. What do you think of these current protests and the pushback it's experiencing? It's my pleasure to be here. Well, the current protests are actually quite normal. For any war, they are bound to be protests. In every recent war in American history, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, there were mass protests. I'm not surprised about this at all. However, what is interesting is the significant opposition that these protests are experiencing. It's quite unprecedented. So is this surprising seeing that it's unprecedented? No, no, it's not surprising at all. The fact that these elves are literally enslaving and massacring humans has created a negative public opinion of the elves and reduced the scale of the protests we are currently having. So what can we expect in the future? As you said, there has been a lot of pushback from the public about these anti-war protests. I really don't expect any significant protests but there definitely will be. Jack switched the channel to another news network. It was substantial. It was overwhelming, yet it was ignored by these Antifa. These people, Antifa, have a clear anti-American agenda. They are trying to undermine our country in any way possible. They are protesting the sacrifices made by our soldiers who protect us. They are. Huh. This is one of the few times that I have actually seen these two news channels kinda actually agreeing on something, Jack muttered to himself as he turned off the television. 0850 May 16, 2020 CE 0725 Sun 46, 196 E, a few miles further into the Elven Nation, the forest soon gave way to hilly but treeless drain. Dust came out of the back of the two Bradleys as they drove down the road. It was quite a large road and led to the next city a few hundred miles away. In the lead Bradley, the driver, without taking his eyes off of the road, spoke to his commander, Staff Sergeant Clyde McKinney. I don't feel that safe here. We are only two Bradleys. Nothing to worry about. We have an armor company right behind us and three combined arms battalions further behind. We are just scouts. We can pull back whenever things get iffy. Just continue driving down the road. Okay, sir. Stop, Clyde shouted to his driver. The two Bradleys came to a halt. Clyde looked through his imaging system and scanned the town miles in front of him. Small town, the road cuts right through it. Seems to be armed civilians again. Probably need to secure it so the main force can use this road. Clyde got on his radio. The town in our route is defended by armed civilians. The town doesn't seem bigger than a hundred or so people. I probably need a tank platoon here to help clear it out. A few minutes later. Staff Sergeant McKinney? Yep. Second Lieutenant Bob Craig. What's the situation here? Just a town with a few elves, nothing too much. My platoon will lead then. The four Abrams formed into a wedge formation as they drove towards the town. Rifle shots pinged off of the lead Abrams. They came to a stop. The machine guns on the Abrams opened up on the elves. The boxes and furniture that the elves were hiding behind were torn apart. The Abrams formed a column formation on the road and moved into town. Feels like a ghost too. We have an elf that's surrendering in front of us. Can your boys secure him? Understood. Be careful. This might be an ambush. We'll keep an eye out. A total of six infantrymen came out of the two Bradleys. Clyde watched as the squad leader of the dismounted infantry shouted at the elf. The elf dropped all of his weapons. The soldiers moved in and quickly secured him. Just then, a few elves slowly came out of their houses. The infantry quickly reacted and aimed their guns at the elves. The elves all put their hands up. Twenty minutes later, the elves formed a line and threw their weapons down into a pile. It was only rifles, pistols, and submachine guns. Infantry stood around keeping an eye on the elves. Clyde mused to his driver. Seems like these townspeople are much less inclined to fight. We killed like what? Ten elves? This feels so much different from the city. The entire town was secured in less than an hour and all the weapons were confiscated. The two Bradleys continued on with their reconnaissance. 66. 
Chapter 80, Genocide or War 0936 May 16, 2020 CE 0748 Sun 46, 196 E Washington DC General Griffith, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, conversed with President Hayes The towns further away from the cities have surrendered much more easily, the Recon forces have been able to take them mostly by themselves compared to cities, it's likely that they haven't been bombarded constantly by propaganda, we should be able to expect only minimal resistance from them, Mr. President, we should be besieging the cities from now on. Directly assaulting them would just be a gross waste of lives when we can just force them into submission or at least weaken them through air and artillery strikes. General, we will just be engaging in genocide at that point, we will give them time and allow any civilians to leave if there even are any that can be considered civilians. Do you really think anybody will leave? And what about the humans they are keeping as slaves? How will the media react when they learn we literally have forsaken them? It will be a humanitarian disaster. Humanitarian disaster. Boohoo. Who cares? There is no international community to criticize us anymore. Public opinion is already souring because of the large loss of life we are experiencing. It's only been a few days into the invasion and we have already suffered 50% of the total casualties we have suffered during the entire Gulf War. I'm gonna be blamed for the entire thing, goddamn it, and you can say bye to your career at that point, in war, we have to kill our enemies, that's the military's job to kill the enemy and you are stopping me from doing their job, these so-called civilians are all armed to the teeth. We are not barbarians, general. There are established rules of war. Bar rules. When did wars have rules? The elves don't even follow them. Mr. President, make the right choice here. Let the military off this goddamn idiotic leash. Now get out of my office. You have been coming here every single fucking day. You have been a great advisor in the past, but I'm very close to removing you, Quincy. A few miles away from the Orvacalora human concentration camp. The grass billowed as 20 megavolts minus 22 Ospreys touched down onto the planes surrounding the landing area were M1A2 Abrams and Hemp trucks. Cylindrical tanks full of aviation fuel were on the back of the Hemp's. Soldiers rushed to connect the fuel hoses from the Hemp's to the Ospreys. Once refueled, it was only a short journey from there to the Orvacalora Human Concentration Camp. A few minutes later, Orvacalora Human Concentration Camp. Damon shouted at the Magusians. Stay in your groups. We will be evacuating you soon. The sound of the MV-22 Ospreys got louder and louder. The first one soon appeared and landed in a clearing in the concentration camp. Get on in an orderly fashion. Please put all your baggage on the floor. Once you have sat down. Please do not get up unless instructed to do so, as each osprey filled up with Magusians. Dust was kicked up by the rotors and they took off one by one, what was a bleak concentration camp had been completely transformed. In the past few days, the Rangers and the Green Berets had turned the concentration camp nearly into a fob forward operating base. Well, the army should be arriving soon, guess we will be welcoming them. Less than an hour later, I see two Bradleys, the Recon Force is here. The two Bradleys came to a stop and the commander at the lead Bradley popped out of his hatch. The commander grinned. Nice place you have here. Damon laughed. Welcome to our humble abode. Somewhere in the elven nation. Stop. Elven military convoy over to the northeast. Multiple magic trucks followed by a single guard tank raced down the paved road. The two Bradleys that pulled onto a grassy hilltop spied on them. I'm calling in an airstrike. Let's tail them and see how it goes. The two Bradleys sped down the hill and through the grass. They kept the elven convoy that was on the road in sight but kept a distance. A few minutes later, an F-15 flew over the elven convoy. The noise of the F-15 flying over was still reverberating when multiple large explosions wiped the convoy out. Black and dirt and the mangled, charred metal wrecks were all that remained. Woo, baby. An explosion occurred underneath the track of the lead Bradley. Or oh, fuck, mine. The Bradley behind came to a stop. The commander of the lead Bradley opened his hatch and looked over the side. Tracks bust. 0810 Sun 46, 196 E. Most forces have been repositioned into the mountains. We have lost hundreds of vehicles and delves to American bombing attacks. We have also been receiving bombing runs on the mountains but I don't believe they have discovered our main base here yet. Taran clasped his hands together. Gentle elves. We shall hold this position to the last elf. Anifelon raised his voice in opposition. My leader, I don't think that's advisable. 
the Americans are perfectly capable of wiping out our concentrated forces, in fact, I won't be surprised if their military has been made to destroy a concentration of units, it is more advisable if we spread out instead of staying here, that will make us a much harder target to kill. Taran frowned and his eyes narrowed. Then who will keep an organized command of the units? How will we perform organized defenses and counterattacks? Ah, we don't sir, the point is, we aim for our survival, Taran spread his arm round. This mountain is the perfect terrain for defense and will be the staging area of our counteroffensive. Our main base is under hundreds of feet of solid stone. I don't believe the Americans have the capability of destroying that. Understood. The various department heads and the general staff nodded in agreement. Taran smiled, dismissed, and also, Anaphelin, I would like to see you in your office. A few minutes later, Taran sat down in Anaphelin's chair in his office. I told you before. You are getting on my nerves. My leader, I'm only giving sensible advice. I only need you to do as I say. That's your job. You manage the Department of Intelligence. That's all. I'm also an advisor. I don't need time for advice. Everything is already in motion. And Phelan didn't respond for a few seconds before nodding. Yes, my leader, Taran exited the room. And Phelan sat down and a worried force grew on his face. His wife was also in the base with him but he had no heart to go see her, he had noticed that Taran had changed ever since they abandoned the capital and it greatly concerned him. Taran seemed to be angrier and was much less willing to listen to others, what should I do? What should I do? He whispered over and over again as his mind played out his options. 1046 May 16, 2020 CE 0823 Sun 46 196 e Port City of Philaneers and 109 a 6 howitzers were taken off of the cargo ship. Finn's eyes followed the self-propelled howitzers. 1st Infantry Division Artillery. Blake looked over. Where's the rest of the 1st Infantry? Probably on the way. Docked a few feet away from the cargo ship was a World War I style transport ship. A tank rolled off of it. Blake whistled wow. A fucking M4 Sherman. Finn nodded. The Magusians are here. How effective are they even gonna be? Probably just gonna be filler or something. Maybe garrisoning the towns? Do you think the brass will even trust them with that? Finn chuckled. I feel bad for them if they get sent to the front line. M4 Shermans are quite easy to kill. McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. General Abrams Thompson, commander of the U.S. New World Command, conversed with his staff. Other than retreating units and stragglers. The planes are mostly clear of enemy units. This is a good situation. Our units are starting to get stretched thin. The 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team from the 1st Infantry Division and the 1st Infantry Brigade Combat Team from the 10th Mountain Division are arriving. The Magusians are also arriving and they will be under our guidance. Most of the Elven forces have retreated to the mountains. We have lost sight of them but we are sure that there will be heavy fortifications on the mountains and that they are holed up there. Abrams nodded, increased drone surveillance on that. Prepare for airstrikes on that region. Depending on how heavily they are fortified, we might need to get a mob out for this one. Port City of Jalin, Elv Nation. Elements of the 1st ABCT of the 1st Armored Division surrounded the port city. They kept their distance and had screening forces keeping an eye out. In his house, Lawson felt panic coursing through his blood. He knew that all the articles that he had read about their recent glorious victories were most likely lies. He sat down eating with a gun leaning against his table. The humans had his city surrounded and there was no way out. 70. Chapter 81 Part 1 Bombardment 1110 May 16. 2020 CE 0835 Sun 46, 196 E. Outside the port city of Jalin, Elv Nation. I guess we are sieging the city. It was quiet. There was no sound of artillery or bullets, only the sound of idling engines and men chatting away. Well, the orders are just to stay outside of the city. Doesn't say anything about a siege. We could be waiting for reinforcements. It doesn't seem that the elves want to advance. They are just holing up in there, we might as well leave them there if they aren't gonna attack us, it's gonna be a hassle if we don't do something about them since we will have to protect our logistics from possible attacks. Might as well as get rid of concentrated enemy units before they become a problem. Do we even know what's inside the city? Are there any elven soldiers? I haven't seen one since we began this invasion. 
Well, Intel has nothing. They are probably just a ragtag group of armed citizenry. Can we just start calling them terrorists? I don't see much of a difference at this point. They just seem to be Taliban with World War II weaponry and thoughts. Near Primopolis, Magus Imperium. After stepping off the plane and onto the airfield, Renaud felt a sense of relief since he was finally back in his home country. A tent had been set up nearby and Magusian soldiers directed him and the rest of the people who have been rescued to it. A few minutes in a line, Renaud entered the tent. A Magusian officer looked up. Full name and the place you are from. I'm Renaud Hewitt. I'm from the village of Hallfeld. The Magusian officer looked back down onto his desk and started writing. That has been completely burned to the ground. You could try to return to rebuild it but I can't see how much one man can do. Do you have any relatives or friends that are willing to house you? Renault hesitated. I have a question about that. The Magusian officer didn't look up. Yes? I'm trying to find my parents and younger sister. They have been captured by the elves. Have they come through here? The officer opened a drawer in his desk and took out a book and opened it. We have a very short list of people who have been rescued. Can I have their names? Anna Hewitt, Imelny Hewitt, and Arthurus Hewitt. After flipping through the book, the officer shook his head. Sorry, they aren't on the list. If you have nowhere to go, we are providing five days of free lodging at nearby hotels. Will all those who are rescued going to come through here? I'm not sure about that. As of right now, yes. All right. Thanks. There's a tent to the right. They will send you to the hotel and give you some more help. Walking out, Renaud saw a poster on the wall. On it was a soldier holding a rifle charging forward. Emblazoned on it below was your Imperium needs you. He thought about it. If he could go, he could try to save his parents and sister himself. He was scared to actually join. He had kept his head down when he was a slave to the elves and now he wants to go back there and fight them. He wondered if it was even reasonable since he had just gotten out of that hellhole. He was quite a lonely person and didn't make many friends because of his awkwardness. He also knew that the idea of going to save his family by himself was absurd. How long was it going to take to train him? Would his family have returned by the time he was sent to battle? Will he even be sent to the right area? The thoughts circled through his head. A few minutes after an out's exit, Furry entered the tent. Full name and the place you are from? I'm Furry Gorvain. I'm an engineer at the Fauk Aviation Company. I'm looking to return to the headquarters at Law Feinberg. I meant the place that you live at, not the place you work at. I live at Law Feinberg. The officer looked up. How were you captured by the elves? I was on vacation. Well, nothing happened at Law Feinberg. It was far away from the fighting. Then, I would like to go there. I need to have an urgent meeting with my boss. Okay. We will provide you with a train ticket to the city. 1235 May 20th, 2020 CE. 0917 Sun 50th, 196 E. Washington DC. The president looked at a satellite map of the Elven Nation. General Griffith briefed him on the current situation. Other than their major cities, everything on this side of the mountain range has been secured. The towns and villages have been much easier to deal with. We are laying siege to multiple cities. Mr. President, we will save more lives if we advance into the city instead of sieging it. Sieges will just lead to more suffering from both sides and the will of the elves are undeniably strong. They have already been there for four days. They may prefer starvation to surrender. The losses we will take from these battles will be too grave. President Hayes pondered quietly for a bit. All right, General. You have your wish. I'm authorizing the use of artillery and airstrikes on any groups of identified armed elves in the city. Pass that down the chain. Port city of Jalin. A woman carried a basket of fruits that was gathered from her master's small front yard garden. Right next to her master's house, a group of armed elves stood behind a makeshift barricade. The elves decided to set up defenses street by street to make the fight as bloody as possible. One of the elves eyed her as she went back into the house. She hurried into the house. After setting down the fruit basket, she looked around to make sure no one was home and went to the room that had been provided to her. It was a small room and the only thing provided was a ragged mat to sleep on. We will be saved soon. Emmeline looked at her daughter, Anna, in the room. Anna slept quietly. She was gaunt and was likely still hungry. They had been through unspeakable things but the end seemed to be drawing near. From what she has seen and heard, the city had been surrounded. 2200 May 20th, 
2020 CE 0200 Sun 51st 196 E. Emeline awoke to a whistling noise. The ground shook as explosions occurred outside. 62. Chapter 81 Part 2 Bombardment 2130 May 20, 2020 CE 0145 Sun 51st 196 E. Outside the port city of Jalin, our drones have found barricades set up throughout the city with armed elves manning them. A few of them even have elven children there. Are they armed? We observed them holding what seems to be guns. If they are armed, they are a threat. The streets aren't that wide so surrounding houses might be destroyed. We will have to take that chance then. Only target the barricades with armed elves or any area with a concentration of them. Understood, sir. M109A7 Paladins of the 2nd Battalion. 3rd Field Artillery Regiment raised their guns and fired in unison. Their shells went for different targets across the city. 2246 May 20, 2020 CE 0223 Sun 51st, 196 E. Kasna Human Concentration Camp, Elv Nation. A soldier talked to a war correspondent observing the evacuation. They walked past a park Tabrams and a few of the crew hanging around. We are currently evacuating these Magusian civilians. This is the biggest concentration camp we believe that the elves have. About 10,000 Magusian civilians were held here. How many were saved? Around 9,500. Luckily, the elves just started executing prisoners when we rolled up. We caught them off guard by advancing at night. Most of the elves ran. The ones we have captured seem to be have been confused at the ongoing situation. I heard that there are multiple other concentration camps. What happened to those? The operation to free the prisoners started six days ago when special forces and army rangers secured multiple small and medium-sized concentration camps. Why was this camp not prioritized? Being this large in size and so densely packed. Sending in a small or medium force would have been unwise. The distance made any insertion via air impossible. We are literally next to the mountains that cut this entire country in half. This camp was a priority target though and ground troops got here as fast as possible. There should be a ton of elves crawling around in those mountains so we are getting these Magusian civilians out as fast as possible. Close by, an osprey took off. Is it okay if I questioned a few of the Magusians? Feel free to do so but they speak Latin. I can translate for you to a degree. The soldier went around asking those who were still waiting for a helicopter. Many responded with stories of how they were starved, forced to work, and shot for not working fast enough or collapsing. The war correspondent took multiple pictures of the interior and exterior of multiple buildings. The execution sites were also captured on camera. A picture of an Ospreys full of Magusians was also taken and a few pictures of CH-53E Super Stallions and Ospreys lifting into the air. Port city of Jalin. Don't cry. We will be fine. Emeline tried to soothe Anna. Explosions after explosions occurred and the ground shook violently. A deafening explosion occurred and the wall caved in. Abrams and Bradleys entered the city. The barricade at the outskirts of the city had already been destroyed by shots from the Abrams. Isaac followed his squad towards the city. Even with the artillery bombardments, the elves put up stiff resistance, and house-to-house -house fighting occurred. A few hours later, Isaac sat down on the street and leaned his head back. Jacob stood before him. We have secured half of the city. Only half. Sheesh. We have a much smaller force trying to take over a big city. Of course. We only secured half across the elven cities of the southern side of the mountains. Similar fighting raged on Nilfalan, elven nation. A Sherman tank rolled down a street. Magusian infantry flanked it. Suddenly a rocket shot out and flew over the turret of the tank. Its .30 caliber machine guns opened up and the Magusian started shooting. 0301 May 21st, 2020 CE. 0433 Sun 51st. 196 E. Goliath Mountain Range, Elv Nation. Gerald talked to Scott over the comms. Seems like they haven't learned that their static defenses aren't gonna do shit in the end. Ha. Huh? The Magusian food is doing more damage to us than they are. Gerald snickered. I hope Hayden will be alright. We told him not to eat it. A squadron of F-15s dropped loads of bombs onto the Goliath Mountain Range. Anti-aircraft fire sprayed into the sky but nothing was hit. 
They just made the targets much more obvious. Elf Nation. One of the generals reported to Taran. My leader, the defenses outside of the base have been devastated by air attacks. It's fine we still have our troops inside the mountains. They will be protected. Anne Phelan spoke up. My leader, I still suggest we disperse our troops. We have been setting up defensive positions after defensive positions and none of them are working. The Americans have the capability to destroy any sort of organized defense we throw at them. Anne Phelan, when did you become a general? You are the head of intelligence, not a person who makes military decisions. Isn't that right gentle leaders? The general staff snickered and nodded. Anne Phelan sat down in the chair of his new home. It was more of an apartment than a normal house. They're all fucking yesmen. An elf with short blonde hair and ears that pointed a bit upwards looked out from the kitchen. Anne Phelan, it's your first time home. You should think of something other than work. Well, we can't really call this home, can we? I know, I know. But we have to make do. Anne Phelan laughed and continued on with his previous thought. When haven't they been yearsmen? It's just gotten worse. Silly. Maybe I should do something. Anne Phelan. I know your work is important but don't stress yourself out too much. Tonight, we are having some petron fish cooked with salt nut sauce. Anne Phelan stood up. It's a good thing this place has a large stock of food. I do prefer the fresh stuff though. 61. Chapter 82, Internal Affairs. 0955 May 23, 2020 CE. Washington DC. President Hayes read the report as the Krausen explained it to him. Most of the resistant towns and smaller cities have surrendered. From these recent battles, we have only suffered 47 casualties. The total so far for the entire war is only 263 casualties. Isn't that a bit grim compared to the figures from the Iraq War? Well compared to the Iraq War, we didn't face an army that was nearly 5 million strong and a fanatical populace. Casualties will still mount though as we start battling our way through their larger cities, Pentagon, United States of America. General Griffith poured whiskey into his lowball glass. The ice inside plinked around. He looked outside the window of his office. I want those reports to be erased or changed. Understood? The president doesn't need to know about them. It's fine if one or two reports slip through. As long as the actual figures don't get to him, it will be fine. With this, I will get to keep my job. Heck, maybe I will even get recognized for what I did. And you will keep your job too. A man stood near the closed door. I'm not too sure about this, General. Quincy took a sip out of his whiskey. Who do you think got you this job, Charles? I can get you fired from it with just a single phone call. Just follow this and you will keep your job. Charles swallowed and stayed where he was. Quincy gave a sigh and put his glass down on his desk. We have no obligation to protect people from other countries. In fact, fuck them. That shit of a president thinks it's our duty to save foreigners who don't even give a damn about our country. Continuing the war in the Middle East and for what? To help rebuild countries? We should have just bombed them back to the Stone Age and left. I have seen good men die out there fighting for people who aren't American. Quincy's voice started to develop a tone of hatred, and in the end, the world still blames us. If they aren't American, there's no need to help them. Our job, our duty, is to protect our fellow Americans, and only that. Well sadly, in our previous world we couldn't do that because of a stupid convention. Do you know how many of my buddies, my men died because of that? This world is a dream. No international community to watch us, no rules to follow. The foreigners are nothing more than idiots, animals, or barbarians. Think about it, a US-centric world with nobody to question what we do. We can destroy any foreign country that dares not listen to us. Hiding what we do from the domestic media isn't that hard in this world. And now that idiotic president is thinking about transparency and a rulebook to restrict us like the Geneva Convention. Maybe I should run for president. We will be so much better off. Charles felt a bit shocked by the general's rant. But, Quincy cut him off. I know you have been struggling recently. You have your wife and your kids. Once you finish this, maybe there's even something in line for you. Maybe a promotion of sorts, with a good raise in salary. And also isn't your daughter suffering from cancer? I can get her the best doctor there is, paid by me. Understood, General. Most of the civilian casualties are from elven executions. Our artillery and airstrikes have caused minimal civilian casualties. Ronel nodded at Quincy's words. Maybe you were right, Quincy. 
I'm not a military man. The current situation seems better than the past. Mr. President, war is not a clean thing. You have to take risks. Your idea to restrict our airstrikes and artillery strikes until the target was confirmed and the chance of collateral damage was completely gone made us lose many men. I sympathize with the fact that you want to help the innocent, but sometimes you just can't do that. 1030 May 23, 2020 CE 0815 Sun 23, 196 CE Goliath Mountain Range I see 130 Hercules flew toward the mountain range. The navigator spoke on comms. This should be the biggest entrance to the cave and tunnel system that the elves have in the mountain. The back door of the C-130 opened and a mob slid out and dropped onto the side of the mountain. A small mushroom cloud rose into the sky. The open air entrance to the base was very large so that it could allow Majapanzas and aircraft to fit in. Usually, the front entrance would have a few elves milling around and a couple of aircraft being serviced, but because of the recent bombings, everything was moved further into the cave and closer to the part that was dug out. The elf engineers doing maintenance to the aircraft felt the ground rumble. They looked out of the cave just as they were thrown in a blast. The overpressure from the mob created shockwaves that reverberated into the cave and through the tunnels carved out by the elves. Because it was not reinforced, many parts of the cave collapsed. The initial blast killed those at the entrance and destroyed the vehicles stored there. Thousands of elves died from the shockwaves. Hundreds more were trapped in the mountain. The mob, which was meant to destroy bunkers by going through the roofs and floors of a reinforced structure, was not suited for destroying a massive tunnel system that was carved into the side of a mountain. Ara looked up into the sky and saw a mass of white rising into the sky. She had seen a single plane that had four propellers drop a large bomb onto the mountain. When the bombings began, she was sheltered at a smaller cave system along with others so she was able to survive. Elf Nation, we have lost all communications with the soldiers in the mountain's main base. We have received reports from nearby soldiers that a large explosion occurred. It is highly possible that the main base has been wiped out in the hallway. Loud yelling came from Taran's room. It went on for a few minutes before stopping and an eerie silence fell. And Phelan rushed into the room. Shalen, we need to leave. We aren't safe here. Shalen looked bewildered. Where are we going? What's happening? You know where my parents live right? Their village? Go there. I already have a driver arranged to do that. Pack. They walked out of the enormous space. Two cars were waiting outside. Talon stopped. And Phelan. Why are there two cars? And Phelan sighed. I'm not going with you. Why? I'm going to find a way to stop this madness. And Phelan stopped her from saying more. I will be fine. And Phelan nodded at the elf standing next to the driver's door of the first car. Vestan, you are one of my most trusted officers and our close friend. Keep her safe. Vestan gave a small smile. Will do, sir. Come on see. Talon hesitated. Vess. But. And Phelan urged her. Leave. Go. I will return to your side as soon as possible. If the Americans come to your village, do not resist. And Phelan watched as Talon got into the car. He had thought long and hard about this. Killing Taran would accomplish nothing. Someone else would take over and the entire mess would continue. If he tried to take over, he will just be killed for treason. He needed another way and he now was taking a gamble. It was the most reasonable out of the three he had thought of. He hoped Salen will be safe. Taran was handicapped at this point. He neither has the time nor the resources to waste to try to kill his parents or his wife. Anne Phelan turned towards his second in command, Athteraladen. Let's go. Taran gave out orders in the general staff room. Order all units to withdraw from the mountains. Disperse into the forest. Where's Anne Phelan? Get Anne Phelan. I need to talk to him. Taran brows greased. He loathed to admit it but Anne Phelan was right. A few minutes later, a soldier saluted him. Hail Van Harris. We were unable to find him and his wife was not at the living quarters. Okay, then search around the compound. A few hours later, it was clear that Anne Phelan was gone. Two cars had disappeared from the vehicle storage and Taran along with his wife and two intelligence officers were gone. After hearing this in his office, Taran gritted his teeth before shouting and slamming his fist onto his desk. Anne Phelan. Anne Phelan. Anne Phelan. On the road to the Goliath Mountains. Athta. In the driver's seat, spoke up to Anne Phelan who was beside him. I see things coming down the mountain. Seem to be our soldiers. Find a different route. We need to get to the other side of the mountain without being caught. You know, Anne Phelan. 
This entire thing feels like a stupid idea. Well, it's only one I can think of at this point. 60. Chapter 83, Dying Down. 0044 May 24th, 2020 CE. 0322 Sun 24th, 196 E. Miles from the Goliath Mountain Range, Elf Nation. Surrounded by trees, Ara sat down on a flat rock while rubbing her forehead. Beside her was her night tank. She was glad that she had filled it up during their stay in the mountains. A few beleaguered elven soldiers milled around. Among them, one soldier came up to her and saluted. She didn't know his unit nor his name but he had patches that indicated that he was a lieutenant. He was most likely the highest rank soldier here other than her, Major General. Quite a few of our elves are missing. We have witnesses that say they have deserted. Okay. The lieutenant looked at Ara curiously. Shouldn't we give out orders to shoot anyone who deserts and to find those who deserted? We don't have time to care about deserters and we aren't going to shoot them. I don't even know which units these men are all from. I know which unit they are from. I gathered them, Major General. It is your duty to command us. Ara sighed. The deserters are just following orders. The lieutenant blinked. Um, Major General, I don't think the orders were to give up. They are dispersing. The orders were to disperse. That's what they are doing. I'm not even their actual commanding officer. They just joined up with us when we fled the mountains. In fact, some of these deserters could be trying to find their own units or their commanding officers. Are aside again after he left. She really wished that she could also desert. Uck, this is a mess. A few minutes later. We are running low on food and we have nowhere to be resupplied. Ara shook her head. High command is giving no help to us. Every time I ask for supplies and such, they only told me to follow the order to disperse. Seems like we will have to fend for ourselves. The lieutenant nodded. Major General, should we take a position in one of the nearby towns? They have food and probably fuel. That's actually not a bad idea. The Americans haven't gotten to this side of the mountains yet. Ara stood up. Elves, move out. We are getting resupplied. 0120 May 24th, 2020 CE. McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. General Thompson looked over the Citrep. Huh. They abandoned the mountains. That's incredibly stupid of them but incredibly lucky for us. One of his staff nodded. I guess they got scared of the mob we dropped on them. Well. We only have 14 more of them so thank God for that. It would be a repeat of Iyo Jima if they continued staying in those mountains. 0133 May 24th, 2020 CE. 0346 Sun 24th, 196 E. Somewhere in the Elven Nation. Under the blazing sun, a platoon of M1A2 Abrams sat in the middle of the plains. Captain Rose sat on the commander's hatch of his Abrams and studied the wide open plains. A voice came over the comms. When the hell is the fuel going to come? The front line is already way ahead of us. This is Praetorian. They did say that they did have fuel trucks coming towards us. I won't be surprised if the shipment is lost somewhere in the Magusian Empire. It's so fucking hot here. At least let us find a few trees to sit under the shade. We still have fuel. Yes, we can definitely still move. But we are trying to conserve fuel here just in case anything happens. We are in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, miles behind the front line. I don't expect some idiotic elf to attack us. On the road, a group of Humvees passed them. The soldiers on the Humvees were laughing. One of the tankers who was sitting beside his Abrams gave them a middle finger and shouted, Oh, fuck you. Skies over Elven territory. Leaflets spewed out of an F-15E that was cruising over the skies of the Elven nation. All cities west of your mountain range have fallen. Those that have surrendered are being treated humanely. We mean no harm to the Elves of the Elven nation. We only seek those responsible for initiating this war. On the back of the leaflet was a map of the Elven nation. One side of the Elven nation was colored blue and had the American and Magusian flag on it. On the other side was colored gray with the elven flag on it. Multiple blue arrows pointed towards the gray area. Outskirts of Faluna, Elven Nation. The sound of M77782 S firing rumbled across the plains. The firing had been going on for a few days, starting every time a target was marked. US troops have also advanced slowly into the city. Ovagroth, Elven Nation. Finn walked down the street. There were a few bodies lying on the street. Fucking hell. These elves did a number on these Magusians. A burnt out Sherman sat right in the middle. A few miles away, an Magusian officer greeted the commander of the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines, 
the elves have been stubbornly defending this city, our shermans have helped make some progress but we have been stopped by their anti-tank weaponry, if I'm hearing it correctly, the current situation is a stalemate then, near the Goliath mountain ranges, elf nation, a few US soldiers, from the 2nd Battalion, 22nd Infantry Regiment of the 10th Mountain Division, stood around relaxingly at a checkpoint, a car appeared from the horizon, one of the soldiers noticed it and his eyes widened in disbelief, we will be trying to stop it, be careful, the elves haven't done this yet but it could be a suicide bomber, what the hell, why the hell is there a car here, get into positions, the soldiers raised their M4S towards the car. The car soon came to a halt and two elves stepped out with their hands up. Ten minutes later, Washington DC, the phone next to Ronel's bed started to ring. Ark. What time is it? Ronel picked up the phone. One of them is claiming to be the head of their intelligence agency. He seems to want to negotiate with us. Huh. A defector? That's unexpected. A few miles from the Goliath mountain range. An American soldier stood by the entrance and kept an eye on Ann Phelan as he sat down. I'm Ann Phelan in Anero's head. I guess now former head of the Elven Intelligence Agency. A soldier sitting on the opposite side of the table greeted him. Nice to meet you, Mr. Inanero's. I'm Colonel Brian Trujillo, commander of the 1st Infantry Brigade Combat Team of the 10th Mountain Division of the United States Army. I will be acting as a temporary representative of the government of the United States. Although we are unable to confirm your identity, we are interested in what you want to say. Do understand that the soldier by the door is there as a precaution. I know that you Americans have capabilities beyond my wildest dreams. My agency has gathered a lot about your country, from your planes that are faster than the speed of sound, your helicopters, and your weapons that can attack out of sight. You also come from another world don't you? Brian smiled. Well. You do seem to know more than the average elven soldier. Go ahead. You know who our leader is correct? I presume you are talking about Taron Van Harris. Anne Phelan nodded. I am. Was a very close aide to him. In recent times, he has become more and more delusional. He started threatening me whenever I gave suggestions. I couldn't take it anymore. I knew that we weren't going to win and Taron will be forsaking the entire elven race if he continued. And how does this lead to you defecting to us? I believe that there are elves just like me, tired of the war and tired of this fanaticism, there are elves like you, especially, from your country's rural areas, but how do you expect to drum up support? I don't suspect that you are well known, are you? I'm not, but I know I will have support. Like you said, in the rural areas, elves are less supportive of Taran, it's because our propaganda has targeted the urban elves more than the rural ones. Now. Elves in places that you have occupied are more willing to show their distaste for the current elven government. They won't be in hiding anymore. I'm hoping to gather elves like these to form a new elven government. It is better than you humans taking over. Not many elves will accept that. I won't be surprised if a resistance movement forms because of that. Brian set his eyes on Anne Phelan. But what if the elves see you as a puppet government? Well, they won't because only elves are in the government. If humans were in the government, then the elves will see it as a puppet government. Having an elf-only government doesn't guarantee that a resistance movement doesn't form against you. And Phelan grew quiet. Um, Brian chuckled. I may have questioned you too much there. Well, the end decision isn't up to me. We will let you meet an actual diplomat soon to sort this out. Brian paused. Here is a serious question. Do you know where your leader currently is? I know Taran's hideout. I will be willing to give you this information if your government agrees to what I'm proposing. 082, May 24, 2020 CE, Washington DC. President Hayes swept his eyes across the members of the committee. The issue with the underwater sea monsters is becoming quite a nuisance. Secretary of Homeland Security Lanny Clark, started speaking. We have had a recent uptick in ships being mysteriously sunk with holes on the bottom. The Coast Guard is currently investigating but hasn't come up with much. However, a team of scientists we have gathered has come up with some information. Dr. Levi Munoz is here to talk about what his team has learned so far. Levi stood. Ahem, Mr. President, we believe that it is a creature, most likely native to only this part of the world, just like how the phoenixes were, 
However, they are fewer in numbers and should not be able to cause much damage. As long as we avoid the areas where it is mostly found, we can minimize the damage. My team has been creating a map to show where they are commonly found. Here's a map of the result. Lenny nodded. We will need to find a way to track them and then find a way to exterminate them. The Coast Guard is cooperating with the Navy in order to use their MHRS-60 to try to detect the sea monsters. We are not sure about the environmental impact of exterminating such creatures. We should tread carefully. 65, Chapter 84, Those Above. 0930 May 24, 2020 CE. 0745 Sun 24, 196 E. Goliath Mountain Range. Jacob sat on a rock that was beside the cave not an elf in sight. He took a sip out of his canteen, Isaac looked into the cave, the caves might have some. Pretty sure they have been cleared out, we will be over this mountain in no time. Would be nice if the elves gave up. The way they are fighting? Jacob shook his head, no chance. Creech Air Force Base Nevada, United States, a sensor operator looked closely at his screen, we have a single large heavy tank on the road. The mission coordinator looked over his shoulder. Whoa, that's a big one. Permissions to fire? Granted. Skies above Elven territory. A MQ-9 Reaper cruised over a long road that led to the mountain. A Hellfire missile shot out and a large explosion rocked the road. Elven Nation. My leader, the Titan Magipanzer had just been found destroyed. A loud, angry yell came from Taran's office followed by the noise of shooting. Taran came out of the office. My leader, what? The guard stopped as he saw that Taran was holding a pistol and was fuming. Drag him out. I'm going to my quarters. Don't disturb me for the next few hours. Taran waved his pistol at his aide behind him. The aide laid slumped by a wall that was covered in blood. Taran started muttering under his breath and walked away. Anira watched a screen when she heard an angry yell resumed. Elder sister. Sister. What is the meaning of this? What is it? Odelda? A red-faced young-looking man. Odelda appeared in front of Anira holding a screen. This? The night skyline of San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge was seen from the ocean on the screen. Anira gave a glance. Oh. That? You told me that I could summon anything I wanted to help me in your challenge. When I said summon anything I thought you would do something like a hero that uncle did for his world. Not. Whatever this is, Odelda, I don't understand why you have to be this cruel. Can't you retract this challenge? The redness of Odelda's face started to fade. A smirk grew on his face. What? It's fun. I killed everything in mine so it got boring. Ha. Huh. Whatever, from the looks of it, you didn't summon anything special if you are still worried. I hope you watch as I destroy everything you loved. Bye. Odelda's smirk widened and his eyes held a tint of wildness as he disappeared. Inira sighed and shook her head. How did he share the same parents as me? He just did one of those mood swings again. I really wish mother and father will be back soon. One thousand years ago, Odelda watched from a floating screen as a human wearing chain link armor ran from a group of huge, grey dog-like monsters. He laughed as tears flowed down the human's face. It wasn't long before the monsters caught up and tore the human apart. When Odelda giggling stopped, he took a deep breath and that should be the last one. That's surprising. Being base creatures, they survived the longest. He looked around his world. Many types of jet black and red creatures were everywhere. The land was a tan color devoid of vegetation. Ruins of civilization could be seen everywhere. It kinda feels boring now. There's nothing to kill anywhere. 500 years ago, Inira happily watched as a group of humans built a home brick by brick. Their architecture has gotten really good because of how little interaction the gods and goddesses have with each other. They are prone to talking to themselves. Older dear popped up. Elder sis. Anira didn't like at her younger brother. What is it, older dear? I'm bored. Don't you have a world to manage? Oh, I killed everything on it. Anira swished her head towards older dear. You what? Older dear smiled. What? Mom and Dad have only been gone on vacation for 5,000 years and you already killed everything in your world? Yeah, I got bored and made some demons. Hey sis, is that your world? Yes. What about it? Can I join? No. Older dear pouted. Or, oh, come on. Then how about I challenge you? My world is perfectly fine. I don't want to challenge. Older dear giggled. It will be fun. I will get to kill everything on your world. Older dear. 
Mom and Dad will be really angry once they, they are gonna be gone for another 5000 years. I give you 500 years before my demons invade your world. Also you are allowed to summon anything to help your world. Inira's eyes widened. Only 500 years. Bye. Can I even develop my world enough? Should I summon something? Inira hesitated. Summoning something that didn't come from her world could drastically change it. Sometimes, the result would be terrible. 1040 May 24th, 2020 CE. 0820 Sun 24th, 196 E. Malian, Elf Nation. After having most of the elves that were with her stay at the outskirts of the town, Ara and a few other elves walked into the town square. On her way there, the town was eerily quiet. She stopped and took in the scene in front of her. Standing besides her, the lieutenant turned his head to look at her. Major General, seems like we have units that got here before us. Two elves in officer uniforms were in the town square arguing. These are our supplies. No, ours. Elven soldiers were scattered around. A few scared town elves stood by and watched. Ara and the lieutenant approached them. What's happening here? Both elves turned towards Ara and said the same thing. Who are you? Major General Ara Belra of the 11th Blitz Panzer Division. Beside me is Lieutenant Ihlak Vagtsana of the 10th Infantry Division. Who are you too? Captain Jandar Mirarik of the 5th Tract Infantry Division. Major Reuven Jostina of the 33rd Infantry Division. Reuven stared at Ara. Look here. We got here first so these supplies belong to us. Jandar chuckled. Well. Tell that to my Magitrack. A Magitrack rolled into the town square. A soldier manned the machine gun on it. Ara looked at Ihlak and whispered into his ear. Lieutenant. Get it over here. Are you sure Major General? We can't use. Ara cut him off. Yes. I'm sure. I'm. I guess I'm currently your commanding officer. I will take full responsibility for anything that happens. After Ihlak nodded and left, Ara shook her head. Sheesh. He follows the rules too much. She turned back to the standoff, we will shoot, you won't dare, Ara shouted, stop, 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 Jandar and Reuven looked at her and said the same thing again, what, look we are all soldiers of the elven nation here, we are part of the same army, can't we share the supplies, maybe we can even travel together as a single unit, Reuven stared at her, between the three of us, together, Jandar shook his head, I have a couple hundred elves of my unit with me, they are my unit and my unit only. We need those supplies. No, my unit need them. Ara coughed. I outrank Bo. She got cut off by Jandar. Look here Missy, tell your rank to my Magitrack. These supplies are mine. A vein popped on her forehead. Oh so you gentle elves want to have a who has the biggest dick contest? A rumbling noise came from behind her. Well then, tell that to my knight. A knight came from behind her and stopped in the town square. It turned its turret towards the Magitrack. Ara took a deep breath. Okay now, we will be sharing these supplies based on how many elves we have and what we need. Understood, gentle elves. Reuven and Jandar stared at each other and then looked back at Ara and then looked at the knight. Okay, I guess. Fifteen minutes later, Ara, Jandar, and Reuven were sitting in someone's house conversing. Ara looked at Jandar. Okay so since you have Magitracks and I have Magipanzers, we will be splitting the fuel. I'm taking 60%. You are taking 40%. Jandar immediately protested. Hey, that's not fair. My knight needs more fuel than your Magitrack. I'm already being lenient here. Jandar looked away. All right. Okay and that should cover almost everything. I hope you two have a good day. Elven Underground Command Complex. Elven Nation. Taran, with a frown on his face, approached his aides. The aides who have been busy with compiling reports and various other tasks, all stopped and nervously stared at Taran. Taran looked around, we are leaving. If he really betrayed us, I won't be surprised if he tells the humans where we are located. Spread the word, take as much supplies as you can. Forty minutes later, outside the complex, Colonel General Vu Duin Roke looked at Taran. My leader, we have nearly completed evacuations. Where will we go from here? Taran smiled. Where our ancestors have called their home. 61. Chapter 85. Warlord, Opposition, and Resistance. 0310 May 26, 2020 CE. 0435 Sun 26, 196 E. Ovagroth, Elven Nation. 
Although it has been reduced for the past few days, the tension between the surviving elves in the city and the human soldiers still ran high. Finn yawned as he stood on the busy street watching the elves walk by. Beside him, Blake and Curtis were laughing about some joke. Finn was glad to see Curtis doing fine. Finn started to yawn again but stopped as he heard gunshots. Shit. The crowd of elven civilians started screaming and running. What is going on out there? Shit. There's an elf shooting some magic at us. Finn, Curtis, and Blake ran towards the noise. The gunshots died down just as they arrived on scene. A clearly dead elf laid on the ground a yard or so away from US soldiers. He's down. Blake looked around. Fuck. What was that? Anybody injured? A US soldier laid on the ground. A medic was working on him. The downed soldier coughed. Shit. I'm fine. Just a bit shook up. The medic patted the soldier's back. It didn't even get through your vest. Just throwing stones at us with magic. He bent down and picked up one of the projectiles. It was just a small stone. Thank God most of these civvies have weak magic. That water guy last week was nasty. Finn walked towards the group of soldiers. Heard he injured two guys. He was a soldier that we didn't net when we swept through the area. Blake shook his head. I really can't be comfortable with the fact that all these elves have weapons on them. Kurtz nodded. At least most of the elven civilians here are peaceful. Blake chuckled. Well, we kinda killed and imprisoned almost all of the non-peaceful ones. A few miles from the Goliath mountain range, Colonel Brian Trujillo led Anne Phelan out to the field that had a black hawk waiting. Anne Phelan looked curiously at it. So these are helicopters. You know about helicopters? The advancement department was working on producing helicopters. They haven't made it yet though. Well, this is a black hawk, a transport helicopter, probably the safest way of transport here. We will be sending you to the port city of Philaneas. Our diplomat will meet you there. 0623 May 26, 2020 CE. 0611 Sun 26, 196 CE. Port City of Philaneas. Daniel felt a bit tired. He was a US diplomat in the Magusian Imperium that was just given a bunch of information and rushed here. He entered the room. An elf was standing next to a seat. They shook hands. Nice to meet you. I'm diplomat Daniel Foley. Anne Phelan in Aeneros, former head of the Elven Intelligence Department. Take a seat. I have been temporarily assigned by my government to meet with you. Of course, I hope you understand that we are not here for compromise. The current Elven government must be completely dissolved and remade. Taryn Van Harris will either be killed or if he survives, be tried for crimes against humanity. That is perfectly all right with me. As long as we remain a free race, we will not accept being ruled by humans. We are not here to conquer you. We will leave once a stable democratic Kelvin government. I will help. Well, my government would like a lot of information from you. A few minutes later, Daniel walked beside Anaphelon. It is highly likely that you would be a target of assassination. I won't be surprised if they electrocute you or something. Electrocute? We don't have electricity magic. Well, that explains why I haven't heard anything about our soldiers getting struck by lightning magic or something. Does your country's intelligence not know this? Lightning magic doesn't exist. There are four main types of mana. Air, water, fire, and earth. I'm able to manipulate hair mana quite well. It's not good at attacking but very good at defending against regular magic attacks. Well, we will still have guards with you. 0839 May 26th. 2020 CE 0719 Sun 26 196 E Skies over the Elven Nation A B2 bomber cut through the sky Its black paint glinted in the sunlight The bay doors slowly opened up and a mop dropped A few seconds later a massive blast went off on the ground An RQ170 stealth drone circled around in the sky Ronel watched the live footage from the situation room Kralson nodded that should be a good effect on target if the bunker is really there. The entrance is where he said it will be. Hopefully, we killed that Taran bastard. Inora, Elf Nation, an elf, holding a submachine gun, shouted. They have a knight with them. Get the Pam. Another elf ran up and aimed a Pam at the knight. The Maga rocket flew over the turret of the knight. The knight's turret turned towards the elf. O.N. Elves started throwing down their weapons and raising their hands towards the tank. We surrender. Don't shoot. A tied up elf looked you are nothing more than traitors to the leader. Oh, Wyrenth. I doubt our leader is even alive anymore. Even if he was, 
he has abandoned us and proven himself incompetent, we may be traitors to the leader but we aren't traitors to our country, I'm proclaiming myself as the ruler of this town and the surrounding area, my reinforcements will come, Nazir. You will regret your betrayal, ha, huh? reinforcements, what reinforcements, a chain of command doesn't exist anymore, it's everyone for themselves, for the past few days. I tried to receive orders and tried to request for supplies but we were ignored. My elves were forced to scavenge just to survive. Look, I give you this chance to live. Most of your elves have agreed to serve me. How about you? If you swear your oath to me, we can create an empire. Never. Nazir nodded to the two elves flanking Wyranth. Well, if that's your decision, take him away and deal with him. Fifty miles from the elven underground command complex, a platoon of elves held up their rifles at the sight of two elves approaching them. Halt. Identify yourselves. We are forward elements of the leader security company. The leader would like to meet with the current commander of your force. Which unit are you? We are the 11th Tracked Infantry Regiment. Ten minutes later, Colonel Guriz Balhorn saluted. My leader, Taran nodded. Colonel Balhorn, your orders. Sir, we will be conducting a retreat to the Forest of Origin. I would like to give a short speech to your elves. Of course, sir. Taran stood in front of a thousand or so elves of the 11th Tracked Infantry. We will be fighting a war for the survival of all elves. These humans may have demons supporting them but do not fear. We are the mightest species on this planet. Through our righteousness and our will, we shall destroy these pests that infest this planet. We will make them run from our homes. We shall cleanse this world of them. We shall return to our ancestral land and show these humans that we are not defeated. Taran conversed with his general staff. Before destroying the large communication equipment, we sent out a message telling all units to regroup at the Forest of Origin. I'm not sure how many units were able to receive it though, Taran nodded. As long as we have a division of elves, we can still fight. Port City of Phylaneers. Anne Phelan stood in front of a crowd of elves. My fellow elves, I have made a deal with these humans. I understand why you want to call me a traitor but I'm an ally of all elves. What I seek for is the survival and freedom of the elven species. There were murmurs among the elves. Look at where we are now. We have no control of our country and humans are everywhere. I dream of a future where we will have control over our own country and these humans will be gone. Of course, you can continue fighting but I'm afraid we won't win. The humans have already taken the mountains, our military is in disarray, and our leaders have fled. Two F-15s make sonic booms overhead. Like you, I have no intention of living under humans. The humans have offered me the fact that they don't want to control us either since they know we will resist every second of it. As long as we don't attack the humans, they will leave us alone. In a forest, elf nation. Ara watched as her tank crew refueled the night. The crew popped open the doors on the back of the night. They removed their two massive magic batteries that were attached. A long tube, the mana suction connector, connected the large magic batteries with multiple smaller ones which was the fuel they got from the town. After checking that the connector was linked in the right direction, they turned the valve. Mana flowed from the smaller magic battery to the bigger ones. Ara wondered how much of the magic batteries was left. Cities were the major producers of magic batteries. The density of cities, in the millions, allowed magic batteries to be easily fueled. With most cities bombed by the Americans, she doubted there would be enough. The night's consumption of mana was ridiculously high. To travel a few hundred miles, it required mana that was capable of powering a town for multiple days. If she had her men continuously refill the smaller magic batteries, she doubted it would be enough. At this point, she regretted not pushing the idea to join forces. 1023 May 26, 2020 CE Washington DC Ronald sat back and listened to Kralson. We will be launching an assault on the elven capital city within 35 hours. The air force and artillery have pounded it for the last 10 days. According to General Thompson, resistance will still be heavy. We are expecting something like the Battle of Berlin. 39 hours later, Afvelin. Elf nation. John's Abrams lurched to a stop. Fire. The stallion exploded as an Abrams shell went right through it. The Abrams machine guns opened up on the elven infantry defending the street. The ground started shaking. Whoa. What the fuck? 54. Chapter 86. The elves fight on. 1444 May 27th, 2020 CE. 1022 Sun 27th. 
196E, Afvalin, Elv Nation, from far away. The explosions and orange glows could be heard and seen in the night skies of Afvalin. The fire control officer looked at the black and white video feed. We got an elven armored column down there, goddamn, how well did they hide their armor? Seems like they crashed them into houses so they could be hidden. Well not like that matters much now. The 105mm on AC-130 circling the city opened up on the four elven knights below. We have what seems to be a company of elven infantry coming down that street. The 30mm auto cannon made bright white dots on the screen of the thermal camera as rounds hit the elves below. The battle had been going on for a day and the elves were fighting tooth and nail for their capital city. 0123 May 28, 2020 CE. 0341 Sun 28, 196 CE. The shooting stopped as the ground shook violently. Bricks fell off of some of the three-story buildings, Jacob ducked and yelled at his squad. Get back into the Bradleys, the buildings are coming down, Isaac piled into the Bradley along with his squad. Why the fuck is there an earthquake, what's the chances of that? The Bradley shook violently. A metallic pang rang out as something hit the Bradley from the outside. Captain John Rose felt his entire body shake as the ground shook violently. This is second platoon, the river is overflowing. It's overflowing? How bad? The water in the river is rising up at unbelievable speeds. Shit. All tanks in second platoon back up. Shit. 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 Fuck. It's gushing towards us. Another voice came on the radio. Find the fastest route possible. The city is submerging. As the shaking stopped, some water started flowing down the street. John's tank started moving back. Even with the rising water, elves were shooting again. There's a tank to our left. The driver of the Bradley yelled back at Jacob, the water is getting too high, we have to abandon the Bradley or we will be swept away everyone get out, they have been trying to navigate the city in order to get out but weren't fast enough. Elves had also tried to stop the Bradley but were quickly dealt with by its 25mm chain gun. Fuck, we need to get on a building. Go, Isaac waded his way through the gushing water and followed his squad, entering the house. There was already a few feet of water on the ground, they rushed up the deserted building, Jacob, Isaac, and the rest of the squad got onto the roof of the house through a window, the water was filling the street and rising, their Bradley started floating away, a wave then engulfed it and turned it sideways, Jacob shook his head, fucking hell, the elves must be up to some shit with their magic, Isaac looked over the roof and at the ground, um, the water is still rising. We may need to find higher ground, the building beside us is a story or two higher. We should swim across when the water gets high enough. Isaac shook his head, the water is too violent and there are random waves, we can't swim across. Jacob nodded, I'm gonna try to get an evac for us. I have my squad with me. We need an evac here, we are stuck on a building on the east side of the city. Isaac couldn't hear what was being said on the other side of the radio but Jacob shouted. Ten minutes later, in the distance, a black helicopter got closer and closer. Isaac shouted, our ride is here. Jacob looked at the edges of the roof. Jesus Christ, get in the helicopter. Go, go, go. The water was splashing onto the sides of the roof of the building. The men piled into the Black Hawk. As the water started flowing onto the roof, the Black Hawk's wheels started lifting off the ground, the Black Hawk's rotors made waves onto the water. Suddenly, a wave of water started coming for them, there's a fucking wave incoming. Come on, get us off the ground, the wave barely missed them as the Black Hawk gained altitude, Afvalin, Elv Nation, the capital city of the elves was once in a valley that had a river run through it, now, it was just a massive lake debris floated around in the water and the structures that hadn't been swept away stuck out of the water, it was as if a hurricane just swept through. A few black hawks and chinooks flew over the flooded city, an F-15 flew by. In one of the black hawks, Isaac looked out, they fucking sacrificed an entire city, their capital, just to kill a few of us. Jacob took in the view, probably for their sense of pride or something, the elves' mentality doesn't differ that much from a human's. I guess, if we can't have it, you can't have it either. 0444 May 28, 2020 CE. 0522 Sun 28, 2020 CE. Washington DC. Ronell looked very stern. How many men did we lose? Kralson looked grim, 
a couple hundred word round, we lost five Abrams, two Bradley, and a couple of other vehicles, this was completely out of our expectations. Fucking magic bullshit, we have to look out for things like these in the future. I would like all units to stay about a mile away from rivers, we could ask the elven official that surrendered to us, he may know something. Port city of Philaneers, Anne Phelan shook his head. I did not know that Taran had any plans to submerge the capital city. Daniel nodded, can your entire country be submerged again? We aren't capable of submerging this country as of right now, we were able to submerge our country and keep it submerged because of the last great Magus, we surfaced our continent right when he died. The current great Magus doesn't have the power to submerge us or keep us submerged, the Great Magus with that amount of ability comes about once every few thousand years. Good to hear that we only have to deal with one of these bastards. Well, if the capital is gone, then the current Great Magus might be dead. With great amounts of mana, comes great physical weakness. So much mana in one elf is not good for their health. I don't believe that the current Great Magus could have moved out of there. I remember the successor of the current Great Magus wasn't that powerful. We were still trying to find a suitable replacement for him. Washington DC, Ronell was delighted to hear that the chances of another flooding incident happening wasn't likely, however, the stay away from Rivers command was still in effect just in case. The president sat in the situation room for a briefing by General Thompson, we are seeing a general breakdown of order among their units, we have some units seemingly retreating in a similar southern direction. However we have many units that are holding their ground yet not covering anybody's retreat, there are some units moving in a completely unreasonable direction. According to military intelligence, it is highly likely that Taran Van Harris is dead. Forest of origin, Elven Nation, Colonel General viewed you in Rogue and took in the forest. I have never actually visited this place before, Taran looked around. Our ancestors ruled these forests during the days when we used bows and arrows. Well. Not much is left of that time, the forest reclaimed it all when we ventured outwards, a few minutes later here's my plan, we will begin building a base in this forest, multiple small spread out camps, each with an independent yet still unified command, the Americans can easily destroy concentrated formations of us and find ways to tear apart our chain of command, this forest is perfect for ambushes, their armor can't enter the forest, Taran nodded to view Duin's words. What will we do about our armor? We can't just abandon them outside the forest. Our armor has proven quite ineffective against theirs. At this point, they are just metal coffins. The Titan was killed without even putting up a fight. At most, we bring our stallions. The knights have some use. We can entrench them and make them into bunkers. We can even hide the few fortresses we have until the day we use them again. May 29th, Sun 29th, Galath Mountain Range. With elven forces in disarray, U.S. and Magusian forces easily crossed over the mountains. The scattered elven units that tried to hold their ground were easily pushed aside. 52. Chapter 87. Crumbling Power. 0246 May 29th, 2020 CE. 0423 Sun 29th, 196 CE. On the other side of the Galath Mountain Range. Frontline. Nick Sabrams came to a halt. We have elven soldiers right in front of us. Fire. The shell exploded on the ten or so elves on the hill. Some elves panickedly stood up with their weapons, while others were frozen in shock. Suddenly they started shouting, We surrender, we surrender. Droves of elves put their hands up and laid down their weapons. Nick Sabrams along with the rest of the platoon drove close to the surrendering elves and stopped. Conley smiled huh. Nice. Either their fighting spirit is gone or these are just a bunch of untrained conscripts. Nick stared at them through the slit of the commander's hatch. Well, look at them. Some of them seem to be starving. I guess their logistics fell apart. Infantry started arriving to secure the surrendering elves. Ten minutes later, an elf ran into a rundown building. There were many elves in the building but the messenger ran directly to one. Commander, human forces are here. Our forward observers have been defeated. The elf stood up. Our leader may have run away in fear of these measly humans, but we will face them. Elves, into positions. They will not take our city. Woo. Our new leader. A shout came from outside. Human aircraft. Get into cover. Explosions rumbled the ground. The elves dived for the ground and took cover under desks. A few minutes later, another messenger came in through the door. 
Commander. Our forces are surrendering. Human tanks are here. Shooting and explosions could be heard outside. We are retreating. Get to the car. Somewhere in elven-held territory, elven nation. Sitting on the back of the turret of the moving night, Ihlark scanned the sky. His head swished back and forth. There aren't that many human aircraft overhead anymore. Ara, who was sitting in the opened commander's hatch, replied without looking back at Ihlark. We are just a magic tank on the road. I don't think the humans will send aircraft just for us. There are probably larger groups moving towards where the leader is. Ara turned her head towards the forest beside the road. A few elves could be seen. In reality, a hundred or so elves were in there. Something landed a few feet in front of her knight and exploded. Ara lurched forward as her knight came to a sudden halt. Ara, quickly gathering herself, went back into the night and closed her hatch. Enemy magic tank to our left. It's another knight. The turret started moving. Ihlark slid off of the side of the tank and ran into the forest. Ara looked through the slits of her hatch. Off in the distance, a knight had its gun aimed at her tank. Fire. Her magic tank's shell hit the front sloped armor. First one bounced. Reload. Driver. Turn our tank towards the enemy. Another shot came from the enemy knight and flew over her knight. Fire. This time the shot went through the front and an explosion occurred. Ara took a deep breath and let it out. She opened the hatch and looked out towards the destroyed knight in the grassy field. Ihlark was beside her in an instant. Are you all right Major General? Ara's eyes widened at the voice of Ihlark. Oh, Ihlark, you spooked me there. I'm fine. Ara turned her head to the forest. I need a squad over here. Check the enemy knight. An elf saluted as he approached her. Major General, the bodies are definitely elves. The surrounding area seems clear though. Ara rubbed her head. We need to be more careful. We don't know who is friend or foe now. Ihlark and Ara stood side by side while observing the destroyed tank. Ara touched the hole that her knight made in it. Any idea which unit they are from? Ihlark shook his head. Based on the designation on it, it should be from the 88th Major Panzer Division. However, the crew aren't wearing a tank as uniform so they could be from another unit. Ara frowned. Their shots are so bad, I don't think they are a part of the double eight unless they started conscripting random elves into their division. I don't think their pride could have taken it. Four hours later, Ara awaited the response of the village chief. After swallowing, the village chief spoke. Sorry, Major General. We just restarted production after another group of soldiers took ours. We barely have enough to power our village. Such a measly amount can't power your vehicles. Ara sighed and walked out of the building. Ihlark was standing outside. Ara looked at Ihlark. We may have to abandon our night. 0845 May 29th, 2020 CE. Washington DC. Ronell looked through the satellite images. We have spotted increased activity inside this large forest. It seems that a lot of surviving elven units are moving towards this location. Either a new leader has arisen or Taran isn't dead. Ronel groaned. I want this forest destroyed. Understood, Mr. President. 0833 May 30th, 2020 CE. 0716 Sun 30th, 196 E. Forest of Origin, Elven Nation. Many elves were working on trenches that would crisscross the main base. A single elf came running towards them. We have reports of human aircraft. Get back into the bunkers. Our observers outside the forest have reported human aircraft. The humans seem to have found us, sir. General of the Infantry Yomaya Horn nodded. Of course. This was inevitable. Hopefully. They can't see through the forest canopy. Somewhere in the forest of origin. I seem to be living more underground now than up above. Taran laughed sadly as he drank. He was currently in a dimly lit room with Vujuin. The room was part of a hastily constructed building dug into the ground. There was rapid knocking on the door of his room. Whoever was on the other side of the door shouted, My leader, we are under attack. Human aircraft are overhead. They have found us. Taran chuckled. There seems to be nowhere I can run to anymore. Vujuin, who was sitting beside him, raised his glass. Well, we are with you till the end. Cheers. 1322 May 30th, 2020 CE. 0941 Sun 30th, 196 E. Washington DC. How's the provisional government? Katerina smiled at Ronell's question. Well, Mr. Inaniros has been setting some things up. They are already making a census and he has elves fixing basic services in the territories we have secured. We are going directly for a democracy after the war in this situation. 
I wonder how well the elves will adapt to it, having never experienced it. Well, we are there as a guiding hand, we can probably fix them the same way we fixed the Germans and Japanese after World War II. They are a nation state unlike the Mac Imperium. Also, I heard the Bim Kingdom will be having their referendum soon. R, yes, that had been delayed until now because the process to strip the nobles of their titles has been complicated. The National Guard unit there has been doing quite a good job at keeping the nobles in check. The king already removed the personal armies of most of the nobles so that helped a lot. Ronel smiled, that's good to hear. Do we have a set day for the referendum? June 6, less than two weeks from now. A bit of concern crossed his face on that. Ajinport, Bum Kingdom, Private Seth Campbell of the 116th Infantry Brigade Combat Team of the Virginia Army National Guard made a big yawn as he stood guard in the street. The sun had just started going down. His squad leader, Staff Sergeant Noah Gonzalez chuckled. Tired, Seth? Seth rubbed his eyes. Well, yeah, we just kicked another one of those nobles' asses yesterday. That should have been the last one. The referendum is gonna happen soon and if that goes well, we get to go home. I didn't think being a part of the National Guard would be this much. I thought we would help people out during natural disasters, not shooting people trying to kill us with muskets. Ha, huh? we are still soldiers, not sure what you expected. National Guard units have been sent to fight wars since World War II or something. Well, at least you weren't here when we deployed to Iraq. I rather fight a bunch of 17th century soldiers with muskets than terrorists with axe and suicide vests. Well if you put it that way, I guess so. 58, Chapter 88, The Inevitable 0840 May 30th, 2020 CE 0720 Sun 30th, 196 E Forest of Origin Elven Nation A.A. Thorguns, positioned in openings in the forest so that their shells didn't explode in the trees, fired into the air. This isn't working, they are too fast. The human plane zoomed by before the Menaflak even exploded in the air. Mark 77 incendiary bombs dropped from the F-15S zooming overhead. The forest is on fire. We need to put it out. Sir, they are still bombing us. We can't go out. Anybody who has water abilities. We need you up here. But sir, we have to put out the fire before it spreads even further. Flames chewed through the forest and explosions rocked the ground. McDill Air Force Base Florida, General Abrams Thompson watched the drone footage that showed the damage done on the forest. The elves seem to have put the flames out quite fast. His aide snorted, they have water magic bullshit, of course they put it out fast. Well, the president has given specific orders for that forest to be wiped off of the face of this planet. I want more strikes on that forest. Also divert 2B52S on that. I want the place leveled. Carpet bomb it if you need to. 1722 May 30th, 2020 CE. The Pentagon. In his office cubicle, Daniel Gretting looked at the report on his computer screen and muttered to himself. Weird. These numbers seem to be incorrect. The past few reports were all three deaths from airstrikes. He scrolled through the report that detailed the latest numbers on civilian casualties. In the end, the information on these reports will have to be compiled into an overall report titled Annual Report on Civilian Casualties in Connection with United States Military Operations in 2020. Daniel looked at the time. He looked back down at his computer screen. He was just a civilian worker for the Department of Defense and it was nearly time for him to clock out. Rubbing his head, he turned off his computer and stood up. I will deal with this later. I get the feeling this is complicated shit that I got myself into. Of course it had to be fucking me to notice. 0250 May 31st, 2020 CE. 0425 Sun 31st, 196 E. 87 miles from the Forest of Origin. The night started sputtering and suddenly stopped. Ara looked down into the tank. Has the major batteries ran out of fuel? One of her crew members shouted back. I think so. It's not starting. Okay, everyone get out. Ara jumped off the side of the night and hit the ground. She turned around and looked at the night. The rest of the crew slid off the tank. Ihlark also slid off the side of the tank. Ara looked at Ihlark. Well, I had hoped it would have gotten us to the forest of origin. I didn't want to steal from those civilians if I had known we would have had to abandon it. Ihlark cocked his head. In military law and rules of conduct, 
seizing materials from civilians in order to aid the war effort is legal and encouraged. Ara sighed and shook her head. Are rules all you think about? Forest of origin, Taran listened intently to Vujuin. According to reports from those who have recently arrived, there are multiple units who have defected, to the humans? No, my leader, it seems like they couldn't bear the humiliation of turning to the humans, so instead they have formed their own independent groups. Well, they will just be a bump in the road for the humans, as long as they don't attack us, they are free to do whatever they want, it's probably better since they are bogging down the human advance. Vujuin stopped what he was saying. He wanted to warn Taran that he was losing his grip over the country and many had become disillusioned. Taran cocked his head, Colonel General, oh, sorry, was thinking if there was anything else. We do have reports of elves being attacked by other elves. Three days later, 0506 June 3rd, 2020 CE, 0533 Sun 34th, 196 CE. Explosions shook the ground. Loose dirt fell from the ceiling and landed on Taran's map. He swept it off and sighed. They have been bombing for the last four days already. Less than a mile away, Ara stood in utter shock. The forest of origin looked almost unrecognizable. What was once a lush green forest had become grey charred wood and black and dirt. What? Ihlark had a grim look on his face. The humans found out. Ara gritted her teeth. Who goes there? Ara and Ihlark pulled out their pistols while her de facto unit raised their rifles and submachine guns. They turned to face an elf approaching them. I'm Major General Arabara of the 11th Blitz Panzer Division. Who am I speaking to? The elf saluted. Private Rhys Kiegel with the leader security company. Is the leader still alive? He is. We have set up a bunker system in the forest. Human aircraft have been bombarding us daily for the past four days but it's been holding up. I would like to meet with the leader. I will see what I can do. Are these elves from your division? No. These are just survivors that I gathered at random. I haven't bothered to check which unit they were from. Forty-five minutes later, Ara entered the room and immediately saluted. My leader, Major General, I would like to commend you for safely guiding a hundred elves here. Just doing my duty, sir. Good to hear. May I inquire about our current situation? I have not been able to communicate with any form of command. Tarrant smiled at that. This is Colonel General Vudu in Roken. He will update you on the current situation. Ara gave a salute to Vujuin. Vujuin nodded. Let's take this conversation outside. There is much to inform you about. Ah, before you two go, I forgot something important. Congratulations, Major General Ara Balra. I'm awarding you a two-rank promotion to General of the Majapanzas. Also, so much has been happening for the past few days and this is far overdue but Colonel General Vujuin wrote can you have been promoted to Field Marshal. I expect much from you too. General of the Magi Panzers Balra and Field Marshal Rogan. They both saluted. Thank you my leader. The Forest of Origin is currently the only place in our actual control. Everything else not controlled by humans is in our de jure control. We have been bombed daily and it's worsening. Truth to be told. Viewed you in stopped. Ara eyed him. Viewed you and looked around and lowered his voice. Truth to be told, I don't think this war is currently in our favor. Our current government has lost legitimacy. I'm pretty sure you have been fired upon by other elves. I would actually suggest, sir. Negotiations with the humans. You know, if you said that to most other elves, they would probably report you for treason. However, I agree with that. But with how you are saying it, I guess our leader isn't too keen on that idea. Viewed you and laughed. I'm a field marshal now and I'm currently quite close with Taran. He will believe my words more than anybody else. They exited the bunker. They were deeper in the forest and this portion wasn't as devastated as other parts of the forest. Viewed you and continued. I have been talking with a few other officers who also are thinking like me. But we don't want to do anything premature. Any orders then? Those 500 or so elves you led here have been assigned to you. We also have a couple hundred elves that will also be under your command. Not much but that will have to do. Which unit were you from? Again? The 11th Blitz Panzer Division. I believe we have some survivors from your units. With Major Panzers too. They will be assigned to you. Ara smiled. I'm happy to hear. My elves are some hardy ones. Also, I don't need you to write up a report about what you faced during your retreat here. We have more important things to do. We have been building up defensive positions, trenches, bunkers, and such. I will take you to the command center and give you the exact locations. 
An hour later, Ara found Ahlark among the other elves she had left. Ahlark, I got promoted to General of the Majapanzas. You are under my command now. Glad to hear that, General. Not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm giving you a five rank promotion. Congratulations, Colonel Valtsana. Um, Ara chuckled. Any higher you will be a general and I'm pretty sure I'm not allowed to do that. But I do need a second in command. You may follow the rules too much but you are probably the most suited. 0822 June 3rd, 2020 CE. 0711 Sun 34th, 196 E. White House. Kralson updated him on the current military situation. Most areas have fallen under our control. There has been limited and ineffective resistance from the elves. I believe we have broken them. Ronel frowned. Then why hasn't this war ended? It seems that the elves would rather become independent forces than surrender to us. We have witnessed elves fighting amongst themselves while still fighting us. Ronel frowned. Okay, what's next? Katrina? Katrina handed him a report titled Preparations for the First Boom Elections. We have the full list of candidates from the Electoral Committee. The BUM have around an 60% literacy rate so the candidates are using symbols to represent themselves. How's the security situation there? We have National Guardsmen posted at voting sites, protecting candidates, and patrolling settlements. Agenport, BUM Kingdom. Seth stood guard at an election site and watched as people walked into the building. He spoke to Noah. So they are doing the presidential elections first. There are already a couple parties and quite a few independents on the ballot. They even have a monarchist party. Seth raised his eyebrows and groaned. What? Yeah seriously, I don't really know their goal but I do hope they just want to figure it. Well, there's something even worse. The nobles party. Oh come on, guess what they want. Fuck off. Staff sergeant. I don't wanna hear any more. Noah laughed. 52. Chapter 89. The Occupied Territories 0848 June 3, 2020 CE 0724 Sun 34, 196 E Agenport, Bum Kingdom side by side, two Bum men wearing full skirted knee length coats, knee breeches, and a vest, which seemed straight out of 18th century Europe, walked by an electric light pole. Say, Glover, chap. I know they made us register for this and issued us ID cards but I have yet to be informed of how this voting works. Glover scratched his head, have you not been reading the Agenport Daily Journal? My old friend, it has a full description of how to do so. It also said that if we are confused, they will have people there to help us. Now, what I'm more concerned about is whether or not these Americans will rig this in their favor in order to have control of us. Now, now. Why would they care about controlling us? Irvin, it is of most sense. Any normal country would want to control another country. That's just how the world works these days. Irvin waved around. Then they don't have to put such effort into doing this. They already have full control of our country. Look around us. We are basically an occupied nation. Both watched as an American soldier walked by holding his automatic rifle. Irvin continued. And besides, they have given us so much unlike the Mac Imperium. They even created an electric company to give us electricity. Well, it is just a subsidiary of an American company and they haven't given everyone electricity. They still gave us electricity in the end. Better medicine, interesting products, and their food is great. I don't have anything to argue against that. They took their place at the end of the line that stretched outside the polling station. American soldiers were more present than on the streets but there were also some BIM soldiers who were armed with muskets. Walking into the polling station, they were greeted by a man dressed just like them sitting at a desk. He looked up at Irvin. Please present your ID card. Irvin showed it. Okay, please sign your name on this form. A few minutes later, Irvin found Glover as he walked out of the polling station. So, who did you vote for? Glover raised an eyebrow. Well. Who did you vote for? A predicament indeed. How about we say it together? Sure. That's a terrific idea. I will count down. Ready? Glover nodded. Three, two, one. Irvin's words came out a second earlier. Milton Wem of the Boom Democracy Party. Ned Hayes of the Unity Party. Why Ned Hayes? He's a bit too conservative there. Well, I like the status quo. Too much change doesn't suit me well. He isn't bringing much change to the laws from what I have read. We have a new system, we should have new laws to go along with it, it's only of most sense. Irvin, I never saw you as one of those revolutionaries. Oh, pish posh, Glover, 
Everything has changed. By any standards, the Democracy Party isn't revolutionary at all. If you want revolutionary, then look at the New World Party. 0812 June 5th. 2020 CE 0706 Sun 36 196 E White House Ronell looked through the report on the election results of the BIM presidential elections, Katrina was beside him with 54% of the vote, Milton Wem of the BIM Democracy Party won the presidential elections. Ronell nodded slowly as he read. What did they campaign on? Closer relations with us, improvements to civil rights and support for free market capitalism seem to be their main focus. That sounds decent. There are other good options but much better than the Monarchist Restoration Party or the Nobles Party. Ronell looked up at Katrina. There's already a party that wants to restore the monarchy. They only had about 2% of the votes. We literally just got rid of the monarchy. Ronell shook his head. I want to have a meeting with Mr. Wem as soon as possible. Katrina nodded. I will set that up. Also, when are the parliamentary elections occurring? We are hoping no more than six months from now but that isn't guaranteed. Well, at least we have someone up there running the country. Port City of Philaneas. The port city of Philaneas had become the temporary capital city of the new elven nation. Of course with Afvalan becoming a massive lake, the port city could actually become the permanent capital. Anne Phelan sat at the desk of his office in the presidential building. The Americans had made him interim president. He looked through the papers stacked on his desk, reporting everything ranging from the food situation in every city to the appointment of new officials. Anne Phelan was glad to see that rebuilding efforts had already begun in multiple cities albeit slowly. They had just gotten the power back on in this city. He looked at one of the reports and sighed. The main problem was how hostile most elves were to the humans. The Americans were already on his skin about the situation. There were those who just didn't care about the humans but quite a lot ranged from skeptical to outright suicidally hostile. It was going to take a lot of work to change the hearts and the minds of the population after living so long under a regime with the main goal of teaching everyone to hate humans. Right now he was placating the population using the promise that once they established this new government, the humans would be gone. Anne Phelan feared that once he wasn't president anymore. A dumb zealot in his place would launch another idiotic war against the humans again. Another concern right now was the loss of population. Some cities lost 50% of their population due to the war. It was estimated that by the end of the war, 25% to 50% of the elven population would have died. Recovery might take decades. He got on his phone and called up an aide. He had to deal with the short-term problems right now and worry about the long-term ones later the aide entered the room. Send the major battery engineers we have in this city to the port city of Ilis Zari. We need to get power back as soon as possible in every city. In the streets of the port city of Philaneas, everyone kept a wide distance from the human soldier. Some stared at him hostilely. Aras and Kinriath walked briskly to the food market in order to get out of the tense atmosphere. With current infrastructure in tatters, much of the food here came from relief aid from the humans more specifically the Americans. Some avoided it but she relatively didn't care as long as it kept her fed. As she looked through the selection of vegetables, a human military vehicle colored in various shades of green drove past her. Someone threw a rock at it but missed and it kept going, getting her groceries. She got back home in a few minutes. She turned on the lights. The power had just come back on a few days ago and she was thankful for it. She was thankful for a lot of things. The fact that she survived, that the humans occupiers weren't being hostile, and that things were actually going back to normal. 0912 June 5, 2020 CE 0755 Sun 36, 196 E Forest of Origin 2B52S cruised through the skies in formation. The bomb bay doors of both B52S opened up. Bombs started dropping in a slow pace. The forest below started exploding. An elven officer shook his head. They completely destroyed a portion of the forest. Everything is gone. The entire defensive network, a hundred or so elves are all gone. They are seeking to completely destroy us all. What do we do, Field Marshal? We have nowhere else to run. They are shooting at us like fish in a barrel. We only have one option left. I don't like it but we won't survive if we continue. Subacan Kingdom, Sown Continent. Well. King Ferdinand. What do you have to say for yourself? Vilo's lioness figure loomed over the king who was clearly trembling in fear. Commander Flametail, 
I was forced to do this. I had to do this to save my people. The situation was hopeless. They came at us with tanks and guns. You have to understand. Vilo snorted and turned to walk away. You threw yourself at their feet the moment they arrived and offered your full collaboration. You sent your own army to fight us. No matter how much I would like to kill you right now, the council will deal with you. Knights, take him away. Ron quickly followed after her. Jeb and Ahab also started to take their leave. Behind them, the king struggled. What are you doing? I'm the king of this nation. Get your hands off of me. Vilo turned and glared at him. Or, I could tell the council an accident happened and a sword accidentally found its way cleaved into your head. I'm pretty sure the council will understand. The king emitted an ip and went quiet. Ahab walked beside Vilo. The elves are pretty much broken at this point. Quite a lot of the occupied nations have declared their liberation. I wonder if you guys even need our services anymore. Vilo nodded. That's up to the council. And your contract hasn't ended yet. We still have some resisting elements to sweep up. Ahab chuckled. The resisting elves have no armored support anymore and barely have any ammo left. My country has nearly conquered the elves' homeland. Well, it still feels nice to kick their ass. 55, Chapter 90, The Plan to End It All 0844 June 7, 2020 CE 0722 Sun 38, 196 E Forest of Origin Ara sat down across from Vujuin. She looked around. I hope the messenger gets there in time. He probably won't. We will have to leave before this place is completely burned and bombed to the ground. We can trust the messenger right? Navar's actually a very close friend. I trust him with my life. Ara nodded. Now, how are we going to leave without Taran catching wind of us doing so? We don't. Even he will know when we need to relocate from a position. We will be leaving with him? How are we supposed to surrender to the humans then? He will most definitely stop us. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. I have been keeping an eye on who's the most loyal to him and who's having doubts. I will give you the plan soon. Are you sure the humans will treat us well? I'm gambling on it. We are really short on time. I wanted to ask for pardons first before we gave them the information but that will take too long. Anne Phalant seemed to have defected to the humans so we may have a chance. 0929 June 7, 2020 CE 0744 Sun 38. 196 e. White House. Ronel checked his appearance as he sat in front of a screen. He looked back down at a dossier given to him by the National Security Council. It was packed with information about Milton Wem. Beside him, a translator fluent in Latin stood. The screen then flickered on. On the screen, Ronel could see the American ambassador to the Bum Republic. The ambassador turned his back and nodded to someone behind him. The ambassador's face left the screen to show another person sitting at a desk. He had a bushy white moustache and was a bit rotund. He had a friendly look. He was wearing black knee-length coat and a powdered wig. There was a translator beside him. Ronel smiled. Congratulations, President Wem. I hope to see your administration create the first democracy of this world. Thank you, President Hayes. My administration shall do the best it can. That's good to hear. I want to know if there's anything on your agenda or any help we can offer. The BIM Republic is interested in continued cooperation with the United States of America. I hope your country reciprocates this interest. Of course, of course, we will do whatever we can in developing a stable democracy in the BIM Republic. The thing that worries me the most right now is the discontent from formal nobles. I fear they may be plotting a way to take back power. I abhor the nobles party and I'm currently debating on banning them. Outlawing a political party would set a dangerous precedent. Unless they directly act or there is proof of collaboration with violent entities, I would not recommend banning them. A stable democracy should accept other political ideologies and movements. However, there will be American soldiers on the ground in your country to keep the peace. We are hoping to establish an indefinite military base on your territory. My country will gladly welcome that. Although that may depend on the parliament once it's established. Well, we will continue operating the current airfields in your country in order to support the war against the elves. Once the war is over and the situation in your country is stable, there will be a scaling down of troops. However, we will base our soldiers in the military base we establish most likely 10,000 or so, maybe even more, after a few more minutes. The video call ended. It was more of a simple courtesy call but Ronel felt that it got much accomplished. Seems like a good man. We can work with this. 
Katrina nodded. Well, we can only truly know from his actions. But I think things will go smoothly. 1025 June 7, 2020 CE 0812 Sun 38. 196 e forest of origin human aircraft zipped through the sky dropping more and more bombs even with the size of the forest the elves were taking heavy casualties the humans were slowly demolishing every square inch of the forest the only thing the elves could do was sit in their bunkers and hope they won't blow up what they feared most was when two gigantic aircraft flew over those dropped gigantic loads of bombs capable of reducing a couple square miles to charred wasteland. Viewed you and entered into the room where Taran was in. My leader, we need to disperse. This forest is no longer safe. We have lost too much elves trying to hold this position without even doing damage to the humans. The few anti ethyl guns we had are all gone. Startled, Taran looked towards Vyudyuin. A bit of dirt fell from the roof of the ceiling. And how do you recommend doing this dispersion? We have nowhere to go. We spent so much energy building all of this. It's no use. It's slowly getting destroyed. We shouldn't have regrouped here. We will split into multiple companies spread out across this countryside. Less effective, true. But we won't be sitting ducks. Viewed you and pulls out a small map from a case and sets it on the table. This is how I have our units spread out. My leader, you will be with your security company and will be in a safe location away from the fighting. White House. Ronell looked at the people in his office. A military aide seems to be the one giving information. What is this urgent report about? An elven soldier approached our forces about ten minutes ago claiming to be a messenger for an elven field marshal. He gave us a letter from said field marshal. What did it say? Here's a digital copy. He hands Ronell a tablet. Basically, the writer introduces himself as Field Marshal Roken and is currently with Taran in the forest that we are currently bombing. So that bastard is still alive. Military intelligence told me he was dead. God damn it. This Field Marshal is claiming that he and many other elven military officials are contemplating surrendering. He claims that Taran would never agree to it so he created a plan to end this war. He will disperse the elven military outside the forest. Some of them will be surrendering while the others we can wipe out. He's also asking for him, the other surrendering officials, and their men to be pardoned. How are we going to know where they are then? We haven't received it yet but he gave us a map of where all the units he planned will be. It has units marked that are going to surrender and those that aren't. We even know where Taran will be in about two days. Taran will have a security company with him and most likely a couple of tanks. Ronell read through the message. This could be a trap. True, but we can have drones recon the area to see if it is. If it isn't, we can end this war. Has someone sent this to Anne Phelan? For confirmation about this Rogan fellow. We are being cautious at who we give this information to. The only people who know about this on our side are the commanding officer who read this and everyone in this room. Although I can get someone to talk to him about whether or not he has heard of Field Marshal Rogan. Okay, so Anne Phelan has heard of him, but he was a Colonel General, I guess he was recently promoted, glad we can confirm that. Now just to see if the information that was given to us was correct, I want special forces on standby to capture Taran if we find him, Mr. Dot President. The elven messenger is requesting a response to send back to the field marshal. Let me write a response to thank them. I will guarantee to pardon them if the information is true. Pentagon. Daniel looked through the reports. He scrolled through past ones. He started muttering. Something's not right. Someone's trying to hide something. All he wanted to do was to ignore this because he knew this would involve a lot of shit that he wasn't going to be happy to go through. But his damn conscience was screaming at him to do something. He needed to talk to someone. About five hours later, in a cafe, Daniel sipped on a coffee as he waited for his friend. It didn't take long for his buddy from the same agency of the DoD. Charles, how has your day been? Had you got a promotion? Congratulations. Charles sat down and smiled. Thank you, I have been doing well. How are you Daniel? This is unusual. We usually don't meet right after work. Well. There's a reason I called you here today. Do you want to get something to drink or eat before we talk about it? Charles shook his head. Daniel gave a quick look around and lowered his voice. I think someone is messing with the civilian casualty reports. Some of the data I was looking through seemed suspicious. Something flashed over Charles' face before going back to normal. Daniel guessed it was probably shock from what he was telling him. What is it? What do you mean by suspicious? 
Some of the data seems to be repeating. It's as if someone is trying to hide something. Charles kept silent. Daniel continued. For all I know, the president could be trying to hide things from Congress, and that is way above my pay grade. I don't want to play the hero but this is some serious stuff. I'm not sure what to do and who to report this to. Then maybe you shouldn't. We don't know who is trying to change the data. It could ruin your life. Someone up there could try to get rid of you. Daniel sighed. I just don't know. 52. Chapter 91. The end of an era is here. 1711. June 7, 2020 CE. Pentagon. Quincy had his reading glasses on as he scanned through a piece of paper. So what are you here for today, Charles? Um, Quincy. Quincy put the paper down and raised his eyebrow at Charles. Spit it out. I don't have all day. Someone may have found out about what we are trying to do. That got Quincy's full attention. Who? Not totally but someone I know believes that something was suspicious with the reports. He's thinking about investigating it. You fucking fool. Tell me their name. Um, I don't think we have to worry. He doesn't seem. Quincy cut him off. Spit it out or I swear your life will be a living hell from this point forward. Charles looked to the side. Daniel Gretting. He's a co-worker. He talked to me about the civilian casualty reports being weird and wanted my advice. 1025 June 7, 2020 CE. 0812 Sun 38. 196 E. Forest of Origin. Taran reviewed the plan that Viu Duin had given him. And you are sure this is a good plan? I have already talked with the other high-ranking officers and they have approved. It's better than us sitting here until we get bombed to oblivion. And where will I be exactly? You will be with your security company at an isolated location. It should be labeled on the map. Viu Duin pointed at the red circle with LSC labeled on it. Then he pointed to another red circle labeled Viewduin. I will be in command of the center. I will lead about 500 or so elves to garrison this town. We will subjugate any rogue elves we find. I don't expect there to be much since this is less than 60 miles away from here. 20 minutes later, in one of the rooms of the bunker system in the forest, Ara looked at the map presented to her by Viewduin. So we are defecting to the humans then? I'm not sure how my elves will take this. Viu Duin smiled, don't worry, we will be surrounded and then forced to surrender, of course, we won't be doing much fighting, we will be intentionally falling into a trap. 1422 June 7, 2020 CE 1011 Sun 38, 196 E. It had only been an hour since Viu Duin and his unit set off in the cover of darkness when the elves at the front of the unit noticed a car barreling towards them. Viu Duin, who was on foot with his other aides, was approached by an elf from his unit. Field Marshal, there's an elf who claims to be your friend and has an important message. Lead him to me. The elven messenger approached Viu Duin. Viu Duin looked at his aides. Please give me some privacy. This is sensitive information. After getting out of hearing distance, Viu Duin looked at the messenger. Navar, did you relay the message? Navar nodded. The humans have guaranteed a pardon to you and your soldiers and officers. Well done. How long did it take you? It was a short car ride. The humans are about 100 or so miles away from us. Wasn't that long. Okay, I need you to send another message. This time, stay with the humans and don't come back. Understood? Yes, sir. Viu Duin handed him a piece of paper. I will see you there. One hours later. White House. The camera on the MQ-9 Reaper drone rotated. Ronel watched the green-tinted video feed. Multiple others were watching it with him. There are a lot of elven soldiers down there. This might be it. How many soldiers are we dealing with? According to the elven messenger, there should be around 200 of them with armored vehicles. That large group seems to be them. We have yet to confirm if Taran is there. I want his location to be confirmed and the surrounding area be surveyed before sending in Task Force 141. 20 minutes later, it has just been confirmed. They are in a very vulnerable position. There is no other elven soldiers in the surrounding area and we have confirmation that someone matching Taran's description is there. Ronel smiled. Tell the commander in charge of this operation that I want that bastard alive. 1533 June 7, 2020 CE. 1046 Sun 38, 196 E. 40 miles from the forest of origin. 3 AH6 Little Birds. An egg-shaped helicopter with a minigun and rocket pod on each side. 
touched down, four men jumped off the sides of each helicopter. The twelve-men Delta Force team quickly disembarked and the little birds took off. A Hellfire missile shot out from the Reaper drone that had been observing the leader security company. The stallion exploded as the missile slammed into it. The elves took one glance at the burning husk of a light tank and moved into action. The humans are here. Guard the leader. Taran looked around at the commotion. Suddenly an elf came up to him and saluted. My leader, we need to leave. Quickly. They rushed Taran in the direction of the forest of origin. Five black hawks and two chinooks touched down on the plains a few miles in front of the elves. Men of Bravo Company. 1st Ranger Battalion of the 75th Ranger Regiment fanned out and crouched after they disembarked from their helicopters. The Chinooks left as soon as they were empty but the Black Hawks lifted off and pressed forwards. The ground a few miles in front of them lit up. Shots flew overhead. The Rangers as the Elves opened fire at the lights of the helicopter. The crouched Rangers immediately went prone. Keep your head down. Jesus Christ. Did they fucking land us too close? The concentrated and accurate fire from the elves was overwhelming. This is the wrong fucking LZ. The little birds came from behind the elves and started pouring down lead and rockets. That moment really broke the elven fire on the rangers. That was just enough time for the rangers to set up their MK-48 machine gun and return fire. The gunners on the doors of the Black Hawks spewed bullets down on the elves using Ming guns. Despite the support from the helicopters, the rangers continued to face intense fire from the security company. Ten minutes later, in the heat of the battle, one of the little bird pilots noticed that he was starting to lose control. Bullet holes riddled his glass but luckily none had hit him. He looked at the tail of his helicopter and in the darkness, barely noticed that smoke was pouring out. I'm going down. The pilot struggled with the controls as the helicopter started swishing left and right. A platoon of 25 elves hurried Taran. They were moving away from the fighting. Two of the elves had a small fireball in their palms. Taran turned to the lieutenant that was closely following him. Do we have any other units near us? No, my leader. They are too far away. The humans seemed to have known we were isolated. Realization dawned on him. Vujuin, you bastard. The platoon looked at Taran in surprise. A crack was heard and one the elves dropped dead with blood gushing out of his head. Sniper. The elves get down and pull Taran to the ground. They opened fire with their submachine guns towards the right, where the shot came from. The Delta sniper kept his head down as bullets whizzed past him. Shit. How the fuck did they see me so fast in the night? They don't have night vision goggles. Fucking hell. I need some covering fire. A stream of shots started coming towards the elves. From their left, Taran kept his head down as his ears felt deaf from the bullets whizzing overhead. It felt like forever but the shooting stopped and everything went silent. Taran could hear the crunching of boots on the ground. He looked up. Humans approached him wearing strange headgear and pointing guns at him. Taran looked around to see that the entire platoon protecting him was dead. Mostly from headshots. Taran raised his hands. One of the humans handled him roughly and tied him up while the other said something. We have suffered two wounded, awaiting extraction. Five minutes out. Good job team. Sixty miles from the forest of origin. Vu Duin received reports that his forward elements had ran into a large group of humans and were forced to retreat under intense fire. Vu Duin's MAGA radio operator spoke up again after giving that first report. Field Marshal. We have reports of a large number of human soldiers to our flanks and read. We are surrounded. Give me the Magi radio. We are completely surrounded, fellow elves. I pain to say this but, lay down your arms. I have just received reports that our leader has been captured. The war is over. The soldiers murmured among themselves. Some looked grim and a few started throwing down their weapons. Soon the rest joined. It was the final straw. They were clearly losing. They had suffered from intense human bombardment in the forests with no ability to fight back. And now they were surrounded and informed that their leader had been captured. Vu Duin made the last part up but he was certain that Taran was either dead or captured at this point. White House. Ronel heaved a sigh of relief as he watched the video feed from the soldier's camera. I think this thing is about over. Not quite yet. Mr. Dot President. We still have rogue elven elements across this region. 43. Chapter 92. Let the politics begin. 1650 June 7, 2020 CE. 1125 Sun 38, 
196 e 40 miles from the forest of origin, the survivors of the leader security company were tied up after they surrendered. We have 23 severely injured on our side and 11 severely injured elves. No need for additional helicopters for extraction. We only have 9 captured uninjured. 1745 June 7, 2020 CE, Nashville, Tennessee. Jack noticed the words breaking news flashed across the TV. The White House has just announced that the president will be speaking soon in order to most likely declare an end to this war. Jack slightly frowned since that wasn't that much news. It was a war against a nation more than 70 years technologically behind, it was over before it started, he didn't expect many people to be overly celebratory about it or take notice at all, Ajinport, Bum Kingdom, a group of men sat around a table, one of the men stood up, the results were, as predicted, not in our favor, it is of most sense that those stinky peasants won't vote for us, at the head of the table. Duke Philpot looked sternly at the one who stood up. Earl Fawns, sit down. This is a meeting. Not one of your parties. Now, now, who put you in charge? You aren't even a duke anymore. None of us have titles anymore. But we will address each other as if we didn't lose them. Understood? Now sit down. Earl Fawns grumbled as he sat. The duke shook his head. Now, do any of you have anything else you would like to share before we begin? Baron Pettit spoke out. Duke Philpot, I have a proposition. The Duke nodded. Should we join forces with the monarchist party? The Duke frowned as Earl Fawns chuckled. Earl Corbeld responded, They are just a bunch of wealthy peasants who bribe the king. Once they realize they can do the same thing with a democracy, they will turn on us. A few murmurs rose up and the nobles in the room started random discussions. Duke Philpot raised his voice. Quiet, quiet. Enough with the acting gentleman. We all know what we want. Baron Bacon shook his head. It isn't possible. The Duke smiled. It is. These Americans will leave eventually. And how are you certain they are going to leave? Before I lost my title, I was able to come upon the previous king discussing with the Americans about their planned withdrawal after the country became a democracy. I didn't hear everything but I'm sure they are planning to leave. And how are you planning to do this? Our personal armies have all been disbanded. I have a few of my most loyal personal knights at my beck and call. I'm sure you all still have those who greatly favor you and we can always find dissenters to fill the rest of our ranks. All the fallen nobles looked at each other. So, it's agreed. It's time to gather an army then. Once these Americans leave, we will strike. Now, meeting. Earl Fawn stood up and interjected. But what about afterwards? The Duke narrowed his eyes. What do you mean afterwards? The Americans won't miraculously disappear after we overthrow the current government. They will be back and we have no power to stop them. I'm sure you have seen their weapons of war? The room fell silent. 0244 June 8, 2020 CE. 0422 Sun 39, 196 E. Port City of Philaneers, Elve Nation. Anne Phelan spoke into the Magi radio microphone. The war is over. Taron Van Harris has been arrested and will be judged for his crimes against the sentient and his reckless pursuit of war. Elves, I hate to say this but the tri youth has to be said, hard times are upon us. We have lost nearly a half of our population. Our cities have been devastated and our capital city has been sunk underwater. But we will rebuild. As the new leader of the Elven Nation, I shall guide us back to the old glory days of the Elven Kingdom a prosperous and peaceful nation. Anne Phelan greeted the American delegation. Before we begin, I want to know. When will your forces start leaving? The head of the delegation, Ambassador Henry Cole, frowned. President Janine Rose, you have to understand, we cannot leave immediately, but I promise my elves that. Your promise is your promise. We only promise to leave once the current situation is over. Anne Phelan raised an eyebrow. But it is over. You still have rogue elements in your country. We can deal with it ourselves. You are sure? Anne Phelan slightly frowned. We know you don't have an army and are in no position to fight even against rogue units. Anne Phelan fell quiet for a few seconds, took a deep breath, and sighed. I understand that. Sorry. That was unreasonable of me. I'm under a lot of pressure right now. We understand that. Once the last of the rogue units have surrendered and you have created a force capable of keeping the peace, we will leave. That is good to hear. This leads me to the main thing I'm here about, the treaty, correct? The ambassador nodded. Usually, 
The terms will be discussed between delegates from both nations. However, you have expressed the wish to directly negotiate it. Is that true? Yes. My current government is being set up and I'm not sure who to trust and who has the ability to do this. Then let's begin with the talks. 30 minutes later, we will keep Taran in our custody and will decide what will happen to him at a later date. And Fela nodded. I would prefer you have executed him so we don't have anyone who thinks they can put the leader back in power. We don't want to make a march either, but we will hold off on what to do with him. With that out of the way, here comes the harder part of our demands. And Phelan slowly spoke. Go ahead. My government is looking at placing a brigade strength military unit here in order to keep an eye on things. And Phelan stood up in an instant. What? He sat back down quickly and took a second before talking again. Then what's the point of you promising me you will leave if you actually aren't? I only say we are looking into it. We are also looking into leaving completely. But we want to ensure that you elves don't start another war. And Phelan chuckled. We have literally been devastated. Our economy and population is gone. We can't start another war. But I'm pretty sure your country has a few that won't be afraid to. And Phelan became quiet. I'm afraid so. But as long as I'm in power, I promise you, there won't be any aggression from us. I will rebuild this country and I will clean up the brainwashing that Taran and his further did. We can't just take your word for this, and we aren't sure how long you can stay in power. I will stay in power for as long as I can. And you are sure you are able to keep a country of fanatics under control? You are very susceptible to an assassination or coup attempt. Not all elves are fanatics. Henry didn't say anything. And Phelan pursed his lips. Okay look, if the situation gets bad, I will inform your government and ask for help. But I will not allow any humans on our land. During times of peace, there will be severe consequences for everyone if I do. This isn't a threat. This is just a fact. Henry nodded. I will pass this along to my government. Good. What else? We would also like to continue providing aid to your nation. You will not have to pay it back. We hope that by doing this, we can improve relations with elves. I cannot decide on that right now. Anne Phelan was stuck between a rock and a hard place. He knew that he needed that aid but the problem was that it came from humans. He himself didn't care but that didn't matter. The average elf would care. The food aid that the Americans were providing were already being avoided by some of the elves. Somewhere in the elven nation, target is direct front fire. The stallion that was racing across the fields burst into flames as a shot from the Abrams tank went through it. Good. That should be the last of them in this area. They really suck at guerrilla tactics. It won't be long before we are sent back home. Man, I can't wait. The native population here is just too hostile. Fifty. Chapter 93. Negotiations, Demands, and Reconstruction. 0644 June 8, 2020 CE. 0622 Sun 39, 196 CE. Port City of Philaneas, Elven Nation. This has been quite the productive meeting, President Inaneros. We have gone a bit over time and we would also like to contact our government for further instructions so we shall continue this tomorrow. And Phelan looked at Henry's outstretched hand questionably. Ah sorry, it is an etiquette for hum, Americans to shake hands at either the start or end of an important meeting. Ah, noted. And Phelan stood up to shake Henry's hand. Thank you, Americans. I hope we come to a final treaty soon. Thank you, President Inaneros. I hope so too. I would also like to inform you that the delegation from the Magus Imperium will also be arriving tomorrow. And Phelan thought for a few seconds before raising his eyebrow. And which country is that? Henry chuckled a bit. The country your nation had invaded. A worried look washed over Anne Phelan's face. Ah, yes, the Magus Imperium. I nearly forgot. Noting Anne Phelan's expression, Henry nodded. Do not worry. Their demands will not be over the top. We understand that your nation is currently suffering. We have requested that they do not demand any land concessions. However they may require payment for damages that you have caused. As soon as the Americans left, Anne Phelan immediately called in his aides. They had a lot of work to do. Double, Elf Nation. Double was a city that was untouched by the war since it was on the other side of the mountain. An elf messenger carrying a satchel hanging from his shoulder knocked on the door of a house. An elf female answered the door. The messenger looked at the letter he held. M apostrophe S dot Rowaran? Yes. What is it? He handed the letter to her. I'm sorry to inform you that your husband has died in the service of his country. 
A shocked expression passed over her face as her hand holding the letter trembled. The messenger lowered his cap to cover his eyes. I'm sorry for your loss. The messenger left and traveled two houses away to knock on another door with such a large number of deaths. It took time for the news of it to reach a family member. In fact, Anne Phelan had to set up a system in order to speed up the process. Messengers were hired to be in charge of delivering it to their jurisdictions whenever they received the letters. It wasn't long before they were called the messengers of grief. A Bellinum, Magus Imperium. Emperor Arstant watched as people scurried around. The sound of hammers and the clanking of machines were everywhere. Rubble littered the ground of a once bustling city. Buildings have just begun taking shape again. Emperor asked and listened to his head economic advisor who had a grim look. This will take a year or so to completely rebuild, probably more for the people to come back. How much damage has all this done to our economy? The entire southern region has taken a massive hit. It is predicted that there will be more than a 90% reduction in regional productivity. We are also afraid that the entire southern region is vulnerable to a famine. Although originally self-sufficient, the amount of farms and cropland torched by the elves have slashed food production by nearly 75%. We need to send food from the northern region southward. Do we have enough? The economic advisor looked through his notepad, to prepare for the worst. We are thinking of implementing a ration. However, I'm hoping we can demand food from the elves. I will add that onto the list of demands. 1022 June 8, 2020 CE White House Quincy walked besides the president as they went down a hallway in the White House. Aren't we being a bit too lenient here? They wanted to enslave all of humanity and would have succeeded if we weren't here. The elves are one hell of a powder keg. If we push it, it's just going to explode in our face. We won the war. Why do we have to be so cautious? We have to reshape these elves whether they like it or not. Set up a military government. Show them who is in charge now. Quincy, after our experience in the Middle East, nobody in their right mind will want to take on this mess. I don't want to be remembered as the president who created another Afghanistan or Iraq. I'm actually glad there is somebody sensible in charge of the elves. You are taking a risk with that Anne Phelan. I'm willing to take that risk lest we be dragged into another endless war. 1645 June 8, 2020 CE Washington DC In a park, Quincy sighed as a man in a t-shirt and sweatpants sat down beside him. Trevor, I'm getting sick and tired of these meetings that I have to travel to. We don't want to risk having someone listening in on our conversation on the phone. I won't be surprised if your phone is bugged. You know that as well as I do that this is the best place. Not many people. No cameras. We can see our surroundings. Not suggesting we change. Just complaining. So how did it go? I couldn't convince him. Give me some time. Trevor looked around before continuing. General. I want you to remember there's a couple million dollars for you on a line here. Quincy put his head back onto the bench and looked at the sky. Don't worry. I will find a way. I always have. I have heard plans that Congress wants to decrease the military budget. That cannot happen. With no more countries to export to, my company wants. Needs that money. Understood? You will get your contracts. I promise. Just continue developing those jets. You don't have to worry about anything. Good. The CEO expects to see results. 0332 June 9, 2020 CE. 0446 Sun 40th. 196 e, Port City of Philaneers, Elf Nation. The members of the American delegation looked behind them as the door to Anne Phelan's office opened. Anne Phelan stood up. Welcome. The delegation from the Magus Imperium I presume. I'm President Janane Rose, the current leader of the Elves. The Americans have informed me of your arrival today. The Magusians barely acknowledged Anne Phelan as they walked in and sat down in the chairs that had been prepared for them. I'm head diplomat Jeff Benedict. We are here not to negotiate but to demand compensation. I understand that and I would like to apologize on behalf of all elves for what we have done. Jeff's frown deepened. Thousands are dead and tens of thousands are without homes. All major cities in the southern region of my country are nothing but ashes and rubble. An apology will not suffice. What are your demands? A delivery of one million tons of agricultural foodstuff once every year for the next two years. A total of 2 million tons of steel, bricks, and wood each. 500 tons of gold. 250 tons of silver. Other than the food, 
We expect them to be delivered to us within four years. Blueprints for every single weapon design. Guns, ships, Magitanks, everything. We also hope to receive intact and working weapons. 100 Magitanks. 6,000 small arms of each type. 1,000 of each type of Thor gun which includes artillery, anti-tank, and anti-air. Two of your latest battleships, one carrier, five cruisers, five destroyers, and ten submarines. 100 of each type of military aircraft. We also expect manuals on how to use all of them. These are our main demands. More minor demands are included in these documents. Jeff threw a heap of papers onto the table. The room fell silent. Anne Phelan's face was of pure shock. Even the Americans were showing some shock. Anne Phelan quickly okay. I will say this right now. Some of these demands can't be possibly met. We are willing to change some of these demands. However, the result will be under our terms. Somewhere in the elven nation, Taran looked grimly around his cell. After being thrown onto the helicopter and flown for a few hours to some city, he was then locked into a cell. There were human guards who constantly kept watch on him. He mulled over his current situation while sitting in a corner. He couldn't believe it. He lost. He lost everything even though it went so well at the beginning. He was supposed to be the chosen one to lead the elves to victory. Sixty miles from the forest of origin. Ara walked up to Vujuin. Glad to see that you are okay, Field Marshal. You can drop the honorifics now. It's over. Ara nodded. What was it all for? Vujuin looked up to the sky. One elf's hatred. Ara thought about it for a few minutes before replying. I guess that was all it was. They watched as the elves who had been led by Vujuin started dispersing. They had all been disarmed but were not taken prisoner. The elven officers, like Hara and, had to stay. The officers had all been transported to Vujuin to make sure everyone was present. Ara turned to Elark who was beside her. Colonel, want to go for a drink? After all this is over, we are prisoners of war. I'm not sure if we will be able to see each other. The war is over. All we have left to do is answer these humans some questions and then go home. Ara stopped at that. Hey, Colonel. Do you have a house? Yes. Why are you asking? Ara chuckled. I got disowned by my parents and kicked out of their house for expressing my wish to have a career in the military and not marrying. I also never bought a house. You were a major general and you never bought a house. Your pay would have been more than enough. Ara rubbed her neck. Never thought I needed it. I would have bought one after I retired, but my retirement kind of came early as you can see. I also don't think houses are that common now. 47. Chapter 94, The Home Front 0755 June 10, 2020 CE Kansas Keith led his horse back to the stable. He found his father in the house making himself coffee in the kitchen. Dad, I heard you hired a lot more new employees and bought a few acres of new land. Are you sure we are able to cover the costs? His father took a sip from his mug. People can't import crops no more so us farms have to do more work. I'm expecting a lot of demand this year. Keith poured himself a cup of coffee. There are rumors that companies are trying to find replacements though. Taking a gamble here, I don't expect any place on this world to have the capacity to fulfill what our country needs. They sat down drinking. I'm a bit worried about you, Dad. I'm already 32 years old. Let me help you manage the farm. Keith's further chuckled. I told you I won't let you have the farm until I kick the bucket. I may be getting old but I still have some energy in my bones. All right dad, I will go tend to the pigs. You will never stop asking, will ya? Nope. Until you agree. Keith's further chuckled again. In your dreams. 0815 June 10th, 2020 CE. 0707 Sun 40th, 196 E. Port City of Phylaneers, Elven Nation. For your main demands, here's what I can do. The demanded gold, silver, steel, wood, and bricks in four years. The military blueprints, and the manuals. Anne Phelan stopped. The one million tons of agricultural foodstuffs. Is difficult. If not impossible, we have suffered population loss of nearly 50% and I'm not sure what the state of my country's farms are like at the moment. We are currently depending on American aid. I also cannot guarantee the intact and working weapons. Our weapons inventory has been greatly depleted. From my knowledge, the small arms and Thor guns should be possible. However, the ships and planes are not possible seeing that most of them have been destroyed. Jeff frowned. The one million tons of agricultural foodstuff is non-negotiable. 
We do not have enough to feed our population since you elves burned down almost all the cropland we had in the south. As I said, we are depending on American aid. We also do not have enough to feed our population. I'm sorry, I'm not able to help you with that. Well, you elves should have thought about that before starting a war. I may have a solution. Both turn to look at Henry. My country may be able to cover some of the foodstuffs. We are already providing aid to you elves. We should also be able to provide food to the Magus Imperium. However, I currently cannot give exact figures on how much. 1345 June 10, 2020 CE Washington DC President Hayes was being informed of all the agreed terms so far, a pull out of all US forces once rogue elements have been dealt with. The aide stopped to let the president speak. I know this is something we set as a term but I really have a bad feeling about this part. I would like us to leave as fast as possible. Krausen shook his head. We can't just abandon them. They don't have a functioning military capable of countering the rogue units. I just don't want ourselves to get into another decade-long war. I want us to leave this powder keg as soon as possible. Not every insurgency will turn into that and I fully believe in the military's capabilities against an already defeated enemy that is 70 years technologically behind. The aide waited for them to stop so he could continue on about the terms. In the ocean, a fishing ship 50 miles away from New York hauled in a net. Quite a good catch we have today. The newest member of the crew, Paul, checked out the fish in the net. Hey Curtis, the fish really look odd. These are redfin tuna. They have the looks of one but are not actually tuna. Tastes a bit different too. Isn't that name a bit misleading? People didn't want to make up new fish names and we don't know what the people of this world name their fish. It's good for business too. Is there supposed to be a hole in the red fin tuna? Huh. No. Untie the net let me take a look. Paul pointed to the fish that had a gaping hole right through its side. Huh. As Curtis studied the fish, Paul gave a shout. Hey, guys, there's quite a lot of fish like that in here. Damn it. There goes our profits. Guys, could this be the rumored kraken? We are well outside the restricted areas and this hole seems small for something like a kraken. Atlanta, Georgia. In an office room, a few people sat around a long rectangular table. A person at the head of the table started talking. The impact of being transferred here has just started to mellow. Domestic sales have kept us afloat but we had to lay off a few hundred employees. We are hoping to start expanding operations into other countries soon. Has the government agreed to let us begin expansion? There are still restrictions on travel but we are sure we will be able to begin in three months. The people in the marketing department have a concern though, we have to test the taste of the people in this world, they are not sure if our current lineup of products will suit the tastes of the people here, especially the different species. I heard the McDonald's in the Boom Kingdom have been getting good sales on Coca-Cola and Sprite. That is only one country out of many and they are populated by humans. We will definitely try to identify possible local flavors. We will offer up our current lineup before beginning to present local flavors. Somewhere in the northern frontier, a group of people trekked through the forest. Are you sure there is gold up here? I don't feel comfortable in such foreign places. Just don't eat any of the plants or whatever. According to the EPA, there's no animals here so there shouldn't be anything to creep you out. Aren't the EPA and CDC still operating here to make sure there isn't any weird stuff? Are you sure we can be here? They are just making sure there are no harmful and invasive plants or insects or whatever. This land is full of natural resources and the government is selling it to companies. We common folk have to stake a claim too. Um, I thought we were just here to find gold. Why are we talking about land all of a sudden? You are thinking so small, brother. Just grabbing some gold and leaving? No. 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 We claim the land where we found the gold. That land will be rich with it and we will be rich too. They soon happened upon an open field. Pretty sure this is corporate land. Exxon Mobil, maybe? Multiple oil derricks dotted the field. Ain't what we are searching for. Let the corporations go for black gold. We are going for real gold here. Come on. Let's not get too close. We don't want to be spotted. 1345 June 10, 2020 CE. 1036 Sun 40th. 196 e. Industriopolis, Mac Imperium. Pomponia had a very unhappy face as she greeted the American diplomat. I'm getting sick and tired of being here. You promised me I will be able to step down soon yet here I am. Still on the throne. 
The diplomat nodded. Apologies for that. We have run into issues on what to do for your country. Establishing a unified democratic state holds great potential to create unrest which we seek to avoid. How about you place another monarch here instead of me? One more willing to rule? We are seeking ways to break up the Imperium into a collection of independent democratic states along cultural and ethnic lines. Keeping a monarch is not looked upon well in my country. However, it is possible for a monarch to remain as a figurehead. I just want to quit and go back to my house. Just get me off of this throne. I swear if I have to spend another year with these noble assholes and their haughty parties. 1345 June 10, 2020 CE 1036 Sun 41st, 196 E, Port City of Philaneas, Elven Nation. I am hoping that by meeting your country's demands, that your country will allow the return of elven prisoners of war. I have been informed that most of the prisoners are being held by your country. Jeff turned to the other Magusian diplomats. Henry interrupted. My government insists that you agree upon this. More elves returned means that the elves will have more capabilities to provide you with the demanded materials. Moreover, Keeping these elves locked up is a waste of resources and food that could be used to feed your own population. 45. Chapter 95 Conspiracies 0604 June 11, 2020 CE 0602 Sun 41st, 196 E, a prison in the Magus Imperium. Simon languished on the bed in his cell. If not for the small barred window, he would have lost count on how many days he had been stuck in his cell. If he was right, it had been eight days since he was allowed outside. At least they hadn't forgotten to feed him, however little it was. Suddenly, there was banging. The door to his cell opened. Get out here you elves. Was over. As he walked out, Simon noted the crowded surroundings. Human soldiers were everywhere and armed to the teeth. The warden appeared in the middle of the hall. We will be escorting you out of here. You are all going home. Now, behave yourselves. Do not dare try to attack us. You all lost the war, you hear me? If you do, we will kill you and we will find any of your family and kill them too. Understood? The warden didn't wait for a reply and looked at the still closed cells down the hall. Now, you boys will be let out once they leave. Can't have all of you out at once. 1822 June 11, 2020 CE on the streets in Arlington, Virginia. Two men flanked Daniel in the streets. One of them looked at him. Are you Daniel McCormick? Yes. What may I do for you too? He lowered his voice. We need you to come with us. We are with the FBI. He showed his badge. Daniel instantly froze as his mind went into panic mode. He took a deep breath and barely said a word. Okay. They led him to a nondescript black car. They entered the car and the agents started driving. The other man started talking. We have found out that you have discovered some information that was supposed to stay confidential. If you release that information, you will be considered committing treason. Daniel nodded. Do not report it under any circumstance. There will be consequences. Do not try to hand it over to the media. We will be monitoring you. Daniel nodded again. The car stopped. Now get out. Daniel looked around as he exited the car. He was in front of his house. Daniel fumbled with his keys and opened the door to his house. Then he stopped. Cold dread filled him. He remembered something that he was too panicked during the car ride to tell them. He had already sent the information to the FBI. He shut his door and started rationalizing to try to calm himself. It was to their organization so it should be fine. And he sent it before they even came to talk to him. Maybe it was even that tip that caused them to approach him. If not he was probably going to have a meeting with them quite soon but hopefully they would let him off the hook. A few minutes later, the agent driving laughed. Well that guy was scared shitless. His legs seemed to have turned into jello. I don't think we have anything to worry about. And here I was afraid this dude would be more resistant. An hour later, Pentagon. Good job you two. The two FBI agents sat down. And when are we getting paid? I have struck a nice deal with a certain corporation. Once the money comes in, I will pay you too handsomely. The agents nodded. Understood General. Quincy looked at both of them. Not threatening me? It's bad for business, you know. And this isn't Hollywood. Ha. Huh? Never thought there would be anything as handy as corrupt FBI agents. Corrupt is a loaded word, General. We prefer capitalistic. White House. Mr. President, this is from the FBI and is classified confidential. 
They recently received a tip that someone was tampering with the civilian casualty reports. Upon further investigation by the FBI, this seems to hold true. Civilian casualty reports? Were the numbers faked? Yes, the numbers are much smaller than reality. I want a corrected version as soon as possible. Classify that as confidential. I want to see it before anybody else. President Hayes' face grew pale as he skimmed through the papers in the file. These numbers. This can't get out to the media or any public report. Understood? Tell the FBI to keep it under wraps. Find the guy who reported this. When did the data start being manipulated? From the earliest reports, it seems to be a couple days after the military began landings on the Elven Nation. Does the FBI have a suspect for who is tampering with the data? None so far but they are looking into logs connected with the tampered data. Tell them to put more people on it, people who can keep their mouths shut. This will be a political shit show if it gets out. I don't want to be the president who gets remembered for authorizing the killings of thousands of innocent Magusians. And get me Quincy, he needs to explain what the hell is with this collateral damage. Were we firing artillery and dropping bombs indiscriminatingly? Wait, don't get him. Actually, don't inform any member connected to the military. Someone from there could be the one who did this. 0128 June 12th, 2020 CE. 0344 Sun 42nd, 196 E. Primopolis, Magus Imperium. Renout waited near the entrance of the refugee processing center. A soldier guarding the gate walked to him. Look, Renout, you should go home. There's no point sitting out here. The higher ups are about done with you too. I don't have a home to go to, I just have to wait, I know they will be back. Run out, I know you have a job and home now. I don't want to actually kick you out like I'm supposed to. Settle down, don't spend all your free time waiting here. Find some friends, maybe a wife even. Run out didn't answer, tell you what? I will ask around occasionally to see if any Hewitts came through here. I will visit you the moment I'm informed. Run out still refused to respond. Look run out. You have been here every single day and it's gotten to the point that I know you by name, don't you see how ridiculous this is, if I don't kick you out, they are just going to send someone else who will use actual force. If you take my offer, you will still get informed, you get what you want and I don't need to either bully you or get fired from my job. Fine. 0450 June 12th, 2020 CE. 0525 Sun 42nd. 196 e. Port City of Philaneers. Henry invited the Magusian diplomats for a new S. Magusian only discussion. After the greetings, Henry gave the Magusians an announcement. My government has agreed to provide food aid. However we will not be sending as high as your original offer. My countrymen need that food. And if you can't supply that, the elves will. Your countrymen do not need that much. We are willing to supply up to 500,000 tons of food a year for the next two years. Anything in excess of that will be utterly ridiculous and does not reflect the needs of your population. We know what you are trying to do. Jeff hissed. The elves are supposed to be punished for their wrongdoings. We have all punished them enough. Their country is in ruins. They are being forced to give over resources and military information. To starve their population would only incite future conflict. 1403 June 12, 2020 CE. Kansas. Keith. Have you heard? The government is sending even more food aid. I knew this would pay off. Keith glanced at his dad. It's only going to the large corporations, dad. They won't ask such a small farm like ours. Don't you get it? Those corporations will be too busy trying to fulfill those government orders that the local markets are gonna turn to us small farms. This is the jackpot. Who? Keith's further started doing a weird dance. Somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Dive. 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 The USS Cheyenne, and Los Angeles class submarine, started going deeper into the ocean. 44. Chapter 96. The world ain't black and white. 1024 June 13th. 2020 CE, Pentagon, multiple men entered Quincy's office, Quincy looked up in a jolt but quickly put a smile on his face, what can I do for you fine gentlemen, one of them spoke, general, we need you to come with us, may I know what for, one of them showed their FBI badges, we have a warrant for your arrest for suspicions of corruption and intentionally falsifying government documents, Quincy chuckled, and you have evidence for this, the agent nodded, we have someone who has confessed and linked it to you. You can't arrest me just because someone said I did it. The agents approached him. 
In addition to that, we have more than enough proof to convict you. Face the wall in an interrogation room at FBI headquarters, Washington, D.C. Quincy looked up from his handcuffs as a person flanked by Secret Service agents entered the room. R. Mr. President, how nice to see you. I can't say so myself Quincy. Ronell sat down as the door closed. Quincy, you betrayed me. You betrayed the oath you swore. You betrayed this country. Quincy frowned a bit. I have been loyal to this country all my life. And I believe all my actions have been done on its behalf. I feel no guilt for my actions. Ronell shook his head. You are a lucky bastard. We will be handing you a lighter sentencing but the information about civilian casualties must never be revealed. Your career is ruined, Quincy. Quincy smiled. And what if I tell everybody about this? How are you going to stop me? You will be sentenced for charges of treason. And you think that will stop me? You can take what we are giving you right now. Serve a few years in prison. Get out and live your life. Or we can convict you of treason and make you serve life in prison. White House Tom Nolan, the FBI director, sat across from Ronell. Mr. President, are you sure about this? If I do reveal this information, sure he will get what he deserved or the collateral damage would not be negligible. We are talking about domestic outcry and if it spreads outside, straining of foreign relations. If I could kill that bastard I would but goddammit we lived in a civilized country. We can make him disappear, sir. Even though it has been rare, we have made people disappear before. God no, that's a line that I will hopefully never cross. I hope so too. We usually only do it to those who endanger national security to an extreme degree. 1355 June 13th, 2020 CE A corporate office in the US. The FBI have found plausible evidence but have not declared who the now former general has taken bribes from. The court date currently has yet to be set but it is currently predicted that he may face multiple years in prison. The arrest has sent shockwaves through the government. General Griffith was considered a close friend of the president. The TV was shut down. A man sitting behind a desk shook his head. Truly disappointing. He got caught. Another man standing nearby spoke. Doesn't matter. It won't be traced back to us. I made sure of it. The sitting man waved. I'm not worried about that. You have always been good with this. Such a shame though. We still have a couple of congressmen under our thumbs so we should get that approval nonetheless. Would have been nice to have more people in the Pentagon on our side too. Especially the fact Quincy has so many connections. Maybe we can try with a different one or whoever is replacing him? Let's lay low for a bit. The government will turn a blind eye if we don't act up for now. The standing man nodded. But we really need more people in. We have really taken a hit from not being able to sell to foreign countries anymore. Even our country has a limit to the amount of weapons it can buy. We don't want to bankrupt our only customer. What about foreign countries in this world? I have tried to convince them to let us sell our weapons to the people of this world but they were extremely against it. It's a tall order. People are going to find it suspicious that there are congressmen willing to sell high-tech weaponry to basically barbarians. Somewhere in the northern frontier, soldiers, with rifles drawn, wearing baggy clothes and gas masks approached them, hands in the air, you are all under arrest for trespassing on restricted land. The group raised their hands, fuck you and your corporations. A few minutes later, the soldiers loaded them onto Humvees. Where are you taking us? To a medical facility. You will be put under quarantine. This is for your health and safety. You will also be interrogated. Ha! Huh? So concerned about our health and safety. Yet you let these corporate bastards roam around taking all the good stuff. All company employees have to wear protective suits while operating here. You are violating the law so you will be charged upon return to the state's White House. In the Oval Office, the President spoke to Austrian Rhodes, the director of the CDC. I am concerned about the returning soldiers. You are certain we do not need to take heavier measures to ensure that an unknown disease will spread here? I mean you recommended that I authorize the use of protective equipment in the northern frontier yet you show no concern about our soldiers being deployed on unknown land elsewhere. Mr. President, from what we have learned from the natives' records of diseases, there should not be anything concerning. There are many diseases with similar symptoms as the diseases in our world. From what we have seen, the anatomy of the humans in this world are exactly the same as ours. If a soldier did catch anything, it would most likely be the common cold. 
We have yet to discover any overly concerning diseases which we do find strange. This world does not seem to have smallpox or any worse infectious disease. It's delightful but concerning at the same time. Then why are we so concerned about the northern frontier if the diseases are similar and there's nothing actually concerning? From what native records state, humans have not stepped foot on that place for nearly a thousand years. We have no idea what could be up there. It is supposedly devoid of animals but it is vital that we are certain, for all we know, there could be a small animal carrying around this world's smallpox. 1424 June 13, 2020 CE Hundreds of miles away from Hawaii, Pacific Ocean, the USS Cheyenne continued on its exercises. A sonarman looked surprised as his sonar screen went off. Captain we are detecting multiple signatures on the sonar. Fast moving seems to be torpedoes heading straight towards us. The captain of the USS Cheyenne, a testament to his experience and training, quickly started ordering commands. Engage countermeasures. Acoustic decoys were deployed from the submarine and jammers tried to confuse the incoming torpedoes. Dive, dive, dive. The submarine started diving further down. The blips on the sonar screen got closer and closer. The sonarman stared hoping that the blips would pass over them. The submarine jolted as the torpedoes slammed into it. 1500 June 13, 2020 CE White House, an aide ran up to Ronell in a hallway. Mr. President Urgent report, we lost contact with the USS Cheyenne, a Los Angeles-class submarine a couple hundred miles away from Hawaii. It was doing exercises by itself. Ronell frowned. Are we certain it's not any communication error or some equipment malfunction? We have lost contact with them for the past 30 minutes. We are currently dispatching ships for search and rescue. Could it possibly be those sea creatures that have been plaguing us? We are not certain at this time, sir. But if it is, it will be well outside their usual zones. Sir, inform the members of the National Security Council of the situation. I want to stay updated on this. Inform me the moment we get anything new. How many sailors were on that submarine? It has a crew of 129. What ships are on search and rescue? Various ones from the U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard. I am not able to give you the specifics of much. Get me quink. Get me the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Nelson Bird? No, I meant the one that's now chairman. Stephen Decker, 35, Chapter 97, The Incident. 1509 June 13, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. While walking towards the Oval Office, Ronell ran into the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Stephen, I know you haven't had much time to settle down on this unexpected promotion but the current situation is worrisome. What's happening? I need details. All we know is that the USS Cheyenne has not responded to attempts to communicate with it after it missed its scheduled status report. The only three scenarios where this is possible is either the communication equipment broke, they have sunk, or a mutiny occurred. I don't believe a mutiny is likely so we are between the first two probabilities and going under the assumption that they have sunk. They entered the Oval Office where the Kralson was already there. Mr. Dot President, Kralson, I have been informed what's happening. We don't know much do we? As much as anybody other than the submarine crew themselves knows. We know the general area of where the submarine sank. According to the Chief of Naval Operations, they were conducting regular exercises there. Are we certain that the submarine has sunk? Kralson shook his head. We have to expect the worst. Ronell's face looked grim. Stephen, if they are sunk, what are the crew's chances of survival? If they have, it's slim. If they met an accident while on the surface, then it's likely we can save them. But they were most likely submerged. Depending on how far they have sunk, we may not be able to rescue them. In addition, based on the amount of damage the submarine took, oxygen production could have been knocked offline and they could be running out of oxygen. I cannot say much more until our ships arrive. What ships are we sending? Kralson answered. The USNS Impeccable is en route. They are an ocean surveillance ship capable of searching for undersea objects in a wide range. We also have multiple Ali Burks that have been stationed in Hawaii too. P-8 Posidons, maritime patrol aircraft that can deploy sonar boys, will be the first ones there. The Undersea Rescue Command has also already been deployed. They are trained specifically for rescuing crews of disabled submarines. 
They are currently en route with the hose dominator that's carrying a submarine rescue diving recompression system which can rescue the crews. 30 minutes later, they had quickly moved into the situation room. Ronel stood with his hands on his hips as he watched the screens that displayed the data coming from the sonars. They have detected what we believe is to be the USS Cheyenne. It has only slightly deviated from its planned route but it's sinking. Good news is that it is still within range for rescue. Bad news is that it's sinking fast. They are only about a thousand feet down but the SRDRS only has a range of 2,000. We will have to get to them fast. 1,625 June 13, 2020 CE Submarine location in the Pacific a submarine rescue diving recompression system, SRDRS, was lowered into the ocean from the hose dominator. Two members of the Undersea Rescue Command went along in it. Washington D.C. Ronell watched the camera feed from the SRDRS as it was lowered to the submarine. There were holes on the side of the USS Cheyenne. It doesn't look good. Stephen nodded. There still could be survivors. It's equipped with watertight doors that can seal off flooded areas. From what I have seen, those holes seem to be a match. It is definitely done by that damn sea creature, Kralson. I want a restriction on all submarine activities in the Pacific. Call them back to their home ports. A few minutes later, there was a video feed from the commanding naval officer of the rescue operation on screen. We have confirmed survivors from the URC. The SRDRS is being attached to the submarine hatch to get them out. Excellent work Admiral. The people in the Situation Room watched as the SRDRS started positioning itself on the hatch that was at the back on a long end of the submarine where the engine room was situated. Haggard sailors started coming into the SRDRS. Once full with 16 people, it started its ascent. Clapping started on the screen. The SRDRS started its descent again in order to rescue more crew. The officer on live video looked grim after receiving a report. Mr. Dot President, we are expecting casualties, it's likely more than 90 deaths. It seems only the sailors in the engine room survived. A heavy silence fell on the room. An hour later, Dr. Munoz, the biologist hired to help identify the mysterious sea creature, was in the situation room. The screen had been set to a bunch of slides. A photo showed up on screen. It was similar to a swordfish but its nose was much larger and connected from the skull to the jaw. From studying the damage done by it, we have made what we believe is a possible model of the sea creature that is currently attacking us. I do not guarantee this is correct but it's our best scientific guess. For all we know, it could be the tentacles of a giant sea monster, but if we are correct, we are currently identifying it as the lance fish because of its semblance to a swordfish except with a lance instead of a sword as its nose. Ronell posed a question. And how is it drilling holes through the sides of ships and submarines? We are not exactly sure but we believe that its nose is as strong as tungsten. They vary in size. The largest capable of drilling a hoi about a yard in diameter. The smallest is capable of drilling around a few inches. The biologist switched to a slide that showed the sizes of the lancefish. Stephen asked next. And how do we kill it? I would need a captured specimen in order to find a way to kill it. On that note, I believe that their presence is growing and it's concerning. The waters around us may soon become inaccessible. Dr. Dot Munoz changed the slides to a gif that showed swathes of red growing in the oceans surrounding the Formidum continent. Kraus nodded. We did have reports of fishing ships catching fishes with holes in them in the Atlantic. Ronell sighed. They have spread over there too? Krausen shrugged we aren't sure since it's only one occurrence and it's just fish. Dr. Dot Munoz continued. That is why we suggested that they vary in size. From photos, the fish seem to have been pierced in a similar fashion as the ships. Ronell shook his head. Any idea on how we can find a specimen that can tear through metal like paper? It's not like we can catch it with a net. You probably will have to kill it in order for me to study it. So you need us to kill it for you to find a way to kill it? 1705 June 13th, 2020 CE 1132 Sun 43rd 196 E. Primopolis, Magus Imperium. An American diplomat bowed before Emperor Rostant. Thank you for granting me this audience at such a late hour. No need for this. We are glad you have helped us against the elves and are supplying us with food. What do our American friends need? We are wondering if you have any knowledge of any sea creatures capable of drilling through metal. I do not believe so. Why do you ask? 
Our ships have come under attack by sea creatures capable of such and we are hoping you would have any information. Arston sat there thinking, let me call in one of my scholars knowledgeable on this. A few minutes later, a person in scholar robes stood beside the emperor. Other than the records of the large birds on the Formidum continent, there should be no other hostile creatures in that region. Most records of creature attacks come from the birds. I have never heard of any stories of attacking sea creatures capable of drilling through metal. 1822 June 13, 2020 CE Golden, Colorado, in the National Earthquake Information Center, the seismograph started printing out jagged lines going up and down. The geologists in the room started looking at that specific seismograph. This is weird. This is from the seismic stations in Hawaii. What's weird about that? Isn't it usual for Hawaii to experience earthquakes? Oh yeah, you are new. It's the first earthquake in Hawaii we have had ever since Earth was transferred here. The plates had stopped being so active there. Seems to be quite minor though. 40. Chapter 98, State of the World. 1029 June 14th. 2020 CE, Riverside National Cemetery, California. This is one of the single most devastating events that our country has faced since coming to this new world. We are here to honor the 93 brave sailors of the USS Cheyenne who have died in service of this great nation. We shall, after a few more minutes to finish his speech, Ronell was escorted to the side. Rifles were fired in three volleys as a lone trumpet played. Families of the sailors stood crying before their loved ones' graves, five miles from Los Angeles. A Marine Protector class patrol boat, the Uskk Pike tried to keep up with the speeding yacht. By order of the President of the United States, no boats are allowed into the Pacific Ocean, please remain within five miles of land, you are currently going beyond five miles. Turn back, I repeat, turn back. Failure to comply will result in your vessel being boarded and those aboard arrested. The yacht completely ignored the commands of the Coast Guard ship and continued sailing there. 50 calories machine gun on the Coast Guard ship opened up in a small burst. There were multiple splashes of water in front of the yacht, the yacht veered to the right and quickly came to a stop. Shouts came from the yacht, don't shoot, what the fuck are you doing? Go, you are not getting paid if you don't. I don't want to fucking die, this isn't worth it anymore. Eight coast guardsmen with rifles boarded the ship down on the ground. Hands up, the small group of people on board quickly raised their hands. The coast guardsmen handcuffed the crew and a middle-aged couple on the yacht. The husband, who seemed to be the owner of the yacht, was visibly upset. What is this, Nazi Germany? You have no right to stop me from traveling where I want. The sailors started leading the arrested towards the Uskk Pike. Sir, there has been a restriction ordered by the president that does not allow ships on the Pacific Ocean beyond five miles of shore. If you wanted to go out to sea, you could have followed the shoreline until you got to the Southern Ocean where there is no restriction. Do you know who I am? You can't do this to me. If you aren't the President of the United States, I don't care who you are. No one is allowed to sail into the Pacific Ocean unless with prior approval. You and the others on this ship will be detained and the ship will be seized. Well you can go fuck yourself. And you have the right to stay silent. 1745 June 14, 2020 CE Washington DC The FBI Director sat down across from the President. The court date for Quincy has been set. Oh. It's about this matter, I nearly forgot about Quincy, as long as he is charged within the bounds of the law, I don't give a damn anymore. What if he breaks the agreement? As I ordered before, I want people to keep an eye on him and make sure that he doesn't talk and that if he does talk, make sure that it doesn't spread. What do you want me to do to him if he does talk? Ronell became quiet, after a few seconds, he sighed, just make it look like an accident, alright, have no records of it. Of course, Mr. President, we have done this before, I'm trusting you on this. Major Research and Development Center, Magus Imperium, multiple elves in green cloaks looked over the engine of a night Majapanzer, the elves seem to have decided on using a hybrid approach. Combining both mechanical and magical, isn't it similar to our hybrid engines? Yes but they have applied magic to all of their technology. Even their ammunition is special. Well. In our view the elves technological aim is still hybrid like ours. Ours is pure and true magic, I'm concerned about the American mechanical technology. The emperor seems to be really fond of those toys that they gave him, 
One of the researchers who had a white beard shook his head. He has been invested in magical research since the moment he became emperor. He won't let all that investment go to waste, not including the superiority of the American mechanical technology. Won't these elven technologies that we know have encouraged him to still use a hybrid approach? He is very interested in these magic batteries that the elves have. We just need to present something even better. Our research should be coming into fruition soon. Although I cannot guarantee it to be better than what the American mechanical technology has to offer, I can say it will be better or comparable to elven technology. 0222 June 15, 2020 CE 0411 Sun 45th, 196 E Primopolis, Magus Imperium Emperor Arstant looked up at the sky. Soldiers in uniform were marching down the street in the view of his palace. Civilians lined the sidewalks cheering and waving. Wyverns flew overhead at the military parade. A squadron of P-51 Mustangs flew in V-formation. While they now had the capability to build P-51s, their air force was mainly still reliant on Wyverns. The major researchers were studying the idea of enhancement magic in order to improve the Wyverns and hopefully make them comparable to these P-51s. On the ground, a platoon of four M4 Shermans drove down the road side by side followed by columns of A1s. The difference was stunning. The A1 was just a long rectangular box with a 75mm gun in front. It had riveted armor and looked unwieldy. Artillery and anti-aircraft pieces pulled by trucks followed the tanks. More soldiers followed. Emperor Arstant smiled as he watched them go by. 0430 June 15, 2020 CE 0515 Sun 45th, 196 E Aster Air Base, Magus Imperium Welcome, Emperor Arstant. We are happy to let you view the first shipments of food aid that are being given to your country. An American colonel guided Arstant through the airbase. A gigantic gray aircraft sat on the field next to the paved runway. Arstant looked at it in wonder. The size of it was unlike anything he has ever seen. And, that's an aircraft? Yes, a C-5M Super Galaxy. It is a transport aircraft capable of carrying vehicles, men and equipment. We are sending food aid to your country using aircraft such as this. It's currently carrying about 100 tons of food. Arstant got himself out of staring at it. That doesn't sound like the agreed amount. More shipments will come soon, mostly via ship but the first few will be by aircraft such as these to provide fast trade. A random airfield, Magus Imperium. Simon waited at an airfield where he was scheduled to be transported back home. At least 40 other elves were besides him. American soldiers stood nearby keeping a watch on them. They were very laid back. Somewhere in the elven nation, groups of Chinooks carrying soldiers departed from an airfield. An infantryman looked out from the window besides his seat in the Chinook. This is much faster than expected isn't it? We are already going home. There are still some poor sods that still need to keep stuff under control. We were just fighting the remnants of a defeated army. They will do fine without the rest of us there. The prophecy shall be fulfilled, it will be to the will of the Great One. The gate will be opened soon. Our darkness will spread to the other worlds. Guttural noises could be heard among what seemed like a crowd of jet black flesh. Some of them had sticks with skulls on them. 33, Chapter 99, Welcome to California. 0655 June 15, 2020 CE. 0627 Sun 45th. 196 E. Elven Nation. Mr. President, the Americans have begun their general withdrawal. There are still contingents of American soldiers present for security reasons. A Phelan smiled a bit. What is the current state of our military? About 10,000 strong, sir. Armed mostly with small arms. We have a few magic bands, barely a company. We have no air force or navy to speak of. I think that's good enough. I'm shrinking the military budget and redirecting the funds to rebuilding efforts. Give me the agriculture minister's update on the food situation. We just need half of the amount of pre-war farmland to feed our population so we should have more than enough. Good. I'm glad they started running again. What's next on my agenda for today? Sir, you still have a meeting in the afternoon with the American diplomat to discuss how the Americans wish for how the elven government should be restructured. Duly noted, Athta. A Phelan started looking through a bunch of reports and briefs. And Phelan didn't know how long it was but a knock soon came on the door which he answered. Selene popped her head in. And Phelan, lunch is about ready. After, join us too. 
We are having Petron fish cooked with salt nut sauce. Walking the hallways of his office, home, Anne Phelan looked at Selene and sighed. We have a long road ahead of us don't we, Selene? Yes, we do. Anne Phelan, yes we do. Washington D.C. It is highly likely that he will serve life in prison. Ronell turned off the TV and drank a sip of water. This has got to be the strangest thing a president has ever experienced. Fucking elves. Magus Imperium. This is not true pure magic. On his throne, Arstant looked upset at his major researchers. Then what is true pure magic? Their ammunition doesn't even consist of metal, but it requires a vehicle to fire from. Arstant shook his head. He looked up at the ceiling of his castle while thinking about what kind of crazy idiots he had hired. We don't even use magic as ammunition. We use metal for ammunition. I don't understand what you are trying to do. We are aiming to not even need the vehicle to fire from. Pure and true magic. Have we not told your majesty? This is the true pursuit of our institution. To do away with using anything mechanical and to embrace magic as humans' true future. Our empire accepts both magic and the mechanical and has accepted them both since our founding. I see no reason to embrace only magic. Of course, of course. We will not persecute those who embrace machines but this will be a magic revolution, your majesty. Do you have anything to show for it then? Of course. A few hours later. A testing ground somewhere in the Magus Imperium. The Emperor, multiple major researchers, and members of the military crowded together on a field and looked towards the sky. A single wyvern flew about, the wyvern suddenly sped up to incredible speeds. The Emperor widened his eyes in amazement. Then the wyvern then suddenly slowed down to regular speed. One of the major researchers nodded, and that is an example of enhancement magic we are developing. How fast was that? That should have been about 650 miles per hour much faster than an elven jet aircraft. Why did it slow down so fast? Well, this is why we haven't shown it to you yet. It's not perfect. We will still need to find a way to extend it beyond a few mere seconds. We are making progress. Arstant frowned. But aren't the Americans much faster and their high speeds can be maintained? Your Majesty, I understand that they have amazing mechanical technology but our empire has had its roots in magic. Our empire was founded on the basis of protecting users of magic. To switch focus onto just mechanical technology in pursuit of the Americans would be a mistake because we will never see or find out the potential of magical technology. 0720 June 15th 2020 CE, Fremont, California. Luke Fuller. His mom bellowed from the floor below, wake up or you are going to be late for school. Luke jolted awake and sat in his bed blinking. He looked at his clock. 8.05, I'm coming. Give me a second. Rushing downstairs after brushing his teeth and slinging his backpack on his back, his mom greeted him. His golden hair was still wet from the water he splashed on his face. Your dad is already off to work. It's 7.25. You are going to miss the bus. He slid into his seat at the table after setting his backpack down. He choked down a scrambled egg. Not if I eat fast enough. Luke got onto his bus right on time. Hayden, how you doing? Hayden just nodded in response and looked out the window. Luke rolled his eyes and sat right next to Hayden. He put in his earbuds and started to doze off. A sea of people was in front of him as Luke walked in through the doors that lined the front entrance. Sundale High School. He was going to finally graduate in nine days and get out of this place. He was supposed to graduate earlier but due to the chaos following the transferal, the start of the school year was pushed back by two weeks which in turn pushed the end date back by the same amount. As Luke looked through his locker, a voice caught his attention. Luke. Luke greeted the tall figure approaching him. Jackson. What's up? Jackson fist bumped Luke. Doing good. You ready for the party two weeks from now? Of course. You ain't chickening out like last party right? Luke snorted. Of course not. It's the graduation party. Who do you think I am? Jackson laughed. The guy who ditched me last party. Look, I wasn't feeling that comfortable. Jackson placed an arm around Luke's shoulder. Jackson's brown hair went down to Luke's shoulder. You have to get out of your shell, you know. You are some weird mystery in between an extrovert and introvert. I will show you the way of the extrovert. Trust me. I'm an expert. You may even find a girl or something. Luke laughed nervously at that. Luke stared at Mr. Johnson's mouth. As Mr. Johnson talked about whatever subject he was currently in. He couldn't quite remember. He really didn't see the point of class anymore since he already got accepted into Santa Clara University. 
Then his whole body started shaking. He got out of his stupor just as the teacher shouted, Get your head down below the desk. Stay under your desk until the shaking stops. Keep a hold of one of the legs of your table. Luke dove under his desk and got his hands on one of the legs. As the shaking turned even more violent, he closed his eyes as loud crashes indicated objects falling onto the ground. His hand wrapped around his desk's leg even firmer. The crashing noise stopped but the shaking wasn't done. A couple minutes passed by until the shaking stopped. The room became eerily quiet. Everyone, stay under your desks. Luke opened his eyes. The floor was a complete mess. He could see the rest of his classmates under their desks. All seemed to be okay. A few minutes later, his teacher spoke again. It seems safe enough. You can come out but don't touch anything that fell, especially the lights. Mr. Johnson was still looking around at the damage. While Luke and his classmates got a hold of themselves. Earthquakes weren't uncommon in California but it had been a long time since one occurred. One of his classmates raised their hands. When can we leave? We are going to wait until directions come from the speaker. Feet could be heard out in the hallway. One of his classmates looked back at Mr. Dot Johnson from the door. Hey. The other classes are leaving, it's been a few minutes, the speaker is probably broken. Mr. Johnson looked out of the door. All right, we are evacuating to the assembly area outside. Everyone, stay together. Luke got into his mom's car. After everyone assembled in a field and the teachers made sure that everyone was accounted for, school was dismissed for the rest of the day. Hi mom, is the house fine? Only some things that fell off. Your father is coming back from work. Sweet. I also have no school for the rest of the day. Fort Irwin, California. Two soldiers looked around as the shaking subsided. Huh. That lasted a couple minutes. I think it's a high magnitude earthquake. That didn't do much damage though. Man. Is it just me? Or are these earthquakes getting more and more frequent? California probably had all that pent up and is releasing it right now. Like how someone holds in their farts and then lets them all out later. You. You really have to be that disgusting? What? It's an accurate description. You could have settled for anything else but you just had to settle with a fart analogy. If I don't make you queasy every day, then I haven't done my duty. God damn it, man. A knock came on the door. Date, Bishop. You two all right? Bishop answered. Yes, Staff Sergeant. We are fine. Well if not for Tate's analogies. 0759 June 18th, 2020 CE. San Francisco, California. Officer Andrew Molano arrested in his police vehicle. He was still exhausted from helping during the cleanup efforts after the earthquake. It has now been three days since the earthquake and the streets looked quite normal. Somewhat scrambled noises start coming out of his radio. Andrew put the radio to his mouth. There are reports of multiple strange animals on Baker Beach. Possible 10 to 91 volts. Advise 10 to 0. 10 to 4. We'll investigate. 37. Chapter 100. Battle of San Francisco Part 1. Blood on the Sands 0814 June 18th, 2020 CE, time at San Francisco. San Francisco, Andrew put his police car, a Ford Taurus, at the parking lot of the beach. It was a familiar place since he had been to this beach many times, with his kids. The view of the Golden Gate Bridge just to the right was impressive as always. Being a Monday morning, the parking lot only had a few cars and the beach was mostly deserted. A man with white hair came running up to him. Officer, were you the one who reported the sightings of strange animals? Yes, it wasn't like anything I have ever seen. About the size of an elephant. And where is it right now? It went back into the ocean just a few minutes after it came out. The man pointed over to a direction towards the left. Andrew got out his notepad and a pen. All right. Can I get your name and what you were doing here? Tony Corals. My wife and I were just walking along the beach. I recently retired and it's not crowded at this time so I decided we could use a nice walk. Andrew nodded while scribbling on his notepad. Thank you, Mr. Corals. I'm Officer Andrew Molinoz with the San Francisco Police Department. Do you have any photos or videos of the animal? Any other witnesses? No, I didn't bring anything that could have recorded it. Other than my wife and I, I don't think anybody else saw it. I might be able to get it on one of the cameras in the area but can you describe what it looked like? Um, it was jet black, had a long sharp nose like a, like a swordfish, stumpy four legs. Thank you, I would also like to see the exact location of where the animal came ashore. Thank you for the information. Mr. Corals, I recommend you stay clear of the beach for the time being. 
Andrew walked back to his patrol vehicle and sat down in the driver's seat. The sand where Mr. Corals led him was imprinted with countless large round holes. If it was an animal, it would have been about the size of an elephant. He picked up his car radio. This is Officer Molinos. Go ahead, just question the person who made the report. The animal seems to have returned to the ocean. I'm suspecting it's an unknown elephant-sized New World animal. I would suggest that people stay clear of any nearby beak. Screaming cut him off. He looked outside of the window. Shit. He rushed out of his car and drew his pistol. Mr. Corals was hanging in the jaws of an elephant-sized, jet-black, four-legged creature that had a long, pointed nose similar to a jousting lance and a long tail. The monstrosity's front legs were bent in a fashion so that its mouth could get to Mr. Corals without having its nose jutting into the ground. The creature crunched Mr. Corals's torso. A few people ran past Andrew. He shouted to the horrified viewers, Get off the beach. Andrew emptied the magazine of his Sig Sayer P226 at the creature. The .40 S and W bullets bounced off the scales of the creature. Andrew's eyes grew wide as numerous similar creatures of varying size started coming ashore. Even more jet black backs of the creatures started emerging from the waters and swimming towards the beach. The creature he just shot at looked up from its meal at him. Blood covered its mouth and dripped onto the sand, coloring it red. Shit. The creature started lumbering towards him. Running into the parking lot, he found it empty. He got back into his car, slammed the door shut, put the car in drive and slammed on the gas. The tire screeched on the gravel. I repeat 11 to 99. This is Officer Molinos. Multiple large and dangerous creatures have come ashore at Baker's Beach. One of the creatures has eaten a man and is currently pursuing me. My pistol had no effect on it. I need help immediately. Understood. More units are on their way. I'm notifying SWAT. He got onto the main road. A few cars drove by and there were people walking on the streets. He switched on the lights of his sirens and the loudspeakers. I repeat, evacuate immediately. Stay away from the beach. Down the road to the left, trees fell as one of the creatures emerged next to the road. A car swerved to the left to avoid it. Traffic needs to be cleared from the surrounding area. The creature is on the road. The blaring sirens indicated that other units were nearby and closing in. 1134 June 18th, 2020 CE. Time at Washington D.C. Washington D.C. In the hallways of the White House, an aide ran up to Ronell. Mr. President. Urgent report. San Francisco is under attack. What? By whom? Unknown jet black creatures came ashore at Baker's Beach. Local law enforcement are currently responding. Ronell stood there, rubbed his face and grimaced. Fucking hell. Fremont, California. Luke played with his pencil as Mr. Johnson droned on about history. The PA system came on. We have received information that a dangerous situation is occurring nearby. All teachers are advised not to let students out of the classrooms. Please be prepared to evacuate at a moment's notice. The class went quiet at that. Mr. Johnson frowned. All right. Seeing that this isn't occurring in the school, we are going to continue with the lesson. Mr. Johnson went and locked the door before returning to the front of the room. 0905 June 18th. 2020 CE, Fort Irwin, California. Tate went up to the staff sergeant. Staff sergeant, why are we being deployed? Some strange monsters are attacking San Francisco. Now, you two, get to your Humvee. We will get more information on the trip there. We have no time to waste. A few Humvees, M1A2 Abrams, and M2A3 Bradleys were already gathering on the concrete field. 1022 June 18th. 2020 CE, San Francisco. Andrew had retreated further inland with other police units. They had evacuated most of the civilians behind them. The creatures weren't that fast but it took time to evacuate civilians and form a line of defense to hold the creatures back. Along the way, he got handed a police AR-15. He stopped his patrol vehicle in front of a SWAT van and got out. The intersection of Kirkham Street and 19th Avenue in front of him was full of patrol vehicles. A line of patrol vehicles blocked the intersection. Dozens of police officers and SWAT officers were present. A SWAT officer approached him. Andrew greeted him. Officer Molinos, I was told to report here. We just arrived here too. Seems like we are gonna try to stop them here. Stop them here? We killed a few of them while helping with evacuation. I'm sure your AR-15 will do fine. Pump a bunch of 5.56 in them and they will die. Their head is the best place to shoot. 
Avoid the nose though, bullets literally ping off of that. Andrew frowned. San Francisco isn't that good of a place to defend. I heard they were coming ashore from the ocean all around the city. We are forming a line of defense along State Route 1 up to the Golden Gate Park for the west side, a line on Page Street for the north side, and starting from Page Street going down, a line near US 101 for the east side. They are still units outside of this defensive perimeter trying to evacuate civilians though. Behind the SWAT officer, a police sergeant shouted at two other police officers. You two, check those houses for civilians. If there are, tell them to leave immediately. We got incoming. A single creature came barreling down the street. Andrew opened up with his AR-15. SWAT officers flanking him also opened fire. The creature took multiple hits to the head before going down. Cheers erupted but soon died down as screeches were heard. We got more. Washington, D.C. The multiple screens in the Situation Room showed muted news channels. The channels were showing footage from news helicopters in San Francisco. Groups of the jet black creatures were shown coming ashore in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mr. President, they are coming ashore everywhere along the San Francisco Bay. We have reports of them on the S trips at the Oakland International Airport. We aren't sure of the numbers but it seems to be in the hundreds. Local law enforcement is being overwhelmed. Ronel furrowed his eyebrows. Stephen, what military units are responding? The chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff responded. The California National Guard has been alerted and their quick response forces should be responding within hours from now. The Air Force should also arrive close to that time. The one Marine Expeditionary Force at Camp Pendleton should arrive within five hours. The 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment is currently preparing to travel to San Francisco. They will need more than 10 hours to mobilize and reach San Francisco. We are limited in our response capabilities. Since a majority of our forces are in transition to return after the Elven War. Ronel sat back on his chair. Now, do we have any idea what these are? I guess you are here for a reason. Dr. Munoz nodded as Ronel looked at him. Mr. President. I am certain that this is the lance fish I was talking about. The nose definitely fits the bill. Of course. I guess the fish part of the name is not true now and it's most likely to be a reptile. Lance reptile. Doesn't have that nice of a ring to it. Lance fish is better. Stephen interrupted Dr. Munoz's mumbling about the creature's name. From the reports from local law enforcement, it seems to take multiple bullets from a 5.56mm rifle to kill it. A .50 sniper round kills them quite easily though. A few minutes later, an aide entered the room. Mr. President, we have various sightings of ships approaching San Francisco. Ships, civilian or military? Um, we aren't sure if we can even call them ships. 36, Chapter 101, Battle of San Francisco Part 2 the initial wave. 1036 June 18th, 2020 CE. San Francisco. Gunfire opened up from the police line on another creature that lumbered towards them. Andrew felt his AR-15 jerk back onto his shoulder every time he pulled the trigger. The creature quickly went down. There were corpses of these creatures spread across the street in front of them. Some were huge, while others were much smaller. The rotor blades of a helicopter could be heard above him. Andrew looked up as a police helicopter positioned itself with its side facing down the street. A single shot came from the open side door of the helicopter and streaked down the street towards an unseen target. The police sniper on the helicopter stayed silent for a few minutes before they opened fire again. A shout near him caught his attention. Andrew. It was a co-worker he was close to at his station. Oh, Terry. You are here too. Terry nodded. Just got here. Where you get that R? I don't remember you being issued one. Terry was carrying an AR-15 that was issued to him. Someone had a spare and gave it to me while I was evacuating people. That's good. I don't think we have to do much now though. They got a 50 calorie sniper on that helicopter. It definitely put a stop to those monsters. The shots from there. 50 calories started becoming constant and faster. Every few seconds, the sniper opened fire. They seemingly only stopped at intervals to reload. Somebody further behind him shouted. We have a wave of them. Brace yourselves. A few minutes later. Holy shit. Open fire. A massive black was just lumbering towards. There were so many creatures that they seemingly blended in together. Andrew put his empty magazine down on the ground and reached for another one of the magazines that he kept on his waist only to grasp at nothing. Anybody got a spare mag? 
Terry tossed him to and continued shooting. Andrew slammed the magazine in and gave Terry a quick thanks. The mass of creatures slowly but surely inched towards the police line. A SWAT officer besides him shouted, I don't think we can hold this. Andrew didn't know who but somebody responded. Keep shooting. Don't let them through. Fucking hell. Start backing up. Washington DC. One of the TVs in the Situation Room was set to a local news station in San Francisco. San Francisco County, Marin County, San Mateo County, Contra Costa County, and Alameda County are under evacuation orders. All civilians are required to evacuate from these counties. Sonoma County, Napa County, Solano County, and Santa Clara County are under evacuation warning. Although not required, all civilians are suggested to evacuate further inland from these counties. If you live in a county under evacuation orders and are unable to evacuate by your own means, it is recommended that you travel to one of these locations for evacuations. The screen switched from a new anchor to a list of locations. Please locate the one closest to you on this list. Stephen had a concerned look on his face. Mr. President, that's nearly 5 million people under evacuation orders. Are there any reports of large fish sightings in Hawaii or Guam? Krausen shook his head. None whatsoever so. People there are being restricted from accessing the beaches. The Hawaii National Guard and the military units on Guam are on high alert. Ronel sighed. We can only hope for the best at this point. When will the Air Force arrive in San Francisco? Within minutes. Sir, have we found out what those mysterious ships were? Any more information on that? We have sent a drone to investigate. It will take some time to arrive. Well, do we have any information we can gather now? They are described to be the same jet black as the creatures ashore but closely resembles a ship. That's mostly what we know from witnesses far away. A aide walked into the room. Mr. President, the governor of California is on the phone. Give me that. 1055 June 18th. 2020 CE Fremont California even though class was supposed to end 20 minutes ago Mr Johnson continued with his lesson dot the PA system went on again please remain with your teachers and class as you exit towards the front of the school your parents have already been informed of the evacuation location you will be able to meet your parents there please refrain from asking your parents to come pick you up at the school as we want to avoid traffic jams Please remain calm and follow all instructions from your teachers. Luke looked around. There was a moment of silence before voices arose. What's happening? Oh my god. Some people got out their smartphones. Mr. Johnson had a surprised look on his face but it quickly wore off. Okay everyone. The students' voices drowned out Mr. Dot Johnson. Holy cow. We're under attack by strange monsters. Look at this. A few of the students crowded around the smartphone of the student who said that. Mr. Dot Johnson bellowed, everyone. A silence fell on the students as they looked at Mr. Dot Johnson. I don't know what is happening but we will be following these instructions. We will be leaving the classroom in an orderly fashion. Please stay together and do not stray from your classmates. Luke exited the school building following his classmates. He just had to keep an eye on Mr. Johnson's bald head. A line of yellow school buses lined the school driveway. There were also three police cars. Two near the exit of the driveway and one behind the line of school buses. His class came to a stop at the pavement near the buses. One of the front office ladies was talking with Mr. Johnson. Shouting caught Luke's attention. On the grass a few yards away, a police officer and a school faculty member were arguing with a woman. Why can't I just grab my child and go? The school faculty member shook his head. Sorry, ma'am, we aren't giving anybody preferential treatment. You can follow the buses to their location, but it's my child. Mabel Darrison, can't you just go find her really quickly? The policeman took over the conversation. It will take time to do so and we don't have time. We aren't sure how long we can hold them off. That is why we aren't letting parents pick up their kids. We can't have traffic snarling up the evacuation. Those things will get here before even half the students would be able to get picked up. There will also be people trapped in a traffic jam. It will be a massacre. Please return to your vehicle. You may follow the buses towards the evacuation site. All students will be returned to their parents there. The argument continued but Luke couldn't listen for much longer. Mr. Johnson turned to the class. Quickly, onto the bus everybody. Luke sat down by himself. He didn't really talk much to the classmates he had in Mr. Dot Johnson's class. Another class started boarding the bus. 
A person sat down to Luke and he brightened up as he saw who it was. Hayden, your class is on this bus too? Hayden nodded. Luke did a small laugh. Ha, huh, what are the chances? A third class started filing in. Luke looked around. Isn't this bus getting a bit crowded? Mr. Johnson shouted. Everyone, please sit close together. We need at least three people per seat. 1113 June 18th, 2020 CE. California State Route 58, 70 miles from Los Angeles. Bishop was at the wheel staring at the back of a Bradley as they traveled at 35 miles per hour. Tate looked out from the window of the Humvee at the vast expanse of nothingness. A long convoy of Bradleys, Abrams, and Humvees were on the highway. Tate sighed how long till we get there? Should be eight more hours. 36. Chapter 102. Battle of San Francisco Part 3. Airspace Denied. 1122. June 18. 2020 CE. San Francisco. Two of the patrol vehicles that had made up the blockade were pushed aside. The third one was overturned. The monsters had pushed back the firing line but the withering fire that the officers put up kept them at bay. While Andrew loaded another magazine into his R, the radio on his shoulder crackled. How's the overall evacuation going? The monsters are swarming the park. There are about 20% complete. How much longer is it going to take? A string of curses from a third person interrupted the radio conversation. Hold for a moment. Lieutenant Beckenridge. Who is this? Please keep this frequency reserved for important information. You can curse in your assigned frequency. This is fucking important information. This is Sergeant Adam Jang. The damn things have broken through at the intersection between Page Street and Devazadero Street. We are retreating. Fuck. Gunshots could be heard over the radio. Sergeant? Where are the units they're retreating to? There was a moment of silence. Sergeant? Are you there? Sergeant? There was another moment of silence as Sergeant Jang didn't respond. Lieutenant Beckin rigged. Yes, sir. To everyone on this frequency. We are planning a full back line. We will inform you of the location soon. Pass the word. He had forgotten to switch the frequency to the one that he had been told when he arrived at this intersection. He was glad he forgot though. Shit. Terry didn't hear Andrew's cursing but he did notice that Andrew had stopped shooting. Terry stopped firing and raised his voice over the sound of the gunfire around them. What's the matter? Need more ammo? No. Terry shook his head. What? Speak louder. No, someone reported over the command frequency that the monsters broke through at a point on Page Street. My children go to school near there. Jesse told me that schools have been ordered to be evacuated to the evacuation points. I'm sure they are all right. Andrew patted on his phone in his pocket. I'm gonna go make a call. Jesse is on her way to pick up our children at the evacuation point. She can also pick up yours if you want her to. Will she be staying there or evacuating? Most of Richmond District is overrun now so I don't think going back home is a good idea anymore. Most likely staying and waiting for us. If the situation gets worse, she will evacuate with the kids. I will call my kids and tell them that Jessie is picking them up at the evacuation point then. I think you should do it later when we don't have fucking monsters a couple yards away from us. Andrew shook his head. Family comes first. I got to make sure my kiddos are fine. I think you guys can handle it if one guy leaves for a bit. Then call Jessie for me and tell her about your kids. Also tell her I'm doing fine, all right, got it. Thanks, Terry. With that Terry continued shooting. As Andrew began walking away from the firing line, he looked up as he heard and then saw jets fly over them. Soon after, multiple explosions were heard. The package has been dropped. We are Winchester and will RTB. RTB is authorized. Have a safe trip back. The two F-15s banked to their sides so they could circle back, multiple objects on radar coming towards us from behind at high speeds. Break formation. Break formation. Deploying countermeasures. Flares and chaff popped out of the F-15s as they climbed upwards. Multiple projectiles sped past them straight into the sky. I have been hit. Copy. How bad is the damage? Are you able to return to base? It hit my left wing. I'm unsure of the damage but the aircraft still seems capable of flying. I will try to make it back to base. This is Eagle 2. I have a visual on the damage. Half of Eagle 1's left wing is gone. Less than an hour later, Nellis Air Force Base Nevada, the F-15 that was missing half its left wing started its descent onto the runway. Eagle 2 stayed in the air above making loops. The pilot sweated as she focused on keeping the aircraft in control. 
The landing gear came out and the F-15 started touching the ground. The pilot and her weapon systems officer clambered out of the aircraft and took a look at it as the ground crew started running up to her. Half of the F-15's left wing was sheared clean off. Washington, D.C. Mr. President, one of our F-15s that was conducting an airstrike over San Francisco was nearly shot down from an unidentified source. It has landed safely at its airbase. However, it brings up the fact that what we are facing could possibly have surface-to-air missiles. Ronel frowned. Surface-to-air missiles? Are we facing a technologically comparable enemy? We aren't certain. From current information, a high-speed projectile collided with an F-15 when it began its return trip from bombing the Lance Fish. Tore off its wing but did not explode. Do we have a visual of their ships yet? We have an RQ-4 Global Hawk from Beale's Air Base approaching the area soon. Sir, Fremont, California. Chattering filled the bus as Luke classmates looked through videos of the monsters invading the Bay Area. A few others around him were making phone calls like him. Luke felt relieved as his mom's voice came on through the other side. Have you heard what's happening? Her mom's voice, tinged with worry, replied. Are you all right? Where are you right now? I'm fine, mom. I'm on a school bus. We have police escorts. The school told me that they are taking us to Levi's Stadium and that our parents can pick us up there. I know, the school informed me. I'm on my way. I'm glad you are okay. Your dad got off work and is also on his way. Stay there until we arrive all right? Okay. Luke couldn't finish as he felt as if he was flying. In a snap, pain pierced through him. Luke, are you there? Hearing his mom's voice, Luke opened his eyes and blinked. A group of blurry colors filled his vision. He heard gunshots and shouting as he got out of his pain-filled days. Realizing that he was lying on his side with something cold touching his face, he sat up to look around. The bus was flipped on its side. He was sitting on the windows, which were thankfully laminated glass so it didn't shatter into glass shards. He could hear groans from a few others on the bus. Looking around, a few were sitting up like him but some were still lying down. Hayden was lying beside him with his eyes closed. Luke started shaking Hayden. Hayden, you all right? Hayden responded with coughing. Luke looked around for where the voice came from and found his phone. His smartphone survived thanks to the heavy-duty case and screen protector he had put on it. The screen was cracked and his mom was getting hysterical though. Luke picked up his phone. What? What hit your bus? Do you need me to pick you up? Are you hurt? Whoa, whoa. Slow down there mom. I'm all right. I, uh, I don't know. Just, uh, just give me a few minutes. I need to get out of the bus. Luke looked towards Hayden who had opened his eyes but was staring off into space. Hayden, you good? We need to get off the bus. 1234 June 18th, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. We have just gotten a visual of the ships that were approaching San Francisco. They seem to have landed and are concentrated on Ocean Beach. It will be on screen momentarily. The large screen that covered a side of the situation room soon displayed a beach with rolling waves. On the beach were multiple figures that all those in the room were staring at. Ronell's frown deepened. What the hell are those? 35, Chapter 103, Battle of San Francisco Part 4, Reinforcements. 1235 June 18, 2020 CE, Washington Boulevard, Irvington, California. The emergency exit door at the back of the bus was opened. A policewoman peeked in every body. Get off the bus. The monsters are attacking. Without thinking, Luke grabbed Hayden and slung Hayden's arm over his shoulder. Luke's mind was still taking in what had happened. Around him, people stood up to get off the bus and some, like him, carried and helped others. Since the door was sideways, everyone had to climb to get out. Luke gave Hayden to a person outside and Hayden was pulled out of the bus. When Luke himself got out, he was met with utter carnage. Police officers were trying to get the rest of the students off the bus. Whilst another waved and shouted at them to go somewhere. Go, go, go. Come on. Off the street and into that building. A couple people pushed past him to get to wherever the officer was telling them to go to. The background noises were deafening. Around the street. Multiple police officers had assault rifles in their hands firing towards something. There was a metallic smell in the air that Luke had never smelled before. None of the other buses that their bus was following were there, most likely having already fled. A person patted him on the back. Luke turned to see Mr. Dot Johnson looking at him with concern. Luke barely made out what he said. Luke, 
we have to go. Come on. Mr. Johnson had rarely addressed him before so it came as a shock that he remembered his name. Luke replied with only a nod and started walking towards where everybody else was going. Behind him, Mr. Johnson's voice vibrated in the air amidst the gunshots. Stay together. A blast of cool air hit him as Luke entered the Wells Fargo Bank. Students crowded the place. The amount wasn't surprising as three classes had been jammed onto that one bus. Two police officers and the teachers of the two other classes were also there. They had their attention on the students lying on the ground. Close by, a police officer was shouting into their radio, We have people bleeding here. I need medical here. Luke quickly looked away when he saw that the girl that the policeman was tending to had an arm covered in blood. A shout came from the door behind him. Is everybody here all right? This position is collapsing. We have to move. The police officer tending to the wounded girl shouted back. We have people who are injured. They need medical assistance. Luke looked at the door that he had entered from. The voice that had told them that they had to move came from another policeman. No time. Just carry them. I'm not sure how much longer we can stay here. We are going on foot. Mr. Johnson, who Luke had not noticed coming into the bank, walked up to the officer shouting from the door. Luke heard Mr. Johnson raised voice but he didn't make out what he said. Luke noticed that Mr. Johnson looked unhappily at the police officer. Luke could hear the policeman's reply. Sorry, I can't do that. I promise you that we are gonna find some way to transport you guys there. But we have to get away from this area first and the best way is by foot. One of the teachers shouted. We need some people to help carry the injured. Amidst the commotion of people carrying the wounded, Luke soon found Hayden sitting down, leaned against the wall. Hey, Hayden. Hayden had his eyes open and seemed to be less dazed. Hey, Luke, you alright? Thanks for saving me. Luke nodded. Come on let's go. We have to leave. Hayden nodded. Washington DC. On the screen, the beach was populated by large humanoid creatures with leathery jet black skin. Some of them had horns on them while others did not. They were all holding chunks of rock that somewhat resembled a spear. A few were grabbing crates and moving them onto the beach from their ships. Their ships looked very unnerving. It resembled a cargo ship without a bridge. It was the same skin texture as the humanoids and multiple eyes dotted the ship at random locations. While most of their ships had eyes moving around and looking in all directions, the eyes of one of the ships seemed to be focused on the drone. A giant red toad with a giant box-shaped growth on its back jumped into the camera view of the beach. It turned towards the drone. In the situation room, a voice pierced the quietness and shock. I think they noticed the drone. A blast of objects came out of the box on the back of a toad. The screen suddenly became black. Ronel immediately spoke up. What happened? What was that? It seems that the drone was shot down by that giant toad thing. Steven spoke up. Their munitions are not guided at all. It's more akin to a canister shot. Ronel turned his attention to him. Canister shot? When you fire a canister shot out of a cannon, the shell turns into multiple pieces in order to damage a large group of something. That's what's happening here. They don't have the accuracy so they just blanket the sky with shrapnel or objects. Ronel shook his head. What are we even facing and where did these things come from? I have to say they look like things from the depth of damned hell. Those anti-air weapons do seem alive. Maybe we can't get that scientist back in here to give us an explanation. Dr. Munoz tapped his chin. This could possibly be an artificial modification of the creature. On the other hand, it could be naturally occurring. If the species ate flying animals and those animals flew at heights similar to fighter jets, it is possible. Albeit you would only expect something like this from a fantasy world created by an insane maniac. But I can't tell you where it came from. This new world has quite a different biological makeup than our world and we haven't cataloged all of it. Kralson interrupted Dr. Dot Munoz's musings. Mr. President, we are setting up a task team to scour through satellite images in order to locate their origins. We are hoping for results soon. San Francisco. Andrew walked back towards the firing line. Having just finished his phone calls, a shout caught his attention. One of our jets are going down. He looked to the sky. A fighter jet was spinning out of control in the sky. Both of its wings were missing. Twenty minutes later, they are breaking through. Andrew kept firing his R but it seemed as if every monster he downed, another came to replace it. The entire firing line had started backing up once again. A voice came through his radio. We have set up another perimeter. 
7th Avenue for the west, Frederick Street and Dubose Avenue for the north, Folsom Street for the east. The National Guard will be arriving soon. Retreat. Andrew turned his patrol vehicle around and followed the other police vehicles. After driving down the road for a few minutes, they saw two Humvees rushing towards them from the opposite direction. There, 50 calories from an California National Guard Humvee started laying down lead on the monsters behind the fleeing police vehicles. A few minutes later, Andrew and the others had gotten to 7th Avenue safely thanks to their retreat to being covered by the two Humvees. A couple soldiers rushed around setting up sandbags at the intersection. Andrew noticed a police lieutenant was talking with a soldier. We are with the California National Guard and will be providing assistance to these creatures known as Lance Fishes. That's the dumbest name I have ever heard. Not my choice. A couple scientists have decided to name them that and the government ran with it. There are only ten of us here but these monsters seem to be slow mindless meatbags so it shouldn't be that hard to deal with. Our mission is to help you hold this perimeter until the Marines, Army, and additional National Guard units get here to push them back. We could definitely use the additional firepower. The police lieutenants looked at the Humvees. I think we can hold them back with these. You say these are 50 calories machine guns? Yep. 50 calories snipers seem to kill these monsters in an instant so that's good. Andrew rested his hands on his R. Two Humvees with 50 calories sat in the middle of the intersection, their machine guns aimed down the road. Camp Pendleton, California. V-22 Ospreys lifted off from the airfield. Following them were AH-1Z Vipers. 29, Chapter 104. Battle of San Francisco Part 5, Not So Pleasant Surprise 1310 June 18, 2020 CE San Francisco, California The riveting noise of their 50 calories machine guns firing reverberated through the air. The lance fishes were collapsing by the dozens into pools of their own purple blood. The sound of their 50 calories was deafening, since he didn't have ear protection and the adrenaline from earlier was wearing off. The noise from their 50 calories was actually awful. Andrew was certain he was going to be suffering from tinnitus for the rest of his life. Other than the SWAT, none of his other co-workers wore ear protection so they were all pretty much guaranteed this fate as well. However, they had to keep firing in order to keep the monsters at bay. Even two 50 calories machine guns were not enough at holding back a tidal wave of monsters. Washington Boulevard, Irvington, California, Luke pulled Hayden to his feet. You sure you can walk on your own? Yeah, just a little woozy. I'm fine. Amidst the commotion of everybody helping each other up and moving towards the door, one of the police officers' voices was being drowned out. Everyone shut up. The building became dead silent. The policeman continued in a raised voice. Listen, if you want to survive, you have to listen. We will be going from building to building until we get out of this area. The other officers are trying to hold the line until we get out. The only exit is through the front door. When you get out, go right immediately and get into the parking lot. Avoid the intersection. I don't believe any of you will be dumb enough to run into the middle of a battle but I repeat do not go left into the intersection. We will be ducking behind this building for cover so go fast. When you get into the parking lot, start moving towards the neighborhood behind this bank. Let's go. No time to waste. 1615 June 18, 2020 CE, Washington D.C. Time. Outside the White House, Ronell looked at the crowd of reporters gathered in front of him. Good afternoon. This morning, as many of you already know, the city of San Francisco came under attack by creatures that we have never seen before. Our understanding of these creatures are limited. We are not certain of their origin. We are not certain if they are intelligent or that we are capable of communicating with them, and we are not certain as to why they are attacking San Francisco. However, we are working tirelessly to understand the nature and origins of such creatures. What we do know is that these creatures do not come in peace. They have attacked the city of San Francisco and its people unprovoked. The battle is still ongoing. Just a few minutes ago, I was in the Situation Room being updated on the situation. Our first priority is to ensure the safety of the people of San Francisco. Local law enforcement have held off the advance and civilians are being evacuated from the Bay Area. I have federalized the National Guards of California, Nevada, Oregon, and Arizona and I have directed them to repel the creatures invading San Francisco. The California National Guard have already begun arriving to assist. In addition, 
I have directed the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment from Fort Irwin, California along with 2,200 Marines of the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit from Camp Pendleton, California to provide further support. The current situation is still developing and we will provide further updates once more is known. Thank you. And may God bless the United States of America. Situation Room. Stephen gave his update to the President. The Air Force has reassessed the situation and are switching their munitions to long-range cruise missiles in order to take out the enemy anti-air and to bombard their landings on the beach. Direct bombing runs are no longer considered viable due to losses. The Navy is also unable to be deployed in the Pacific due to the fact that there are still lance fishes in the water. Do we have any updates on the origins of these creatures? None whatsoever. But rest assured, Mr. President, we will find something. The entire National Spatial Intelligence Agency is working on it. Well then, the only thing we can do at this point, gentlemen, is to hope for the best. Should we inform other nations of the current situation? Inquired the Secretary of State, Katerina. I was planning to do so but I'm looking for your approval. Ronell shook his head. Keep it under wraps for now. We don't want them knowing something they can take advantage of. We can inform them later. If they start being attacked, then we will tell them. Ronel sighed and swiveled his head to look through all the screens in the situation room. Multiple news channels were in a frenzy over this. Some of the screens showed footage of the monsters in the streets of San Francisco. News anchors talking with almost any person they could get a hold of that was somehow related or could give an opinion on this. Dot. 1325 June 18th. 2020 CE Irvington, California Luke looked around at the houses that lined both sides of the street they were on, their large group made their way down the street, they could still hear gunshots since they had only traveled about three blocks away from the bank. Luke realized that his phone had been vibrating in his pocket for a while now, looking at it, there were 20 missed calls from his mom. His mom came through the moment it connected. Luke, why haven't you picked up? Luke paused for a second at his mom's hysterical shouting. Mom, calm down. I'm fine. Where are you right now? Are you all right? What happened? Why didn't you pick up? Calm down. I'm alive and safe. Perfectly fine. Not a scratch. Don't freak but our bus was. Had engine problems. We had to travel onto the streets and I didn't hear my phone. Were you able to get on another bus? Usually, his mom would pick up on that pause but she was probably either too panicked to notice that he was lying or that she was just taking it since she understood she probably didn't want to hear the truth, and hey, he wasn't technically lying, the engine of the bus is having problems, more so caused by the bus being flipped than the bus engine itself though, but hey, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, no, mom, we are currently on foot. We have police officers escorting us and I think we are trying to find a vehicle or something to get us to the evacuation point. San Francisco, California. A guardsman tapped Andrew's shoulder. We will take it over from here. Report to your commanding officer back there. An amalgamation of police forces all gathered in front of their supposed commanding officer. I'm Lieutenant Alan Beckingridge, in charge of all local law enforcement forces in this intersection. Gonna keep this short. There are people handing out mres over there. Get some food and rest. You guys have 20 minutes. Then we gotta cycle you guys out so half of the soldiers can eat. Any questions? A city police officer raised his voice. Why can't we focus on just evacuations now that the National Guard is here? There aren't enough soldiers. What we have is just a quick response force from the California National Guard spread out at some of the intersections. More soldiers are coming to reinforce us but they need some more time. So take your break, and get ready to come back. Be glad. You're even having a break. Twenty minutes later, Andrew was getting up from his break when loud shouting from the firing line caught his attention. A Humvee was suddenly flung. It gained some air before skidding on the ground a few yards away from Andrew. A giant metallic spear-like log was punctured through what was left of the Humvee. The second Humvee started reversing, its 50 calories firing wildly. Fall back, fall back, Ognu Daria Sugar, what the hell are those? The soldiers on the firing line quickly started backing up in an organized manner. Irvington, California. Luke looked around at the houses that lined the sides of the deserted street. One of the police officers pushed past him and went to converse with Mr. Johnson. A few seconds later, the police officer shouted, All right, everybody stop, we have to hide in these houses. 
we may have monsters approaching soon, then murmurs grew as people looked down the road, a sand-colored Humvee appeared there, Luke could see that a soldier manned the machine gun on it, behind the first Humvee, three more Humvees showed up followed by sand-colored trucks, everybody got onto the sidewalk in order to clear the road, a Humvee without a machine gun on top separated from the convoy and parked on the side of the road near them, the rest of the convoy continued, a soldier dressed in full sand-colored combat gear and carrying a rifle walked out, what are you guys doing out here, it's not safe here, a police officer went up to him, I'm officer Hills Cooper with the Fremont Police Department, we were escorting a convoy of school buses from Sundale High School to the evacuation point at Levi's Stadium, however, one of the school buses was overturned by one of those monsters, these are the kids from that school bus and we are trying to find another vehicle to get us to the evac point, Sergeant David Lumen of the California Army National Guard. The sergeant looked around at everybody, let me check with my commanding officer to see if they can offer any help, 34, Chapter 105, San Francisco is Lost Part 1, Fleeing, 1345 June 18. 2020 CE Irvington California around Luke a few sat down on the sidewalk to rest Luke looked around it was a nice little neighborhood with a variety of white one story and two story houses lining both sides Luke looked to Hayden who was also sitting down I'm gonna go listen to what they are saying David came back from his Humvee sorry my unit can't spare any vehicles right now Hills sighed well thanks for asking David pointed behind him you guys are nearing the Paseo Padre Parkway, there's still a lot of people driving through there, you can probably flag down someone to get a ride, I did see a couple buses which could probably fit all of you guys, maybe if you are lucky, another bus will pass by, the sound of machine gunfire interrupted their conversation, David looked down the road towards where the gunfire came from, someone in the Humvee shouted, Sergeant, they made contact, there's a horde of them, David looked to hills, I need to go. I have orders to stop those monsters here. You geese should be relatively safe for now but I do suggest that you guys keep moving. The soldier got back into the Humvee and it drove off. Hills looked at the students around him. Most had sat down to rest. Okay, everyone, we will be stopping for a few minutes in order to make a decision. Please take this time to rest whilst we talk with your teachers. I need all teachers and all officers over here. A few, who hadn't lost their stuff started eating from their lunch boxes and drinking from their bottled water, Luke sat down besides Hayden and hugged his legs to his cheek, Luke took a deep breath, you okay, Hayden, yeah I'm fine, you think we're gonna live, probably, they sat together without speaking, Luke rummaged through his pockets for his earbuds, to his surprise, nothing came up, he probably dropped his earbuds in the chaos, chattering filled up the air and Luke fidgeted a bit while sitting silently besides Hayden, he didn't know anybody else around and making new friends would be awkward in this situation. A few minutes passed by for Luke to say anything again. Hayden would usually ignore him. Today, however, Hayden seemed finally able to talk. Although being given the chance, Luke started feeling like he would chicken out. Hayden. Um, I have been meaning to talk to you about this. I know this is probably not the place and I'm a bit late on this but we have been good friends since middle school. You kinda stopped talking to me starting. Luke was interrupted. Okay, everyone. Attention. We are asking everyone to call their parents to come pick them up at the Paseo Padre Parkway. Tell them to pick you up at the Paseo Padre Parkway. For those who can't be picked up, we will find a bus or something to get you guys to the evac point. A few minutes later Luke got off of his phone with his mom again. Hayden, will your parents be picking you up? They told me that they are already at the stadium waiting for me. They are gonna try to drive to me though. Oddly, even though they had already walked the street away from where they met the soldiers, the sound of gunfire seemed to be getting louder and louder. Somewhere in their group of 60 or so students, somebody shouted, Hey the soldiers are coming back. Unlike the first time they had seen them, the military vehicles weren't in a neat convoy line. Instead disorganized Humvees and trucks were speeding towards them. The vehicles came to a halt near them, the soldier from earlier that had talked to them jumped out of one of the Humvees, he started waving to everybody, the monsters are coming, get onto the trucks, come on, officer Hills ran up to him, what, what's happening, get these kids onto the trucks, 
We can't hold off the monsters. Squeeze in as much as you can. People started getting onto the backs of the trucks. Luke spotted something in the sky. A Humvee flew right over them. It clipped a house down the road and smashed upside down onto the lawn of a house further down. Radio transmissions 10 minutes earlier. Shit, shit. This is 2nd Lieutenant George Rowland of 2nd Platoon. We are not able to keep the monsters from reaching the Paseo Padre Parkway in Irvington. I repeat. We are not able to keep the monsters from reaching the Paseo Padre Parkway. What's happening, Lieutenant? I need a sit rep. This instant, the monsters are flinging projectiles at us and we have taken heavy casualties. They have taken out most of our 50 calories Humvees. We need someone to redirect the traffic on the parkway elsewhere. We are not able to hold this position at all. That's a negative lieutenant. Don't let them onto the parkway. That's an order. Sir, we can't hold it. Don't we have anything on hand? Is there any air support? There was a bit of silence before a response came. Negative. Lieutenant. Air support is unavailable. Enemy air defense is proving too strong. Sir, for the safety of my men, my unit is retreating to the parkway. Holding our current position is impossible. We will try our best to protect the parkway for as long as possible but we don't have the firepower to hold it for long. There was another brief silence over the radio. I will see what I can do. Washington DC. Inside the situation room, Stephen presented worrying news to Ronell. Mr. President, the National Guard is being pushed back. We are receiving reports that humanoid monsters, description matching the ones we saw on our drone, appear to be throwing projectiles at high speeds towards Humvees and destroying them. Ronel rubbed his forehead. How long until the Marines are there? Within an hour. How much of San Francisco have these monsters taken? Mr. President. Stephen paused. San Francisco may be lost. So you are telling me that an American city will be occupied by foreign forces and that we can do nothing about it? Yes, sir. Even with the responding Marines, we do not have sufficient force to prevent San Francisco from being, well more infested with monsters than occupied. Ronell sighed. The first wave were monsters, those lance fish things. Whatever that second wave was with the giant humanoids and anti-air toads seemed like a coordinated military to me. 1411 June 18th. 2020 CE, San Francisco, California. A patrol vehicle barreled down a street lined with stores but devoid of people. Andrew's radio squawked as he made a right turn in his patrol vehicle that nearly tilted his vehicle. He felt his entire body slide to the left. Terry had his eyes wide open at that. Whoa, drive a bit slower. You are gonna kill us. Do you not see the situation we are in? We got to get out of here. I know but these monsters aren't that fast. Another message came through the radio that silenced all other radio chatter. All units, holding San Francisco is no longer viable. San Francisco is lost. I repeat, San Francisco is lost. The evacuation of remaining civilians is top priority. Hold Interstate 280 at all costs. We must keep our only way out open. I guess that's where we are going then. A ringtone started playing in the car. Andrew felt his right pocket vibrate. That must be my kids. Terry, can you fish that out of my right pocket? Answer it and put it on speaker too please. Terry placed the phone in the cup holder. Yes? I'm here. Hey dad. Mrs. Gray is making us board a helicopter. Andrew made another tight turn. Keep your younger sister safe. Alright? Okay dad. Are you okay? I'm hearing that San Francisco is being overrun. Are you still in the city? Ashley wants to see you. I'm still in the city but I'm fine. I'm with Mr. Gray and we are finding our way out. Just listen to Mrs. Gray. And can you put your sister on the phone? A young, quivering female voice came through. Dad? Yes sweetheart. She sounded near tearing up. Dad. I want to see you. I'm worried that what happened to mom will happen to you. Dad's a okay. I'm already at a very safe location. Just listen to your brother and Mrs. Gray. Can you give your phone back to your brother? MHM. His son's voice came through. Dad, call me when you get to wherever the helicopter is taking you. Sorry that I can't talk for long. Take care of your sister. I will see you guys soon. 27. Chapter 106. San Francisco is lost. Part 2. The last line. 1420 June 18th. 2020 CE, San Francisco, California. Their patrol vehicle barreled down the deserted street. Andrew held tightly onto the steering wheel. He looked around. Where is Interstate 280? 
There are signs on the street that will get us there. Can you get a map out on your phone or something? If you stop driving like a maniac, we can just check the street signs. Well, the entire city is being overrun. Who won't drive like a maniac? You are gonna get us killed. I'm driving at only 60 miles per hour and there's literally nobody here. We are way behind everybody and have no idea when those things are gonna get here. Just please check where we are. Terry tapped on his phone. Ah, okay, take the next right. As Andrew rounded the turn, the entire car tilted to the left, its right wheel spinning in the air, jostled as the car slammed back onto the ground, Terry held onto the door Jesus H. Christ. A few minutes later, in front of them were multiple police vehicles and a Humvee that formed a checkpoint of sorts. See we didn't need the signs, next time, if we ever have to do another escape or something, I'm driving. Andrew and Terry got out of the vehicle. A police officer from the checkpoint approached them. You guys all right? Andrew and Terry introduced themselves. We are fine. I'm Officer Andrew Molinoz from Richmond Station. Officer Terry Grays, also from Richmond Station. Corporal Anthony White from Mission Station. Did you say Richmond Station? Yeah. Why are you asking? Ouch. Wasn't that where the first reports of those monsters came from? Andrew nodded. Oh yeah. I'm pretty sure I was the one who made that first report, you were? Huh, glad to see you are still alive. Well, surprised to see actually. We need all the officers we can get. Terry looked around at the couple other officers and guardsmen. Can you tell us what has been going on? Nobody seems to be communicating over the radio anymore. They walked towards the checkpoint. I think we switched frequencies or something but that isn't important right now. It's not going well. The National Guard is in complete retreat. They are trying to reorganize and regroup. We have abandoned most of the city north of here. Antony pointed southwards. The Ingleside Police Station is now the headquarters. The City College of San Francisco next to it has also become the main evacuation site. The various stadiums there and the parking lot are being used as landing areas for National Guard helicopters to ferry out civilians. People can also drive out of San Francisco using Interstate 280. But we are trying to control the flow of traffic so it keeps moving. And what are we doing here? Our orders are to hold this highway and that evacuation point. We will most likely be the last ones to leave unless the National Guard gets their shit together. I will call someone from HQ and see if they need you guys elsewhere. You will probably be staying here with me though. Irvington, California. Everyone stared bewilderedly at the destroyed and upside down Humvee. Sergeant Lumen waved at the students to snap them out of it. Quickly, go. Get on. People started rushing into the trucks. Gunfire could be heard in the distance. Luke soon clambered onto one of the military trucks. The sand-colored tarp covering the back of the truck had concealed how crowded it was inside. The truck was packed with students. Other than that. There was a soldier tending to a wounded soldier lying in the middle of everybody. Luke sat down on the truck bed. He heard gunfire again. This time it sounded extremely close. Screams also came from outside. Luke looked out the back of the truck. A Humvee was driving towards them with a monster following it. 1433 June 18, 2020 CE San Jose International Airport, Forward Operating Base Colonel Bill Gunn looked increasingly worried as radio messages flooded in. I repeat, we can't hold. The monsters are breaching. The only thing he could do now was order a general retreat. The monsters had heavy firepower with them and easily dealt with the lightly armed National Guard, the heaviest weapon he had currently in his disposal are Humvees armed with 50 calories machine guns. He was gonna have to wait for more heavy weaponry in order to turn the tide. A beacon of hope came to him in the form of someone rushing to him with a message. Colonel, the commander of the Marines that are arriving soon wants to speak to you. Is this Colonel Gunn of the California Army National Guard? Yes, it is. My forces will be arriving soon. What is the situation in San Francisco? Thank God you guys are here. The front is collapsing. I currently have at my disposal just about 250 men. We had to throw together what we had at hand since we couldn't get the entire 79th IBCT mobilized fast enough. Our top priority is getting people out. Holding defensive positions is no longer viable for us. My forces in San Francisco have been mostly pushed out and are in disarray. Elsewhere along the Bay Area, my forces are being forced to retreat but they are still organized. We are also severely lacking in air support since these monsters are shooting down the Air Force with ease. 
Thanks for the information. I will be taking command once I arrive. AH-1Z Vipers will fly in low to avoid the enemy anti-air and will provide air support. I will patch you in with the squadron commander. 30 minutes later. MV-22 Ospreys landed all along one of the runways of the San Jose International Airport. Marines ran out from the backs of the Ospreys towards the hangars. Corporal Eric Liu was among the Marines. As he got off of his Osprey, Eric looked up just as three AH-1Z Vipers in formation flew by overhead. Besides him, Humvees were driving around on the runway of the airport carrying his serviced rifle, the M27ER. He ran with his fellow Marines. Let's go, let's go. Move, move, move. A large number of soldiers crowded the hangar that they just entered. The aircraft hangar had been turned into a command center of sorts. Whiteboards and computers on desks were everywhere. In a rather large open area in the hangar, Marines clad in combat crowded together and filled the space. Captain Dan Martinez, commander of their company, was standing in front of a large whiteboard with a map on it. All right, Echo Company. This is the current situation. To enable easier travel, most of northern San Jose has been cleared of civilians. Across the Bay Area, the National Guard is on retreat. They are the worst hit in San Francisco. The situation there is also the most dire because San Francisco is on a peninsula and can be cut off. The captain traced his finger on a highway on the map. Local law enforcement and National Guard have been pushed back to Interstate 280 and are desperately holding it as the main highway for evacuations. He then pointed at an area on Interstate 280. This is the City College of San Francisco, where they are evacuating civilians via helicopter. This is where this company and Fox Company will be headed to. However, each platoon from Fox Company has been assigned to protect various points along Interstate 280 so they will not accompany you the entire way to San Francisco. Elements from the Battalion Weapons Company will be attached to this company. They will have javelins, toes, and mortars with them. Those will be vital against these demons. We do not know much about these demons but we do know that they are hardy enough to take multiple rifle shots and can seemingly fling Humvees. This will be a retreating battle. Our goal is to protect the civilians and hold out until more forces arrive. The 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment is a few hours away and will bring heavier firepower. The rest of the 1st Marine Division will be pouring in too. Understood? Let's go kill some demons. Marines, Aurora, Aurora. 1733 June 18th, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0046 Sun 48th. 196 e off the coast of the Mac Imperium. A Macan battleship cruised lazily in the waters. It was an old battleship but it was one of the few battleships that the Mac Imperium had left after its war with America. Suddenly, a commotion occurred on the bridge. Captain, we are suffering from a hull breach and are flooding. Something punctured through the side of our ship. Seal the areas where the flooding is occurring. Is this an enemy attack? We are not certain. Captain, whatever it was. It seemingly went through one side of our ships and out the other. However it's not exploding. A few minutes later, there's reports of even more flooding. It seems something has punctured our ship again. Captain, we might not be able to control this flooding. Set course for home port. Contact headquarters. We have to save this ship at all costs. 31. Chapter 107. San Francisco is lost. Part 3. Evacuations. 1800 June 18th. 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. Katrina alerted the president. Our ambassador to the Mac Imperium has just told me that the Mac government is currently in uproar. They are trying to keep it under wraps but there are rumors floating around that a Max battleship being sunk was the cause for this. A battleship? Didn't we sink almost their entire navy? According to the ambassador, it was an old battleship bound for the scrap yards that they recommissioned. Ronel sighed. Seriously? They are rebuilding their military, they still seem to be wary of the Magus Imperium. What were our plans for the Mac again? I remember we have that queen in power but I heard she really doesn't want to stay and will be abdicating the moment we give her the chance to. The committee in charge is hoping to split them into multiple republics. They have so far identified 85 or so different possible republics based upon ethnicity, religious background, and other factors. We will most likely have to spend billions of dollars to prop up these countries and ensure stability. According to them, 
a single republic wasn't going to work because the ethnic and religious differences run deep and may interfere in the processes of an unified democracy. Krausen coughed. Mr. President, Secretary of State, now is not really a good time to be discussing nation building. We are being invaded. Ronell nodded. Sorry. Yes, Krausen, you are correct. So it seems like these demons have started their attack on the Mag Imperium. It isn't confirmed but there is a very high possibility since they face the ocean where they came from. I suppose we are ready to reveal to the world our current predicament. 1500 June 18, 2020 CE Somewhere along Interstate 280, San Francisco Andrew shook his head. San Francisco is really a terrible place to defend. We are on a peninsula being attacked on all sides. I hope we can get out of here soon. Andrew and Terry stood at the edge of the highway crowded with cars. Although their view of San Francisco was blocked by houses and hills, they could see the black smoke rising into the sky from the general direction of the city. Terry looked over any ideas of where you are going to go after this? <laughs> our homes are overrun by monsters. Where are you gonna live until our military takes back San Francisco? Andrew frowned. We aren't exactly out of danger yet so I haven't thought of it. Better to start thinking early. It will definitely take some time for us to be able to return to San Francisco. I might go to my parents-in-law's place or try to see if my old home that I sold to that company has been bought yet. Have your parents-in-law forgiven you for? Terry stopped himself as Andrew's face darkened. If you really need a place, my grandpa might be willing to take you. He's an ex-cop and his house definitely is space. Andrew smiled. I might take you up on that offer. I will probably go there too. Ha. Huh? I literally just bought my house in San Francisco. I'm not sure if it's still there. Andrew chuckled. Well, now I'm glad that I rented my home. I don't have to pay my rent this month and I don't own the place so I don't have to worry about it. Anthony called out to them from a distance. I want you guys over here to direct the flow of traffic. A few minutes later, cars slowly crawled in front of them. Other than one empty lane, the two-way highway was filled with cars going the same direction, out of San Francisco. Andrew cursed at his phone. I haven't been able to reach my kids at all. They are in a helicopter and probably don't have good reception. I can't contact my wife either but I'm sure she's safe. Andrew looked up into the sky. I promised her that I will protect them. Terry nodded slowly. And you will keep that promise. Don't worry about it. The sound of helicopters could be heard getting closer. Andrew and Terry looked up as military helicopters flew over them. They had to brace themselves as the helicopters were flying so low that the winds from the rotors could be felt. Terry's hat flew off into the distance but Andrew held onto his. Oh well, there goes my hat. Seems to be attack helicopters from the marines. Won't they get shot down? We saw what happened to those jets. The military is the military. I'm not sure what they are up to but I'm glad they are here. Hopefully they are successful. Mission Valley, Fremont, California. It has been going well so far. They had escaped the monsters and saved all of the students and teachers. However, David was still visible with worry as he scanned the surroundings. He was sitting in the passenger seat at the front of his Humvee as their convoy sped down Paseo Padre Parkway in an effort to distance themselves from the monsters. Because of their earlier warnings, the parkway was mostly clear of cars. What really worried him was that his entire group was now just a mishmash of around 24 able National Guard soldiers and a few police officers that had been escorting the high school group. They didn't have any heavy weapons on them so they couldn't possibly face a horde of those monsters. David was lost in thought but the sight of helicopters brought him back to reality. His second lieutenant came over the comms. There was a moment of silence before his second lieutenant talked again. I can't get Aaron on the comms. David looked behind him and didn't see the last truck. A curse word floated through his head. A few minutes earlier, Luke closed his eyes and took a couple deep breaths as he rested next to Hayden. He rubbed his head. He was sick and tired of what had been happening so far and wanted to go home. Luke's mental complaints were stopped because he felt a force suddenly fling him forward as the truck came to an abrupt stop. Then he felt an impact that caused the truck to veer to the left. Luke sat up coughing. He literally had enough of this. This was the second vehicle accident he had in a single day. Ugh. What the fuck? Not this again. A voice shouted a couple seconds later. Everybody get out. Come on. Wake up. Including Luke. 
A few others walked out of the back of the truck. A lot of people were still unconscious inside the cargo bed of the truck. A girl looked around. What happened? I don't see another one of those monsters. Looking at the cab of the truck, they instantly found the answer. A red sedan had slammed into the side of the truck. The airbag had been deployed and the driver of the red sedan was slumped onto it. Luke sighed as a few went to investigate. Luke shouted to one of the boys who went to the cab. Are the soldiers at the front of the truck all right? The boy had opened the door to the cab. One of them is unconscious, the other is. The boy looked away and into the street while covering his mouth. That was enough for Luke to understand what happened to the other. Luke and a couple others pulled out the surviving but unconscious soldier. A rifle dropped out from the cab. More people gathered outside the truck as Moore had regained consciousness. There were murmurs amongst everyone. What do we do now? Holy shit, that guy's dead. This is bad. Where is the rest of the convoy? A screech filled the air and they all became quiet. Luke slowly turned to the right and realized why the car had slammed into the truck. It was trying to escape one of the monsters, much smaller than the other monsters they had seen. It was looking at all of them with its red eyes, its black pupils switching between them. Its spear-like nose swung around. Luke gulped. Everybody stood in silence and didn't dare move, none of the soldiers were conscious, there were no police officers or teachers in their truck either, they were just a bunch of high school students. The monster started galloping towards them, Luke panically looked around, his eyes darted everywhere, there was a rifle on the ground but he had no idea how to use it. Everybody was frozen in fear, Luke shut his eyes and braced himself. 29, Chapter 108 San Francisco is lost part 4 1523 June 18th, 2020 CE Mission Valley, Fremont, California In his mind, the world seemingly slowed down I am so dead, that thought coursed through Luke's brain as he saw himself in slow motion raising his hands in an instinctive yet futile effort to save himself He knew for certain that the spear of the monster would pierce right through him Then everything, suddenly went back to regular speed as gunshots went off besides him. Luke's hands went from futilely shielding himself to quickly covering his ears from the piercing noise. He blinked and looked to where the gunfire was from. Standing just to his left, Hayden had grabbed the rifle on the ground. He fired another burst into the monster. The monster stopped charging, staggered a bit and roared. The bullets clearly were hurting it. The creature turned its attention towards Hayden, its red eyes seemingly burning with hatred and began its charge. Hayden, with a face that showed no panic, looked down the sights of the gun and fired a few more shots. This time, the shots hit the monster's skull as purple blood flowed down its head. The monster slowed down as if in shock and collapsed. Luke stared in amazement, instantly forgetting about how close he was to becoming a meal. Holy shit, you know how to shoot a gun? Luke looked towards the dead monster. What the hell was that? Holy shit, this is California. Where did you? Hayden had a sheepish smile on his face as he rubbed his neck with his left hand. My grandparents live in Arizona. Getting a gun there is very easy. I have been on the range there every time I went. You didn't strike me as someone interested in guns. It was nice to shoot targets and get away from the problems in my life. A classmate interrupted them. Um, I don't want to disturb you guys' conversations but we have more problems coming our way. They looked down the road where the dead monster laid and couldn't believe their eyes. From further down the road, a dozen red, seemingly pissed off eyes stared at them. These ones were much larger than the one they had killed. They moved slowly towards them, seemingly incapable of going faster due to their size, but it was certain that they were pissed. Hayden pulled up his rifle in position and aimed again. Steadying himself, he hit the trigger of the rifle instead of the expected gunshot sound. Nothing happened. He hit a couple of times and then blinked. U.TCH. No ammo. Do any of you see any magazines lying around? Everybody started looking around on the ground. As Luke looked around, he noticed that most of the students had finally recovered from being knocked out by the crash. Hayden called out again. Check the soldiers. They should have ammo on them. Quickly, Luke tapped Hayden's shoulder. Hayden. I think they are slow enough. We have to run away. Hayden looked towards the monster and then turned his head back to Luke and the others. Are any of the soldiers awake? The injured one is awake but I don't think he can help us that much. We need some people to carry the soldiers. Together, a couple students tried to lift the unconscious soldier from the front seat of the cab. I found some ammo. 
catch. A magazine was thrown at Hayden and he caught it and slammed it into the gun. Just as Hayden aimed to fire, fiery explosions blinded him and Luke. The grounds where the monsters stood tore up. Everybody stopped to look at the scene in front of them. The shrieks of the dying monsters could be heard in their panic to leave. They didn't hear the whirring helicopters above them. Two gray colored military helicopters hovered overhead as bullets spewed from them. Holy shit, attack helicopters. The firing soon stopped and not a single one of the monsters stood alive. Trucks from their convoy pulled up. Are you guys all right? A few minutes later, there are too many of these monsters and we have multiple wounded. We are currently evacuating civilians that we found during our retreat. Number of civilians? It was just the earlier reported high school students with their teachers and police escort. About 60 or so people. Good work, second lieutenant. We cannot spare both helicopters but one will provide overwatch and follow your convoy. Continue your retreat. We are, at the insistence of the teachers, traveling to Levi's Stadium. Continue on for Levi's Stadium. Marines are moving out just south of there. You will be able to be reinforced there with other elements will do. Above them, one of the two helicopters banked to the right and flew away whilst the other stayed above them. Somewhere in the Pacific, a towering humanoid stood among the various creatures scurrying around. The ground was barren dirt that showed no signs of life and the sea surrounded their island. A soldier came up to him and bowed. We had fed Simmons. It was a regular so she could barely understand what he was saying. The soldier rambled on in what was to her gibberish. The more developed one was, the less they were capable of understanding the less developed. Those ranked at the bottom of development, the beasts, actually didn't even have a language. It was a sort of instinctual understanding of noises. She couldn't understand much of what those ranked lower than the enlightened said but they could understand her. The beasts only understood how to take orders from their lord and act on instinct. Although inferior in mind, she actually really liked the beasts. They were good at giving hope to the humans that they were fighting a mindless horde. In reality, the true Horeza waited. She calmly waited for the soldier to finish before she looked to her advisor, an enlightened. On the right, he has said that our invasion forces to the west are facing stiff resistance. It seems that the humans of this plane have peculiar weapons. Has this impeded the advance? Not at all, great lord. The beasts are advancing albeit slowly. Slowly. My fellow enlightened advise you to allow our greatest creation to ascend. Then we shall unleash it. By your will, great lord. Thirty minutes later, a roar vibrated throughout the island and the ground shook. 1850 June 18, 2020 CE. Washington DC. The first of the marines are arriving, Mr. President. Get me in contact with their commander. I want to speak directly to him. A few minutes later, the man on the screen saluted. The background showed that he was in a hangar at an airfield. People in uniform scrambled around. Colonel Henry Weiss, commander of the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit, at ease Colonel. Before O'Neill could say anything else, Henry spoke. Go ahead. It is an honor to speak to you but I'm busy commanding my men and I really wonder if this is necessary. I understand Colonel but your assessments will be vital to me. Assessments? How confident are you that you will hold San Francisco? With your current numbers and with more reinforcements, Mr. President, General, Ronell interrupted. No, I don't want what the General said. I want your honest opinion. As a commander on the ground, what is your say on this with my current numbers? No, not at all. Colonel Gunn of the California Army National Guard has informed me about these demons we are facing. Unless we bring in armor, we will be pushed back. Even with more reinforcements, especially armor, it will still be a hard fight. Ronell nodded slowly. Thank you Colonel. Somewhere in the Magus Imperium. Nick shook his head after coming out of a briefing. What the hell is happening back home? San Francisco under attack? Brian nodded. They are trying to get us back home as fast as possible it seems. Nick scratched his head. The information they gave us wasn't much. Is there any way we can find out more? Well, seeing that we don't have internet or cellular because this world hasn't developed that yet. No. Well, it shouldn't be long before we go back home though. They are rushing marine units back. We will be there if whatever invading San Francisco is truly a threat. Nick snorted. If we get sent there, then something's wrong. There's an entire marine expeditionary force there. 28, Chapter 109, 
A Ray of Hope Part 1 1610 June 18, 2020 CE San Jose International Airport, Forward Operating Base Eric stood among his platoon listening to Second Lieutenant Ryan Scottfield as he gave them a more detailed briefing than Captain Martinez. We will be deployed to defend whatever parts of Interstate 280 that are still being held in San Francisco. We will be backed up by 3rd Platoon, an anti-armor squad, a tow squad, and a heavy machine gun section will be joining us as well. It seems like the LAF-25S just got here on time so we may have them at our disposal. Private First Class Gregor Edwards, a grenadier in his squad, looked at Ryan with questioning eyes. Didn't the captain say we will be facing demons that can throw Humvees? Yep. So that will be all our forces? Yep. Other than disorganized local law enforcement and guardsmen? Yes. First platoon will be busy securing the evacuation sites in the City College of San Francisco. As the captain said, Fox Company will be keeping our rear together so we can get the heck out if things go to hell. What about Golf Company? They got sent to East Bay cause those things are over there as well. Any other questions? Everybody stayed silent, Ryan sighed. I know that this is the first time some of you have had odds so stacked against you. Some of you haven't even seen combat before, but just like how good old Chesty, who once commanded our specific battalion, once said about communists, we are first marines and not all the demons in hell can overrun us. Ora, let's make him proud boys. Interstate 280, San Francisco. I want all officers to defend that street. Do not let a single one onto the highway. Andrew tapped Terry on his shoulder. You hear that? I think that's our cue. Come on. As Andrew and Terry got closer to the on-ramp, the sound of rifle fire got louder. They had to weave and squeeze through the cars that were bumper to bumper on the highway. Andrew's eyes darted around looking at all the people in their cars. An elderly couple in a sedan, a family of four in an SUV. A clearly pregnant mother with her son sitting right beside her. Most of them were looking towards where the sound of shooting was coming from. Most had fear and worry on their faces. Some looked at them with a bit of hope. They hurriedly ran off the off-ramp and onto Monterey Boulevard, at the three-way intersection in front of them, the one where Acadia Street went into Monterey Boulevard. Multiple officers and a few guardsmen with a Humvee were laying down withering fire. Andrew fired his rifle as the Lance Fish's head appeared. Since Acadia Street was an uphill road, the first thing that always appeared was the Lance Fish's nose. A small mound of monster corpses were already forming at the top of the road, because there were also houses on both sides of the street. It was the perfect choke point for funneling these creatures. A few minutes later, there's too much of them, besides Andrew and Terry. Corporal White shouted into his radio, the situation on Acadia Street is stable, I can send a couple officers, White turned towards them, Andrew, Terry, I need you two to get into your cars and get to Forrester Street as fast as possible, shit, Andrew's police car screeched to a halt, the Lance Fishes had clearly pushed past the mouth of the intersection, officers and guardsmen were still trying to hold on to the middle of the boulevard. Andrew and Terry got out of their cars and opened fire while shielding themselves using the car doors. Although the car doors were completely useless if the monsters came barreling down towards them, it gave them a sense of safety. Terry shouted while shooting where the hell are those attack helicopters from earlier? I don't know. Reloading or some shit? It didn't take long for the Lance Fishes to notice two guys shooting them in their vulnerable sides. Three monsters turned towards them. Ah fuck. Explosions rocked the ground in front of them. An attack helicopter flew in a straight line down Forrester Street, rockets spewing out of it onto the monsters below. The sound of its minigun could then be heard. Fucking hell. They took their merry time to get here. Cheers and whoops rose out of the men on the intersection. Some even waved at the helicopter. 1635 June 18, 2020 CE Interstate 280 near Daly City A convoy of 16 Humvees led by two LAF-25 sped down Interstate 280 In the lanes beside them, civilian cars crowded them His squad commander, Sergeant Julian Shelton, commented on it Good thing they kept this lane open Eric looked over his shoulder couldn't we have used the Ospreys and flown over this? Something about them being needed to get more guys and stuff over here. The situation at the front is also not that clear at the moment so they don't know where we should be dropped off. 
On that note, we should probably slow down once we enter San Francisco. Don't want to run into one of those things. 1940 June 18th, 2020 CE. 1120 San 48th, 196 E. Primopolis, Magus Imperium. In the throne room, magician officials lined both sides. Jimmy stood in the middle and Emperor Arston sat on his throne. Does your nation need any assistance? The Magus Imperium would be a glad to provide it. Jimmy shook his head. My government fears that these creatures may be preparing to land on the shores of the Mac Imperium. We would like to request your nation's assistance in defending against them once they do arrive there. Our country would only be able to provide limited support to the Macans and we fear that these monsters may overrun them. Arstant frowned. What sort of assistance? Boots on the ground. We are hoping that you will send your military to bolster and help the Magus. Rubbing his beard, the Magusian Emperor contemplated the request. I am afraid that is not possible to support a nation that had been our arch nemesis and the greatest threat to our sovereignty for a hundred and twenty years would only cause an uproar in my court, my populace, and my soldiers. On top of that, these monsters may land directly on my country, requiring me to have the full might of my military available. We are certain that these monsters will not be landing directly in your country as they have only appeared in the seas facing the Mac. I do understand your first sentiment, but if these monsters trample through the Mac Imperium, who will be its next target? This is a matter of your country's own safety. You could prepare until these monsters arrive on your borders but the damage will then extend to within your country. Arstant fidgeted around as if agonizing over the issue. Multiple expressions flashed through his face as he gave it thought. Give me some time to discuss this with a few of my most trusted officials. These monsters have yet to appear on this continent so it does not seem urgent. I will see what I can do. Thank you. Before you go, the offer for support to your country is still on the table. That is the least we can do for your country helping us defeat the Mac. Washington DC. A group of aerial photographs were laid down in front of Ronell. An aide explained what they were. Mr. President, we have spotted something rather massive 100 miles off the coast. We have some photos via satellite, courtesy of the National Spatial Intelligence Agency, and we are also sending a drone over it. Ronell held one of the photos in his hand while scratching his head. A giant dark red rectangle? We think it's some sort of massive radar system. We are detecting signals from it. It's likely what they have been using to detect and help shoot down our aircraft. 31. Chapter 110 a Ray of Hope Part 2 1945 June 18, 2020 CE Washington, D.C. Ronell looked to Kralson, if we destroy it, is it possible to regain air superiority? We aren't certain seeing that we don't have a clear picture of how their anti-air systems work, we do believe it will degrade their air defense capabilities. Then what are we waiting for? I want missile strikes on that thing this instant. Kralson nodded. The bombers are already in the air. They should be firing their cruise missiles soon. We will get visual confirmation of the damage through the drone. Good. Anything else to report? Katrina got Ronell's attention. The ambassador to the Magus Imperium recently finished up his audience with Emperor Arstant. We made the request but he seems reluctant in helping the Mac Imperium. Figures. We will be giving out a detailed report about the meeting later. Thank you, Katrina. I guess we should consider this another way. Does the Mac need help from the Magus? What units do we have in the Mac Imperium? Kralson responded to that. We have two National Guard Brigade combat teams operating in the Mac Imperium. The 2nd IBCT, 28th Infantry Division from the Pennsylvania National Guard and the 56th IBCT, 36th Infantry Division from the Texas National Guard. We also have many forces in transit so those might not be the final figures. We currently do not have plans in sending additional forces there though. These numbers are lacking when it comes to defending the entire Mac Imperium. Ronell crossed his arms together. Should we provide some incentive to get them to defend the Mac? But what could we offer? Everybody in the room stayed silent at that. After a few minutes, Ronell sighed. I suppose we can consider that later. Kralson, does anyone in the DoD have a clear picture on how many units do we need in San Francisco? We have yet to form a clear idea on the capabilities of the enemy so there is no actual answer. We are hoping that sending a couple brigade combat teams can push them, Katrina interrupted. Well on that note, Emperor Arstant seemed quite willing to help us, though. 
the ambassador told me that it felt like the emperor was quite enthusiastic to offer it, he says, from his experience. He thinks it probably has something to do with us helping them finally defeat the Mac. I won't be surprised if there's a part of Arstant that fears that we could make demands from him since we helped them quite a lot against the Mac. 1645 June 18, 2020 CE Somewhere in the middle of San Francisco, a humanoid stood in the middle of a street. His height was comparable to that of a one-story house. He looked down at what was below him. These humans are using quite strange weapons, quite different from the ones we faced in our world. He looked at his second-in-command, Shkvdik, a regular who was the most intelligent amongst the regulars he commanded. Yes VGHNG, agree much, think they advanced. We careful. Still pray. VGHG picked up the object at his feet and flipped it around to what he thought was its upright position. He studied it, the four round things that were at the bottom of the object touched the ground. A memory flickered in him, the humans in his world would put round things on their wooden boxes in order to move them. He could barely remember because no humans existed anymore in his world, this object was different from the wooden boxes seeing that it was made of metal. A human weapon also sat on top of the hatch of the object, it spewed out stuff that caused pain. VGHG thought up a name. Metal box with four round things at bottom and human weapon on top sounds like a good name for this human weapon. Shkvdi didn't care about the metal box with four round things at bottom and human weapon on top at all and only stared hungrily at the dead humans inside. They're still human inside. He grabbed it and shook a human out of it. He then grabbed onto the body and put it into his mouth. VGHG looked at Shkvdi with mild disinterest. You still eat them raw? You should really try them cooked. No cook. Hate cooked. Taste bad. Interstate 280, San Francisco. Andrew looked around and shouted. Anybody got any spare AR-15 ammo? I'm out. Someone shouted in response. Catch. Thank you. The attack helicopter had only provided relief for 10 minutes before being forced to retreat in order to refuel and rearm. But with the lull in the monster's advance. They had been able to retake the entire intersection. Andrew had his back against a wall as he reloaded his R. Shit how much longer do we have to hold out? The monsters don't seem to ever stop, a guardsman close to him answered. Until all the civilians are evacuated, now less whining and more shooting. As Andrew got back to shooting, he noticed that in the short time he had spent talking to the guardsman, the lance fishes had gotten closer. Shit they are getting through again. Where are the fucking helicopters? Thirty minutes later, they were barely holding the intersection. They had plenty of ammunition gathered but the sheer number of the lance fishes meant that the monsters inched forward little by little. There also seemed to be some intelligence in the lance fishes. Instead of letting the bodies pile up, they seemed to have been purposefully moving them aside in order to not block their advance. Sweat dripped down from Andrew's head as he fired from his rifle. He had no idea how long he had been fighting for but he was growing seriously tired. Then. What sounded like four pop rivets vibrated through the air, the forwardmost lance fish instantly collapsed as purple blood sprayed out of it. Andrew looked to his left to see an armored vehicle with a turreted cannon. The cannon on the armored vehicle fired more continuous shots at the monsters, behind the armored vehicle were multiple Humvees. The military vehicles drove into the intersection and fanned out. Soldiers poured out from the Humvees and opened fire on the lance fishes. A few whoops erupted amongst the tried police officers and guardsmen. Andrew breathed a sigh of life. Finally, the actual military arrived. The guardsman beside him chuckled. Hey, we are army, too. Says so on our patch. Be glad that we were here too or you guys would have been toast. Andrew chuckled. I know, I know. Just a joke. A soldier got out of the Humvee and walked in the middle of the intersection. He shouted over the noise of the gunfire. I'm 2nd Lieutenant Ryan Scottfield. Commanding Officer of 2nd Platoon, Echo Company of the 2 Fourths Marines. I would like to speak to the officer in charge here. A guardsman responded, I'm Staff Sergeant Joe Schneider. I believe I'm the highest ranking one at this intersection. Do you not have a platoon leader with you? A lieutenant? There could be a guardsman higher ranked than me along this street. I'm not sure. We lost organization during our retreat. A policeman interjected. Well, the chief of police is still on the radio and is basically the one giving commands. Well mostly just giving us instructions. The guardsman just joined up with us. We can contact him for you. The marine nodded. 
I think it's actually better to patch him through to our expeditionary unit commander. Ten minutes later, Andrew's radio crackled. This is Chief of the SFPD, James Hawthorne. I would like to say that you have all gone above and beyond your duties to protect the citizens of San Francisco. Although we have been bolstered by the Marines and National Guard, we are not certain if it's enough to hold these monsters off. We will need some officers to stay and fight on the front lines. Of course, this is not mandatory, and I will not force anyone to do so. Those who want to stay and fight, stay and fight. Those who do not want to stay and fight, we will need you to help with the evacuations at the City College of San Francisco. No matter if you stay or not, every one of you are heroes. I am proud to serve with the finest men and women the SFPD have ever had. I will be staying at the Ingleside Police Station until the last officer has been evacuated. Andrew glanced at Terry. I think it's time for us to go. Well, you can stay if you want but I got two kids who will be orphans if I don't get back to them. Terry nodded. Yeah. I'm not interested in playing a hero right now. Eric looked around. Quite a few of the police officers had decided to stay and fight. The fire from the LAV-25 kept the Lance fishes at bay. Behind him, through LAV-25s sped by, on their way to help the other intersections. 18. Chapter 111. A Ray of Hope Part 3. 1735 June 18, 2020 CE Parking lot of the City College of San Francisco Andrew parked his police car on the road next to the parking lot that was being used as an evacuation site. Helicopters were lifting off and landing. From what he could see, all sorts of helicopters that they could get a hand on were being used. He could also see a mixture of soldiers and police officers trying to barely organize the situation. A soldier spoke from a megaphone whilst standing on an elevated platform. This is a reminder to all to keep your baggage to the minimum. We are allowing one suitcase per person. We are trying to evacuate as many people as possible. As Andrew and Terry walked onto the parking lot, they heard an argument breaking out. A man with a backpack and holding onto two suitcases was arguing with two officers. I'm getting on with all my stuff whether you like it or not. Sir. You are not allowed onto this helicopter with all that. The man let go of his suitcases and fished something out of his backpack. Oh yeah what you gonna do about huh? Anybody wanna steal my stuff, huh? He started waving around a knife at the officer. Guns were quickly drawn at him. Sir, drop the knife. The man started shouting. I want to have all my stuff with me. More police officers surrounded him. Sir, drop the knife or you will be taste. The man started moving forwards. Shut the fuck up. Last warning. Drop the knife. Taza, taza, taza. The man fell to the ground spasming as a taza hit him. Quick, detain this man. Andrew shook his head as he watched the scene unfold. Good grief. They quickly found and reported to the police captain in charge of all local law enforcement at the evacuation site. We just got here from Monterey Boulevard. Part of the defenses then? Terry nodded. Yep. Got relieved by the Marines. Good to hear. We could definitely use more hands to keep this place under control. Andrew pointed to the unconscious man that was being detained. Was that incident common? The captain nodded his head grimly. We had a fair share of troublemakers. Two idiots came in waving pistols. They got gunned down. They stopped talking as a news helicopter carrying five people lifted off beside them. San Jose, California. As they got closer to Levi's Stadium, the traffic got worse. Luke looked out the back of the truck. Their helicopter escort was gone. There were people crowding the streets and even onto the roads, making their way to the stadium whilst seemingly carrying all that they had. Some wore their dress shirts and ties with barely any luggage as if they had just gotten off of work. Parents held onto their children, who mostly had just their school backpacks. No one had been prepared for such a sudden evacuation. Their convoy of trucks and Humvees came to a stop. A soldier appeared at the back of the truck. Okay, everybody off. Traffic is gonna get worse from here on out. We got orders to link up with another unit so this is where you guys get off. One of Luke's classmate looked outside of the truck. Where are we? You guys are on the Great America Parkway. Just follow your teachers and those police officers further down and you will get to Levi's Stadium. Their teachers were already shouting at everyone and gathering the other students. Everybody, please stay together. Get into contact with your parents. Luke and Hayden joined the gathering of high schoolers. One of the teachers of the other classes was talking to Mr. Johnson. My husband and son are already here so I'm gonna be going first. Mr. Johnson nodded. 
You go on. We can handle it. 1803 June 18th, 2020 CE. Interstate 280, San Francisco. The street was eerily quiet. The lance fish corpses that littered the street in front of them made it impossible for regular people. Near the end of the horde, the monsters had to climb over their dead comrades in order to advance. At some point, the monsters seemingly just stopped and retreated. Eric looked around with suspicion in his eyes. I don't like this. Lance Corporal John Felder sighed. Yeah, we still haven't seen those humanoid monsters yet. What do you think? Second Lieutenant. Ryan nodded. We got reports that some of our helicopters were shot down trying to go deeper into San Francisco. Rockets streaked from the Viper that was doing overwatch for them. Eric looked up. What is it shooting at? Ryan shouted. The humanoid things are approaching. Everybody get ready. Eric was confused as he saw the attack helicopter bank hard to the left. It soon became clear why something streaked past the helicopter's right side at extreme speeds. Holy shit, did you see that lieutenant? The fuck? More of the objects streaked past the helicopter as it tried to get out of the way. Ryan shouted again. The humanoids are throwing some stone lances at it. They don't think they can dodge all of them and are retreating. I see them. Fire, fire, fire. The LAF 25S opened up with its auto cannon. Ryan looked over. Shit, it ain't having an effect. The rounds were just not penetrating these monsters. The humanoid monsters were a terrifying sight as they clambered over the dead lance fishes. They had reddish and jet black skin, were about one to two stories tall, and had muscles like bodybuilders. They seemed just like what one would imagine a demon as. Some were carrying shiny, black stone lances. Back blast. A javelin missile shot towards the monstrosity. The missile shot towards the sky and soon came back down on top of the monster. The monster looked up as he sensed it. The javelin missile blasted the monster's head apart. Purple blood and guts exploded from it. The headless body of the giant monster stood for a few seconds before collapsing to the ground. This gave all the humanoid monsters a pause as they looked at their fallen comrade. Keep those javelin missiles coming. San Jose International Airport, forward operating base. In the aircraft hangar that had been turned into a command center, a radio message got Colonel Weiss's attention. The evacuation point at Levi's Stadium is at risk. We need units down here. Get me in contact with the commander of the 11th Armored Cavalry this instant. A few minutes later. Is this Colonel Timothy Wades of the 11th Armored Cavalry? This is Colonel Wades. We are currently en route to your position. How far out are you currently? We are about an hour away. Are there new developments? We need your assistance at San Jose. The monsters are arriving on the beaches of San Jose and will be threatening a major evacuation site at Levi's Stadium. I do not have enough forces at my disposal if a horde appears. Understood. I will send out a detachment that can reach you faster. They will be infantry though. Anything will help. Colonel Weiss turned to one of his aides as he got off the radio. Get me in contact with the Air Force and the Attack Helicopter Squadron Commander. 15. Chapter 112. A Ray of Hope Part 4. 1810 June 18, 2020 CE. Interstate 280, San Francisco. Look out. The LAF-25 backed up just in time as the stone lance embedded itself into the ground where the LAV just was. The LAV didn't stop firing at the demons as it repositioned itself. Its turret turned to keep the gun facing the demons. The demons started throwing even more lances at them. Eric jumped out of the way as a lance landed a few feet from him. The shock wave from the impact knocked him to the ground. He coughed as he dealt with the after effects of slamming into the ground. What the heck? As he got up, he saw a rocket from an AT-4 slammed into one of the demons and blew off its right arm around him. The voices from his fellow soldiers seemingly mixed together. Fucking hell. Keep firing. Shit. It's no use. He watched as a guardsman started screaming as he shot his M249. He didn't let go of the trigger as he focused the firepower on the demon. He suddenly got slapped on the back. The bullets had absolutely no effect on the demon as it continued marching towards them. Snap out of it Eric. Keep shooting. More lances soon rained down on them. The second lieutenant shouted at them. They ran out of lances. Keep them back. They aren't that fast. We can hold them off. One of the larger demons roared. The sound was deafening. And then the demon started charging. 0205 Sun 49th. 196E. Industriopolis, Mac Imperium. Pomponia looked quite unhappily at the American diplomat. 
Chris Wilkins, as he explained his visit. My government requests that you begin evacuating your civilians from the shore, especially the land facing the area where your battleship was sunk. This is for the safety of those civilians. Pomponia nodded, I will see what I can do. Chris frowned. Pomponia, I'm serious. This is not a request but a demand. Chris, I have heard that one of your major cities is under attack. Chris paused. That is correct. My colleagues have announced it. Pomponia sighed. Some anti-American factions are seeing this as the perfect time to strike. I have no idea how much control I have right now in my government. That is concerning to hear. I'm not certain how much aid I can provide on political issues but rest assured that my nation has enough military force in your country to put down any possible rebellion. It is vital to keep in mind my government's demands for evacuation, it is for your citizens' safety. I understand that and I will do whatever I can to get them away from there. Chris bowed. Thank you. Chris began to turn to leave but Pomponia stopped him. I would like to ask something. Go ahead, how much will your military be helping us against this new threat? We have not recovered from the last war with your country. Our forces are being sent home in order to help with defense and we are garrisoning multiple military bases across this continent in order to keep the peace. We may not possess enough military power in your country to stop those demons, but rest assured, we have a solution. Pomponia raised an eyebrow. May I hear what kind of solution it is? Chris decided this was the perfect opportunity. It is on a need-to-know basis only. This is why I am requesting the evacuation of civilians near the shore. Pomponia narrowed her eyes. Seeing that you are insisting on evacuations. How dangerous is this solution? Chris kept a straight and unchanging expression as he stared at the Queen. Sorry madam. It's classified. I'm sorry but this is still my country no matter how much I want to step down. They stared at each in silence for nearly a minute. Please keep your citizens away from the shore where those monsters land. Those that refuse will face the consequences. Have a good day, Your Majesty. 1830 June 18th, 2020 CE, near Levi's Stadium, San Jose. Do not rush or panic. All pedestrians, stay off the road. For those in vehicles, we still have space in the parking garage. Do not leave your vehicles in the middle of the street. If Luke started to tune out the officer that was shouting through a megaphone at them, it was just the same message over and over again. According to what he heard from others, they were outside a convention center, it seemed to have been turned into a help center of sorts. The police officers that had been with them have left but two out of the three teachers, including Mr. Dot Johnson, remained, they were talking with soldiers for some reason, Luke studied the sign in front of him. Higher Regency Santa Clara Hayden commented on it, yeah, a hotel, ah, I see, I guess it's nearly time for us to go find our parents, yeah, also, you wanted to talk to me about us being friends earlier weren't you, Luke scratched his face with a slight frown, yeah, you know how much you started hanging out with Jackson when we started high school, yeah, I just thought you won't think of me as cool anymore, what, why, Jackson kinda threatened me, seriously, yeah, what did he say, Hayden kept quiet. Luke looked back at the sign. I won't press you on this. Look I don't give a damn what Jackson says. I mean look at what you just did today. You literally saved my life dude. Thanks. I mean it. We are gonna see each other after all this is over. Shouting behind them disturbed their conversation. Stay clear. Stay clear. The road full of people and cars started parting. Hayden tapped Luke on the shoulder and pointed further down the road. Look at that. Multiple tanks and military vehicles drove past them. Cheers erupted from the crowds. Whilst waiting for entrance to the stadium, Luke noticed something in the sky and pointed at them. Hey Hayden, you see those? In the skies near Levi's Stadium. Bomb them to hell. Roger that. Near Levi's Stadium, San Jose, Hayden pondered to himself. I think those were fighter jets dropping bombs. Luke widened his eyes in shock. The monsters are already here? What do you think they are bombing? Thinking about it, where was the Air Force when San Francisco was being overrun? I didn't see any. 2140 June 18th, 2020 CE. Washington DC. Krausen got off his phone. The missiles are approaching the target, Mr. President. The drone has eyes on it. The screen flickered on as it showed the live feed from an RQ-170 that showed a huge dark red mass in the ocean. It's huge. How many missiles did we fire at it? 40 Jasms are headed directly for it. 14, 
Chapter 113, Holding On, 1850 June 18, 2020 CE, America Center Drive, San Jose, California, the lead Abrams came to a stop in the parking lot, it swiveled its turret to the right, fire, the tank fired towards the beaches full of lance fishes, the shell found its target as a lance fish's head was blown off and its remaining body collapsed, the machine guns on the tank started firing punching holes into the creatures. The lead tank moved into the parking lot which still had a couple cars parked here and there. Behind it, Abrams, Bradleys, and Humvees poured into the parking lot. Some of the lance fishes had already reached the asphalt of the parking lot from the grassy beaches. One was even beside the massive glass cube building that had the sign Hewlett Packard Enterprise on its top left. A tow missile streaked out of the Bradley towards the forwardmost lance fish its autocannon pummeling the second closest one. Soldiers rushed out of the open doors of the Humvees and the back of the Bradleys. We cannot let them break through. There are hundreds of civilians at Levi's Stadium behind you. Air support is also available. Levi's Stadium. After a bit of directions, the students found that their parents had all been waiting together at a western end of the football field. Luke found his mom first. She looked very tired. You all right hun? Luke smiled yeah, I'm fine, I'm a bit tired, his dad chuckled and he ruffled Luke's hair as he approached from behind, you have definitely seen better days, Luke didn't resist at all, he felt all energy leave his body as he embraced his mom and dad's hug, his dad let go first, we still need to get out of here, come on, I know you are still tired but I got a backup of your stuff, here, we are boarding the next helicopter we can get in, neat you got my laptop, in the middle of the field, various helicopters were taking off and landing. 100 miles off of San Francisco, 40 Jassams cruised through the air at subsonic speeds. There were anti-air frogs on top of the creature that started firing its grape shot into the air. However, the Jassams were skimming the ocean surface. Bits of the creature's flesh erupted and flew off in chunks as the 1,000-pound armor-piercing warhead slammed into the right side of the massive block of flesh. The creature started moving and wiggling as if in pain. Then it finally stopped and started sinking into the ocean. March Air Reserve Base California A drone operator had an aerial view of Oakland, California. An MQ-9 Reaper was circling right outside the suspected range of the monster's anti-air, his officer nodded as he got off of his radio, we got the go-ahead, approaching their air defense zone. Let's see how far this drone can go. Understood. Minutes passed as the drone got closer and closer to the San Francisco Bay, the officer got onto his radio again. We will be proceeding to check out the airspace over San Francisco, the skies should be ours. A few minutes later. Nellis Air Force Base Nevada. Seems like that thing was some sort of radar system. We got the all clear for Oakland and we are pretty certain that also means their rare defense is down in San Fran. The colonel who was in charge of the base, screamed to the men in the room. You heard him. Get all the planes off the ground. We are sweeping these things out of San Francisco. A few seconds later. Good luck and come back with both of your wings this time. The voice over the comms chuckled. 1903 June 18th. 2020 CE. Above Lafayette, California, an E-3 Sentry, an airborne early warning and control aircraft, circled Lafayette, California. A surveillance operator rubbed his eyes and looked closer at his radar screen. There's an unidentified aircraft approaching from the ocean. It's... it's huge. Sir, we need to contact command. Look at the size I'm reading from this. The tactical director got onto the comms. It will reach San Francisco in an hour and a half. It seems to be something that is 1,500 feet wide and 500 feet long. 2,230 June 18th, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. Ronell sat back in his chair, exasperated at the news he received a couple minutes earlier. Do we have any idea what that massive thing is? We have just received satellite imagery of it. It's a dragon. Its coloring is similar to the monsters in San Francisco. Based on the data from the E3, it is possible that it is a wingspan of more than 1,500 feet and a length of 500 feet. It is a wingspan of about 8 Boeing 747s, if it reaches San Francisco. The amount of destruction it can cause will be horrific. Ronell sighed. One thing after another. How long do we have? An hour and a half. A few minutes later, General Schmidt of the U.S. Northern Command appeared on screen. General, 
I want everything on hand that can intercept that thing to intercept that thing. Mr. President, I already understand the situation and we are working on it. The Air National Guard and the Air Force will be responding in a moment's notice. Rest assured, we will do everything in our power to shoot that thing down. Fresno Air National Guard Base California With the not yet setting sun in front of them, F-15CS and F-15DS of the 194th Fighter Squadron lifted off from the runway of the airport. Hill Air Force Base, Utah. F 35s of the 388th Fighter Wing sat on the tarmac. An officer shouted at the ground crew as he walked past Get it into air to air beast mode. There's a massive air target approaching San Francisco. Let's go. Let's go. The ground crews rushed to attack missiles onto the F 35s. Missiles were loaded into the internal load bay and onto the hard points on the wings. 14 MRAMs and two sidewinders were loaded onto each F-35. Washington, D.C. Ronell tapped his hand on the desk. How long till we engage it? It's gonna take about 10 minutes for our first wave of aircraft to have the target within missile range of the MRAMs. The Air Force and Air National Guard will be intercepting it. We are not sure how much of an effect the MRAMs will have on it but hopefully enough ordnance can kill it. 1945 June 18. 2020 CE Forrester Street, San Francisco, California. Everything north is basically overrun. Eric spoke into his comms after listening. I'm with Lance Corporal John Felder and Corman Ian Stevenson of the same company. We are currently behind enemy lines, specifically in a house on Forrester Street. Can anybody get us out of here? Negative. Corporal, the voice sounded very familiar. Second Lieutenant? Yes, Corporal. The entire 2nd Battalion has been pushed back. You guys are cut off. It's impossible to get to you. You will have to figure something out. Eric had his back against a wall and he looked to the other two. We have to retreat. We are cut off. Ian was kneeling on the ground tending to the wounded John. Let me finish patching him up. You alright? That's a bad looking head injury. Do you see how many fingers I'm holding up? John nodded. Yeah doc. Two. Tis but a scratch. Ian chuckled. I think you may need to get your head checked if you are quoting Monty Python. But yeah you seem fine enough. John laughed back. Let's get our asses out of here. Eric peeked out the window besides him. Well, we can't go through the front cause a fucking monster is outside. John stood up and responded. Let's try the back door. All right. Be quiet when exiting. We don't want to alert the damn things. Eric slowly opened the back door and peered out. Clear. It's a fenced in backyard. Should be safe. Let's go. They exited the house and into the backyard. Eric peeked over the fence. It's just all backyards. There seems to be a street on the right. But we are gonna need to vault over multiple fences and I'm not sure how safe that street is. 16. Chapter 114. The Dragon. 1955 June 18, 2020 CE. A few miles east of San Francisco. 52 F-35s closed into their firing position. Ahead of them, 24 F-16s were about 20 miles away from the Dragon that was closing in on San Francisco. Nearly a hundred MRAMs launched from the F-16s. The swarm of MRAMs cruised over the Pacific Ocean. Right ahead of them, a massive Dragon with a wingspan of nearly 1,500 feet flapped slowly towards San Francisco. Explosions blanketed the entire wingspan of the Dragon. Peterson Air Force Base, U.S. Northern Command Headquarters, Lieutenant General Doug tapped his chin while watching the large screen in front of him. Behind him, a number of soldiers were on computers with a variety of maps open. The Lieutenant General turned to General Schmidt. The missiles from the F-16S have no effect. It's continuing towards San Francisco. I can see that. So it took the brunt of nearly a hundred MRAMs and not a thing happened to it? Were any of the missiles shot down? We are certain that almost all missiles hit their target. The E-3 is reporting that it seems to be moving faster. I think we only pissed it off. Ten miles west of San Francisco. More than 700 MRAMs from the F-35S streaked through the skies over San Francisco, all headed towards the Dragon. This time, the explosions were much more numerous. The Dragon reopened its eyes after the onslaught of missiles. Its piercing red eyes shone through the smoke of the explosions. A roar filled the air in the ocean. 2305 June 18, 2020 CE. Situation Room. White House. Mr. President. General Skymt is reporting no effect at all. Ugh. Shit. Get me the general. 
The screen flickered on and General Skymed could be seen in his command center. General, Mr. President, we are preparing for the worst. We have a Patriot battery being set up to try to shoot it down. We are hoping that the bigger warhead would have an impact. Krausen shook his head. That thing took on nearly 30,000 pounds of explosives head on. What would a battery of Patriot missiles do? Then do we have any other option? A silence filled the room. Krausen leaned forward in his seat and clasped his hands together. The Nuclear One 2010 June 18, 2020 CE A few miles east of San Francisco. You have 30 minutes before a massive dragon will reach the area. A pilot in an F-35 got on his comms. Permission to engage with guns and the side winders? Request denied. The thing is gonna reach San Francisco if we don't kill it. Hundreds of MRAMs didn't do anything to it. And you expect guns and side winders to do anything? You are just gonna get yourself killed and waste your life for nothing. Return to base. That's an order. Understood. America Center Drive. San Jose, California. We are barely holding the line over here. Understood. Please await further instructions. An AC-130 watts Stinger 2's 105mm cannon rained down onto the lance fissures below as it circled the battle. The soldiers and vehicles on the ground didn't let up on their fire. Without ranged weapons, the lance fishes couldn't do much but mindlessly surge forth. Two F-15s passed over the horde while unleashing a cluster of 16 small diameter bombs from each aircraft. The radio crackled. Air support at Levi's Stadium will remain available unless the dragon changes direction. The pulverized corpses of thousands of the lance fishes littered the beach and the pavement but there seemed to be a tidal wave of them as they continued walking ashore. An A-10 swooped in with its signature BRRRRTTT coming from its rotary cannon. As it passed over the horde, a variety of cluster and regular bombs dropped from its wings. Explosions rocked the jet black tidal wave. As soon as the aircraft passed, the lance fishes surged into the places where their brethren had just been obliterated. Let's try the new shell out. Gunner AMP air burst up fire on the way. The round exploded in front of the horde, scattering fragments onto the lance fishes. Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. Colonel Todd listened to the orders while visibly upset. What do you mean ground all aircraft? I just got them into the air less than 30 minutes ago. A voice replied over the phone. The colonel seemed like he was about to throw the phone across the room but he put it down. Damn it. We finally got them up in the air but now we need to ground all of them. 2310 June 18th, 2020 CE. Situation Room. White House. Ronell shook his head. Are you insane? We are basically nuking San Francisco at this point. Krauss encountered. Won't the dragon cause destruction nonetheless? A nuclear bomb will be resigning every single person still in San Francisco to death. Only an utterly idiotic person would suggest such a thing. With a dragon, we might hope for people to escape. We aren't sure what the dragon is capable of. What if it could breath fire that could be comparable to a nuke? Ronell frowned. Why do you want to use a nuclear bomb on American soil that much? This is a last resort weapon. We may no longer have restrictions like we did on Earth. But throwing nukes around without a care in the world is not something I want to do. That dragon requires a last resort weapon. What if we threw a low-yield nuclear bomb at the thing? Won't that still have the consequences of fallout affecting thousands of people? So what if a couple thousand civilians get cancer or leukemia? We will save millions by destroying that thing before it gets to San Francisco. Ronell became silent. Somewhere in the Pacific. What do you mean our communications with our invasion force have been cut off? Sog should have been positioned far from the battle. Great Lord. We are pretty certain Sog has been destroyed. Sogra is such a massive entity. It couldn't have been that quickly destroyed. The humans have weapons that causes explosions. That seems to have been what happened to Sog. What about the next army? Our next army should be approaching in a couple hours. They have F with them. We will re-establish contact once they arrive. The Great Lord walked to a team of enlightened who were fiddling around with an aquatic creature of this plane. She observed them. One of them poured a purple viscous liquid into its scathing mouth. The reddish skin of the aquatic creature turned jet black and seemingly hardened. One of the enlightened had an obsida, a smooth black metal, in his hand. It was forged into a spear-like shape. The enlightened proceeded to place the obsida spear on the front of the aquatic creature. A purplish liquid oozed from the altered creature onto the obsida and secured it. They placed the creature back into the ocean and crowded round. 
The creature floated back up and was soon motionless. One of the enlightened who noticed her approached her. Great Lord, the aquatic creatures of this world are too weak for modification, so it seems, we are certain we can find a stronger being to re-engineer. I don't care, just make something useful. Thank you, Great Lord. 2010 June 18, 2020 CE, Hearst Avenue, San Francisco, California. We are only a couple of blocks from the City College of San Francisco, we just have to avoid getting caught, they were pressed up to a wooden fence in somebody's backyard. Eric peeked over the fence, the street was empty and there was a school building across from them, we should probably get into that school building, are you sure Eric, we have to cross an open street. I don't see any of the monsters here, is there nowhere else we can hide? The only thing across from us is the school building. That's the only way we can get to safety. Ian stayed silent and nodded. They could still hear heavy amounts of gunshots which gave them hope. 19, Chapter 115, The Destroyer of Worlds. Now, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. J. Robert Oppenheimer, father of the atomic bomb. 2315 June 18, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. By the time we get the bomber in the air, it would have already reached San Francisco. General Schmidt nodded at Kralson's statement, Mr. President, the Air Force is planning to strike it again. The President sighed, we already fired 800 missiles at the thing and it did nothing. Kralson crossed his arms. At least most of San Francisco is evacuated. The President shook his head. We are not nuking San Francisco, Kralson. We are not nuking a fucking major American city for Christ's sakes. Just because there's an overgrown flying lizard in the city, it could possibly breathe fire. We aren't in a fantas. The president stopped himself and sighed. We aren't certain of its capabilities. 2020 June 18, 2020 CE, Sunnyside Elementary School, San Francisco, California. The three soldiers all dropped to the floor the instant a roar shook the building. Ian frowned. What the fuck was that? Eric Whisper shouted. It's the dragon. Keep your head down. John looked at the two. Dragon? I forgot to tell you about that when it came over the comms. You were still unconscious then. Yeah, there's a dragon on its way here. John frown deepened. And you didn't tell me why? Well we are trying to sneak away from some monsters much closer to us. We just need to focus on getting out to here. Dragon didn't seem that important. Eric peeked out the window of the school building and looked towards the dimming sky. For right now, we should probably stay in here and see what happens. Just then, Eric Psy caught something. With what was left of the dimming twilight, he could make out a massive dragon. It flew right over them and it was terrifying. Although a completely different form, it was obvious that it was related to the monsters on the ground. The building seemed to quiver as it passed overhead. 2325 June 18, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. We have reports that the dragon has passed over San Francisco. It hasn't landed anywhere. If it keeps going, it's headed straight for Nevada. The president sighed. Where is it going if it's not stopping in San Francisco? General Schmidt frowned. We are not sure to be honest. So far it has been flying in a straight line. It hasn't changed direction that much. We are expecting for it to continue that route. Kralson immediately perked up about that. Nevada? Aren't our nuclear testing sites over there? Yes they are secretary. We can nuke the thing when it passes over one of the sites can't we? Won't that minimize the damage caused? Will it pass over the Nevada test site? General Schmidt nodded. Interesting proposal. Mr. President, if the Patriot missile system fails, then we won't have many options left. President Ronell rubbed his forehead. What will the collateral be if we nuke it in the Nevada test site? General Skymed nodded. I'm gonna get someone on that. In the meantime, the Patriot missiles have been set up to shoot it down into the San Francisco Bay. We will be seeing what happens in a few minutes. 2030 June 18, 2020 CE. 30 miles east of San Francisco, across the road from a worn-down gray barn, six Patriot missile launchers sat in a field overgrown with golden and green wheat-like vegetation. The sound of crickets echoed through the night. It's approaching the bay. We are ready to fire at your command. Fire. Six missiles exited from the launchers leaving a plume of dust around the launcher. The missiles streaked across the darkening orange sky. The crews stared at the radar as it dragged the missiles streaking towards the dragon. All confirmed hits. No effect on target. Fuck. 
pack up and relocate. We are not sure where it's going but we are not sticking around if it's trying to find what shot it with missiles. But, we can try another volley at it, the thing got hit with fuckton of missiles. I heard command has decided to smack it with a nuke in the test field in Nevada. We were just here as a last ditch effort. Our orders were clear, hit it and then bugger off. The trucks hooked themselves to the radar and the Patriot batteries. The Patriot batteries had little effect on it Mr. President. What do we have about the nuclear option? It's going to pass over the training range instead of the test site. If we use a low-yield nuclear device, there won't be much damage and the fallout won't affect any large population centers. We just have to evacuate the surrounding towns. How many people are in the surrounding towns? Tanapa is the biggest with a population of around 2,000 people. In addition to the smaller towns, we would be expecting to evacuate up to 3,000 people. And the fallout. How far will it spread? Most of the land is government land that we used as a training range. Well depending on the actual yield, the impact should be minimal due to the fact that most of the area is empty. Of course, the area will have to be avoided because of the fallout but there's usually nobody on most of this land anyway. Then we are going ahead with this, it's impervious to our conventional weapons. This is the only way we can shoot it down? Mr. President, this is our best option, are we even sure if it's gonna land somewhere, we shouldn't be taking any chances, it will pass through multiple cities that are filled with more people than San Francisco right now. Ronel slumped and sighed, get me the Pentagon's deputy director of operations and the commander of strategic command. Yes sir. A few minutes later, a few men were on the screens in front of the president. A nuclear cruise missile with a low enough yield to not cause major destruction to any large population centers but a high enough yield to kill that thing. An AGM-86B from a B-52 would do fine, it's a W-80 nuclear warhead with a blast yield of 150 kilotons of TNT, however, the question is whether or not it will hit the target since it's an air-to-ground missile. It does have an inertial navigation system with terrain contour matching but none of those mean it can hit a moving target. Although, with that large of a target, we can probably assume that the missile will hit it. Are we certain? I don't want to have to use a nuclear missile just to have it miss. We can probably calculate where the dragon will be based on its current speed and direction. Then use those coordinates to set the target. Worse comes to worse, we miss. The nuclear missile detonates on the ground close to it and the nuclear blast will still at least heavily injure it. Do we not have any nuclear missiles capable of hitting a moving aerial target? We retire those kinds of things in the 1980s. All right then. I'm ordering a nuclear strike on that dragon. An aide gave the president a black laminated card. On the screen, the deputy director of operations looked at his card. Tango Delta the president replied, Alpha Victor, Minute Air Force Base North Dakota. A single B-52 taxied onto the runway of the base. The runway was lit up with lights. Get the B-52 on cart start. We are loading it up with a nuclear cruise missile. The ground crew inserted small explosives into two compartments next to two of the eight turbofan engines. Black and white fumes poured out of the back of the B-52s from its engines. The B-52 taxied down the runway and lifted off into the night sky. A nuclear cruise missile launched from the belly of the B-52. 18. Chapter 116. The Hammer Falls. Do you prefer military time? Oh, 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 or regular time? 12 a.m., for the times that put above location. Military time. Oh, 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 regular time. 12 a.m. Total voters. 65. Cast vote. View results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Do you prefer military time? Oh, 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 or regular time? 12 a.m., for the times that put above location. 2105 June 18th, 2020 CE. Sky above Nevada. The dragon looked around in this foreign, night sky. The sky reminded it of what its world looked like before everything happened. It still remembered the time it was a being of its own. Before the monsters took over the world and made him into this. There wasn't much it could do but listen to the commands. Strangely, it hadn't received anything new so it was just flying in a straight line. Out of the corner of its eye, the dragon saw something approaching it. Another one of those weapons. This was a single one of the explosive arrows of whoever it was attacking. However, the explosive arrow was much slower than the ones that had hit it earlier. 
The dragon felt the arrow impact its back. Then a blinding light enveloped it. A mushroom cloud formed above where the dragon had been. 0005 June 19, 2020 CE Washington DC The president tapped on the table of the Situation Room as everyone awaited the report of the nuclear detonation. Everyone in the room was tired and cups of coffee were everywhere. General Schmidt who was in his command center was on screen. A flurry of activity occurred behind General Schmidt. Mr. President, we have confirmation that the dragon has been downed. A drone will fly over to verify its death. We have strike fighters on standby in case it needs to be bombed. There was mild clapping and a few unhappy faces. They had just launched a nuclear missile on American soil. Even though it was on grounds that have been used for nuclear testing before, it was still a very heavy decision. I want to know where that thing came from, and I want that place blown to smithereens. Also, Get someone to check on how bad the radiation around the nuclear detonation is and where it will spread, the EPA is already on that. Somewhere in the Pacific, on her shiny, jet black metallic throne in the middle of the island, the Great Lord listened patiently as her advisor translated the garbled message of the less intelligent soldier level, Great Lord, we have reconnected communications with our forces in the battle, the Great Lord stood up from her throne, how is the situation, how far inland have we pushed? There seems to be a stalemate, we have accomplished in taking the northern part of the peninsula but have not been able to advance any further south or east despite our large numbers. What about the dragon, we? The advisor frowned and paused as he got confirmation from the soldier. Lost contact. You lost contact? Are you still able to detect it? It's just gone. We can't find it or detect it. We are not certain what happened. It somehow disappeared during the time when communications became offline. Her advisor slowly inched away. The soldier had already dismissed themselves. She was not like her predecessor that skewered all who came with bad news. However that didn't mean she didn't have anger issues like her predecessor. At that moment, no one wanted to be near her when she sat quietly on her throne. 2045 June 18, 2020 CE, Sunnyside Elementary School, San Francisco, California. Corporal Lerically looked out at the school building. If I remember correctly, we are only a couple streets away from the City College of San Francisco. I can hear the intense firefight from here. Ian frowned. Won't that mean there are gonna be those monsters swarming in front of us since we are approaching the front line? Eric rubbed the back of neck. They won't expect us to come from behind in the night? Ian shook his head and sighed we still need to get through them and I have no interest in running through a group of those things. And with his head injury, I'm not sure how well John will do. John looked up, I'm perfectly fine, doc, it just hurts a bit, then that's bad, that's a head injury, also I'm a medic, not a doctor, we need to get you to actual help, Eric sighed, I'm gonna get second lieutenant on the comms and see what they can do, Eric got on his communication device, go ahead corporal, I'm listening, we are approaching the city college of San Francisco from Forrester Street and hearing heavy combat, is there any path we can take to get to you guys, negative, we are holding the line but monsters are swarming the place, is there any way you can make a path for us, Lance Corporal Felder is a bit banged up with a head injury and may need medical attention, no reply came for a few seconds, ok corporal, I will see what I can do, in the meantime, are you able to check on how many monsters are on Fister Street? Got it, sir. A few minutes later, Eric reported what he saw outside from the second floor window of the school. It's a bit dark so I can't confirm. Corporal, where exactly are you on Fister Street? We are currently in a building that seems to be an elementary school. Which type of those monsters are you seeing? The anteater-like ones with spears for noses or the humanoid ones? From the forms, I believe they are the humanoid types. Thanks for the info, Corporal, go down Fister Street and in exactly, 20 minutes, have yourself right behind the avenue between the rows of houses and the college. How will you let us know that the path is clear? Keep an eye out and just get ready to run, there will be a clear path. 0010 June 19, 2020 CE, Washington DC, we have confirmation of the death of the dragon, we are confident that the dragon is not alive. A green-tinted night vision video feed was shown from the camera of the drone. In the desert below, a charred corpse of the dragon with half of its wings missing was shown. The aide went on. Since it was an airburst, the nuclear fallout is minimal. However, 
it is still recommended to avoid a 10-mile radius around the blast zone. Although the towns closest to the nuclear blast were not affected, the EPA has recommended testing the area for radiation so we will have to relocate a couple thousand people for the time being. Ronell leaned back on his chair. How's the media coverage on this? People are definitely debating about the usage of a nuclear weapon on American soil. Most are still reeling from the invasion of San Francisco. Ronell rubbed his closed eyes. Well, I hope we can weather this storm. Not that it's that important. I kind of just want to retire and go to the beach at this point. McDill Air Force Base Florida. General Thompson, our drones have spotted movement on the easternmost shores of the Magos Imperium. It is just as we anticipated. Earlier sightings were most definitely these monsters' reconnaissance forces. How's the situation on the ground? All civilians have been evacuated and the Magusian military is pulling back as instructed. We will wait as more of these monsters advance inland, then we will hit them somewhere in the Pacific. She had calmed down immensely from her anger. She had found her scientists tinkering with another aquatic species of this world. Great Lord, we are gonna use the toy that you guys has been so excited about. How many of them do we have? We have five in total. You are certain it won't have any effects on our forces, just the humans? Yes we have done extensive testing on both our own and the humans. Early tests had a very bad effect on our own and many died but with later improvements it has proven extremely lethal to humans and non-lethal to us. Can they be ready before our second wave of forces land? The gate has to be fully cleared so we can transport them across. But we believe they can be ready before our second wave arrives. 18. Chapter 117, Fire in the Sky 0010 June 19, 2020 CE, McDill Air Force Base Florida, General Abrams Thompson watched the digital strategic map on the screen. The red that indicated the area that the monsters have taken grew on the eastern portion of the Mac Imperium. His aide looked up from the comm system. The monsters are swiftly advancing forwards from their landing positions, they are pushing out from the port city and into the surrounding farmland. They will be approaching the outer kill zones within minutes. Inform all artillery units to fire on their pre-designated targets, accounting for time to impact. The general looked at his watch. They should hit them as soon as they arrive. 0805 Sun 49th, 196 E, in a field 50 miles from Stillport, Mac Imperium. We have confirmation to fire at the pre-designated coordinates. Light them up. The missile pods on the M270 MLRS that were already lifted up towards the sky and let off a volley of 12 M30A1 rockets. The rest of the battery of two other M270s let off their rockets towards the sky. Monsters advanced lazily through the tight streets of the city that were lined with red and grey brick buildings. A whistling sound caught their attention and they looked up to the sky to see where the noise came from. All hell broke loose as the streets and buildings were peppered by holes as the monsters were torn apart by tungsten fragments falling from the sky. The tungsten fragments sliced and ripped through the monsters. The M270 gunner leaned back on his chair. I don't think the Mekans will be happy with all that collateral damage in their city. At least they are just metal pieces and not the explosive Pikm submunitions. Should be much easier to fix. I'm pretty certain the brass brought up M777S to finish up the job so it doesn't really matter. In the distance, they could hear the booms of the M777S as they fired. 0022 June 19th. 2020 CE, Washington DC. Mr. President, we believe we have found where the monsters originated from. A haggard-looking Ronell set down his coffee. Go on. We have found an island in the western portions of the Pacific. We are currently confirming whether or not this island existed beforehand. Another island? How big of an island is this for this many demons to appear? Don't tell me this is something like the elves and there were a bunch of them living underwater. This is not confirmed but there seems to be a structure in the middle of the island that is transporting more of these monsters here. Ronell rubbed his eyes. Great, this could mean they are coming from somewhere else on this planet. I have been informed that it is possible for it to be not from this planet. A gate from another world? What is this? A pro JSDF Japanese fantasy novel series? Well, we are basically in a fantasy world so why not? Our situation feels like a fantasy web novel written by someone. 0711 Sun 49th, 196 E. Boom Republic. Six of the once prominent members of the Boom nobility sat around a table. 
a heavy silence permeated the air. Finally, one of the members spoke. Seems like these demons actually exist. That is a problem for our plans. Why? This is an opportunity. These demons are only invading the Americans and the Mac right now. We should take this chance to throw the Americans out. The Americans stopped leaving. That's the problem. Then we will have to push back the date of what we plan to do. We will let these Americans fight the demons for us. I overheard rumors that they will be establishing a permanent base here. Everyone was silent at the table again. Even with our original plans, we had no way of preventing them from coming back. We say we had plans but I don't think any of us have any idea what we are doing. The silence continued after that sentence. It's not fair at all. These Immersions just all of a sudden appear out of nowhere and then mess up the order of the world. I had plans you know. Being a noble and all, you know. Maybe we should just give up. We lived under the yoke of the Mac before this and now we live under these Americans. What's the difference? Well under the Mac, we were nobles, and the Americans completely destroyed the Mac. What hope do we have? You know what, screw this, I'm done. The person stood up and exited out of the room. A silence hung in the air yet again. One of them interrupted it. I'm thinking about using what I have left to create a business. Who wants to do that instead? We could make a joint business. The commoner merchants seem to have gotten rich doing this so why can't we? 2120 June 18th, 2020 CE, near the intersection of Fuster Street and Staples Avenue. The gunfire was much much closer now. Jesus. How the fuck are we meant to safely get across this? Eric poked his head up from the wooden fence they were hiding behind. It was dark and he could make out a row of houses that was basically on an incline across the street. The front yards of each house was terraced. Each house had stairs leading up to the front door. None of them had fences that they could jump over. Ian shrugged. At least the monsters aren't filing into the avenue and are just pushing forward on the street. Eric sighed in resignation. We can hide in those bushes and find a house we can get into. Let's just hope that somebody left in a panic and forgot to lock their doors. There has to be at least one house. Monsters packed Forrester Street. Eric prayed that the darkness of the night hopefully concealed them. A couple minutes later. You geese stay down here. I will sneak up the stairs and see if either house has their door open. Eric twisted the doorknob on the door and pushed into no avail. He tried the door in the neighboring house. Seven minutes later. Come on. Come on. Finally, the door swung slightly inwards as Eric gently pushed it in. He crouched walked down the stairs and whispered to Ian and John. Let's go. This house has its door open. They had passed through a few more backyards and another street before getting to their supposed position. Ian looked out of the window of the house they were hiding in. Now what? We are basically at where they told us to be and this place is swarming with them. They could hear a massive boom from where they suspected the front line was. They were on the first floor of a house right next to where they were told to be. It was directly on the front and the monsters infested the streets. They were lucky to have snuck into this house Eric's comes crackled. You in position? Yes, sir. Get your ass ready to run. You will know when to do it. Multiple booms penetrated the air. Suddenly, the swarms of monsters were being mowed down. Explosions after explosions impacted the mob of monsters. Traces from machine gun fire lit up the night. Ian shook his head in disbelief. Jesus fuck. They want us to run through that? Ian, John, hug the wall. They're concentrating fire in the middle of the street. Hug the wall. Go, go, go. They made it out of the house and stuck themselves to the wall outside. They started moving towards the human lines. Peterson Air Force Base Colorado. General Ralph Albert, commander of both U.S. Northern Command and NARAD, rushed into the command center. He was immediately greeted by his deputy commander. The general's face was serious as he asked his deputy, Give me a rundown. What's happening? Sir, our satellites are detecting missile launches from the Pacific. Are we certain it's not a glitch in the system? No one in this world is supposed to have missile technology. We are not certain. The PAVE pause at the Beale Air Force Base is currently tracking five possible missiles. The system is calculating its trajectory and should come up with a solution quite soon. Everyone in the room closely looked at the screens on the wall as the trajectory was calculated by the computer. Within a few seconds, lines appeared showing where the missiles were headed. Each line streaked to the same city. Realization dawned on them. Sir, we need to get Washington on the line right now. They are all heading for San Francisco. 17. Chapter 118. 
Limited Exchange, 0033 June 19, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. Ronell's face was extremely bitter. It was almost as if he aged 10 years and got a hundred wrinkles. Missiles? Are we certain that's not a glitch? We are confirming it right now and preparing for the possible need to intercept the missiles. Getting red on the goddamn line. On the screen, General Albert appeared. Mr. President, are you certain this is not? The general replied as if he had expected the question. No, Mr. President, it is not a glitch. We are 99% certain that those are in fact missiles. All of them are headed for San Francisco. Ronell took a deep breath. Where exactly are those missiles from? We detected missile launches from this island in the western part of the Pacific. The screen changed to depict a satellite map of the Pacific. Ronell pinched the bridge of his nose as he replied. Make that 100%. I have just recently been informed that that is where these creatures came from. Do we know what kind of missiles they are? Due to their range and their exotmospheric capabilities, we are categorizing these five missiles as intercontinental ballistic missiles. However, we are uncertain as to what type of warhead they are carrying. They could be conventional, biological, chemical, or nuclear. We are also uncertain if they are MRFs. Are we able to intercept them? I have already put in motion the orders to shoot them down. We have the ground-based mid-course defense in Alaska that will fire once the missiles are within range. If the missiles get through that, SM-3s fired from ships based in Naval Base San Diego will attempt to shoot down any that get through. What are the chances of intercept? We are 90% certain we are capable of intercepting all five missiles. Ronell side, only 90%. Mr. President, sir. Shooting down an ICBM is a complicated task. To be honest, the 90% estimate might be an overestimation. In our simulated tests in perfect conditions, the GMD system has had only a 55% success rate overall. We are hoping the newest variant of the SM3s that we haven't tested yet could do something. I know. I know that it's complicated. We can only hope for the best. Has this information gotten to the ground forces in San Francisco yet? They should have been informed already. Thank you, General. Now if you don't mind, I have an island to wipe off of the face of this fucking planet. The screen turned off as Ronell faced the room. Get me the Pentagon's Deputy Director of Operations and the Commander of Strategic Command again. 2035 June 18th. 2020 CE, Fort Greeley, Alaska. Multiple ground based interceptors flew up into the starry Alaskan sky out of their silos. The exhaust flame lit up the cool night. 2135 June 18, 2020 CE, Judson Avenue, San Francisco. Corporal, just as Eric arrived onto friendly grounds after crossing the avenue, his second lieutenant shouted at him. Eric looked around. Multiple Abrams tanks had situated themselves on the downward slope that was right besides the sidewalk. Only their turrets were exposed on the avenue. His second lieutenant came running to his group. Corporal, good to see you. Find a vehicle and get in. We are retreating. Eric looked quizzically at his second lieutenant. What? Why, sir? I thought this was the last line before these monsters got to the AVAC site. The monsters somehow had missiles. Nrad just detected five launches at San Francisco. It might be nuclear so we are gonna pull back as much as we can before they hit. What? What about the civilians? We are putting the remaining civilians in trucks and prioritizing the roads for them. Get yourself to safety. Understood, sir. Also, don't get into a Humvee. Get in a Bradley or Striker if you can. Those have CPRN protection. If you can't, then get into a Nabrams. If the missiles are just biological or chemical weapons, you will be fine in them. Do we not have gas masks? Logistics is getting them here right now as fast as possible but there won't be enough for everybody. If you get a mask handed to you, put it on and get into a Humvee. A few minutes later, Eric, John, and Ian piled into the back of a Bradley. They were squeezed in since the Bradley was already crowded with the original squad. Good to have you folks on board. Sit tight. Until we get the all clear, stay inside the vehicle. 0035 June 19, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. On screen were the same men who authorized the usage of a nuclear bomb on the Dragon. Twice in less than a few hours, Mr. President Ronell nodded. 
we have located where these monsters have come from and they have just launched missiles at San Francisco. I want a nuclear strike on that island. It's quite obvious that these creatures are a threat to humanity and we need to act now. Any protest against this? Nobody said a word. All right. I want to authorize the use of a nuclear ICBM. I'm afraid they will use more missiles so I want the fastest option possible. The commander of strategic command nodded, understood sir. Since it's a new day, I guess we have the new codes right? The Pentagon deputy director of operations looked at his card. Yes, Mr. President, Oscar Hotel, an aide gave the president a black laminated card. Ronell looked at it. Juliet Tango. 2240 June 18th, 2020 CE. Malmstrom Air Force Space Montana. The missile combat crew commander turned to his deputy after looking at the screen. We are getting launch orders. Open the safe. The safe that contained the sealed authenticator was locked with two locks. Each of them had a key to open one of the locks. They both opened their respective locks. The deputy looked at the code from the screen as the commander got the sealed authenticator out of the envelope. Are the SAS codes valid? The commander nodded. They are the same. You take a look. Yep. They are the same. The commander got in front of the launch control and began typing in the code. Okay, it's all typed in. The commander and his deputy put in their respective keys to their own launch control. They looked at each other and nodded. Both of them turned their key. The silo hatch slid open and a tower of flames spewed upwards and brightened the entire area. Covered in the flames, an LGM 30 Minute Man 3 missile shot out of the silo, almost like a massive bright star. The ICBM traveled upwards in a curve towards the sky. 20. Chapter 119, Race to Intercept. 2035 June 18, 2020 CE, five minutes earlier. Fort Greeley, Alaska. The night sky was veiled in darkness and the frigid Arctic air blew across a field where military police Humvees zoomed round. Tension gripped the soldiers stationed at the ground-based midcourse defense installation. Inside the command center controlling the ground-based interceptors, five soldiers sat in front of their monitors, each carrying out their task. The commanding officer, Colonel Chris Kabler, stood behind the five soldiers and looked at the three monitors that hung at the top of the front of the room. On the three monitors, blips slowly blinked across the map each blip representing an approaching hostile missile. The atmosphere was heavy with the gravity of the situation. The communication officer reported the situation. One minute remaining until hostile missiles breach the threshold of our interceptors. Sir, the commanding officer, Colonel Chris Kabler, glanced at the screens. He wasted no time in issuing his orders, his voice resonating with authority. I want a ratio of two interceptors per hostile missile. Initiate the countdown at five seconds, acknowledging the command. The operations officer nodded with a firm resolve. The other soldiers swiftly moved into action. The room fell into a focused silence as they adjusted controls, double-checked systems, and ensured that every aspect was ready for the interceptors to launch. The operation officer soon began the countdown in a steady but undeniably urgent voice. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Within range, sir. The commanding officer barked out the order to fire. Engage. Outside the command center. Lights were flashing across the field where the interceptors rested in the launch tubes in the ground. Horns and warning messages were being broadcasted of the imminent launch. Military police that patrolled the interceptor missile field have already cleared off. The ground of the field burst in pillars of fire as the night sky soon lit up with the fiery trails of the ten interceptor missiles. The thunderous roar of their engines filled the air, drowning out all the blaring horns and warning messages. The soldiers in the command center held their breath, their eyes locked on the monitors displaying the ongoing interception. 0040 June 18, 2020 CE, now Washington DC, an aide gave the announcement, Mr. President, we have just launched our ICBMs and the ground-based interceptors are approaching the hostile missiles. Ronell had his entire being focused on the screen in front of him. The rest of the situation room was in a similar state of being projected across the screen, green blips representing the interceptors blinked slowly across the map edging ever closer towards the red blips of the hostile missiles. A singular blue blip over Idaho represented the American ICBM that had, mere seconds ago, been fired in response. Two minutes later, the green blips had converged on the red blips. 
Time slowed and the seconds seemingly felt like hours as Ronel waited to see if the red blips would continue. Two red blips blinked forwards. An aide got off the phone and bitterly confirmed what he saw. Mr. President, three missiles have been successfully intercepted. Two have broken through to our final line of defense. Ronel took a sip of his water, put the glass down, and made no comment. Fort Greeley, Alaska. The same screen was being shown on the three monitors at the top of the front of the room. The operation officer reported the result, confirmed interception and destruction of three of the five missiles headed towards San Francisco. Two missiles are confirmed undamaged and still heading to San Francisco. Three minutes later, Naval Base San Diego. The captain of the USS Spruance looked at the radar that showed the incoming two missiles. His Ali Burke-class destroyer was already loaded with all the SM-3 block hires they could get their hands on the newest variant of the SM-3 and was said to have the capability to possibly intercept ICBMs. However, this capability had never been tested. It was supposed to be tested against an ICBM by the end of this year but now it's going against the real deal. The captain's voice reverberated through the control room of the USS Spruance, cutting through the tension-filled air. Split the SM-3s targeting between the two incoming missiles, five on both. Under the light blue lights of the control room, the crew sprang into action. On the green radar screen, the two red blips representing the incoming missiles drew nearer. The crew manning the controls set the limited number of the block IEs to split between the imminent threats. As the missiles closed in on their target, the crew members stood ready to launch at the captain's command. The captain gave the order. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 launch. An ear-splitting siren blared on the deck of the ship, both front VLS cells and the aft VLS cells opened up, the front and back of the ship were illuminated by a blaze of fire and smoke as if the sun had just appeared, the front and aft VLS cells launched their first SM-3 and the noise of their launch drowned out the siren. The noise of the siren returned as the first two SM-3 block hires streaked skyward, leaving trails of exhaust smoke in their wake. The siren was interrupted again as the next two missiles launched, two at a time. Missiles streaked towards the sky. Skies over the Pacific. Two missiles traveled over the Pacific. Under the moonlight, the missiles were shaped like a dark greenish mass of meat. It was pulsating and seemingly had small limbs and eyes jutting out everywhere. Fire spewed out of the back of the missiles through some unknown chemical reaction that propelled the organic missiles forward at insane speeds. One of the eyes on the missile moved its pupil after noticing something blazing towards it. Naval Base San Diego, the crew members in the USS Spruance control room fixated their eyes on the radar screen, tracking the trajectory of the hostile missiles. Beads of sweat formed on some of their brows as they watched. The green blips of 10 SM-3 block hires closed in on both red blips. Washington, D.C. The situation room was filled with tense anticipation, as the green blips representing the SM-3 interceptors closed in on their targets. President Ronell's gaze remained fixed on the map display, his heart pounding in his chest. The room buzzed with restrained energy, the air thick with the weight of the impending outcome. The first two SM-3s that reached the first missile seemingly missed, two green blips flying past the red blip. However the green blip of the third SM-3 seemed to have stopped right on the red blip of the missiles. Both the red blip and green blip disappeared. However, no cheers could be heard for the interception though. The second hostile missile had yet to be hit by its fourth SM-3. The fourth blip flying past it. The fifth and last SM-3 moved ever closer to the missile. Seconds ticked by. The last green and red blip converged. The red blip moved forward. Everybody looked at the phone as it rang. An aide picked up the phone. He proceeded to announce the bitter news to President Ronell, his voice laced with disappointment. Mr. President, despite the successful interception of the first missile, all five of the SM-3s meant for the second missile have failed. It's continuing towards San Francisco. Ronell's expression tightened, his disappointment mirrored in the somber faces surrounding him. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily upon them. San Francisco. The commander of the Bradley that Eric was in shouted into the crew compartment. I just got informed that one of the missiles got through. Brace for impact. 16. Chapter 120. Strike back. 2140 June 18th, 2020 CE. 10 minutes before missile impact. San Francisco. 
Eric sat quietly in the Bradley with apprehension, he didn't quite know how to feel, he felt very safe now that he was back in friendly territory, however, the threat of the ICBM had him worried, he could hear the thump, thump of the Bradley's 25mm as they performed a fighting retreat, he was hopeful that the NBZ system on the Bradley could withstand whatever sort of ICBM that was thrown at them, the retreat was done in as organized a way as possible, however, since they were in the middle of a massive city, not all vehicles could retreat at the same time. Most of the Humvees left first since the Abrams and Bradleys were slower and better suited to cover the rear. Soon, the Bradleys started retreating too with the Abrams slowly backing whilst still covering their rear. Most of the vehicles had to navigate the roads of the City College of San Francisco which was narrow. Eric's Bradley and a few other armored vehicles had resorted to driving over the baseball field and soccer field at Balboa Park, a park directly adjacent to the college. As a few of the tanks moved on to the field, the well-kept grass was soon ripped up by the retreating armor. All this while, the monsters slowly pushed forward despite a wall of lead of all sorts of calibers from Abrams and Bradley's 2150 June 18, 2020 CE. Now, Eric soon heard a shout from presumably the commander of the vehicle. Cease fire, cease fire. The monsters have stopped advancing, continue backing up. Just a few seconds later, the same voice was shouting again. I just got informed that one of the missiles got through. Just in case get ready for impact suburbs of Seattle, across the United States, those that did not mind staying awake late had their eyes glued onto the television, a family of four were watching their television with anxiety, we have received confirmation that four out of the five missiles heading for San Francisco have been successfully intercepted, however, one missile is expected to strike the city, to those who are still in San Francisco, we urge you to prioritize your safety and seek shelter immediately. Take refuge in the basement or the innermost room of the building you are in. It is crucial to distance yourselves from windows and exterior walls. Secure your homes by closing all windows and doors, sealing any gaps, and turning off any ventilation systems to minimize the risk of exposure. If you begin noticing any suspicious colors or odors in the air, it is of utmost importance to avoid inhaling it. Protect yourself by covering your nose and the mouth with a wet cloth or wear a gas mask if available. 0050 June 18, 2020 CE Washington DC The atmosphere in the Situation Room was heavy and thick with concern. Ronell tapped his fingers on the table. We can only hope to God that that doesn't have a nuclear warhead or anything else more dangerous. Kraus nodded. Nuclear warheads require a lot of scientific knowledge to build. Based on these creatures, it is more likely that whatever they have on that missile is biological or chemical. If it is chemical or biological, how many civilians will be caught up in it? Are our soldiers protected? Our soldiers should be protected with their NBC equipment. We have also begun issuing gas masks to civilians that are on evacuation buses. The problem now is the surviving civilians that have been unable to be evacuated. We have already begun broadcasting on emergency frequencies in San Francisco and have already informed news channels of the situation, but there isn't really much else we can do for them. A couple seconds later, upper atmosphere above San Francisco. The greenish missile plummeted towards the center of San Francisco at great speeds. It hit then embedded itself into the ground with the bottom half of the missile jutting out of the ground. A fizz that indicated the release of gas could be heard in the middle of San Francisco. VGHG stood next to his second in command, Shkvdik, and told him what was passed down telepathically to all creatures ranked above regular from the Great Lord. We are not to advance until the smell killer arrives. Once we smell the smell killer, we can proceed since the humans will be all dying around us. Shkvdik nodded. We rest then. Human have terrifying weapons. Me think good idea wait. Me worry we won't survive. VGHG tilted his head does it matter if we survive or don't survive? Whatever the Great Lord commands us to do, how will be done? Great Lord wills it. That true. Me see a lot death. Cause me lose core values. 2213 June 18th, 2020 CE. Near the outer limits of San Francisco. The U.S. military had just undergone a massive retreat and were nearing Daly City, a city basically connected to San Francisco. Once they crossed over the line, there won't be any U.S. forces in San Francisco and it would have been considered completely conquered by the monsters. Eric shouted towards the front of the Bradley. Hey, 
Bradley Commander, are you sure the ICBM has hit? It should have struck by now but I didn't hear any sort of explosion or seen anything happen at all, the name Staff Sergeant Dallas. It is possible that it was non-explosive. Just stay in the vehicle for now. The monsters stopping their advance most definitely has to do something with the missile. We got orders to set up a defensive line at Elimini Boulevard, right outside of Daly City. The various military vehicles were soon filling up the wide boulevard and most of the vehicles had stopped there. In space, the Minuteman 3 that was currently in space had already gone through most of its booster stages. The cone cover of the re-entry vehicle split open to reveal the smaller cone of the single W87 warhead. The last booster separated from the re-entry vehicle. Small thrusters oriented the re-entry vehicle towards the Earth and made minor adjustments. The conical W87 warhead was soon released from its re-entry vehicle base. The W87 warhead started its rapid descent towards a small, blackened island in the Pacific. 17. Chapter 121. Detonation. 2213 June 18. 2020 CE Alimini Boulevard, San Francisco. The boulevard was illuminated by the headlights of the numerous armored vehicles. Everybody was a bit confused and waited quietly in their vehicles as the detonation of the missile had yet to go off. Eric rubbed his chin wondering if whatever missile they had feared hit San Francisco was a dud. Demon fob in the Pacific. The Great Lord sensed something wrong and stood from her open air throne to look around her area. Guards. I feel danger but I don't see anything. Check the surroundings, great lord. Nothing is through it. The guard was cut off as a massive explosion detonated in the middle of the island. There was a blinding flash of light and a mushroom cloud rose to the sky. The ground trembled violently. What is? The great lord was cut off as the shock wave threw her onto the ground. Within seconds, thermal radiation swept over her. The searing heat and flames of the blast quickly engulfed the entire island turning it into a flaming inferno. The only thing that was left standing on the island was a strange circular swirling purple that sat in the middle of the island. Ten minutes later, Eric spoke up in the Bradley well nothing seems to be happening. Staff Sergeant. The Staff Sergeant didn't reply to Eric but gave an announcement instead. I just got informed that PLS trucks are arriving with more than enough gas masks for everyone. I want everybody to have one just in case. The back door of the Bradley was opened and Derek could see the palletized load system trucks driving into the boulevard. A few minutes later, the gas mask was definitely not the most comfortable thing as Eric, now back inside the Bradley, adjusted it in a vain attempt to address the discomfort. Voices came through comms. Yep I see it too. That's probably what the missile brought. Some sort of gas attack. Let's hope our gas masks work. The green gas soon started to envelop the vehicles in the boulevard. The staff sergeant started talking. All systems are holding up. The Bradley is airtight. The staff sergeant then talked into comms. A few seconds later, a curt reply came through. The gas masks are working. Washington DC. An aide started reporting. We are getting information from units on the ground that this may be a chemical attack. They are seeing some sort of green gas. Ronel nodded. Seems to be as predicted. Are our men all fine? The gas masks seem to be working and no deaths among our units have been reported. The tension and apprehension seem to lift a bit at that news. Ronel breathed a sigh of relief. It is not as bad as we feared. What are the chances that those trapped inside San Francisco will survive? Kralsen commented on that. It will depend on what sort of gas it is. We have given orders for some of the gas to be taken as a sample and sent to a lab in order to see what it is. Are we able to push them back now? How many more units are arriving? Kralsen, elements of the 41st Infantry Brigade Combat Team from Oregon and elements of the 116th Cavalry Brigade Combat Team from Idaho are all racing to get to San Francisco. Combined, elements from those two BCTs should amount to about 5,000 more men. We also have more Marines from elements of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force from Camp Pendleton flooding in. In addition to the units already present in San Francisco, the 79th Infantry Brigade Combat Team and the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, this is most of our ground combat units that we have at hand in the West Coast. We also have amphibious assault ships with their complement of Marines and aircraft nearly ready to sail towards San Francisco once the ocean is confirmed to be clear. If we add them all up, it should amount to 20,000 to 30,000 men. 
They have armor support and limited air support due to hostile anti-air. We have been avoiding the usage of artillery and missiles and resorting to precision airstrikes in fear of collateral damage if there are any surviving civilians in the city. We will have to wait and see whether or not that would be sufficient in pushing forward. 2227 June 18, 2020 CE, near Alamany Boulevard, San Francisco. Amongst the crowd of demons, VGHG looked to the front of the street. I'm seeing the human metal boxes in front of us. They have some sort of light, it's very bright. Shkvdik responded. Human alive? Around them the demon army slowly marched forward. I'm not sure. Their boxes aren't moving at all though. Maybe they dead inside? Most likely. Then let's march forward with the rest of the army. Alimani Boulevard, San Francisco. The gunner of the Bradley that Eric was in spoke to the staff sergeant. Staff sergeant, the monsters are getting close. I see the damn things in front of us. Don't open Fion yet, I got orders not to open fire on them until they almost get into the boulevard. Won't they attack us, sir? They aren't doing so yet. So they might think we are dead due to their gas attack, just keep calm and open fire when I tell you. The gunner nodded in response to that, the staff sergeant had his hand reached out, his other hand was trying to get the comms as close as he could to his ear, he repeated what he was hearing. Wait for it, wait for it, now, fire. The connection between the street and the boulevard exploded as machine guns, 120mm cannons, and 25mm chain guns opened up on the monsters that were only a few yards in front. The unsuspecting monsters were caught off guard. Sudden explosions went off at the front of the demon army, they're not dead. Push forward, for the great lord. The mass of monsters surged forwards into the kill zone set up by the human armor. Soldiers disembarked from their vehicles in order to start laying down small arms fire on the surging mass. Eric kneeled as he fired off his M27 rifle. Besides him, a soldier wielding an AT-4 stood up. Back blast clear. Clear. Rocket. 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 An AT-4 rocket slammed into the mass of monsters. 19. Chapter 122. Defang the Demons. 0127 June 19th, 2020 CE. 0843 Sun 49th, 196 E. Stillport, Mac Imperium. A soldier raised his M4 at the twitching monster humanoid on the ground. The thing had been hit by so many tungsten fragments from the M30A1 rockets but yet was somehow still alive. He let off two shots to what he thought was the monster's head. The monster stopped moving. The soldier looked around the streets and got onto his cums. Couple monsters still twitching but nothing else. Corpses of the monsters littered the pockmarked stone ground. The soldier observed his surroundings closer and realized that everything here had been pockmarked by the tungsten fragments. Fifty miles from Stillport, Mac Imperium, the driver of the M270 MLRS nodded his head as he listened to the radio. He looked over to his gunner. Seems like we didn't have to resort to a nuclear bomb for this. When the enemy has no means to counter artillery and we don't have to worry or pay much for the damages, then artillery is truly king. Although this assault felt much much less intense than what I heard was happening in San Francisco. I hope the guys over there are doing okay. Seems like brass doesn't want to use artillery on our own city unless necessary. They are allowing precision strikes though via aircraft. 2300 June 18, 2020 CE. Alimani Boulevard, San Francisco. Humvees poured into the boulevard and soldiers dismounted. Eric momentarily stopped his firing as the new soldiers rushed to their lines in order to help suppress the monsters. Who you guys with? 41st Brigade Combat Team. How about you? I'm with the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit. Although I think at this point. The unit has been put back into the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. 0200 June 19, 2020 CE. Washington DC. Ronell nearly had his head slam into his desk but he jerked himself up. He really needed sleep at this point. The coffee just wasn't doing it for him. He was so weary he couldn't direct a question to anyone so he decided to ask it out loud at random. How likely is something major going to happen in the next hours? Someone responded but Ronell was too tired to care. Seeing that we have nuked their base of operations, we are hoping that the advance of these beings stops. I have confidence that we are able to hold the line and keep the outer edge of San Francisco. Ronell rubbed his eyes. It is extraordinarily late at night now and I need to sleep. Wake me up four hours from now or if any pressing matters occur beforehand, 
Ronell would have liked more sleep but that was the downside of being president especially with the amount of strange things that have occurred, why couldn't I have had a normal presidency, damn it, he slumped his back into the chair and promptly fell asleep, well if they need anything, they can just wake me up since I'm still in the situation room, four hours later, Ronell yawned and drank his cup of coffee, he barely got enough sleep but it was better than nothing, it was a bit unsightly to fall asleep in front of everyone in the situation room but he didn't have much choice, he was now awake and directing questions at Kralson, How's the situation in San Francisco? The monsters seem to be thinning out and the more and more of our men are arriving. The amount of ammunition they are consuming is a minor concern though. We are certain we can keep them supplied but they are burning through it at an amazing rate. I want San Francisco to be retaken if it is possible. Have we been monitoring that island where the monsters have come from? We are pretty certain that everything on that island has been wiped out. However, the satellite imagery is seemingly being disrupted by something in the middle of the island, what is it then? Whatever that is basically confirms our original theory that the gate is where they came from, the island is not large at all, unless there were more space underground, there would not have been sufficient room at all for this amount of creatures we are facing. We suspect the gate structure was wiped out but the portal still remains. That static and random coloration in the middle of the island is most likely the portal. 0310 June 19, 2020 CE, Mission Street, San Francisco. Eric was shaken awake from his brief nap. The sound of gunfire returned to his ears. Your nap shift is over, soldier get to the front. Eric thanked the random soldier, grabbed his rifle beside him, and stood up. Sleeping in a gas mask was not the most comfortable thing but he had been beyond tired to even care. He got out his water canteen from his pouch and connected the gas mask's drinking system to it. The drinking system was basically a tube attached to the gas mask that allowed it to be connected with his issued water canteen. He tilted the water canteen upwards and started gulping in water. He looked to the sky. He hadn't exactly checked the time but the sky was still dark, he was only a block away from the front line. With low risk of an enemy breakthrough, logistics was moving in and out of the area dropping off all supplies in order to support those at the front. A hen truck sped past him and came to a sudden halt. Soldiers in gas masks jumped out and seemed to start unloading rounds for the Abrams 120mm cannon. Other than attacking them from the roads that directly led into Alimany Boulevard, some of the monsters had climbed up onto the freeway which was basically on a hill in front of the boulevard and were spilling downwards towards them. A few minutes later, Eric rushed to the hastily constructed sandbag positions and joined the massive firefight. At this point, this was like a defense mission from a video game where one battled an endless horde of enemies. However, from what he heard, the enemies were thinning out. There won't be any more in the future since the island where these things came from was obliterated by a nuclear missile. Orders started coming through the comms. This part of the boulevard is hard to defend due to the southern freeway blocking the view. We need to take a better position. 0610 June 19, 2020 CE, Washington DC. Ronell sipped his coffee and tried his best to relax whilst fighting the urge to fall asleep again. It had been confirmed that the retaking of San Francisco was only a matter of hours now. Since these creatures seemingly all are on land now, I want to test out if the waters are safe. I also want a team to be sent to check out that island. We need to find a way to close that damn portal. I don't want any more of those damn things coming from there. How are we supposed to close a portal that withstood a nuclear detonation right on it? Well, Let's first check to see if the portal is still functioning and we will go from there. 0605 San 49th, 196 E. Primopolis, Mac Imperium. Underwood looked up at the Queen of the Magus Imperium. Although I do not like the amount of damage that was caused, I would like to thank you and your country for providing so much assistance to mine. Underwood internally chuckled. She still maintains her pride. At least it's not arrogance. She does want to get off the throne as soon as possible but we are definitely not making it easy for her. She is most definitely upset with that. Oh well, not like I can do anything about it. The CIA really loves someone who doesn't have the will to care that much. We were just doing what had to be done. These creatures were a threat to all humankind and wiping them out is the top priority of my country. 17. Chapter 123, Pushing Through. 0403 June 19, 2020 CE. Alimany Boulevard, San Francisco. 
a single Abrams flanked by two Bradleys behind it pushed forwards on Sickles Avenue in order to try to get to Sugamore Street from Alimony Boulevard. The Abrams main cannon fired into the crowd of monsters in front. All the machine guns on the tank were basically firing as fast as possible while trying not to overheat. The Bradley's 25mm were also going to town and laying down lead. Eric had finally been reunited with the remnants of his original unit. The second lieutenant was leading the way as they advanced behind their advancing armor. Although there doesn't seem to be any monsters small enough to fit. We are still going to have to clear all the buildings to make sure, keep an eye on your side boys, don't let them sneak up on you. The response was a bit muted since everyone was tired but everyone nodded, look alive, look alive boys. I know we are all tired but we have a city to liberate. Eric raised his rifle and fired a few shots into the horde of monsters. The armor was doing most of the work but he and the rest of the infantry didn't want to be left out. Of course it was uncertain if they had much effect since the armor was tearing the monsters apart. During all this time, he had yet to see a monster retreat. They all just seemingly mindlessly advanced with no care of casualties or fear for their lives. Eric got his back to a wall of a house. He was in a line of soldiers ready to breach and to clear the place. The soldier by the door kicked it open and entered. 0703 June 19, 2020 CE Washington DC the Chief of Naval Operations, Jeffrey Mills, was in the Situation Room. The Navy at Naval Port San Diego and Naval Station Pearl Harbor were able to send ships into the Pacific. We have yet to receive any news of them being attacked. The President nodded. Although the enemy invasion is dying down, I want the Navy to form a defensive blockade at Hawaii and the West Coast. Prepare a special forces team with protective gear and get them on that island to check it out actually get the Navy to blockade the island too. On that, sir, we should probably get a scientist to study that portal too. Ronel mulled over that. What kind of scientist? There was silence at that question. Homeland Security Advisor Taylor Scar responded with a bit of uncertainty. Maybe one that deals with wormholes? Krausen looked at him with a bit of confusion. You think it's a wormhole? Then what kind of scientist do we get? We will look around and see who we can find. Maybe we can find one that actually studies portals. Ronel shook his head. Make sure the person you get is an actual scientist and not a nut job. Not much of a difference but we will see. A few minutes later, Ronel leaned back and looked at the screens in the Situation Room. It ranged from news broadcasts to military maps that showed the progress of their push to retake San Francisco. An aide's voice broke through the quietness. Mr. President. We have gotten information on the chemical that the monsters used in their chemical attack. The scientist is contacting us via video. Put him on screen then. A person appeared on the TV screen in front of the situation room. The aide rattled off information. This is Desmond Shah, a leading expert on chemical weapons and among the team studying the chemical sample we obtained. Nice to meet you Dr. Shah. Desmond sat down on the screen. An honor to meet you Mr. President. My chemists have discovered a few things about the gas that these monsters used in their chemical attack. Go on, these chemical compounds don't exist on Earth so we are unable to link it to any known chemicals. However through testing, we have been able to find that its effects are very similar to phosgene. It has many differences such as being green and a few other peculiarities that we are still testing. I don't really know what phosgene is, care to explain? Of course, I will just give you a quick description. Phosgene is a chemical compound that was used as a weapon during the First World War. It's a colorless gas with a suffocating odor. Phosgene targets the respiratory system, causing severe damage to the lungs and leading to a slow and painful death by suffocation. San Francisco 0615 June 19, 2020 CE A soldier to his right fired off an AT-4 at the creature a few yards in front of him. It smacked it right in the chest area and punched a hole through it. Eric stopped shooting his rifle and sighed. Another one down. Let's see if there's any more around. They looked around the street that was littered with the corpses of the monsters. Most of the monster corpses were blasted into pieces. His unit's second lieutenant walked up and shouted at them. We are clearing the nearby houses. We need you two on one of the breaching teams. Eric was the first one in. He pointed his M27 rifle with a flashlight attachment into the first room down the hallway. The light shone into the dark room. It was a living room with a TV and couch. 
A person was slumped over the couch. Eric called out to the person. You all right? Eric walked up and shook the person a bit. Foam dripped down his mouth and his eyes were glazed. Eric quickly stepped back in a bit of shock. His second lieutenant, which Eric hadn't noticed earlier, shook his head with a grim look on his face. He's dead, most likely from the chemical attack. 17. Chapter 124, Reclamation of San Francisco Part 1 0700 June 19, 2020 CE Two miles of the shore of San Francisco, the USS Bunker Hill sailed within a couple miles of the beaches of San Francisco. Black smoke was rising into the air from the middle of San Francisco. The captain of the Bunker Hill peered through his binoculars at the city. He started muttering, the lieutenant commander, the executive officer of the ship, looked to his commanding officer, Captain, those damn monsters, I wished we could have killed those fucking things. Me too Cap, we couldn't do much in this scenario, we just make sure that no more of these monsters get on shore, the captain nodded, command seems to be considering an amphibious assault to push those things in from the other side, we have a ton of amphibious assault ships at San Diego, don't these monsters have anti-air we need to worry about Cap? The ships from Hawaii are en route to take out their giant detection thing in the middle of the ocean. Although it's moving away from San Francisco, we aren't sure about its air detection range so we are basically waiting for the pursuing ships to get it. Once that's clear, I think the Marine Corps will begin an amphibious assault. 1000 June 19, 2020 CE Washington DC Kralson nodded and got off the phone. We are receiving reports of confirmed civilian deaths due to the chemical attack. They were trapped in the city and couldn't escape in time. Ronell looked over from the reports he was reading. What is the death toll predicted to be like? We are expecting around 10,000 or possibly more civilian deaths. We are also expecting around 500 military deaths. Ronell shook his head. This is a national tragedy. That's two times more deaths than 9-11 and Pearl Harbor combined. It's been nearly 70 years since an invasion of American soil. What is the cost of the damages? Kralson shrugged. Hundreds of millions of dollars, possibly even a billion. Just a guess but the city has taken a lot of damage. We will probably need professionals to calculate it. Ronell shook his head in grim resignation and looked to an aide. Arrange a trip across the refugee camps. I need to speak to them and reassure these people. Also prepare for me a trip to San Francisco once we have defeated the invasion. I want to take a look at myself. Around 350 miles north away from Pearl Harbor. The Ali Burke class destroyers USS Chung Hoon, USS Halsey, USS Chafee and USS McKeel Murphy sailed at a brisk pace in the Pacific. The four destroyers were part of Destroyer Squadron 31. The commander of Destroyer Squadron 31 was aboard the USS Halsey and was shouting into the radio with delight. We finally get to kill one of those fucking things. Blast them. All four ships launched ten harpoon missiles one after another. 0820 June 19, 2020 CE. Two miles of the shore of San Francisco. Two WASP class amphibious assault ships. Two San Antonio class amphibious transport docks. And the Harpers Ferry class landing ship dock sailed closer to the USS Bunker Hill. From his ship, the captain of the USS Bunker Hill could see the full aircraft complement on the two WASP classes. Each had six F 35 BS stealth strike fighters, four AH 1Z Vipers attack helicopters. 12 megavolts 22B Osprey Tiltraters, CH 53E Super Stallion Heavy Lift Helicopters, 3 UH 1Y Venom Utility Helicopters. The captain whistled at the sight of it. Those monsters are in for it now. 100 miles north of Destroyer Squadron 31, a youth, a massive rectangular dark red mass similar to the being that the U.S. Air Force took out in order to destroy the monster's air detection capabilities, floated back towards the island that it came from. It could no longer hear the voices that came from the island so it was going back to figure out what happened. If it couldn't pass on the communication and orders, it was very useless to the forces on the ground so it was tasked with going back to find out what went wrong. It felt that something was moving very fast towards it. In fact, it felt like many objects were moving towards it. The frog-like anti-air monsters jumped around on top of F and positioned themselves towards the incoming objects. Forty harpoons approached the lumbering sea giant at over 500 miles per hour. 
The frog-like creatures jumped around aboard a hoof in a desperate attempt to position themselves to intercept the missiles. However, the harpoon were skimming the sea and the monsters were sitting on top of the sea giant. They had no way of actually intercepting it. The forty harpoons slammed into the side of the monster. F tilted to the right as the explosive force of the missiles pushed it. It felt tremendous pain and its purple blood pushed out of its left side. Its consciousness slowly faded. Around 350 miles north away from Pearl Harbor, the commander of the USS Halsey received the report on the harpoon missiles he had fired. Sir, all missiles have been confirmed to have hit the target. Our radar is still indicating that the enemy vessel is still afloat so we do not know if it was effective. The commander nodded. Then we will have to wait and see. It's a very massive ship, bigger than one of our aircraft carriers so it will take some time for it to sink. A few minutes later, the enemy vessel has disappeared from radar. Sir, it should have been sunk. Relay that back to command. We got the bastards. 0830 June 19th. 2020 CE. Two miles of the shore of San Francisco. F 35BS vertically took off from the two WASP class amphibious assault ships. They hovered into the sky and flew off towards San Francisco. The CACs with M 1A1 Abrams and AFs carrying Marines were launched from the various large ships into the ocean. On the WASP class ships, Marines piled into MV-22 Ospreys as the Tiltraters on the Ospreys spun up. Intersection of Far Alone Street and Orizabu Avenue. At the middle of the intersection, Eric looked around him. He had to turn his head around because of the limited view offered by his gas mask. The sun was rising and giving the sky a mix of yellow and light blue. The green gas had been dissipating and was mostly gone. The intersection looked totally clear. Not a sign of those monsters were around. 14. Chapter 125, The Reclamation of San Francisco Part 2 0836 June 19, 2020 CE Northern part of Ocean Beach, San Francisco White smoke spewed out the turrets of the AFs as they got closer and closer to the shore. The cacks followed right behind as smoke covered their approach. Although there wasn't anything on the beach, it was a safety precaution in case there were some monsters hiding somewhere. The AFs smoothly went from the sea onto the land their tracks making marks on the sand. The AFs stopped on the beach and the back door opened. U.S. Marines wearing gas masks piled out of the back and onto the sand. Some kneeled as others took up positions behind their AFs. A command was shouted. Beach is clear. There's no resistance. Move into the city. Marines rushed forward on the beach and lined up against the sandy hills that separated the beach from the road. Behind them, M1A1 Abrams rolled onto the beach from the deflated lacacs that had let down their gates. Osprey Tiltraters touched down on the open areas of the beach and more marines with gas masks came running out the back of them. Intersection between Upper Great Highway and Lincoln Way. The first Abrams cleared the sandy hills and was able to get onto the road. The turret turned towards a lone humanoid monster when the commander of the tank noticed it. Gunner. Target in front. Heat. Up. Fire. On the way. The M830A1 heat round smashed into the monster and decimated it. Marines rushed onto the road followed by the AFs and more Abrams. Minerva Street, San Francisco. Eric looked up to the sky as a pair of jets roared through the sky. His second lieutenant's size followed the aircraft as they zipped through the sky in a low pass. Seems like we finally have air support again. Eric nodded. This should make this job so much easier. We still have to clear everything house by house though. Eric sighed. There's literally nothing in the houses. The monsters don't go in them at all. Seems like command is not taking any risks. We still need to clear them just in case. Don't want our logistics to be randomly attacked in the back. Besides, more marines are landing in order to clear San Francisco from the other side. Should make the job faster. Also why are you still wearing your gas masks? Eric perked up a bit. Huh? Don't you see that none of the green stuff is in the air anymore? It dissipated an hour or so ago. Eric looked around and what he had been told was completely true. The air that once had a green tint to it had become completely clear. Eric took off his gas mask before he spoke. I guess we were so focused on liberating the city that we didn't notice it clearing up. 1150 June 19th. 2020 CE Washington DC The situation in San Francisco is all but clearing up it is turning into a clean up and mop up operation of the monsters left there 
That means we can turn our attention to that island if I'm correct. Yes Mr. President, the Navy already has ships heading there in order to blockade it. On board them are a team of Navy SEALs as you requested and are outfitted with CPRN protection. They will be inserted onto the island to clear it and check the portal. What about the scientists? We have contacted scientists who study wormholes, other dimensions, and portals. We aren't certain about what insights they could give us if any but we are hopeful for anything. A few hours later, somewhere in the Pacific, on board the USS Hopper, an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, 16 men of a Navy SEALs team prepared their gear for the duty. Listen up, at exactly 0900 Hawaii time, we will board the ribs and make our way onto the island. Make sure your CPRN gear is fit on tight. The island got nuked so it's irradiated. Don't let your guard down. We have been given information that the portal, which the higher-ups expect was what brought these monsters, is still active. Be cautious and expect possible hostiles. Sir. Yes, sir. 1155 June 19, 2020 CE. San Francisco. Hidden behind a building, Eric looked out into the street. He swished his head from the right to the left and stopped. They were becoming fewer and fewer in number but he was staring at one of the humanoid-type monsters that was directly to the left. The others in his platoon also noticed what he was staring at. He started quietly backing away until a deafening boom. He heard the mechanical whir and tracks of the thing before he saw it. An Abrams rolled down onto the street followed by a platoon of soldiers. Eric waved out to them and they waved back. Eric turned to his second lieutenant. Seems like we met up with the Marines that did the amphibious landing. San Francisco will soon be fully retaken. Eric shook hands with what he supposed was the commanding officer of the platoon. The woman in question answered what he was speculating. Second Lieutenant Wendy Frisk with the 5th Marine Regiment. We are part of the amphibious assault. Corporal Eric Liu with the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit. We were the initial response force. My second lieutenant is busy with getting clarification from our captain right now. Didn't really expect to meet you guys here. Resistance on this side has been light so we have been advancing extremely fast. Island in the Pacific. The SEAL team squad of eight men quickly slid out of their ribs and kneeled on what had been once a sandy beach. Black gas masks obscured their faces and they were all wearing heavy CPRN gear. Trinitite sand that had been fused into a glassy residue, covered the beach. I'm not seeing any form of life on the shores. The nuclear missile has done a number on the environment of the island. Cautiously move up, bring the talents with us just in case we find the portal. Three of the seals each carried out a heavy rectangular object from one of the ribs. 6. Chapter 126, Through the Gates of Hell. 1205 June 19th. 2020 CE. Modesto Junior College West Campus, currently a refugee camp, Modesto, California. It took a bit of time but Andrew finally found them. Come here you two. Both of them shouted in happiness when they noticed his voice. Dad, they ran up to him and embraced him in a deep hug. Andrew smiled as they hugged him. His son was the first to speak up. Dad, you smell awful. Andrew chuckled. Yeah. My clothing has seen better days. A woman approached him. Sir, these are your children? Yeah, I'm Andrew Molinoz, part of the SFPD. I was helping with the evacuations and I was separated from them. The woman nodded. Thank you for your service. Sir, I was just doing my job. The entire police force was there alongside me. The woman who was probably part of the team helping at the refugee camp nodded again. I'm Sarah a volunteer helping parents find missing children and also taking care of the children that were evacuated without their parents. We just need you to fill out the form to confirm that these children have found their guardian. Follow me, sir. Sure. Do we have any news on the situation? I think I heard that the military is taking back the city. Andrew gave a sigh of relief. That's great news. Island in the Pacific. The 16 men of the SEAL team platoon slowly inched towards the center of the island. Black gas masks obscured their faces and they were all wearing heavy CPRN gear. The entire island had been flattened and only a couple pieces of rubble was present here and there. In front of the 16 men was a mass of swirling green air. It was extraordinarily tall and wide. To the sides of the portal were pieces of what looked to have been a frame. One of the soldiers spoke, I think that's the portal. Another soldier nodded, move up slowly, we are dealing with the unknown here. I'm gonna contact command. A small part of what we believe was the frame of the gate is still there. 
The portal looks like some sort of swirling green mass. Can you confirm that the island is clear? As far as we can see, the island is empty other than the portal. It has been basically flattened by the nuclear blast. Copy that. Set up positions around the portal. Go ahead with what was planned. Stay cautious. Understood. The three men set down each of their heavy rectangular objects on the ground and started setting them up. They ensured that the electronics on each were still working. All ready to go. The squad leader, a chief petty officer, nodded. Send the first one in. The heavy rectangular objects were talons, a small unmanned ground vehicle capable of multiple missions. These specific talons were special operations types which meant they were outfitted with cameras and listening devices. The first talons caterpillar tracks spun the vehicle forward and into the portal. As they were situated on the edge of the portal, it was a strange sight for the SEAL team. One half of the unmanned ground vehicle was into the portal so if you looked on the other side of the portal, it wasn't there. 1510 June 19th. 2020 CE Washington DC three screens around the situation room came to life as a video feed was broadcasted from each of the talents cameras directly to the White House Ronell commented whilst staring at the screens it definitely looks like a portal on another screen commander Orville the liaison officer for this mission and the commanding officer of the seal team that the platoon conducting the mission was part of spoke up they are sending it in now Mr. President, island in the Pacific, one of the SEALs was flipping switches on what seemed to be a computer in a metal storage box which was the operator control unit for the Talon, the operator of the first Talon spoke, first one is in, visuals are working, the connection and controls are fine, mobility is good, the lieutenant gave further commands, everything seems to work, send the rest in, the talons tracks spurred up dust behind it as it moved on the dusty ground, a mechanical zooming noise could be heard as its camera adjusted by moving up and down, two of the other talons entered from the portal and split off in other directions to the left and right, Washington DC, Kralson spoke out loud to himself, this is definitely another world, each video showed a red sky devoid of any celestial elements, not a single vegetation could be seen, it seemed like a desert if not for the fact that it was clearly red dust. Ronell nodded. It looks just like Mars. Now where did these monsters come from? It seems completely empty. Command Rawville replied. We will have the operators start moving them further and seeing what they can find. Ten minutes later. That's a city. Isn't it? There was a bit of doubt in Ronell's voice as he viewed the video feed. Kralson nodded. I suppose so. One of the talons was perched on what seemed to be the edge of a cliff. It was the only one with something other than a dusty red desert in front of it. The video from this specific unmanned ground vehicle showed what seemed to be a black mass of objects. Some of the objects seemed to have the appearance of skyscrapers whilst most looked like spires. It was hard to distinguish the exact features. It looked like a city but it felt off to everyone in the room. How close do you think we can get? Command Rawville replied, Mr. President. None of the talons have run into any of the creatures yet so I think we can get quite close, then get it as close as possible without it being seen, to the people sitting in the situation room, it was surprising that these monsters even had a city seeing how mindless the invading horde was, on screen, as the camera from the ground drone zoomed in, they could make out some of the beings that were outside of the city. It all but confirmed that the city was occupied by the same creatures that had landed in San Francisco. The camera zoomed back out as they took in the view of the city. Spirals made out of some dark material could be seen reaching the skies. The entire city was made of some sort of dark material. The connection to the video feed suddenly ceased. Ronell looked concerned. Huh, what happened? The video then came on again. Kralson responded, probably a connection issue. It is being broadcasted back from a portal. Command Rawville's words interrupted Kralson. Mr. President, the SEAL team is reporting that the portal is flickering. Flickering? Is it about to close? We are uncertain. It seemed to have stopped flickering now. Does this mean it could close at any second? We have no idea how to maintain the portal do we? The commander shook his head. As we don't have much information on portals and how they exactly work. We can't really assume anything. Ronell nodded. Well, we found something. What do we do now? 7. Chapter 127. Modern problems require modern solutions. 1525 June 19th. 
2020 CE Washington DC Krausen brought the room to attention. Mr. President, I think we need to retaliate. We did destroy their invasion force but we should send them a message to never come back. Ronell looked at Carlson. And how do you suggest we do that? Seeing that the UGVs haven't found any other cities and this one is clearly populated by these monsters, I think we should nuke it. Are we able to get a nuke there? I'm not sending anyone into that world unless we know they can come back. Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, Stephen, nodded. Here's the idea Mr. President, it's quite simple, we put Nuke onto a drone and drop it over that city. Ronel frowned. Are we certain we are able to operate an aerial drone through the portal? I know we weren't certain if ground drones could operate there until we tried. Stephen contemplated it for a second. Well, it seems that radio signals are capable of passing through the portal. This is why we are still able to control the three UGVs we sent in. In addition, According to how far the UGVs traveled, the monster city can be seen from a cliff only about a bit over 0.5 miles from the portal. It's not a long distance. How does this translate to aerial drones? Usually our aerial drones use satellite communications to be controlled but they are capable of being controlled by a ground control station if within short range. With the city being only about one mile from the portal, it should work if we place a ground control station outside of the portal. Okay. Do we have a drone that is big enough to carry a nuke? Stephen nodded. We do, Mr. President. The QF-16. QF-16? An unmanned old F-16. We have been using those as practice targets since 2013. We can put two B-61 nuclear bombs each with a 340 kiloton yield on it and drop them over that city. Although I think one would be more than enough. Ronel crossed his arms and leaned back on his chair. What does everybody in this room think about this idea? Murmurs of agreement arose from the rest of the members of the National Security Council. We need to pay them back for what they did to San Francisco. Let the door hit them in their ass on their way out. They are human-eating monsters and they launched chemical missiles at one of our major cities. A nuclear strike is completely justified. The president considered the idea from those murmurs of agreements. Are there any possibilities of civilized non-monster beings there? Mr. President, based on the environment of this world, I don't believe it is suited for long-term survival of anything else other than these monsters. Especially considering the fact that these monsters just seem to eat other living beings without regard. This world has been barren other than that city. Ronel pondered for a few seconds before responding, Commander Orville. Can we get confirmation that the portal is big enough for an F-16 to fit through? The commander on screen nodded. A few seconds later, the answer came. The portal seems big enough to fit an aircraft carrier. We shouldn't have any trouble getting a F-16 in there. Ronel nodded. Then get the F-16 there as fast as possible. We don't want this portal closing before we drop it. Stephen responded. Please get the Chief of Naval Operations and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. They should be at the Pentagon. A few minutes later, on another screen in the Situation Room, the Chief of Naval Operations, Darren Mitchell, and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Sam Brown, were talking to the President. Sam was responding, Mr. President, and QF-16 with both drop tanks can get to the island from Hawaii. That's good then. There are two issues with this Mr. President. First of all, it's going to have to land on that island but there's no airfield there. Second, if the QF-16 is carrying both drop tanks, it can't carry a B-61 nuclear gravity bomb. Ronel frowned. How about aerial refueling? Don't we have aircraft specifically for this? We have only ever done a couple tests of aerial refueling of a drone. Never with a QF-16. In this situation, a QF-16 carrying a nuclear bomb. Ronel sighed. Can't we have it take off from an aircraft carrier then? Darren shook his head. Mr. President, an F-16 is not meant to take off from an aircraft carrier. Then does the Navy operate any drones capable of carrying nuclear bombs? We don't have that capability, Mr. President. Then are you able to find a way to get an F-16 drone in the air through that portal and of it drop a nuclear bomb or two on that city? Sam was the one who responded. It will be an undertaking but we believe we can do it. The Pentagon is formulating a plan right now. Give us a couple hours and I think we can have an operation underway. The SEAL team currently on that island will have to stay there. Two hours later, on screen, Commander Orville spoke. 
Mr. President, the portal had flickered again a few minutes earlier. Ronel had just come back from a break. How long was it since the previous flicker? Two hours and five minutes, sir. Okay, keep track of the timing of the next flicker. Let's see if there's a pattern. Stephen, any word from the Pentagon? They have a plan and will be sending it to you once they finalize a few things. It requires your approval due to its involvement in the usage of nuclear weapons. Ten minutes later, the National Security Council were all flipping through documents that detail the operation. Stephen put his document down. What do you think Mr. President? This plan seems quite good but there is a concerning part about the transportation of the nuclear bomb on page 5, the delivery to the island part? Ronell chuckled. Are we certain this is safe? The two nuclear bombs won't be armed during transport and delivery so there is no risk of it going off. Less than an hour later, Travis Air Force Base, California. IC-17 Globemaster III taxied onto the runway. Its cargo compartment was filled with pallets and a Humvee. 8. Chapter 128. Nuclear Logistics. Next. 1830 June 19, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. Command Rawville appeared on screen in the Situation Room. Mr. President, the SEAL team has informed me that the portal has flickered again. It's been exactly two hours since the last flicker. Ronell nodded. It seems to be decreasing by five minutes every time it flickers. Let's wait for the next flicker before confirmation. One hour and fifty-five minutes later, Command Rawville's appearance on screen again confirmed what they had earlier predicted. We are now certain it's decreasing by five minutes every flicker. Based on this pattern. We are predicting that the portal will close in exactly 23 hours from now. Ronell looked to Stephen. Is that enough time? Stephen nodded. If everything goes smoothly, that's more than enough time for us to complete the operation. Sky over the Pacific. As two KC-135 Strato tankers flew close in front of two C-17s, each of their flying booms connected to the top of each of the C-17s cockpit. The four aircraft steadily flew in the formation, as the KC-135s refueled the C-17S. Fuel was being disgorged at around a thousand liters per minute. Thirty minutes later, each of the two massive aircrafts carefully disconnected from each other. The two KC-135s banked right as it turned back towards the Hickam Air Base in Hawaii and the two C-17S continued forward. 1505 June 19. 2020 CE. Hickam Air Base Hawaii, the QF-16, which looked no different from a regular F-16 other than the orange paint on its stabilizers and wingtips, began a careful descent onto the runway of the airbase. A few hours later, island in the Pacific, after resting on the destroyers stationed offshore of the island, the SEAL team had brought more supplies on their return to the island from the ships. They were still wearing their CPRN suits as the island was most likely highly radioactive from the nuclear missile. The setting sun illuminated the ocean in front of them. The package should be arriving soon. Sir, I see the two C-17s. The massive grey military cargo jets appeared in the darkening sky. The last of the sun's rays were shining on them from the west which made them seemingly glitter. The first C-17 flew closer to the ground and its speed seemed to have slowed. The back ramp of the C-17 opened and pallets slid out. One by one, pallets flew out of the back of the C-17 and their parachutes opened up. The sky was soon filled with a line of pallets and parachutes. As the C-17 flew closer to the end of the island, the final object was a Humvee that also flew out with its parachute opening up. The C-17's ramp started closing and the aircraft began to pull up. After the first finished, the second C-17 started its airdrop a few yards to the left of the first C-17. Multiple pallets with parachutes dropped out which formed another line of pallets in the sky as the ones from the first C-17 started hitting the ground. The SEAL team moved into action as the second C-17 made its pass. Find the pallet with the nuclear bombs and keep it secure. There should be two pallets, each with one B-61 nuclear gravity bomb. It should be from the first C-17. The men fanned out. I have the first pallet. Can you confirm? It's labeled B-61 nuclear bomb. They soon found the second one. Securum Ramirez. Keep an eye on the nuclear bombs. Rest of you guys start getting the AM2 matting out and start setting up the airfield. Other than Ramirez, 
the rest of the seals started unpacking the pallets from the first C-17 and taking out the steel rectangles that were coated in epoxy non-skid material. The AM-2 matting was a special matting capable of withstanding a jet landing on it. The SEAL Team platoon started laying down the matting onto the ground and connecting them together in order to form a runway. An hour later, the men's night vision goggles emitted a faint glow into the night. Although dark, the AM-2 matting formed a long rectangular runway on the right side of the island. They had stationed the Humvee less than a thousand feet away from the runway. The back half of this Humvee had been replaced by a large rectangular metal box. The lieutenant started to explain to the men, We have the universal ground control station on this Humvee. This will be what we use to control that QF-16. Raymeris, since you are trained for UAV operations, you will be the one flying the QF-16 once we take possession of it. The last thing we have to do now is to get the drums of JP-8 kerosene fuel and the jet fuel transfer pump out of the pallets. They are in the rest of the pallets. Remember, keep them away from the runway. We don't want an explosion happening due to a misplaced barrel of fuel. Thirty minutes later, almost completely dark, the only lights came from the destroyers out at sea. The lieutenant barked out orders. The QF-16 is in Hawaii now. Since the drone will be attempting to land on what can barely be called a makeshift runway, it's been decided to attempt the landing during daylight since we should have enough time before the portal closes. Take shifts and get some rest. Keep an eye on the portal and make sure nothing comes out of it. 8 End of Block 2